Chapter 541 Gambling Above the sea of clouds is the endless blue sky. The sky here is clean and clear. And it always lights up very early. The strong winds fill the sails of the ship. As if a pair of invisible hands are pushing the magic airship forward. The butler led Serdak into a separate dining room. The view of this restaurant is very broad. And you can see the sea of clouds outside the glass window. Count Alexia was sitting at the dining table. Surrounded by four waiters from the restaurant. There was a plate inlaid with gold in front of him. He smiled at Serdak and nodded. Motioning for Serdak to sit down. On the chair to his left. The waiter quickly put a napkin around Serdak's chest and poured him a glass of aperitif. The housekeeper whispered a few words beside Count it. And Count it's gray eyebrows jumped slightly. With a curious expression on his face. He asked Serdak. I heard from David that you just went out for morning exercise? The old count did not say those words of thanks when he opened his mouth, but instead pulled Soldak to talk about daily topics. Soldak's slightly nervous mood relaxed a little and replied, Yes, as long as conditions permit. Daily morning exercise is essential, so as to maintain the best physical condition. Every armored knight needs to maintain good physical condition at all times, because he may be called to a certain battlefield at any time. It is not easy for young people to be so self-disciplined. When I was young, I was also a construct knight. But at that time, I always felt that being in the army was too hard. I often had to fight enemies who were much stronger than me on the battlefield. So military service, I insisted on retiring as soon as the term was over. If I could have persisted a little longer, maybe we wouldn't be in this situation now. Erlid's eyes showed nostalgia. Soldek rubbed his nose and said, I'm not always like this. Sometimes I lie in bed and don't want to get up. The waiter in the restaurant brought a plate of meatloaf covered with thick sauce and asked Soldak if he wanted it. Soldak nodded and said yes. Rolet sat on the chair and said, Young people like you probably don't know how enviable it is to be able to sleep more. As people get older, their sleep will become worse and worse. For example, I drink a glass of golden cider every day before going to bed. Even so, I can only sleep for a while. I will wake up when there is the slightest movement and then I lie quietly in bed waiting for the dawn to come. And then what flashes through my mind it's all the past that I can't bear to look back on. He looked out the window, as if he could see the past events in his memory through the glass window. Not long after, he woke up from his memories, picked up the spoon and said to Soldek, My appetite is not very good. I can only drink a little oat milk in the morning. But a young man like you should eat more. Replenish your physical strength. Soldek happened to stuff a piece of meat pie into his mouth, and was speechless. He could only nod it rudely. Count ITT didn't care at all, but asked Serdak curiously, You are a noble of the Lensa, but I seem to have never seen you before. Only then did Soldak swallow the beef patties that were a bit chewy in his mouth, and explained to Count it, Well, I am not a hereditary noble. I am a third-class baronet, who was recently conferred by His Majesty Charles. Count Iter thought seriously for a moment, and the butler next to him whispered a few words into Count Iter's ear again. Only then did Count Iter's eyes light up. He looked at Soldak seriously again, and said to him with a faint smile, Oh, I remembered. You are the pride of our Halanza. The plain war in the Maka plain has brought out the momentum of us Bena people. The old Count waved his hand passionately, and made a chopping motion. Hey, young man, you did a great job, Count it said appreciatively. The two chatted happily until the end of breakfast. Several young aristocratic ladies were sitting in the corner of the restaurant and several young aristocrats in formal attire were sitting across the dining table. The group of people were chatting animatedly, and from time to time, they let out elegant chuckles, which made the waiters in the restaurant look at them. This group of young nobles, Soldak and the old count walked to the door of the restaurant and happened to meet the group of construct knights. They seemed to have just finished their morning exercises and had taken a shower. They walked into the restaurant freshly dressed and saw Soldak. When he came, the leading construct knight nodded politely to him. But the eyes of the construct knights behind him looked very unfriendly and full of disdain. Serdak stood in the corridor and said goodbye to Count it. The old Count stood at the door of the restaurant, leaning on a cane, and asked, Baron Soldak, do you want to play cards together later? Playing cards? Serdak had never even seen what playing cards looked like. But he wanted to see the so-called chess and cards socializing among nobles. After thinking about it for a moment, he readily accepted Count It's invitation and said, Okay, see you later. The old Earl pointed to the butler beside him, indicating that the butler would go to the room to invite him later. Serdak saluted, turned and returned to his room. At this moment, 
the deck was crowded with civilians who came out to relax. They crowded on the edge of the ship's side and looked at the sea of clouds and the rising sun, exclaiming in wonder from time to time. There is also an entertainment room on the magic airship. This entertainment room is only open to nobles. It is said that the captain occasionally comes here to play. In addition to the two card tables, there are two billiard tables in the entertainment room and two more against the wall. There is a dart board. The walls of the room are covered with gorgeous wallpaper. The floor is covered with soft carpets. And some fruit plates and tea are placed on the square table next to the wall. Serdak and Earl were sitting at the card table chatting. Only then did Earl know that Suldak had never played cards before. So he told him the rules of cards in detail. He couldn't explain clearly on his own. So he asked the butler to cooperate. The two explained how to play this kind of card. Serdak listened carefully for a while and realized that although the rules of the card were something he had never been exposed to before, it was not difficult to understand. He then asked Earl for a few more words. The two didn't wait too long. Two ladies came to the entertainment room with their maids. When they saw two people sitting at the card table, their eyes lit up. The lady with a pointed chin pulled her companion, holding a folding fan in her hand. She took the initiative to come to the card table. Her eyebrows were slender, and her pointed chin was raised high. She looked extremely proud. She looked deeply at Earlet and asked, Can I sit here? I wish you all, Earlet said with a smile. He and Soldak were sitting here, waiting for nobles, who were willing to play cards, to come over and join in the game. The lady sat reservedly on the chair, and the other lady didn't say anything and sat down directly opposite her best friend. Before everyone could start, the group of construct knights also followed into the entertainment room. A group of construct knights occupied a pool table. But one of the construct knights looked at the card table here. His eyes first fell on the faces of the two ladies. And then he saw Suldak on the card table. He walked to the card table and stared at Suldak. The meaning of his eyes was very clear. And he clearly wanted to let Suldak win. Serdak gave up his position. Serdak sat on the chair without moving. Looking at the construct knight in front of him doubtfully. The housekeeper wanted to come forward to solve the problem. But Earl had reached out to stop him. Seeing that the conflict between the two parties was about to break out, one of the ladies with a round face stood up immediately and said, It happens that I don't really want to play cards. If you want to play, I can give up my seat to you. After she finished speaking to the construct knight, she gave up her seat. The maid behind her moved a chair and placed it behind the lady with a pointed chin. She sat down behind her best friend and gently brushed her shiny black hair, ignoring the gazes around her. The construct knight was also a nobleman. He wore an exquisite leather armor with magic patterns and sat on the chair without saying a word. His tall and tall figure looked outstanding sitting on the chair and his golden hair was combed by him. Meticulously, he nodded politely to the lady opposite and glared at Soldak. Earl had raised his head and glanced at the construct knight and the noble lady opposite and asked politely, Can we start? Both the construct knight and the pointy chin lady said they were ready to deal the cards at any time. At the card table, the card skills of Erlit and the noble construct knight were obviously better. But Suldak didn't lose many chips. Because it was just a pastime in itself. There was no greed. And every hand seemed he is very cautious. Throwing chips on the table one by one. And occasionally make small gains. The lady was the most immersed in the game. But her poker skills were average. And she didn't have much luck. The pile of chips in the tray quickly bottomed out. Although the noble knight won some chips. He was a little absent-minded and always stared at the noble lady, who was watching the battle with his burning eyes. The lady's expression was dull, as if she couldn't see the hot gaze of the construct knight. The lady with a pointed chin tentatively asked the construct knight a few questions, and then she found out that he was a construct knight who completed the mission in Alensa City and returned to Benis City. However, the construct knight did not know which department he belonged to. Explain? The noble lady with a pointed chin occasionally chatted with Count Itter. Serdak was a little confused. Aren't everyone nobles from Halanza City? Why are they so strange to each other? Obviously the old Earl is not familiar with them. It seems that he has no contact with them. It is normal that they are not familiar with the noble knights. But do they not know each other? At this time, I heard Earl had said, The climate here is still too cold. When winter comes, the joints all over my body hurt terribly. I can't help it. It's a problem I got when I was young. So I want to move to the south. A place with a warm and dry climate is best. Do you want to go to Muglad? The noble lady sitting watching the battle raised her head and asked Count Itter curiously. Maybe. 
This is a stop on my journey. But I can only make a decision after actual inspection. Earl had said casually. What about you? Baron Serdak, what are you going to do in Benna City? The lady with a pointed chin asked Serdak. Serdak touched his nose and said with a shy smile. I came to Benna City to visit some friends. After the card game ended, the two noble ladies left the entertainment room first. The construct knight followed the two noble ladies first and shouted, Mrs. Dorothy, Annabelle, do you want it? He chased him out of the door, and the sound dissipated at the door. On the contrary, the construct knights were enjoying themselves around the billiard table, and they were all concentrating on the billiards on the table. The group of young and enthusiastic aristocratic ladies and the young aristocrats quickly got together on the magic airship. They could only play together, but further contact was restricted by the rules of the aristocratic family. The marriage of each aristocratic lady after adulthood. It is all arranged by the family. Or it is a political intermarriage. Or in order to recruit talents for the family. The man needs to be recognized by the family. And only by reaching a marriage contract can there be further contact. On the contrary, ladies no longer have this concern. Ladies with relatively strong family backgrounds can even have lovers in addition to their husbands. Because of this, Annabelle and Lady Dorothy are the targets of these noble knights. They are not willing to contact those noble ladies at all. Only the young nobles, who are about to travel far will spend the whole day with them, being entangled together. Although you can't eat, it can relieve the boredom on the journey. Although the construct knights were a bit dissatisfied with Soldak. Until the last day, there was no conflict between the two sides on the magic airship. Serdak didn't gain much in the past few days on the magic airship, apart from learning to play cards. He didn't seem to have gained anything else. After a week's voyage, the majestic Benna City finally appeared in Suldek's sight. The noble stood on the observation deck on the top of the ship building, and the civilians stood on the deck. Everyone saw the city of Benna through the gaps in the sea of clouds, giving out a cheer. Earl Itt walked off the magic airship on crutches and stood under the airport tower outside Benna City and waved to Serdek, who was riding a horse. The housekeeper stood quietly behind him with his suitcase watching Soldak ride on horseback along the avenue outside the city wall toward Benna City. The group of young nobles and a group of noble ladies stood at the gate of the airport terminal, showing a reluctant expression. These young nobles will stay at the airport terminal, waiting for the magic airship to fly to Hyinsi, and these noble ladies return to the Benna Swordsman Academy to continue their studies. The magician in magic robe walked behind Count It and asked Count It, Teacher, is this journey going well? If Serdak was still on the airport dock at this moment, he would definitely recognize him as the Dale Magician from the White Elephant Trading Company. The Dale Magician was dressed as if he was about to travel far, standing in front of Erlit. It's okay. Dahl, have you bought the ticket to Boseso City? Erlit looked at Dahl kindly and asked casually. Magician Dale quickly replied, There is no magic airship directly to Bosajuo City in Benna. If you don't want to transfer in the Imperial Capital, you have to go to Hayinsi. Then let's go to Hayinsi, the old count decided, and then smiled at Dahl and said, By the way, I met a very interesting young man on the airship this time. Chapter 542 Regular Meeting The airport terminal in Benna City is located outside the main gate in the south of the city. This airport terminal has allowed a warehouse to be built next to the road outside the city. A main road is bustling with traffic. It is dusk at this time, and workers on both sides of the road are leaving the terminal. A long stream of people formed dragging their tired bodies along the long street towards the main residential area and the inner city. The nobles rode horses, or magic caravans, and galloped through the middle of the road. Both sides of the road are crowded with various small vendors. Some selling snacks and snacks, some selling seasonal vegetables, and some selling daily groceries, making this street a simple night market and attracting many civilians to stop. There are no entry taxes or market taxes on goods in this market, so the prices of many goods are quite low. Serdak was riding a horse on the road, and the civilians he encountered moved aside to avoid him. This is the fourth time he has been to Benna City. Looking at the majestic city in front of him and standing under the city wall tens of meters high, he still feels very shocked. A group of homeless people lie on the open space on both sides of the city gate. When some pedestrians and tourists queue up at the city gate waiting to enter the city, they will throw some uneaten and sour food in the package to them, such as scones and whole wheat bread. Most of them, but occasionally there will be unfinished dried chicken and sausages. These homeless people will also take advantage of the night market to pick up some unwanted vegetables, oil residue, and other food at the night market before the market closes. 
Some young wanderers will build a bonfire in the open space outside the city. It is easy to find food in the summer. Some young people will sing and dance next to the fire when they are full. They are a group of free people and at the same time for those who are not protected by the Green Empire's laws. Even if they die outside the city the next day, at most they will be taken to a public cemetery by the night watchman and buried in a hole. When the city gate guard saw Serdak riding on his horse, his eyes would first fall on the noble emblem on his chest. And then, he would look at the magic pattern structure on his body with envy. He would stand up straight and perform a military salute. Then put Serdak in his arms. Duck put into the city. As soon as they entered the city, a group of people came up and asked Serdak if he needed a guide. They could lead Serdak to any neighborhood in Bena City. Soldak shook his head and said he didn't need it. The hands and feet of these guides are not very clean. Not only do they like to take travelers to some contracted hotels, but they also take travelers on detours to some shops along the street to sell some worthless goods. Travelers commissions, but secretly sold traveler information to some shopkeepers, harming the interests of travelers. Finally, before breaking up, he would stand on the street and shout from a distance, Hillbilly. Serdek followed the path in his memory and found the Circle Hotel where the Knights of the Helensa Guard Camp once stayed. The biggest feature of this hotel is that it has more than 800 rooms. And there is one on the first floor that can hold large-scale events. The banquet restaurant has an inner courtyard garden covering an area of nearly two acres. Although the management is a bit rough and the rooms and internal facilities are old, there is nothing to fault about this hotel. Riding a horse into the inner courtyard. The waiter in the hotel came out to hold the horse for Serdek. Serdek jumped off the horse, threw a stack of copper plates to the waiter, and said to the waiter, I want to go there stay here for a few days. He is a brave war horse. So don't let him lose weight. Sir, the people who look after the stables here are all very experienced grooms. Don't worry. The waiter happily accepted the tip and said with a smile on his face. Serdak nodded, climbed the steps, and walked into the hotel. There were many guests waiting to check in in front of the waitress at the front desk of the lobby on the first floor. Serdak was a noble, so there was no need to queue. When he walked into the lobby, a dedicated waitress came up to him and asked Serdak what he needed. I need a quieter room, preferably with a bathroom and a balcony, Soldak said to the waitress. The waitress brought Serdak to the noble resting area, first brought a cup of black tea, and then said to Serdak, You will definitely be satisfied with the luxurious rooms we have specially prepared for nobles like you. She placed the parchment detailed booklet of rooms in the north district in front of Soldak, under the recommendation of the waitress. Soldak chose room 3215 on the third floor of the North District. Walk along the inner corridor of the hotel to the north area. All the rooms in this area are specially open to the nobles. The carpets in the corridor are cleaner than outside. There are also some decorative oil paintings hanging on both sides of the corridor wall. After opening the door and walking in, Soldak discovered that this room was actually a suite, with a separate living room and bedroom. The living room and bedroom were connected to a large balcony. Standing on the balcony, you could see the entire North Street. To the north of the street is a civilian area. The buildings there are all small townhouses. The clotheslines in the narrow courtyard are filled with all kinds of clothes. Some women carrying wooden buckets are collecting clothes in the sunset. Serdak hung the armor on the wooden stand and placed the sword on the table. The big bed in the bedroom was very soft. After lying on it for a while wearing a thin shirt, I felt a little sleepy. Soldak walked to the bathroom and washed his face then opened the window connected to the balcony to let in the air from outside. At this moment, a magic caravan on the North Street downstairs stopped in Soldak's field of vision. He just glanced at it casually and happened to see Mrs. Dorothy walking out of the carriage with the support of the maid. Come down. A young man wearing light yellow sheepskin underwear was waiting on the steps of the townhouse. When he saw Mrs. Dorothy coming down from the carriage, he quickly went to greet her. Mrs. Dorothy held the young man's arm, talked cordially with him and walked into the small townhouse on North Street. The building facing the street was clearly a civilian area. Serdak did not expect that it would be such a coincidence that Mrs. Dorothy had just arrived in Bena City. And she actually ran out to have a private meeting with her lover. And the private meeting happened to be north of the Maple Leaf Hotel, in the civilian residential area of the street. Mrs. Dorothy at the card table was very decent in words and deeds. She did not look like a luxurious and licentious lady. Soldak let out a tisk-tisk sound of admiration probably due to the equal magic contract. Serdak and Aphrodite have some spiritual connections. The other party can feel their relatively strong inner fluctuations and deliberately transmit some signals. When Serdak arrived at the hotel, 
he had already sent some signals to Aphrodite. Just when Serdak stood on the third floor balcony and looked out, he felt that he was surrounded by light blue space elements. And at the same time, a faint hexagram array lit up under his feet. Serdak quickly walked away entering the bedroom, locking the door and closing the curtains. The light in the room immediately dimmed. A space crack in the void was opened by an invisible big hand in front of Serdak. Seeing some breath of nothingness spitting out from the crack in the void, Serdak immediately walked in without any hesitation. He only felt his body pulled by invisible forces. A moment later, Serdak stepped out of the rift in nothingness. Andrew, Samira, and the Ogre Ghoul item were waiting outside the room. When they saw Serdak walking out of the void rift, they breathed a sigh of relief. The succubus Aphrodite stood in the middle of the room with her eyes closed. She also stepped on a magic circle with black light flowing under her feet. Serdak walked out of the void rift, and she slowly opened her eyes. Opening his eyes, he smiled at Soldak and asked softly, Captain, did your trip to Bene City go smoothly this time? Soldak nodded, and he looked at the room where he was standing in the police station. It was also dusk in Wall Village at this moment, and the construction site of the reservoir outside had begun to be completed. The central square of Wall Village looked particularly busy. It's noisy, and everything seems to be normal here in the village. Fortunately, I just settled down at the hotel. Nothing happened here. Right. Soldak sat on the main seat in the room and asked Andrew, who was standing at the door. Several members of the security team sat around the round table, and Andrew reported to Soldak. Well, some adventure groups were restless, like a group of rats, crawling around in the deserted land and sniffing around. Some people ignored the boundary markers and tried to get into the Pussy Mountain to check the distribution of sulfur mines inside. I caught them, I picked up a few of them, and sent them to Paglo's Pass with severe punishment. Serdak nodded. He turned to look at the calm-looking half-elf archer Samira. She didn't have a hood on her head, and her golden curly hair was scattered on her shoulders. He didn't know if it was because the elf blood was awakening in her body, or because her hair had grown longer. Her appearance has recently changed a bit towards that of an elf. Her skin has become crystal clear, and her ears have become a bit more pointed. What about the movements of the rebels? Serdak asked Samira. The half-elf archer raised her head, and the afterglow of the setting sun happened to shine on her pretty face. She squinted her eyes and replied, For the time being, they are hiding well, but they have discovered some suspicious characters. But there is no conclusive evidence. We are currently no arrests were made. Serdak knew that due to limited manpower, it was impossible to track every suspicious person, and he could only let them wander around in the deserted land. Captain, I received a letter here, Andrew said to Soldak. Who wrote this to me? It's an invitation letter from Marquis Luther. Andrew took the letter out of his arms and pushed it in front of Soldak. Marquis Luther? Let me see what the letter says, Soldak said while opening the parchment envelope. There was not much content on the letter. Only a few sentences. Soldak smiled slightly, put down the letter in his hand and said, The general meaning of the letter is to allow me to have time to visit Venice City. What a coincidence. I happen to be in Benna City, and it seems that I have to find time to visit the Marquis of Benna. Then Andrew said, The construction of the main embankment of the third level reservoir has officially begun, but it has been raining in the past few days. Mayor Bright probably wants to postpone it for a few days. Soldak nodded slightly and said, Is there anything else? Several members of the security team looked at each other and said at the same time, No more. The succubus Aphrodite sitting opposite Serdak said with an ambiguous look, Captain, the duration of this summons is about one and a half hours. Of course, you can return at any time. If you have any personal problems that need to be solved, please be sure to use this time wisely. The room suddenly became quiet. Serdak coughed slightly, pretending not to understand the meaning of succubus Aphrodite's words, and said casually, Nothing happens. I will return to Bene City. If there are no accidents, this kind of meeting can be held once a week. It will be set at this time for the time being. Even if I am out on patrol, unless there are special circumstances, I will try my best to hold it during this time. Come back quickly. Everyone quickly agreed. Okay. Captain. Seeing that the meeting was about to end, the ogre finally realized that he needed to show his presence and finally said angrily, since it is a regular gathering, I can prepare a roast lamb for the next meeting. Can. Serdak felt that his promise to bring the ogre from the Maka Plain to the city of Aranza, and that he could eat sheep every day, had not been fully fulfilled so far. So he bit the bullet and agreed. Serdak reached out 
and patted Guaidam on the shoulder and said to him, At the next regular meeting of the security team, I will try to bring you two fresh snappers. I remember the chilled ones here in Bitta City. Fish shop. Gulitum cheered. Then Serdak glanced at Aphrodite. Aphrodite's eyes as deep as night stars blinked. Serdak only felt that he was enveloped by a breath of void again. He stood up from the chair. Taking a step forward, he stepped into the void. The scenery in front of him changed. And he returned to the room of the Maple Leaf Hotel in Bitta City again. He sat on the sofa, flipping through Marquis Luther's invitation, thinking about when would be a good time to visit. There was a knock on the door. Serdak walked to the door and opened it. He saw a waiter pushing a dining station outside the door and said respectfully to Serdak, Baron Serdak, your dinner. Serdak asked the waiter to push the dining car into the room. It was obvious that the service provided to nobles in the hotel was much more considerate than that of civilians. The waiter saw that Serdak was the only one in the room and hinted that the hotel could also provide some other services. In the evening, the tavern on the top floor of the North District was open to nobles alone. Serdak thought for a moment and asked the waiter, Does the hotel and tavern provide information services to the outside world? The waiter took the tip from Soldak and replied quickly and courteously, Our hotel does not have this service. If you want to get some information, you can go downstairs to North Street and walk east along this street. After crossing a crossroad, you can see the Shire Tavern. And many travelers are willing to go to that tavern to get information. Soldak nodded, indicating that it was okay. The waiter quickly pushed the dining cart out of the room. Chapter 543 Tavern After closing the curtains, Soldak closed and locked the door and walked out of the Maple Leaf Hotel along the zigzag corridor. According to the waiter's description, the tavern called the Shire was not far from the hotel. So Soldak walked directly out of the hotel courtyard without riding a horse, walked through the doorway to North Street, and he only wore one suit, ordinary leather armor, and no noble medal on the chest. Just a knight's badge. This kind of attire can be seen everywhere in Bitta City. There were several magic caravans parked on the roadside on North Street next to the hotel. A coachman sitting in the driver's seat saw Soldak walking out of the hotel. He quickly stood up from his seat and opened the door. The hat smiled at Serdak and asked, Sir Knight, do you need to rent a magic caravan? Soldak waved his hand to indicate that he would not sit down. And the coachman returned to his original position. When he reached the spot where Lady Dorothy's carriage had just stopped, he deliberately took two steps slowly and looked towards a dark magic caravan with dark patterns. Sure enough, she saw Mrs. Dorothy's maid sitting alone in the carriage of the magic caravan, drinking tea silently. She did not notice Soldak passing by the roadside. The temperature was a bit hot in summer, so she opened the carriage door. The magic light inside the carriage reflected her childish face. Soldak took another look at the small townhouse opposite. The curtains were drawn on the windows and lights were lit inside. But there was no shadow of the young man. I heard that in Bitta City. It is very common for ladies to have several lovers. It seems that having no lovers is something that is a bit incredible. Although it has become dark, there are still many pedestrians on the street. Some civilians are walking in a hurry with a bag of food. You can see the tired look on their faces. Soldat guessed that the civilians living in such a big city, life must be very stressful. There are also a group of children wearing only shorts and bare backs running around wildly on the street. It seems that the lampposts and low shrub walls on the street are entertainment facilities they can use. Serdak walked through the intersection. Next to the rusty water pipe at the intersection, a man in a windbreaker was squeezing a woman in a silk skirt against the wall. The two hugged tightly in the shadows. Together. And walking a few steps further. Serdak discovered that there were several street girls standing under the shadow of the door of every building on this street. When they saw Serdak approaching, they walked from the shadows to the street lights, lifted up their pleated skirts to reveal their slender legs, or pulled their skirts hard to reveal their snow-white breasts squeezed out of their waists, and then showed sweet smiles. But they were very careful and never made physical contact. Serdak would quickly move away without making any indication, and would not ask questions. Some homeless people were lying on the wooden benches next to the bushes, curled up and sleeping soundly. Some of them even had a bottle of wine on hand. Serdak couldn't understand why these homeless people had to drink this more expensive ale when they couldn't even eat. The Shire Tavern is not difficult to find. There are four waiters guarding the door, seeing Serdak in clean leather clothes. They immediately opened the door of the tavern and invited Serdak to come in and sit down. These waiters didn't look kindly on the homeless people wandering around the entrance of the tavern. Soldak walked into this tavern. 
The room was not too noisy. The lighting in the room is very soft. And the wooden tables and chairs also look very elegant. It is filled with the aroma of alcohol, perfume, and barbecue. The drinkers are chatting in low voices. There are not many wine girls in the tavern. If the drinkers want to order drinks, they will ask the station. The waiter at the wall waved. Soldek walked directly to the bar and sat in front of the bartender. There are also many customers sitting at the bar. Men and women are crowded side by side. Some are sitting next to each other and chatting, while others are drinking alone. The bartender's eyes fell on Soldek, his eyes moving from the solid arms to the calloused hands, showing a questioning look. Serdek pointed to a bottle of golden cider behind him and said, Please give me a glass of golden cider. Northlanders! The bartender turned around and took the bottle of wine deftly. Like a magic trick, a glass was placed in front of Serdek. Three cubes of ice were added, and the glass was filled with golden liquor. Soldek shook the wine glass gently, and the ice cubes clinked in the glass. Halanza people, Serdek said. After speaking, he pointed to the night badge on his chest and asked the bartender, Hey, who should I call when asking for information here? What news? The bartender approached Soldek and asked, staring at Soldek. News about the Bradbury family, including the manor that was attacked, Soldek said to the bartender. The bartender was not surprised at all. He stared at Soldek and said, At least 30 people came to me to inquire about this matter before you. So this information is not valuable. For a gold coin, I can tell you what everyone knows. Of course, if you don't mind the trouble, you can find it in the city. You can also hear these messages by chatting with others. We just summarized these messages. If you want to know more in-depth information, an information fee of one gold coin will be charged for each message. Of course, these messages will definitely make you feel it's worth your money. Solda Clisso pushed out a gold coin and placed it in front of the bartender. The bartender did not take the gold coin immediately, but shouted into the aisle behind him. Sophia, this knight wants to hear the story about Lord Bradbury. No problem. An ordinary-looking woman wearing tight-fitting leather armor, but with very flexible eyes opened the door curtain and walked out of the aisle. Her eyes fell on the gold coins on the table. With just a tap of her index finger on the table, the gold coin jumped off the table. He stood up and fell accurately into the woman's hand. Sophia looked at Soldak with a half-smile and said, Follow me! Turning around and walking into the aisle behind him, the bartender stepped aside to let Soldak pass. Soldak followed the woman into a private room. Sophia sat down at the table, took a sip of wine, and asked Soldak, Tell me, what do you want to hear? Soldak actually just wanted to find out the location of Bradbury Manor and what kind of secrets the family was hiding. But now that he had paid a gold coin, he simply said, I don't care about anything. Too understanding. Tell me all you can. Sophia glanced at Soldak unhappily. Only then did Serdak see a badge on her chest. The pattern on the badge was two daggers stacked on top of each other. The background was hidden in the shadow of the grass. With his eyes, Serdak knew that this was the badge of the Thieves' Guild. But he did not expect that this ordinary-looking lady was actually a thief officially certified by the Thieves' Guild. Serdak was still a little curious about the Thieves' Guild. Oh, do you need me to introduce the glorious deeds of Mr. Bradbury's life? Sophia asked Soldak. Serdak nodded and said, Of course, I am a native of Holanza. Sophia took another sip of ale and then said to Soldak, Let's start with the attack on Bradbury Manor. You should also know that in the past 200 years, the Bradbury family has not even had a knight who is good at fighting. Each generation of lords has done nothing. Not because of poor management. Being heavily in debt means arrogance and wanton squandering of family property. Every generation of Bradbury family leaders has to sell off part of the family property in order to maintain the family's daily expenses and final dignity. Today, except for those in Benna City, the Bradbury family, there is no additional property left beyond the estate that cannot be sold. The current heir of the Bradbury family is Baron Benny Bradbury. After graduating from the Benna Advanced Swordsman Academy, Baron Benny served in the Benna Constructed Swordsman Corps for four years. And then after retiring, he joined an adventure group called Flaming Dragon in Benna City and traveled with the adventure group in various provinces of the Green Empire for several years. When the adventure group returned to Benna City, there were many members of the adventure group. A female magician. Since the attack on Bradbury Manor, the female magician has disappeared from the world. According to our intelligence analysis, this female magician is most likely a member of the Dark Moon Gate. Her purpose of joining the adventure group just to get close to Baron Benny 
and get information about the Bradbury family. She finally led the rebels to sack the Bradbury Manor. Those rebels snatched a crystal key from the Bradbury family showroom. It is said to be a key card from Magic Crystal that can open the door to the Red Dragon treasure. And the Bradbury family, all successive clan leaders, are the custodians of this crystal key. As for why the Bradbury family has not tried to find the Red Dragon treasure, the information we have collected is, it is not that they are not looking. They have been searching for this treasure for so many years. But they do not have a complete treasure map. This time, Baron Benny Bradbury traveled around the Empire with the Flame Dragon Adventure Group to collect information about the treasure map. Unexpectedly, his move immediately attracted the attention of the Dark Moon Gate. Speaking of which, or the name of the dragon-slaying sword Quelsera is too great. Serdak didn't expect that there were so many hidden secrets in it. He remembered that the image projected in the magic crystal was really a mountainous area. His heart moved slightly, and he asked curiously, So the red dragon treasure is real? Sophia nodded and said, From various signs, It is inferred that the red dragon treasure is probably real. You must know that shiny gems and gold coins have an irresistible attraction to dragons, and there is some wealth hidden in their lairs. This is not difficult to understand, and it is said that Quelsera is buried in the red dragon treasure. It turns out that the magic crystal is called the crystal key, so no wonder it is in the hands of the magician Gurdon. Where is the Bradbury family's manor that was attacked by the rebels? Soldak asked pretending to be casual. At number two Hanting Street, the aristocratic old district of Benes City. Sophia answered without thinking. It seemed that she had answered this question many times. Sophia said to Soldak. According to the information we have, the crystal key is currently in the hands of the magicians at the Dark Moon Gate. The manor is now in an abandoned state. Even the man of the successor, Baron Benny Bradbury, does not live there. But every adventurous group that inquires about this matter will go to the manor to look for some clues. After the manor was attacked by the rebels, almost they will all be trampled to pieces. It seems that you are also interested in the red dragon treasure? Sophia asked Sewer tentatively. Serdex smiled noncommittally. Sophia didn't ask any more questions and just said, If you need to hire an adventure group, you can come here to see me at any time. I can introduce you to a trustworthy adventure group with experienced treasure hunters in the team. Okay, if you want to learn more about the details or hidden secrets of the incident, one gold coin for each question. After Sophia finished speaking, a proud smile appeared at the corner of her mouth, thinking that she had already whetted her appetite and just waiting for the knight on the other side to ask him patiently. Gold coins would fly into the purse. No more. Soldek rubbed his hands, stood up from the chair, and said casually. Sophia looked at Soldek with a puzzled look. She couldn't figure out whether the knight in front of her didn't want to know the whereabouts of the crystal key, the origins of the dark moon gate, and the clues about the rebels who attacked Bradbury Manor. Soldek said with satisfaction. It's enough to know so much. I'm just a little curious about what happened in Benna City which disturbed the knights in the guard camp of Alensa City every day. Later, I found out that it was the legend about Quelsera, so I took advantage of it. I took this opportunity to come to Benes City to inquire about it. Thank you for introducing so many stories to me. When I return to Alansa City for the party, there will be a new topic. After saying this, Serdak walked out of the room. Sophia's mouth was dry after talking. She took a big sip of ale, sat on the chair and sulked, thinking about his bad luck tonight. He unexpectedly met such a stingy knight. Back at the hotel, Soldak lay on the soft big bed and began to seriously think about how to deliver the magic crystal to Bradbury Manor. He was planning to go to the abandoned Bradbury Manor tomorrow. I will take a look at Barry Manor and take the time to write a letter of visit and send it to Marquis Luther. In addition, since I came to Benna City, I had to meet Hathaway and Beatrice. Hearing that Hathaway was locked up at home, Soldak planned to write a letter to Beatrice first. Find out the details. The next morning, Soldak had breakfast early in the restaurant downstairs of the hotel, then left the Maple Leaf Hotel on horseback and walked along the city streets toward Bradbury Manor. The old aristocratic district is really far away from the block where the Serdak Hotel is located. Chapter 544 Insight Bradbury Abandoned Manor is located in the old aristocratic district. This area is dotted with various ancient aristocratic mansions. These mansions cover a very large area. In the city of Binna, where land is precious. These ancient aristocratic mansions themselves are huge wealth. The simple walls outside some mansions have become old and worn out by the baptism of time. Some buildings have been repaired several times and now have a sense of historical vicissitudes. Looking solemn and solemn, as well as a little bit of decadent and lonely gothic style. 
walking on this street. You can often see some guard camp knights riding horses through the quiet long street. The walls on both sides of the street are covered with dense ivy and ivy. When Serdak passes by knights, they will carefully examine the badge on Serdak's chest. It seems that this place is far more heavily fortified than Serdak imagined. It is hard to imagine how the rebels managed to attack Bradbury at night under the inspections of so many guard battalion knights. Of the manor. Unfortunately, the woman from the Thieves' Guild didn't give enough information last night. And Serdak didn't know the relevant details. There is a wide square at the gate of Bradbury Manor. This is the place where carriages are parked when grand balls are held. Some weeds and thorns have grown between the gaps between the flat stone slabs. The large iron gate at the gate of the manor is rusty. There are many traces of it. And there is a nearly three-meter-high marble humanoid statue erected in front of the door. The low black stone tablet at the foot of the statue is engraved with Green Empire 1708-1857. Duke Hector Bradbury. Lord of Padlo's Mountain in Bena Province. He walked up the mountains with a sword in his hand at the top. The spirit and glory he left behind will become the most precious wealth here. Written by Joseph Angel Bald in the autumn of 1857. Soldak didn't know which emperor of the Green Empire King Joseph was. But it seemed that he could leave his name on this monument. So much so that even when the descendants of the Bradbury family were at their lowest, they still didn't dare to leave this monument. A mansion was sold. I heard it was because of the stone tablet under the statue. In order to commemorate the great hero's outstanding contribution to Bena City, no one wants to live in this manner. Every time Bradbury's birthday comes, some people will place a bouquet of flowers in front of the bronze statue at the entrance of the manor. Duke Hector Bradbury fought and traveled throughout his life. Although he had the status of a duke, he had never been in charge of the province of Bena. Serdak stood in front of this statue, looking at the man who dared to marry a giant sea beast as his wife, and felt many emotions in his heart. There was a big hole in the iron gate of the manor. They had lost their function as doors. They were tied together with iron wire and became part of the outer wall of the manor. The big hole was almost big enough for Serdak to walk in on horseback. The iron bars were cut with a sharp weapon. Soldak felt that his blood-red crescent was not so sharp as it could not cut through the iron bars on the large iron door that were as thick as a child's arm. There was no one guarding the door of the dilapidated manor. Serdak walked around the manor then left his horse outside the manor, and walked alone into this manor full of decay. There were traces of the battle everywhere, and some disorganized footprints. A group of guard camp knights came from a distance, and once again set their sights on Serdak, knowing that he had attracted the attention of this group of guard camp knights. Soldak no longer planned to sneak into the manor for a walk, but rode out on horseback from the other side of the long street in the noble district. After the rebels attacked Bradbury Manor, the guard camp strengthened patrols in the old aristocratic district. Whenever any suspicious situation was discovered, knights from the guard camp would watch from a distance. For fear of another sudden appearance of rebels in the city, Serdak spent three silver coins to buy parchment and envelopes in the grocery store, and went to a restaurant next to the hotel for lunch before returning to the Maple Leaf Hotel. Back at the hotel, Serdak opened the curtains. During the day, the back streets of the hotel were quieter than at night with not many pedestrians visible and few magic caravans on the roadside. As expected, Mrs. Dorothy's carriage has disappeared. On the small townhouse opposite, a young man in a white shirt is sitting on a wicker chair on the terrace, quietly reading a book, the young man wearing leather armor and breeches. His body is very well proportioned. There is a glass of wine on the coffee table, and he looks very relaxed. Serdek looked away. He turned around and sat at the desk picked up a pen and wrote a letter to Beatrice first. He corresponded with Hathaway, and his replies were always addressed to Beatrice, who was more free. Then he wrote a letter of visit to Marquis Luther. The letter stated that he had arrived in Bena City, and that he would stay in Bena City this week, and could visit him at any time. After writing the two letters, Serdak put them into envelopes, glued the mouth of the envelopes with red mud, and pulled the rope on the wall to call the waiter. Not long after, there was a knock on the door. Soldak walked to the door and opened the door. A hotel waiter stood at the door and asked Soldak respectfully, Sir, what do you need? Serdak asked the waiter to wait at the door, turned around and took out two letters from the table and handed them to the waiter. He gave him a tip of one silver coin and asked him to send the two letters to the address. The waiter took the silver coins and letterhead with a look of joy on his face. He often received a tip for delivering letters. Seeing the waiter put the two letters into his arms, bowed to Soldak and quickly walked out of the hotel. He began to prepare for the sacrifice ceremony. He planned to go to Bradbury Manor, an old aristocratic area, 
again in the evening. But this time, he had to be prepared before going to the manor. Wait until everything is ready for the sacrificial ceremony. Serdak took out a magic sealing box from his magic belt bag. This magic sealing box contained four salamander skulls as sacrifices. The salamander heads were obviously taller than the H, L dog heads. Go to a new level. Since the last time he discovered that there were three more blessing effects to choose from in the sacrifice ceremony. Serdak has not tried these three blessing effects. Mainly because these blessing effects require more sacrifices. This time before going to Bradbury Manor, Soldak was going to try the magical effect of insight among these three blessings. Seeing the two-faced and four-armed demon god statue emerging from the center of the altar, Serdak stood on the altar, holding a salamander head in both hands and offering it to the face of the god. He conveyed to the demon god his wish to gain insight. Ability. But unfortunately, the demon statue didn't respond at all. He gritted his teeth and took out a well-preserved salamander head from the magic sealing box and sacrificed it. As the salamander head turned into a breath and disappeared, the ability of insight still failed to come to him. Serdak was cruel and sacrificed the third head. A beam of light descended from the ceiling and covered Serdak's whole body. Chapter 545 Bradbury This is a temporary expedition team composed of two magicians, four warriors, two archers, three swordsmen, and two rangers. And they also have a very loud sounding name Warriors and Roses. Yesterday afternoon when they attended the fraternity party held at Benna Senior College, these 13 young people sat together and chatted for most of the night. After the fraternity party, they ran to the bar and chatted until late, talking as quickly as possible. Speed makes up this adventure group. Among this group of young people is a magic transfer student named Jimmy. He was originally a student at the Imperial City Magic Academy, but for some unknown reason gave up the excellent study conditions at the Imperial City Magic Academy and recently transferred to the Bena Province Magic Academy. Among the many advanced magic academies in the Green Empire, Bena Magic Academy is definitely not ranked among the top 10. It is said that the family behind Jimmy has a background in the Imperial Capital, and Jimmy himself has made friends with many wealthy and noble sons in the Imperial Capital. Rumor has it that he offended a member of the royal family in the Imperial Capital and ran to Bena City to avoid trouble. Jimmy's aunt is the prosecutor of the Bena Province Adventure Union. Jimmy brought this group of young people to his aunt, and the prosecutor signed a temporary adventure group voucher for these young people. It's just that this adventure group voucher is only valid for three weeks, and it's only valid within Bena City. As the sun sets, the sky in Bena City becomes darker little by little. The young people of the Warriors and Rose's adventure group took a magic caravan to the old aristocratic neighborhood and got off the road about two kilometers away from Bradbury Manor. This group of young people were almost fully armed and dressed in clothes exquisite armor, carrying gorgeous weapons, found a gap in the old wall with excitement on his face. The ranger who led the way pushed aside the ivy at the gap, and the group of people filed into the backyard of Bradbury Manor. In the night, the overgrown backyard of the manor looked desolate. Among the thirteen young people, there are five noble ladies who are studying at the Bena Swordsman Academy. This adventure was actually planned by two young nobles who wanted to please several noble ladies. Jimmy glanced at Miss Judian, who was following behind. She was wearing a set of ice deer leather armor and two light blue long swords hanging on her waist. Her fair face looked a little nervous and her long straight legs were almost almost closed when they were brought together. There are no gaps. Judith pursed her lips slightly, looked at the desolate courtyard and asked her best friend Cora behind her. I heard that a big incident happened in Redberry Manor not long ago. Will there be any trouble if we sneak in like this? Cora stared at her big eyes, hesitated a little, and whispered to Judith. I've heard about this too. Don't worry. We have the credentials of the adventure group. And we did a simple investigation at Bradbury Manor. This manor has been abandoned. And there is usually no one at all. It doesn't matter even if we are discovered. We haven't stolen anything. Besides, we have an adventure group certificate. A young nobleman came up from behind with a sword and shield on his back and said to the two noble ladies. Jimmy squinted his slender eyes turned to the people behind him and said, We will go to the manor at night to look for some clues about the rebels. I heard that a group of rebels had attacked this manor before. Isn't that dangerous? Cora leaned towards Jimmy and wanted to hold his arm. Jimmy calmly asked the young nobleman carrying a sword and shield. It should be nothing. Right. The young nobleman patted his chest and said, You and Luke are the best young magicians in Beta City. And we are equally good. How could there be a problem? Cora. Agatha. Do you want to go? 
Judith hesitated and asked her best friends for advice. When things came to a close, she suddenly didn't want to go anymore. Cora, who had a pointed chin and big eyes, glanced at Jimmy the magician, bit her lipstick smeared lips, and said, How about we go and have a look? No matter what happens, we will turn around and leave immediately. Yes, Judith, haven't you always wanted to explore? Best friend Agatha also echoed. Don't worry. We are just looking for some clues about the rebels in the empty house. Nothing else, Jimmy said to Judith diligently. If we can trace the clues about the rebels, it is estimated that our graduation resume column will be become prettier. At this time, Cora, who looked like a nymphomaniac, leaned against Jimmy again and asked in a delicate voice, Magic Jimmy, will you protect me? Jimmy pointed at the sword and shield nobleman behind Cora and said teasingly, Your prince is standing behind you now, and I think Judith needs my protection more. Judith glanced at Jimmy's dark circles caused by overindulgence and forced a smile. At this time, the ranger who was exploring the path in front sent a signal to move forward. Serdak discovered this adventurous group composed of young nobles at the moment when these young nobles walked into the cloister from the back garden. At that time, this group of young nobles were still discussing in low voices the traces of fighting in the corridor. It had just darkened, and the figures of the young nobles gathered in the cloister were somewhat blurry. Serdak hid behind a broken stone sculpture of a mountain lion. These young nobles gathered around a stone pillar that had been cut off by a sharp sword. When they were talking in low voices, the voices of several young nobles sounded familiar. When the long-legged aristocratic lady turned her head, Soldek recognized her at a glance. She seemed to be one of the aristocratic ladies he had seen on the magic airship, and two of those young nobles seemed to be passengers on the magic airship. Soldek suddenly realized that the world seemed a bit small indeed. They actually entered Bradbury Manor at night and discussed some matters about the northern rebels in the manor. While on the airship, these young nobles they have been hanging around a few noble ladies all day long. And now they are actually exploring the manor together. These young people are really full of energy. After paying three salamander heads, Serdak obtained the blessing effect of insight. Although it was not an enhanced version of the Eye of Truth as Serdak imagined, it strengthened the maintenance time of the Eye of Truth. It is the ability to see at night and see through invisibility. In addition, his vision seems to have become sharper, which allows him to move as easily at night as during the day. Soldak sneaked into Bradbury Manor, walked along the stone steps into the main building of the mansion, and saw this group of young people in the cloister. The dilapidated scene in the manor is more serious than it looks from the outside. It is full of the smell of decay, dilapidated buildings, and withered leaves. Some roads are cracked and overgrown. There was no trace of life in the empty courtyard, and it looked like a cemetery that had been abandoned for a long time. Walking into the manor, Bradbury Manor, with the last layer of veil torn off, is so old and dilapidated. Serdak bypassed the young nobles and stepped into the most luxurious main building of the manor. The emblem of the Bradbury family can still be seen vaguely on the ironwood door with intricately carved patterns. Unfortunately, the door has been broken through and dismantled in pieces. Step through the door and walk into the hall of the main building. The dark hall was empty and there was still some blood on the floor. All the valuable collectibles and furniture in the hall were sold, and the walls were bare. The only thing left was the traces of oil paintings and decorations removed from the walls. Even the chandelier on the ceiling only had a chain and a lamp holder left. Seeing those dozens of lamp holders, one can imagine the grand scene when this hall was brightly lit. A few dozen meters away, Serdak saw a down-and-out nobleman sitting on the carpet holding a wine bottle by the stairs next to the hall. Drunk, Serdak hid in the shadows, bypassed the stairwell, and climbed to the second floor from the other side. There were still traces of the fight in the corridor on the second floor. Serdak took advantage of his night vision. With his ability, he quietly walked around the main building and followed the traces of the fight to find an exhibition hall at the end of the corridor on the third floor of the main building. A section of the ninth spear penetrated straight into the wall two feet behind, and the tip of the spear shot out of the wall from the other side. You could imagine how powerful the strike of the knight holding the spear was at that time. Walking into the smashed exhibition hall, some stone sculptures in the room were broken into stones. Apart from that, there were only some wooden booths and display racks around the walls that could not be moved. While Serdak was wandering around the showroom, he heard a woman's scream coming from downstairs. Then someone loudly exclaimed, There is a person lying here. He seems to be injured. No, he seems to be drunk. He is the last member of the Bradbury family. 
I have seen him at a ball before. At that time, he was a pretty boy who relied on lovers for support. I didn't expect that he would become this depressed now. Hey, you can't say that in front of others. Let's go inside and have a look. I brought a torch. It doesn't have to be so hard. Low light illumination. It's so convenient to have a magician on the team. There was a glimmer of light coming from the window downstairs. And Serdak didn't expect that the adventure group would find its way into the main building so quickly. Without thinking too much, he took out the crystal key from the magic belt bag and placed it on the most conspicuous booth in the center of the showroom. The key-shaped crystal key was broken on the booth. Serdak had placed the crystal key here and wanted to take the opportunity to sneak out. After taking a few steps, he stepped back. He saw a wall card with a gate. He picked up the crystal key that was broken into two parts and walked to a wall relief carved in the shape of a door in the showroom. This relief door occupied almost half of the wall. It was very eye-catching in the showroom. And the relief, there is the Bradbury family emblem in the center of the door. And there is clearly a key-shaped groove in the center of the emblem. Serdak lowered his head and looked at the crystal key in his hand and found that the shape of the crystal key just matched the groove. He put the crystal key into the groove smoothly and the crystal key actually fit in perfectly. A faint magical light flashed on the wall, although it was only for a moment. Serdak was still keenly aware of it. It turns out that the crystal key was placed here before, Soldak thought. He wanted to leave Bradbury Manor before those young people came here. But before he walked out of the showroom, he heard faint footsteps in the corridor. There were no windows in the showroom except display racks and booths. And another door. Serdak was momentarily blocked in the showroom. He didn't want his whereabouts to be revealed. At the critical moment, Soldak looked around the showroom and found a row of closets in the left corner of the showroom. He ran to the most remote corner of the showroom and hurriedly opened a closet. Door, hidden inside the cabinet. Just when Soldak closed the cabinet door, a figure flashed across the door of the showroom. The man seemed to have noticed something moving in the showroom. He held up a moonstone with white light in his hand. After entering the showroom, he looking around vigilantly, he found that there was no one in the showroom and was immediately startled. The man then looked at the wall cabinet on one side of the showroom. The entire empty showroom was the only place where someone could hide. He walked over step by step. Serdak hid in the closet, listening to the footsteps getting closer and closer, calling silently in his heart, Aphrodite, Aphrodite, Aphrodite. The moment the man walked to the closet, a six-pointed star formation appeared under Soldak's feet, and his body passed through the void rift in nothingness. In the far corner of the closet, Serdak's figure disappeared without a trace. The man held up the moonstone and opened the closet doors one after another. He found that the closet was also empty. He was stunned for a while, having a slight doubt about his judgment. At this time, chaotic footsteps sounded in the third floor corridor. The young nobles whispered in low voices and walked along the corridor to the door of the showroom. The man quickly closed all the closet doors and hid in the corner closet. The low light illumination technique is a ball of light floating in midair. The ball of light floated into the showroom, and the young nobles following behind exclaimed. Cora shouted nervously and excitedly. Look, there is a showroom here. Even if she didn't shout, everyone would have seen the showroom. The young nobleman carrying a shield and sword walked up to the spear, touched the cold body of the spear with his hand, and said with great disdain, The craftsmanship of this knight's spear is really rough. Bulwer, how do you think it penetrated into the wall? A ranger came up from behind. He looked at the knight's spear on the wall seriously, shook his head and said, I don't know. I guess even the instructors in the academy can't do it. If it was really a knight who pierced the wall during the battle, it can only mean that he is really strong. Do you think it could be those rebel knights? Jimmy walked from the center of the line to the front, stared at the dark door of the showroom, and said to everyone, Let's go in and take a look. Amidst the sound of discussion, this group of young nobles walked into the showroom. Chapter 546 The Oriole in the Cupboard Alensa Village A candle was lit in the reception room of the police station, and the candlelight illuminated the entire room, and the beating candlelight reflected on Soldak's face. Aphrodite yawned and leaned on the bench next to the wall wearing a black skirt with cut sleeves. She squinted her beautiful eyes and looked at Soldak, her curvy figure looming under the skirt. She asked Soldak curiously, Why are you calling me at this time? Soldak walked to the table poured himself a glass of water, drank it in one gulp, and said, I'm stuck in the showroom of Bradbury Manor. The half-elf archer heard the movement in the living room and walked out of the bedroom. She was wearing a linen nightgown. When she saw Soldak, she asked in surprise, Are you in any trouble? 
Serdak shrugged his shoulders and said to the half-elf archer with long hair, I just didn't want to be discovered and had nowhere to hide. So I hid back here. The indigenous warrior Andrew asked Soldak, How long are you going to wait here? Andrew's question made Serdak realize that there was one of the biggest drawbacks of the summoning technique. He didn't know how long he should hide to avoid those people in the showroom. If those people had been guarding the showroom, Serdak could couldn't tell the time of return. So he could easily be caught if he ran back hastily. Aphrodite seemed to see Serdak's concerns and said to him, Don't worry. If you return there and find that something is wrong, I can summon you back again. Maybe you can drink before returning there. Next bottle of lesser invisibility potion. Then maybe they won't be able to see you. The indigenous warrior asked Aphrodite. By the way, Aphrodite, how long can you persist in this state? The succubus glanced at Serdak and said with a teasing expression on his face. At least it can last the whole night. Serdak planned to wait a little longer before returning to Bradbury Manor. So he decided to take advantage of this free time to go home for a visit. After all, he had been away from home for nearly ten days. Several local dogs in Wall Village heard the sound of walking. And one by one got out of the kennel. When they saw Soldak, they got back into the kennel with their tails between their legs. Wall Village is very peaceful at night. Several old people are sitting under the chestnut tree in front of their house to enjoy the cool air. During the time that Soldak left, three more townhouses were built in Wall Village. Chief Bright arranged for the villagers to move in in batches. He did not dare to question the old village chief's arrangement. The remaining townhouses, the main body of the small building has also been built. And it is just waiting for the tripod to be hoisted to the roof. And then the blue tiles will be laid on it to be initially completed. He glanced at the small building where Selena lived, thought for a while, and walked back home. The large villa in their new home was too big for old Sheila, Rita, Natasha, and little Peter. The gorgeous furniture smelled of lacquer wax and the soft carpets also exuded a faint smell of wax. Everything in the house is brand new, and there are many things that I never dared to think of before. Now I suddenly have them all, just like a dream. Rita had seen the high court compound where the noble men lived in Helensa City before. She was envious and looked forward to living in such a spacious and bright house one day. Now that she has finally moved into a spacious house, Rita realizes that if she wants to feel the warmth of home, her home really does not need to be that big. Now, whether it is old Sheila or Natasha, everyone has their own room. Little Peter also felt that although the house was filled with furniture, it still felt empty. With Soldak's current conditions, it is entirely possible to hire cooks and grooms. But old Sheila felt that whether it was a cook or a groom, with so many women in the family, they could cut the grass and cook by themselves. And there was no need to hire anyone. Everyone is used to sitting together for a while after dinner, even if there is nothing to talk about. They will stay for a while in the living room with a fireplace on the second floor. Old Sheila leaned on the rocking chair next to the fireplace and fell asleep. Little Peter sat on the carpet and laid out building blocks. Children in the village have recently become popular in the game of building a house. These building blocks are leftover materials from the carpenter's workshop making roof tripods. Every child has accumulated a lot of them. Of course, Little Peter the set of building blocks in Peter's hands was the best. Not only were they flat and smooth, the surface was even coated with a layer of varnish. Rita and Natasha sat together, studying how to cut a piece of linen. Soldak opened the door and walked in. Everyone in the room was stunned for a moment. Old Sheila opened her eyes and asked Soldak, Why are you back? Didn't you say you were going to Benna City? I have something to do, and I have to go back later. Soldak walked into the room and responded. Natasha quickly stood up, went over to help Serdak untie the breastplate and skillfully hung it on the wooden frame next to the wall. Have you had dinner? Seeing Soldak's tired look, old Sheila asked again. Soldak scratched his head, smiled and said, Not yet. I still have something to eat at home. I happen to be a little hungry. There's still some oatmeal left. Do you want to fry another steak? Natasha asked. Every time the ogre Gulitam eats sheep, he will leave a leg of lamb or a few steaks and send them here. So the steaks can be eaten at home. Don't bother. Just eat whatever you want. Soldak shook his head and said to Natasha. The steaks are marinated. Just fry them. It won't be too much trouble. Natasha hurriedly walked towards the kitchen, saying as she walked. After dinner, Serdak sat for a while before putting on his armor and preparing to leave. Little Peter was already asleep in bed. He walked to the bedside and stuffed a silver dagger under the pillow, kissed him on the forehead, and then hurried out of the house. A group of young aristocrats stood in the empty showroom. 
under the guidance of low-light illumination. They walked around the empty wooden shelves and booths. Several aristocratic ladies were guarded in the center of the team and wandered around the abandoned manor at night. This novel experience made them feel particularly exciting, even more interesting than the experiences held in the academy. Soon the group of young people discovered the relief on the wall. They stood in front of the false door and looked at the relief mural curiously. A group of young people discussed how there was such a door in the Bradbury family showroom and looked for whether there was a machine tool that could open the door. And then a secret passage would appear. Just when everyone was thinking about this, Jimmy suddenly felt that the stone wall was actually fluctuating with mana. As a magician, he is extremely sensitive to this kind of mana fluctuation, especially in this state of high mental stress. The trace of mana flowing from the wall relief suddenly made Jimmy very alert. He carefully observed whether there was a magic circle hidden in the relief of this stone door, and involuntarily took two steps closer. As the light ball of the low-light illumination technique approached the stone door relief, Jimmy discovered something different about the stone door. The gem base in the center of the stone door was actually inlaid with a magic crystal. The embedded structure made the stone door different. The magic crystal was hidden in the shadow under the light. So no one noticed that there was a magic crystal hidden in the shadow. Look! What is this? Jimmy stared at the magic crystal and called his companions. Under the light of the ball, his forehead was covered with a layer of sweat. The young nobles gathered over at once, following Jimmy's finger. They finally discovered that there was a magic crystal in the shadow of the stone door. The sword and shield warrior named Luke stood at the front with his shield, staring at the magic crystal. The light ball floating in the air fell little by little, making the magic crystal clearly exposed in front of everyone. At this time, behind the team someone said, I heard that what the rebels took away from Bradbury Manor was a magic crystal. Do you think it could be this one? Others said, How is this possible? Jimmy no longer felt the fluctuation of mana and reached out to touch the magic crystal that was tightly embedded in it, looking for the wedge of the magic crystal. When installing this kind of embedded magic crystal, disassembly will be considered. Generally, a wedge will be left, and the magic crystal can be pried out with only a sharp dagger. Jimmy soon discovered the wedge, and he reached for the dagger at his waist. I heard that the lost magic crystal is in the shape of a key. The long-legged beauty Judith stood in the crowd and said to her best friend Cora, This must be a fake. Cora, with her pointed chin and big eyes, said. However, as Jimmy used a dagger to pry out the magic crystal from the relief groove of the stone door, another noble lady Agatha held her breath and said with a trembling voice. Maybe it's true. You see, as Jimmy pried the dagger, the magic crystal exposed was clearly in the shape of a knife. At this time, everyone's attention fell on the magic crystal. However, Jimmy suddenly felt the resistance of the dagger and slowly came out of the groove. The front end of the magic crystal actually fell off, and Jimmy subconsciously caught it, and another piece of magic crystal is still embedded in the groove. Jimmy felt his heart tremble with the magic crystal. Ah! It cracked! A group of young nobles behind them exclaimed. Jimmy took a deep breath and pried the remaining magic crystal out of the groove. The two pieces of magic crystal were placed in the palm of his hand, and sure enough, they fit together into a whole piece. At this time, everyone was silent and everyone was staring at the magic crystal in Jimmy's hand. Sword and Shield Warrior Luke is one of the organizers of the Warrior and Rose Adventure Group. At this time, he quickly stood up and said, To be honest, this is definitely a major discovery. We can go find some professional experts to evaluate it and see. Is it the rumored crystal key? No matter what, our efforts this time were not in vain. Jimmy held the magic crystal and said to everyone, Maybe the gem craftsman can repair it. I happen to know a friend who is a very famous gem craftsman. I can ask him for help. However, other young nobles seem to have different views. Someone immediately said, We must not tell the secret. If this is really the crystal key, then there must be the biggest secret hidden in it. We can look for clues together. And maybe we can find the dragon treasure. Hearing someone say this, everyone's breathing became a little heavier. It seemed that there was more than one person who had this idea. The man hiding in the display cabinet thought it was a trick played by these young nobles at first. But when he heard more, he felt that something was wrong more and more. He has been to the showroom frequently recently and has never found anything. The stone door relief has been carefully inspected more than a dozen times. And every detail of the carving has been memorized. He has never seen magic crystals embedded in the stone door relief. And these young nobles it sounds like it's true. No, they are telling the truth. The man's heart moved slightly 
and he thought about pushing open the wooden door of the closet and rushing out to grab the crystal key. He was holding a magic scroll in his hand, drawing magic symbols quickly with his other hand, and chanting incantations in a low voice. A fireball that kept bursting, rolling, and burning appeared in front of him, and he whispered, Go! A fireball exploded from inside the closet, and the rolling flames wrapped around the broken wood cabinet door and rushed towards a group of noble young people. The incident happened suddenly. Everyone was almost focused on the magic crystal, and no one noticed the surrounding situation at all. Fire bombs exploded in the crowd, and flames immediately enveloped everyone. A figure wearing a magic robe rushed out of the closet. He rushed in front of Jimmy just as the fireball exploded. Jimmy was hit by the huge thrust of the exploding fireball against the stone wall. His whole body was in splitting pain, and he was feeling dizzy. He felt a figure rush over, spread his fingers apart, and grab the piece. The magic crystal broke in half and rushed out of the showroom. Someone is trying to steal the magic crystal! Jimmy shouted at the top of his lungs. Several young nobles, who were not too affected by the fire bombs, heard the sound and immediately chased the figure. Regardless of the pain all over his body, Jimmy gritted his teeth and got up from the ground. He saw the long-legged beauty Judith protecting his two girlfriends. Although the three of them were very embarrassed by the fire bombs, their long hair was only singed. And their bodies were, however, they were not injured. The faces of the three noble ladies were damaged by the explosion of fire bombs, which made them a little dark. The two female archers reacted quickly and successfully avoided the impact of the fire bombs the moment they exploded. At this time, he got up from the ground and chased towards the outside of the showroom with the two rangers. Jimmy gritted his teeth and did not chase him out immediately. Instead, he walked towards Luke, the sword and shield warrior who was seriously injured. Luke, the sword and shield warrior, had the fastest reaction just now. And he, he took out a card from his arms. The magic scroll was unfolded in his hand, and after another short spell, a white light filled with water vapor fell on Luke. This is a magic scroll of hydrotherapy. The magic glow fell on Luke, immediately stabilizing Luke's injury. Leave us alone. Go chase the robber who stole the crystal key. Luke propped up his body with one hand and said eagerly to Jimmy. Jimmy nodded quickly, got up and followed everyone to chase the figure. Chapter 547 Night Party The Warriors and Rose's Adventure Group, composed of 13 young nobles, became famous overnight, and the entire Bena city was talking about what happened last night. A large number of knights from the guard camp once again gathered in the old aristocratic district and launched a carpet-based search, trying to find some clues. According to the analysis of the magicians of the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group, the magician who snatched the crystal key last night should be a member of the Dark Moon Gate. So this time the Bena City Magic Union also dispatched a large number of magicians to investigate the matter. The young magician Jimmy was sitting in the investigation room of the Bena City Guard Camp. He was holding a cup of tea in his hand. The tea leaves were slowly spinning in the water glass. Jimmy raised his head impatiently and glanced at the knight in front of him. Next to him sat the sword and shield warrior Luke and several other male members of the adventure group. As for those noble ladies, who have returned to the Bena Swordsman Academy. A place like the guard camp is not the place they should be. If word spreads, it will affect their reputation. Considering their noble status, the investigation into them will not be carried out. The guard camp is here. Opposite him sat two great knights of the guard camp. One of them was Captain Klaus of the 3rd Brigade of the Bena City Guard Battalion. The other one beside him was Captain Klaus's assistant, Grand Knight Garland. The two great knights next to him were magicians from the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group, who carefully recorded what Jimmy had said. Jimmy had already told what happened last night five times. He moved his buttocks on his chair a little impatiently and took another look at the two magicians next to him. It's just that the two magicians from the Bena Magic Guild were not familiar with Jimmy. They participated in the investigation of the guard camp as observers and did not have the right to interrogate. When I noticed the magic crystal... It was because of the fluctuations of mana on that wall. As a magician, I can sense the fluctuations of magic elements in the surrounding environment. At that time, everyone was still looking for clues in the showroom. Jimmy said, After tossing all night, his head was a little groggy, and he wanted to go back home, take a comfortable hot bath, and lie down on the soft big bed to have a good sleep. He cursed in his heart, instead of arresting the magician. These useless guard camp knights questioned him repeatedly, as if they were interrogating a prisoner. This feeling was really bad, Jimmy said. I understand the specific steps of inlaying magic gems. 
I know that as long as you find a specific point in the groove of the gem, you can pry out the magic crystal in the groove. But I didn't react at the time. When the dagger was inserted, the magic crystal actually cracked in half. Night Cloud stared at the young noble with dark circles in his sharp eyes. He was not interested in this kind of noble dandy. Although there were two magicians sitting next to him, he still asked unceremoniously, Are you? Are you saying that the crystal key was already broken when you got it into your hands? If he wasn't sitting in the investigation room of the Benna City Guard camp, Jimmy would have wanted to stand up and point his finger at the bridge of the knight's nose in front of him and yell at him. But it was impossible for him to do so at the moment. After all, he was on someone else's territory. He could only answer patiently. If that magic crystal is really the crystal key, I'm sure it would have been broken in half by then. At that time, no one thought that the magic crystal might be the crystal key. Oh, we also guessed this possibility at the time. But no one thought too much about it. Jimmy kept telling himself to be patient. What happened for such a big matter? As long as I say something wrong, it is very likely that this matter will be very detrimental to me. The behavior of these hateful guard camp knights was like interrogating prisoners. And they did not regard them as heroes who had found clues. This made Jimmy feel a little aggrieved and the temporary adventure group certificate in front of him seemed to it has no effect. Caught off guard. A fireball exploded in our crowd. By the time I reacted, the magic crystal had already been snatched away. Jimmy continued impatiently. His voice became a little hoarse. And he took a sip of tea. In fact, this matter had already spread last night. And it immediately caused an uproar in Benna City. The crystal key that had been searched for many days was actually hidden in the showroom of Bradbury Manor. The most likely reason is that the rebels who looted the manor did not take it away at all. A crystal key, the knights of the guard camp, and the magicians of the law enforcement regiment knew nothing about it. This shows how perfunctory their investigation over the past few days has been. It is simply the biggest joke of the year. The lost object has always been where it was. The knights from the entire Benes City guard camp and the magicians from the law enforcement corps were mobilized, even searching for the whereabouts of the crystal key throughout the entire Benes province. Perhaps that crystal key is a little homesick and ran back from outside with long legs. No matter which explanation it is, it can make for the most bizarre conversation. The guard camp was under considerable pressure and brought these young nobles with various family backgrounds to the guard camp for detailed investigation. It is precisely because of this that no matter how many times Night Klaus interrogated Jimmy, the two magicians next to him remained silent, and they were holding back a fire in their hearts. This thing is really a bit useless. When Soldak returned to Bradbury Manor last night, the manor was already in a mess. I didn't expect that this matter would cause such a big stir. He took advantage of the chaos and walked out of the corner of the closet in the showroom. There was no one in the showroom. When he walked out of the mansion, he found that the knights from the Benna guard camp were standing outside the manor. He leisurely put on a guard camp style cloak and wore a guard camp knight badge on his chest. He walked naturally and casually and even nodded with a smile to the guard camp knight coming from the opposite side, and then left Bradbury Manor without any hindrance. No one came up to question him the whole time. He returned to the hotel, closed the curtains, and slept until daylight. In just one day, news spread that the crystal key had mysteriously appeared at Bradbury Manor. He didn't expect that this matter would become such a big deal. He originally only hoped that this matter could be spread on a small scale and that he could divert the attention of the magicians from the Dark Moon Gate from always staring at Wall Village. But now it seems that the explanation is really unclear. The magicians at the Dark Moon Gate knew that Magician Gurdon had obtained this crystal key. Now this crystal key had appeared in Benna City, and the news spread quickly. Although the magicians of the Dark Moon Gate will not spread this matter around, and even if they say it, not many people will believe it. They will definitely continue to investigate this matter. The Magician Gurdon died in Wall Village and it seemed that he really couldn't withstand any investigation. Serdak scratched his head in pain and thought seriously about how to silence the magicians of the Dark Moon Gate. If he had known that this would be the case, he should have honestly used this piece of magic in the first place. Hand over the crystal. Tuck, tuck, tuck. There was a knock on the door, and Soldak jumped out of bed alertly. He quickly walked to the table, grabbed the blood ray crescent, and walked to the door. Opening the door, the hotel waiter stood outside with a smile on his face. Baron Soldak, here is your reply. The waiter looked at Soldak expectantly, keeping a smile on his face. Only then did Soldak realize that the waiter was ready to accept his tip. It's just that I was a little nervous just now, and I didn't prepare the tip in advance. Not only that, 
but he also held a sword in his hand. No wonder the waiter's smile only lasted for two seconds before becoming a little stiff. Serdak returned to the room, took out a few coins from the money bag hanging on the clothes rack in the bedroom, and stuffed them into the waiter's hands. Thank you for your generosity. When the waiter said this, his smile looked exaggerated. Soldek ignored it and closed the door. He cut the envelope with a peeling knife, took out the letter paper inside and unfolded it. He found that it was a reply handwritten by Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther did not expect that Serdak would arrive in Bena City so quickly. He frankly expressed that he admired a young noble like Serdak, who was very efficient in doing things. He plans to invite Serdak to his home for dinner this Saturday. It is said that there will be a small dance after the dinner. Soldak did not have much resistance to Marquis Luther's wooing. After all, it was Marquis Luther's recommendation that enabled him to become a noble baron. Waiting until night, there was no news from Hathaway and Beatrice. Soldak thought that maybe they were being watched too closely by their family. And it was possible that the letter he wrote could not reach them. In someone's hand. Or they saw the letter. But they didn't have time to reply. Serdak was going to have something to eat in the restaurant downstairs. And then returned to the room to continue meditating to see how he could light up the dark stars in his body. As soon as he reached the door of the room, he heard another rapid knock on the door. And Soldak opened the door casually. Two aristocratic ladies wearing late blue conical hats with flowers on their heads. Their faces covered with a layer of black gauze. And dark floral palace dresses stood at the door. Behind them was a hotel waiter. They saw Soldak, shouted softly, rushed forward quickly, and lifted the veil on her head, revealing the beautiful and charming face inside. Hathaway gave Soldak a big hug, followed by Beatrice, who was also dressed. Soldak took out a silver coin from his arms, threw it to the hotel waiter, and then closed the door. Night, Soldak. I didn't expect you to come directly from Alenza. When I saw your letter, I didn't want to wait for a moment. I just wanted to come to see you as quickly as possible. The conical hat decorated with flowers on her head fell to the ground, and her long golden hair spread out like a waterfall behind her. Her emerald-like eyes looked at Soldak lovingly, her eyes filled with joy, excitement, excitement and enthusiasm. Serdak put his hands around the girl's slender waist, feeling the energetic body that was pressed tightly against her. He could even see the blush on Hathaway's milky white face. She had a kind of temperament, regardless of the impulse. He closed his eyes, his long eyelashes trembling slightly. Serdak swallowed the words. Actually, I came to Benna City to do some things and stopped by to see you guys. I heard that you were grounded. How did you escape? Soldak put his hands on Hathaway's round shoulders and asked her. Hathaway pursed her lips and glanced back at Beatrice beside her. Hey, did you just think of me now? Round-faced Beatrice stood beside Hathaway with a look of resentment and complained. Hathaway's face became even redder and she quickly let go of Soldak and stepped aside. Feel sorry! Serdak stretched out his hands towards Beatrice. Beatrice was much more generous than Hathaway. She hugged Soldak generously, kissed Soldak on the cheek with her lips as soft as rose petals, then stood on tiptoes. He stretched his neck and whispered into Soldak's ear, We ran out secretly. We used a magic crystal to bribe the guards guarding the tower and sneaked out through the back door. The round-faced Beatrice had a sly smile in her eyes. Would your actions cause greater anger in the family? Serdak asked with some surprise. The two of them were so brave. They actually ran over like this without any hesitation. Hathaway wrinkled her delicate eyebrows and said, I've been grounded in the tower. They won't do anything to me. We have no plans to go back after sneaking out this time. We plan to stay with you in Alenza City for a while. Beatrice said softly beside her. Serdak was speechless for a while. She didn't hide the fact of marriage from them even if they were secretly in love with each other. Would Hathaway really not mind this? I heard that many rich girls have romantic feelings. Maybe Hathaway is just impulsive. He is not slow. Of course, he can feel Hathaway's passionate feelings and knows some of her thoughts and ideas. He has always been there on these matters. To withdraw? To accept passively? It's just that there are some things he wants to protect. And he doesn't want those things to become a mess. After all, the relationship between him and old Sheila had just eased and some of the grudges in old Sheila's heart had just been eliminated. At this time, he didn't want to take Hathaway back to Wall Village. I have never appreciated the beautiful night view of Benna City. I wonder if I have the honor to spend such a beautiful night with these two ladies. Serdak avoided Beatrice's topic and told the two nobles said the lady. Okay, I haven't come out for air for a long time. Let's go to Victory Square for a walk. 
Beatrice responded immediately. Hathaway has no problem with this. She was a little worried just now that if the three of them really spent a night in Suldak's hotel room, whether she would agree to Suldak's excessive demands. After all, the aristocratic education she had received since she was a child had subconsciously influenced her. He told her how an aristocratic lady should clean herself up before marriage, etc. Don't worry about it now. It's really a good idea to visit Bena City at night. Chapter 548 Bena Night There are 237 statues of great swordsmen erected around the hero's square in Bena City. A line of incisive text is engraved on the stone tablet at the foot of each statue, which records the glorious life of this great swordsman. It is precisely because of these great swordsmen that the title of Swordsman Bena is resounding throughout the Green Empire. It is said that every year during the opening season of the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy, the new students will come to Heroes Square to swear an oath to inherit the Bena Swordsman spirit of their ancestors. There is a low wall of shrubs all around the square, and in the center is a flower bed. There is no large fountain in the Heroes Square, for small fountains are set up at the four corners of the square for people to drink when they are thirsty. The fountains there is a trumpet-shaped catchment pool below, and there are always some birds landing next to the catchment pool to drink water. There were many people in the Heroes Square. Some of them were foreign travelers, who came specifically to pay homage to the swordsmen of Bena. But most of them were citizens of Bena City. On summer nights, Heroes Square is much cooler than other places. Some vendors carrying fruit baskets on their heads shuttled among the crowd. There were also many kinds of fruits in the baskets on their heads. Some children's eyes were always chasing them. The girl who was holding a flower basket and buying flowers jumped up to Soldak. She stood timidly in front of Serdak, stood on tiptoes and raised the flower basket in her hand high, staring at a pair of innocent eyes. The eyes said to Serdak, Lord Knight, do you want to buy a flower? She saw the knight's badge on Serdak's chest. So she called him that. The little girl's face was as red as a big apple. And she struggled to hold a basket full of flowers. Hathaway leaned over and looked at the flowers in the basket. And looked at Beatrice. Although she was silent, she could not hide the anticipation in her eyes. Soldak gave the little girl a thumbs up in appreciation. Picked out two tulips from the flower basket. Put ten copper plates into the little girl's little hand. And said, Then I'll buy two. Your flowers are beautiful. Two beautiful big sisters are even more beautiful. The little girl took the coin, narrowed her eyes, and said with a smile. He made a face at Serdak and ran towards the other couple holding a flower basket. She specifically targets young couples who look gorgeously dressed. So her sales success rate is particularly high. Soldak gave the flowers to Hathaway and Beatrice. And the two girls took the tulip with slightly blushing faces. Slightly pursed their red lips and smiled. The three people stopped in front of the flower bed in the center of the square. Inside the flower pool was a sea of flowers. Many citizens sat on the stone platform next to the flower bed. There was a street lamp every 15 meters away, making the entire hero's square appear brightly lit. Hathaway squatted down next to the flower pond holding a tulip. She looked at a cluster of small flowers with white petals and yellow stamens. Her long golden hair hung down from her ears. She gently lifted it up with her hands, revealing her beautiful and fair face. Hathaway saw Suldak looking towards her and said to him, I remember when I was very young. My father liked to take me to Heroes Square to play. He always looked at the statues there. And I would play here in the flower pond. Beatrice blinked and didn't understand why Hathaway mentioned things from her childhood. She held up her long skirt and sat down on the flower bed next to Hathaway. The two of them were wearing court-style dresses often worn by noble ladies and beautiful glass slippers. After walking for such a long time, even if they were fresh graduates of the Swordsman Academy, their feet would inevitably feel a little sore. The round-faced Beatrice thumped her thigh hard through her skirt. She wanted to find a quieter pub to sit in. At least, she didn't have to walk around in this skirt. Although this skirt looked beautiful, it was painful. Only you know, the girdle made her barely able to breathe half. And even after taking a deep breath, her bottom two ribs felt a dull pain. She could hardly move her waist and could hardly eat anything. Every time she took a breath, her breasts would feel like inflated rubber balls, as if they were about to burst out of the bra cups. So she always had to press her chest with her hands. The wide skirt was spread out on the flower bed, and she wanted to kick off the glass slippers on her feet. She had never thought that sitting on the stone platform next to the flower bed would be so comfortable. She wanted to sit here for a while without taking a step. Hathaway leaned on Beatrice's shoulder and continued to tell Soldak, who was sitting aside about her life. Aunt Annabelle said to her that if you want to get into the other person's heart, you must understand him. Life. 
Hathaway only knew that Suldak's home was in the remote mountain village of Alinsa City. As the only knight in the village, Suldak was determined to change the current predicament of Wall Village. Of course, she didn't care about this. She hoped that Serdak could be more proactive. As a noble lady and a well-educated lady, she didn't want to appear irritable. Hathaway continued, At that time, a statue of a great swordsman would be erected in this square every few years. He was very familiar with these statues of great swordsmen and would tell me about their glorious lives every time. I always regret that I did not participate in the Holy War 800 years ago. He always said that a swordsman's biggest regret is that he cannot have his statue erected in Hero Square. Hathaway's eyes are full of admiration for her father. When Suldak heard Hathaway talking about this, he realized that her family background might really be a big noble in Benna City. But he didn't ask. He felt that asking such a question was too utilitarian. He didn't want anything from them. He wanted to retain a little bit of his own pride. And it seems that Hathaway was greatly influenced by his father. Although the two are now in conflict, Hathaway's father's figure is everywhere in Hathaway's memories. Serdak thought of his father, and also thought that his father was no longer in his memory. Whether it was the previous life or this world, he didn't even know where his home was. Those broken memories always seemed like countless fragments. The torn photos are like snowflakes scattered in the sea of memory. He feels that his home is in Helensa. A trace of disappointment flashed in Hathaway's eyes. She lowered her head and picked a small white flower from the flower pond, put it in front of the gem brooch on her chest, and said, As I grew older, he became busier and busier. He seemed to have endless things to do every day, and he always had to attend Parliament. Only during breakfast and dinner could we occasionally chat. Suldak was a little speechless. He didn't expect that Hathaway's father was still a big shot and was actually qualified to participate in the Parliament. Recently he said he wanted to choose a spouse for me and wanted to control my marriage. Hathaway said angrily. He wouldn't have said that before. He said he should respect my opinion. Maybe time can change some people's initial thoughts. But this is not the life I want. After speaking, she glanced at Suldak secretly. I don't want to live like a bird in a cage. What I want is freedom to fly in the sky like a dragon eagle. Seeing the look of approval in Suldak's eyes, Hathaway breathed a sigh of relief. Hathaway pouted in dissatisfaction because she didn't hear about Suldak's past. She still wanted to know about his past. Beatrice almost dragged her numb ankle as she walked around the hero's square with Hathaway and Suldak. Beatrice almost collapsed on the ground when she heard Hathaway propose to go to the clock tower to see the night view of Benna City. Fortunately, when leaving Hero's Square, Serdak very considerately hired a magic caravan so that Beatrice could have a rest in the magic caravan. Climbing to the top of the bell tower observation deck, Beatrice felt that her legs were almost broken. She held on to the iron railings next to the observation deck with both hands, not wanting to take another step. She and Hathaway stood on either side of Suldak, overlooking the entire city of Benna. Countless brightly lit streets weaved an extremely gorgeous network in this huge city and the magic caravans on the streets were moving in the streets. The river flows endlessly. This place is countless times more prosperous than Alinsa. The whole city can't be seen at a glance. And the lights in the farthest place are silent in the distant night. This city is so beautiful! Serdak sighed sincerely from the bottom of his heart. Seeing the night wind blowing Hathaway and Beatrice's blonde hair, Suldak was in a trance. At this time, the observation deck on the top of the bell tower was empty. Hathaway boldly put her hand around Suldak's arm leaned against his shoulder and asked, Have you ever thought about living here? Suldak smelled the faint fragrance of iris juice on Hathaway and felt the fullness of her chest seeming to press against his arm and said, Halanza is actually very good. I'm used to the life there. Unless the magma under Mount Pudu erupts and turns hundreds of miles around into a dead land. There is no way I can leave there. Hathaway leaned next to Suldak, gently smelled the faint scent of soap on his body and listened to his firm words. None of these words were said to cater to her, compared with those she had seen in daily life. Hathaway as a young nobleman. Serdak seems to have some shadow of his father. This feeling made Hathaway's eyes blurred, as if the city in front of her was a little blurry in her eyes. She felt that the man in front of her just had to turn around and say solemnly to her, Come with me. Leave here. And start a new life with me. She is willing to let go of everything in front of her and devote herself to love without hesitation but the expectation did not materialize until they left the bell tower. Serdak did not say such words. On the contrary, he very gentlemanly called a magic caravan in front of the bell tower and took the initiative to take them back to the manor. He did not return to the hotel as Hathaway thought. It was an unforgettable night. 
Thank you for your company, Serdek said while sitting in the magic caravan. The wheels rolled, and the night scene outside the window quickly flew behind the car window. And the street lights on the roadside were like streaks of color. Beatrice was sleeping soundly on the soft leather sofa. She took off her crystal shoes and spread her legs flat on the sofa. The hem of her long skirt was lifted, revealing a section of her snow-white thighs. Soldak felt that as a gentleman. He should not always look at those tempting thighs at this time. He shifted his gaze to Hathaway's face and saw Hathaway's tangled look. I thought she was unwilling to compromise with her family. So he persuaded Hathaway. Don't get into too much trouble with your family. And don't think about escaping at this time. Don't you want your family's blessing on the wedding? Hathaway was hesitant to be more proactive and let him say those words. She hesitated, just. Saldak reached out and touched Hathaway's cheek and said encouragingly, Stick to what you think is right. I will always stand behind you and support you. I will stay in Benna City these days. If you are really determined to leave here, you can come to the hotel to find me at any time. Hearing Saldak say this, the courage Hathaway had just summoned leaked out again. Hathaway nodded, a little annoyed, complaining in his heart that he was a coward for not being able to say what he was thinking. And now, he couldn't say it anymore no matter what. I could only be cruel. Leaned over, hugged Soldek tightly, and pressed my soft lips hard on his lips without saying a word. At this time, the car suddenly became quiet. The magic caravan did not stop at the gate of the manor. Hathaway and Beatrice were going to sneak back through the side door of the manor and sneak out all night, not knowing what kind of anger he would bear from his family next. Beatrice looked like she had just woken up. She yawned and was pulled out of the magic canopy carriage by Hathaway. She stepped on the ground with her bare feet and held the glass slipper in her hand. She had walked a lot tonight. My ankles were highly swollen. And now I seemed to be limping when I walked. Serdak got out of the magic caravan and wanted to see them both off for a while. Beatrice waved her hand to stop him, signaling him to leave in a car quickly to avoid being discovered. Soldak was a little confused. But he still got on the carriage and asked the coachman to drive back to the hotel. Hey, what's wrong with you? Lady Dorothy, sitting in the magic caravan, asked her best friend beside her. She was just talking about last night's affair, and she was showing off to Annabelle. Annabelle was good at everything, but she was old-fashioned and conservative. She had always wanted to find a lover for her, but unfortunately, she couldn't convince her friends. That's Hathaway. Annabelle looked out the car window and recognized at a glance that the person wearing an exquisite evening dress and pulling Beatrice forward quickly along the sidewalk was her niece Hathaway. She turned her head just in time to see Serdak turn and board the magic caravan. Annabelle was slightly stunned. She discovered that the young man having a private meeting with her niece Hathaway was the noble baron who played cards with them on the magic airship. At this time, Dorothy saw Annabelle's strange expression and followed her gaze out the window, just in time to see Soldak's back disappearing at the door of the magic caravan. Dorothy said, and all her life. When she saw Soldak's strong back, she licked her lips gently and whispered, That young man seems familiar. Which noble family is he from? Why do I have no impression of him? Chapter 549 Quarrel The magic caravan moves forward along the avenue. Serdak was sitting in the carriage, wondering whether he should return to Helanza City as soon as possible after the things here were over. After all, the construction of the main body of the third level reservoir in Wall Village has begun. The third expansion of the reservoir runs almost horizontally through the valley upstream of Wall Village, building a true semicircular arc-shaped reinforced concrete dam. This dam after its completion, it indicates that the three most important phases of the Wall Village reservoir have been completed. After this dam is completed, the water storage capacity of the reservoir can satisfy the irrigation of all the land in Wall Village. As for the fourth level storage tank, it can be regarded as the overflow tank designed by Suldek only when there is a flash flood or continuous rain for days, and the river in Wall Village reaches its maximum discharge, and it is still unable to pour rainwater from upstream. The fourth level storage tank will be opened. At the gate of the pool, excess rainwater will be poured into the fourth level reservoir. The role of the fifth level reservoir is smaller. It is more like a landscape belt around the entire reservoir project. A shallow water area will be created here. In the future, the fifth level reservoir will be a holy place to cool off in summer. The townhouses in the village will end at the end of September. Because once October enters, Wall Village will usher in two festivals. The Harvest Festival and the Adult Ceremony Festival. And then the large-scale Autumn Harvest will begin. This year, there will be nearly thousands of acres of wheat fields are ready for harvest. And then all work in the village of Wall will stop again. 
The villagers who built villas in Carl Manor will also return to Wall Village to participate in the autumn harvest. Soldek had already greeted Carl early. A group of swordsmen blocked the middle of the avenue. They emerged from a side alley almost at the same time as the magic caravan drove over. The leading armored swordsman raised his hand and stopped the magic caravan. The coachman quickly jumped out of the carriage and greeted the group of constructed swordsmen with his butt stuck out. Facing these constructed swordsmen wearing cold masks, the coachman seemed a little nervous. Routine inspection. Open the compartment door and stand aside. The leading constructed swordsman waved his hand to the coachman impatiently. The carriage driver walked to the roadside with a grimace and looked at these constructed swordsmen in fear. The leader of the constructed swordsmen and two swordsmen stood at the door of the carriage, looking at the carriage without saying a word. Serdak got out of the carriage. He saw the family emblem on the chest of the constructed swordsman. He felt that it looked familiar. For a moment, he couldn't remember where he had seen it before. Serdak was sure that he wore such an emblem on his chest. The family emblem basically cannot be a rebel. Since they are not rebels, Serdak thinks it doesn't matter. Serdak put all the noble badges and knight badges on his chest, jumped down from the magic caravan, and deliberately spread his hands to prevent the group of unfavorable constructed swordsmen in front of him from making any excuses. The leading constructed swordsman stared at Soldak with a cold face and said, Routine inspection! After saying that, without waiting for Serdak to say anything, he walked up and tried to take off the sword from Serdak's waist. Serdak took two steps back and did not hand over his sword. The two constructed swordsmen behind the leader of the constructed swordsmen immediately spread out and blocked the escape routes on both sides of Serdak, exuding murderous aura. Serdak could feel that the team of constructed swordsmen in front of him were elite swordsmen who had experienced hundreds of battles. As long as he made the slightest move, he would be greeted by the thundering offensive of this team of constructed swordsmen. The leading constructed swordsman came up and said coldly to Soldak, You'd better not make any unnecessary resistance. We are just doing a routine inspection. Serdak leaned against the carriage of the magic caravan. The constructed swordsman approached him again and reached out to grab the sword at his waist, blocking the construct swordsman's hand. The construct swordsman seemed to have expected that Serdak would do this. He flipped his wrist, turned his fist into a knife, and slashed towards Serdak's neck, and bent his other arm, bucked into Serdak's chest with his elbow, and his movements were so coherent that Serdak was almost caught off guard. Serdak used his arm to block the construct knight's sword, but he had no time to pay attention to the elbow that hit his chest. He bent his knees and used his shoulders to block the swordsman's elbow. The constructed swordsman's elbow hit his shoulder. He felt as if he had been hit by a running rhinoceros. The huge force immediately ripped open the leather armor on his shoulder and a huge force made his body move uncontrollably. Then he fell down, and his thick back hit the carriage of the caravan. There was a sudden roar, and the carriage almost fell apart. Serdak wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to pass through the carriage and get out from the other side of the carriage, but he found that there were two more constructed swordsmen behind him, surrounding him, and the magic caravan in the center. Beatrice stepped on the stone road with bare feet, whispering softly to Hathaway as she walked. When they approached the side entrance of the manor, the two of them had a very tacit understanding and remained silent at the same time. Hathaway pushed open the side door of the manor, and from here through the side garden and stables, you can reach the main house in the manor. Seeing that no one seemed to be guarding the side door, Hathaway patted her chest, exhaled a long breath, and motioned for Beatrice, who was holding the glass slipper behind her, to follow her. She saw Beatrice standing there with some restraint, and turned around to see a team of constructed swordsmen standing in the shadow of the garden. Hathaway knew that all these constructed swordsmen were members of the constructed swordsman group under her father, Marquis Luther. They would not normally appear at the manor. She thought that it was probably because she had escaped privately that Marquis Luther would use them. The team of constructed swordsmen under him couldn't help but feel nervous. Miss Hathaway, the Marquis invites you, one of the constructed swordsmen said to Hathaway in a calm tone. After saying that, the team of constructed swordsmen sandwiched Hathaway and Beatrice in the middle and motioned for them to follow. Hathaway spread his hands, shrugged his shoulders, and followed the constructed swordsmen. The group did not go to the main house of the manor, but followed the garden path and walked all the way to the front door of the manor. There was a round arch building built above the large iron gate. Carriage entering the manor from the front door would pass through a long and narrow door opening. Along the stone steps at the back, Hathaway followed the swordsman team to the observation deck in front of the main entrance. I saw that Marquis Luther was only wearing a silk white shirt, a soft leather vest, a pair of crystal leather tight leg breeches, 
and a pair of riding boots on his feet. One foot was on the wall of the watchtower. Leaning out, the body looks outward. His hair was combed meticulously, but his face was a bit scary with a gloomy look. When the round-faced Beatrice saw the appearance of Marquis Luther, she was so frightened that she stuck out her tongue and hid behind Hathaway, not daring to face the scrutinizing gaze of Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther turned his head, glared at Hathaway, snorted coldly, then ignored her, standing alone and looking out onto the street. Hathaway walked over cautiously, thinking about how to eliminate the anger in Marquis Luther's heart. Beatrice didn't think so. When she saw Marquis Luther looking outside the manor, she also looked outside curiously. I saw a group of swordsmen on the street outside the manor, surrounding a magic caravan. Several swordsmen were fighting around someone. Beatrice felt that the magic caravan looked familiar. She looked over there carefully and found that the magic caravan was exactly the one she and Hathaway had just ridden in. The guy surrounded by a group of swordsmen looked like much like Serdak. She secretly pulled Hathaway and pointed to the street outside. Hathaway didn't notice it at first. But when Beatrice winked at her, Hathaway immediately realized something was wrong. She looked in the direction of Beatrice's finger and saw only the street. There seemed to be a fight going on. She knew that Beatrice would not let her look outside the street for no reason, since there was a large open space outside the gate of Luther Manor for parking carriages. The observation deck was quite far away from the street. Hathaway only glanced at it and found that Serdak was being beaten by the constructed swordsman and was being defeated steadily. Hathaway's eyes widened, and her face turned frighteningly pale for a moment. She didn't know what her father would do in a rage. Marquis Luther held the power, and killing a knight was not a big deal. Those swordsmen were clearly his subordinates. You can't do this. He is my friend. Please let him go. Hathaway quickly walked to Marquis Luther and said. She knew how powerful those constructed swordsmen were, and she was worried that if she continued to hesitate, Soldak would die in the hands of those constructed swordsmen. You ignored my grounding order and sneaked out during the day just to see him? Marquis Luther asked in a deep voice, his tone full of anger. Hathaway nodded and explained in a low voice. Yes, he came to Beta City to see me this time. Out of courtesy to my friends, I sneaked out to see him once. She knew Luther's temper. Normally, as long as he said this, Marquis Luther's anger would subside. But obviously it didn't happen this time. Marquis Luther snorted coldly. Dad! Hathaway begged. Annabelle's carriage stopped at the gate of the manor. When she got out of the carriage, she saw a group of people standing on the observation deck at the gate. Leaning against the wall were her brother Marquis Luther and niece Hathaway. From a distance, it looked like the two were arguing on the observation tower. So they quickly climbed onto the observation tower with their long skirts in hand. Chapter 550 Going to the Banquet Ferdinand Hathaway What are you two looking at? With the help of the maid, Annabelle walked up to the observation deck holding her long skirt and asked the father and daughter. The cool night breeze made her pull the scarf around her shoulders. And Annabelle's arrival completely broke the deadlock. Marquis Ferdinand Luther turned to look at Annabelle. His expression softened a little. And he asked in a calm tone, Annabella, did your journey go well this time? Not bad, Annabelle replied. She and Marquis Luther were biological siblings. She had the best relationship with Marquis Luther before she got married. Later, she became a countess after marrying in Constantinople. Every summer, she would return to Marquis Luther's manor in Benna City. Stay for a while. Auntie. Hathaway's eyes were a little red. The fight in the street continued. Five constructed swordsmen surrounded Soldak. Fortunately, both sides were relatively restrained. At least they had not drawn their swords yet. Hey! Who messed with our Hathaway? Annabelle walked over and held her niece in her arms. Both of them had a pair of eyes as gorgeous as emeralds, which was said to be the embodiment of the bloodline of the Luther family. Hathaway's face turned red, and she glared at Marquis Luther angrily, not knowing how to explain it for a moment. Annabelle hugged Hathaway, leaned against the wall of the observation deck, and said to Marquis Luther, I have seen the young man come to Benna City by airship with us. Marquis Luther was slightly startled and asked Annabelle curiously, Which young noble family is he from? Annabelle said with a smile. I didn't ask his name on the airship. I just played cards at a card table. He was a taciturn young man. Marquis Luther nodded and asked again. Annabella, do you want to intercede with Hathaway? Annabelle sneered. I don't want to interfere in your affairs. Ferdinand, I just think you and Hathaway need to sit down and talk. As for this young man from Helensa City, do you really do you want to arrest him? Or do you think that letting him disappear from Hathaway's eyes will completely solve the problem? Then, 
Annabelle turned to Hathaway and asked, The problem between you and your father will occur in every noble family. At the beginning, like you, I hated your grandfather very much for a while. But then come to think of it, since you are enjoying a privileged life, you need to do something for your family. If you want to reconcile with Luther, show your sincerity. I think this matter can be resolved only by giving in on both sides. Hathaway remained silent. Annabelle persuaded again. Hathaway, I know how much your father loves you. He will always give priority to your feelings. But there are some things you must do for the sake of the family. This is your responsibility. Hathaway raised her head and sniffed, with a hint of rebellion in her green eyes. Although her eyes were full of willfulness, she said to Marquis Luther, Let him go. I am willing to attend the meeting the day after tomorrow. I will do what I should do. Are you serious? Marquis Luther looked at Hathaway seriously and asked. Hathaway stared back at Marquis Luther without giving an inch, as if she felt there was no need to answer again. Okay, it's a deal. Marquis Luther nodded and said to the captain of the guard beside him, Go and inform Nathaniel to let the young man leave. The guard standing aside said, Yes, Lord Marquis. Marquis Luther put his arm around his sister Annabel's shoulders and was very happy for her arrival and the group walked down the observation tower. It wasn't until Marquis Luther was done that Beatrice came up from the side and stood next to Hathaway. She reluctantly looked at Soldak, who was being forced to retreat by a group of constructed swordsmen on the street. He sighed softly. The street looked deserted, but the street lights on both sides were very bright. There were almost no people on the street at this time. Five constructed swordsmen pressed forward from five directions, trying to surround Serdak. Their idea was also very simple. They just wanted to collect Serdak's sword hanging on his waist. Could didn't use his weapon. And the constructed swordsmen naturally didn't draw their swords either. Serdak didn't want to keep his hands tied. So he used his arm to block a heavy punch from the leading swordsman constructor. He wore a hard leather wristband on his forearm. But even so, a punch from the leading constructed swordsman almost broke Serdak's wrist. Serdak snorted and immediately punched the guy. The only price for Serdak's punch was that the surrounding constructed swordsmen completely surrounded Serdak. Serdak put on a defensive posture, using the strongest part of his body to block the fists and kicks of the constructed swordsmen. In the process, Serdak was not without the power to fight back. He would occasionally take action. He punched back, and soon his body was covered with footprints. Fortunately, he has a strong physique and did not suffer any injuries from the random punches and kicks of the constructed swordsmen. According to the Imperial Decree, the weapons of knights are a symbol of imperial power. Countless knights form an army that defends the country. They have the right to carry weapons with them. Even the knights of the guard camp have no right to interfere with this. Therefore, Serdak had the courage to reject these constructed swordsmen. Serdak looked very embarrassed when surrounded by five constructed swordsmen. The swordsmen had a strong balance and cooperated with each other very well. They cooperated with each other to attack Serdak, forcing Serdak to panting. If Serdak hadn't had solid basic blocking skills, he would have almost been blasted by these five constructed swordsmen. Although there is no shield on his arm, the habit he developed during fighting makes him still like to raise his arm when attacking. Serdak did not activate the knight's aura of power, and every collision was a contest of strength. Only those who have been on the battlefield can feel it. A fist sneaked up from the side of his ear. As Serdak turned sideways, he ducked his head to the side, barely dodging the punch and casually hit the constructed swordsman with his sword. A sneaky kick from the side hit him in the ribs. Soldak felt a sharp pain, and his body flew out uncontrollably. He fell on the bushes on the side of the road and broke a bench. Wait for Serdak to crawl out of the bushes. The constructed swordsman pounced on them again without hesitation, and once again blended in together. Nathaniel, the Marquis has ordered us to let you go. Just when Serdak was completely in a state of being beaten, a guard ran over from the main entrance of the manor, and said to the constructed swordsman, Okay, everyone, stop the team. The construct swordsman immediately stopped and gave a thumbs up to Soldak. Without saying a word, he turned around and left with a group of construct knights. The personal guard also looked at Soldak curiously, and then turned back to the manor. Serdak looked embarrassed and wiped the blood from the corner of his mouth. His face was punched hard by the constructed swordsman, and it was now swollen. I received a few solid kicks on my body, but I still felt a little bit of pain. He tried to move his legs and feet, but found that they were fine, and then limped onto the magic caravan. He didn't expect that Hathaway's family could actually mobilize such a powerful swordsman. When he sat back on the sofa in the carriage, he glanced at the manor hidden in the night. 
unfortunately. He couldn't see what was inside the manor in the dark. View. Soldak waved to the carriage driver, who was standing stunned on the street again, indicating that he could come over. The carriage driver tremblingly climbed onto the driver's seat of the magic spray car, regardless of the damage on the carriage. He raised his whip and urged the damaged magic caravan to quickly leave the aristocratic area. It wasn't until the magic caravan had completely driven out of the aristocratic neighborhood that the coachman slowed down, seeing that no one was catching up behind him. He let out a long sigh of relief. Serdak sat in the carriage of the magic caravan and used holy light to heal the bruises on his body. Return to hotel. I've been staying in a hotel for the past two days and haven't gone anywhere. The entire Benes city seemed to be talking about the strange events that happened at Bradbury Manor. Everyone is curious about something that happened at Bradbury Manor. After all, it is a crystal key related to the Red Dragon Treasure. It is said that if anyone finds the Red Dragon Treasure, he will immediately have a large fortune. Of course, there are mixed opinions about the Bradbury family. A large part of the citizens thought that everyone was too careless in Bradbury Manor and did not carefully search for the relief groove on the wall. So they did not discover the crystal key hidden inside. When the rebels came from Bradbury Manor, the magic crystal that was stolen was probably fake. There are also some citizens who believe that there is a teleportation circle with some kind of attributive nature engraved on the magic crystal, which will automatically return to Bradbury Manor every once in a while based on the hidden summoning circle on the wall. For this reason, some people have tried to break into Bradbury Manor again to take a look at the magical walls. It's just that this time, these gangsters who took advantage of the chaos and tried to sneak into Bradbury Manor were almost all stopped outside by the knights of the guard camp. Finally, some people believe that the magic crystal that appeared again was simply a fake and had really fallen into the hands of the rebels. Serdak sat in front of the dining table, silently listening to the strange ideas and eating his lunch in silence. After finishing lunch, Soldak sat in the restaurant for a while, then walked to the stables behind the hotel's inner courtyard, took out his ancient horse, and asked the hotel waiter about the equestrian training ground. Leave the hotel on horseback. I took Gubo Lima for a few laps in the training ground to let Gubo Lima stretch his body, and then returned to the hotel before dinner. During this period, he sent some more letters to Hathaway, but did not receive a reply. I don't know if they were severely punished after they went home that night. On the day of the meeting with Luther, the sun was shining brightly outside the window. Serdak got up from bed very early and took advantage of the morning time to take a bath. He shaved the beard on his chin neatly with a skinning knife and began to awkwardly put on a noble dress. Afternoon, Serdak came out of the hotel on an ancient bolai horse. Following the address left by Marquis Luther in the letter, he first walked into the wealthy area. Soldak found that the scenery on both sides of the road was somewhat familiar. When he rode horseback to the gate of Marquis Luther's mansion, he realized that he seemed to have been to this place the day before yesterday. The street outside happened to be the place where he fought with a group of constructed swordsmen. Soldak was still thinking, what a coincidence. Hathaway is actually a neighbor of Marquis Luther. It seems that Hathaway's family also has the same important people as Marquis Luther. There was a wide open space at the entrance of the manor. The Luther family emblem was erected in front of the gate. Serdak came to the big iron gate. The guard at the door quickly came out and asked Serdak what he was doing. Soldak jumped off his horse and took out Marquis Luther's letter from his arms. The guard at the door took the letter from Soldak's hand. When he saw Marquis Luther's personal seal on the letter, he quickly winked at his companions in the concierge and said with a smile, Our Lord Marquis did not go out. It seems that he is waiting for you in the manor. Wait a moment. I have sent someone to report to the Marquis. The guard at the gate said, Not long after, the gate of the manor was completely opened by the concierge guard. Two guards stood at the door and saluted Serdak. Serdak rode into this gorgeous manor. He first passed through a long doorway at the gate then walked inside along the main road in the front yard of the manor for a while, and finally came to the edge of a fountain. The ornate main building is located behind the fountain, with a team of guards standing on the steps. Serdak came to the bottom of the steps and jumped off his horse. Baron Soldak, the Marquis has been waiting for you for a long time. A guard stood on the steps and said to Soldak with a smile. After saying that, he looked at Serdak seriously. When he saw Serdak's face, his expression was obviously slightly suffocating. However, his expression soon recovered and became even more complimentary. The guard asked a servant on the side to take the reins from Serdek, and then led Serdek up the stone steps. He looked as tall as a castle. Architecture. Serdek sighed in his heart at the rich heritage of the Luther family. 
walking up the steps step by step and entering the splendid hall on the first floor. Soldak stepped on the soft carpet and felt like he was falling into the clouds. Marquis Luther and his wife were waiting in the hall on the first floor. When they saw Soldak walking in from the door, Marquis Luther and his wife quickly stood up to greet him and said to his wife Marion with a smile, Baron Soldak is here. Don't underestimate him. He has made many military exploits in Wazimra City in the Maka Plain. And almost all the guards in the city defense department know him. Go and see if Hathaway is ready. If so, call her over. Hathaway's mother, Lady Marianne, said to the maid beside her. Yes, madam. The maid quickly turned around and trotted upstairs. Soldak walked up to Marquis Luther and stood up straight. When he saw Marquis Luther looking at him with great energy, Soldak also felt hot in his heart. Without Marquis Luther's recommendation, he would probably never be able to do it for the rest of his life. Can't cross the threshold of nobility. Lord Marquis Luther. Soldak gave a military salute to Marquis Luther and said, Madam, although Soldak didn't know Mrs. Marion, he also knew that she should be the wife of Marquis Luther. So he also performed a military salute. Mrs. Marion looked at Soldak with a smile and soft eyes, seeing his upright posture and dignified appearance. Her first impression was naturally very good. So she stretched out the back of her gloved hand in front of Soldak. Chapter 551 Meeting Serdak knelt on the ground, held the back of Mrs. Marion's hand with one hand, brought it to her mouth, and kissed her gently. Lady Marion smiled and motioned for Serdak to stand up and speak. Are you Baron Soldak? When she smiled, some crow's feet formed at the corners of her eyes, which were traces of time on her face. She must have been a beauty when she was young. Serdak replied respectfully. Yes, ma'am. Marion said gently. It's a little different from what I imagined. You are as strong as a northerner. Marquis Luther seemed very happy. He spread his hands and motioned for Soldak to sit on the sofa opposite, and said, The journey must have been smooth. You came a week earlier than I expected. Yes, Lord Marquis. After receiving the letter from you, I rushed to the airport terminal of Valencia City. There happened to be a magic airship that was about to fly to Bena. Soldak sat on the sofa embroidered with gorgeous patterns, replied somewhat cautiously. The level of luxury in the hall of the manor castle was beyond his imagination. Many appliances were inlaid with gold wire. Crystal chandeliers hung from the ceiling. And even the tea table in front of him was carved from ironwood. The tea sets on the wooden table were made of made of sterling silver, inlaid with rubies and sapphires, and polished by gold. After Soldak sat down, the maid who had been waiting aside quickly made fragrant tea for everyone. He sat upright on the sofa. But the soft sofa was not suitable for such a sitting posture. He said to Marquis Luther in front of him, Your Majesty, without your recommendation, perhaps my greatest achievement in this life would be Hylon. Guard camp night in Saw City. Please allow me to express my heartfelt thanks to you in person for this. As he spoke, he stood up again and performed a military salute to Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther was wearing a straight aristocratic dress. When he was not keeping a straight face, his fierce aura disappeared immediately, but his eyes were still full of energy. His hair was neatly combed, and his beard was shaved. Very clean, and the whole person is at least ten years younger than when he was in Wazimra City. Marquis Luther was very satisfied with Soldak's humble attitude. He waved his hand and said to Soldak, Uh-huh. It's nothing. For a knight who is good at holy light, you will reach the level of nobility sooner or later. I just shortened the process a little and played a little promotion role in the process. I am very happy. It can help a young and promising knight like you. Marquis Luther picked up the teacup and took a casual sip before asking, Have you decided on your barony? If you don't find a suitable place, you can come to Bitta City. After all, the layout of Helensa City is still a bit small. Almost all the noble lords there have private planes. It's hard to find more fertile land for you to choose from. Serdak did not expect that Marquis Luther would help him expand his territory. He was about to say that he had selected a territory in Helensa City. When Marquis Luther continued, Relatively speaking, the territory options in Bena City are much greater than that in Helensa City. An outstanding young noble like you should choose a plane with more development prospects and set up the barony in a wealthy plane. Once everything stabilizes, you could expand your new territory in the plane. This is the step that every capable noble must go through. Serdak didn't expect to be able to operate in this way. He thought that the land on the main plain would be more valuable. Marquis Luther said, As long as you expand your territory to a large enough size and establish enough merits on the plain battlefield, 
you can be promoted from a third-class baron to a second-class baron. In fact, this process is very easy for you. First of all, the territory that needs to be expanded does not need to be large. And the merits to be established only require a few enemy heads. Hearing Marquis Luther say this, it seemed as if a new door was slowly opening in front of Soldak. And he asked in surprise, Lord Marquis, can my title still be promoted? Marquis Luther and Lady Marion looked at each other and smiled and said, Of course, there seems to be a high wall between the nobility and the common people, which is difficult for ordinary people to cross. But when you enter the aristocracy, you can exercise some of your powers according to the nobility's code of conduct. You will find that the promotion of the title is actually it's not difficult. The only criteria are territory and merit. As long as you build enough merit, you can even reach my current position. Now that plain wars are breaking out all over the Green Empire, it's not as difficult as you think to build meritorious deeds. Soldak thought that Marquis Luther was one of the warlords of Bena province. So he naturally supported the young nobles of the empire to go to the battlefield. He also owned two very famous groups of constructed swordsmen. These were probably Luther's. Marquis says confidence in saying these words. Marquis Luther said, After this battle on the Maka Plain, I guess I will have to rest for a while. It's just that most of the Bena Legion's forces are currently trapped in the Warsaw Plain. Although the war situation has improved some time ago, it has recently fallen into a passive war situation. The main force of the Busman family's construct knights was blocked by those evil spirits in Gandhi. In the eastern mountainous area of Ayers Han, the Kimpato River defense line has also declared a crisis. But Duke Ryan Busman has offended the Angelabled royal family, and the royal constructed knights have now completely withdrawn from the Warsaw Plain. Now the Bena Supreme Council has several different opinions on the next strategic deployment of the Warsaw Plain. No matter which opinion is finally decided, the Bena province will send new troops to each plane for defense. My next defense zone will not be in the Warsaw Plain. I hope you can accompany me on the expedition. Marquis Luther looked at Soldak expectantly. Although Sardak didn't want to participate in the Plain War, and his not-so-good memories were all related to the Plain War, he knew that he could never speak out at this time. So he could only bite the bullet and say, I am willing to follow your instructions. Sir, go to war. Marquis Luther felt very satisfied when he heard Soldak's statement. He liked backbone young nobles like Soldak very much. Young people should have stronger bones. He seemed to have remembered something at this time, looked at the empty seats aside, and glanced at Mrs. Marion impatiently. Lady Marion nodded slightly to him, indicating that he would be patient. At this time, the curtain of the arch next to the living room shook slightly. The two maids lifted the curtain hanging on the arch. And several aristocratic ladies wearing dresses imitating palace dresses came out of the cloister. There was a faint smile on the blonde's face. And his snow-white arms and chest were dazzling. This long dress in the style of a palace dress can be tied at the waist to make the waist thinner. The design style has a large open placket on the chest. Although it is decorated with some white lace, it is still the most unrestrained long dress that Serdak has ever seen. The skirt, exquisite collarbone, and large breasts are almost all visible. Hathaway was walking behind the three aristocratic ladies in a long white gauze dress. Her dress was a little plain and elegant, far less gorgeous than her three sisters but as beautiful as a pure white lily. She deliberately walked at the back and looked depressed and absent-minded as she walked. When these group of aristocratic ladies walked out of the corridor, they saw Soldak sitting on the sofa. Seeing Marquis Luther talking to him in a pleasant manner, they looked at Soldak curiously and whispered to each other, Appearance. Soldak's appearance may not be considered very handsome, and he may even look a little ordinary when thrown into the crowd. But he exudes an aura that can only be obtained after experiencing countless killings on the battlefield. People who have been baptized by countless wars are far better than those young nobles, who were raised in greenhouses were more masculine. The noble lady walking at the front was holding a small folding fan in one hand. When she saw Soldak, her big eyes became bright and the smile on her face became much more natural. In response to his daughter's reaction, Marquis Luther motioned for them to sit over. The four aristocratic ladies came to Marquis Luther all looking gorgeous. Only Hathaway was lowering her head, looking at the toes of her shoes exposed under her skirt, and was constantly stirring a ribbon in her hand. When introducing them, Marquis Luther said to his daughters, This is Baron Soldak, the bravest knight who fought in the Battle of Wazimra City in the Maka Plain. These are my daughters. I'm usually so pampered that I don't know the etiquette of aristocrats. Hearing the first sentence of Marquis Luther's introduction, Hathaway Luther suddenly raised his head absent-mindedly, 
only to find that Soldak was looking at him with bright eyes. A faint smile in his eyes. He was wearing a not-too-decent aristocratic dress and stood in front of the sofa with his waist straight. Hathaway's eyes widened immediately, and the joy in her heart instantly spread to her face. If she didn't still have a little sense in her heart, she might have rushed forward and gave Soldak a big hug at this time. She never expected that the young nobleman Marquis Luther wanted to introduce to their sisters would be Serdak. At this moment, she remembered that when she was in Handenar County, Serdak was just a soldier in the heavy armored infantry regiment. Later, when she saw Serdak again, he had become the commander of the Hellanza City Guard Battalion. Knight, the person standing in front of him now is actually Baron Soldak. Hathaway was a little in disbelief. During this time, I heard Marquis Luther say many times at the dinner table that he met a very good young man in the mock-up plane. Hathaway had never thought about Soldak. Now Serdak suddenly appearing in front of you. This surprise is indeed a bit big. If I had known it would be like this, I wouldn't have risked running out of the manor to meet Serdak privately the night before. Hathaway blushed slightly at the thought. Everyone present, including Marquis Luther and Lady Marion, could see that when the noble ladies walked out of the corridor, Soldak's eyes fell on Hathaway who was walking at the back, and he kept staring at her. Never left. Obviously, this situation was what Marquis Luther wanted to see the most. He stood up and said to Lady Marion, Maybe we should let the young people chat together. Lady Marion stood up, took Marquis Luther's arm, and left the living room. Several aristocratic ladies were like cats full of curiosity, surrounding Serdak, vying to introduce themselves, and then chatting with him. But their topics were not understood by Serdak. Hathaway, who was sitting aside, never intervened from beginning to end. She just sat quietly with a faint smile on her face. At this moment, she just wanted to pass the good news to Beatrice, who was behind. Apparently Hathaway's sisters also had a good first impression of Soldak, and they tried their best to behave more ladylike. I don't know the name of this lady yet. For some reason, the more Hathaway remained silent, the more Soldak wanted to tease her. Hathaway. Hathaway raised her eyebrows and glared at Soldak. She saw the distress in Soldak's eyes, probably because she didn't want to sit here and deal with her boring sisters. Feeling a little proud, she said, There is still some time before dinner. Otherwise, I will bring you take a walk around the manor. I wish you all the best. Soldak quickly stood up from the sofa and followed Hathaway out of the gorgeous hall. The three noble ladies stayed on the sofa and looked at each other. The atmosphere was a bit awkward. Why does everyone like Hathaway? Hathaway's sister complained watching the two walking out of the hall side by side. Another sister sighed. Why do I think they seem to have a tacit understanding? Should we follow? The youngest sister narrowed her eyes, raised her proud chin very angrily, and asked her sisters. When they followed them out of the hall, they saw Hathaway and Soldak ascending the stairs of the castle watchtower through the side door, and they immediately said in frustration, Forget it. Are we required to climb such a high staircase wearing glass slippers? Hathaway's sisters, who were standing by the door, frowned and complained softly. Father is so biased towards Hathaway. She clearly had a fiancé before. So why would she call her this time? Hathaway and Soldak walked side by side towards the top of the observation tower. She deliberately chose this high tower. Only the more than 200 steps here could block the three half-sisters behind her. Hathaway and although they live in the same castle, their daily lives rarely intersect. They are not favored by Marquis Luther and they cannot even go to the restaurant Hathaway often goes to for breakfast. Seeing that there was no one else around, Hathaway turned around, stared at Soldak with her green eyes and asked, How could it be you? You never told me that you are the daughter of Marquis Luther. When I came to Benna City this time, I received an invitation from Marquis Luther. Speaking of which, the world is really small or the aristocratic circle is not that big. Soldak said to Hathaway with a smile. Hathaway turned her head and looked out the window, leaving Soldak with a perfect profile. The pearl necklace around his neck complemented the milk-colored skin. After boarding the high platform, Hathaway leaned against the wall of the observation deck and saw that a dance scene was being arranged in the garden below. Some tables had been set up, covered with neat and clean tablecloths, and some fruit plates were already placed on them. The servants were busy around. Several barbecue grills were set up on the outer edge, and several chefs were cooking delicious food. Are we going to have these for dinner? Serdak asked curiously, looking at the meat on the grill below. Hathaway shook her head and said, Of course not. These are specially prepared for the dance, and the dinner is prepared in the kitchen. After speaking, 
She turned around and raised her pointed chin. When she raised her head, a deep dent appeared on her delicate collarbone. A gust of wind blew across her cheek. She stared at Soldak, who was looking curiously at the back garden. The slightly raised lips, like water chestnuts, traced an upward arc. Chapter 552 Dance The melodious sound of the piano surrounds the dance floor. The surrounding lampposts emitted a soft light, and the marble floor under their feet was polished very smoothly. Hathaway's crystal dancing shoes made a crisp sound when she stepped on them, and the two danced to the faint beat. Soldak was not very good at dancing this kind of ballroom dance. He could only follow Hathaway's footsteps with all his concentration. His body was very stiff, and he would always lower his head and look at his toes, always worrying that he would step on them. Hathaway's dress. He didn't even taste the feeling of hugging Hathaway's slender waist. He just felt that a light rose perfume kept entering his nose. With a fair and smooth forehead, he looked down at her face from top to bottom, in addition to a pair of magnificent gem-like green eyes. Hathaway had a straight bridge of nose, and the proportions of her face were just right, especially after she was carefully dressed. It makes people feel a little amazing. Hathaway raised her head slightly and looked at Soldak with a half-smile. She had dominated Soldak for three dances in a row, which made the Luther sisters on the dance floor want to gouge her with their eyes. But they just thought about it. Hathaway was the most favored. Of. When they danced the first dance, Hathaway knew that this guy couldn't dance at all. But it didn't matter. She could lead him and give him enough tips. And then the two of them slowly spun on the dance floor. And by the third when she sang the song, Serdak was obviously getting better and could keep up with her dance steps. Beatrice was waiting beside the dance floor, a little eager to give it a try. She was worried about Hathaway in the backyard just now, but she didn't expect Soldak to appear directly at the dance. And at this moment, he was considered a guest of Marquis Luther. There were many nobles attending the ball tonight, and the eyes of some young nobles fell on Hathaway. They wanted to drive away the noble who danced with Hathaway three times in one breath. The beloved daughter of Marquis Luther. I rarely attend this kind of after-dinner dance. There are only so many songs in a dance. And this guy took three of them at once. The rest still depends on Hathaway's mood. So the chance of being rejected will inevitably increase greatly. When the music stopped, Hathaway took Soldak's hand and walked towards Beatrice on the edge of the dance floor. In the chaotic crowd, a gorgeously dressed woman stood up and stopped Hathaway. The woman had a beautiful face and looked to be a few years older than Hathaway. She stood in front of Hathaway and said to her unceremoniously, Hathaway, you can't keep occupying him. You should take a break. At least give Baron Soldak a chance to get to know the other sisters. Hathaway looked at the seventh lady, Mabel, with cold eyes. She is a very ambitious woman who once threatened her mother, Lady Marion, in the family. However, since the last time she secretly prevented Marquis Luther from participating in the Battle of Camperto River, Marquis Luther was so angry that he every time Marquis Luther thinks of that battle, his face becomes frighteningly gloomy. Hathaway ignored her. She was a vengeful person and would not forgive the woman in front of her just because the incident had passed so long. She directly pulled Soldak to Beatrice, put Beatrice's hand into Soldak's palm, and said, Beatrice, I'm tired. Come and take my place. Beatrice pursed her lips, lifted up her skirt and curtsied to Soldak, her white breasts dazzling. Serdak also leaned over to salute and smiled at Beatrice. The two of them remained silent in a tacit understanding. Serdak felt that this was also very good. At least, he would not be too nervous while spinning around on the dance floor with familiar people. You won't be embarrassed because you have nothing to talk about. Beatrice was pulled off the dance floor by Soldak and soon disappeared into the chaotic dance floor. Mrs. Mabel caught up from behind and accused Hathaway angrily. Shouldn't it be Baron Soldak's right to dance with whomever he wants? Hathaway! You can't do this. You are too domineering. Hathaway stood by the dance floor, took a glass of fruit wine from a waiter, and took a sip of it. She said to Mrs. Mabel, It's my business, Mabel, and you have no right to accuse me. Mabel's eyes widened, and she was a little out of breath at Hathaway's counterattack. She clenched her hands tightly and said angrily, You actually talk to me like that. Hathaway ignored her and sat directly on the empty chair next to her. Seeing that Hathaway ignored her at all, Mrs. Mabel really had no means to coerce Hathaway. She couldn't even tell Marquis Luther about this matter, lest he feel that she was always stirring up trouble in front of him. Mabel the lady could only leave angrily. She was almost stunned by Hathaway, encouraged by his friends. A handsome young nobleman plucked up the courage to walk up to Hathaway. He bent down and invited Hathaway. 
Miss Hathaway, can you please dance? Hathaway looked at the young man who appeared out of nowhere in front of her with a surprised look on her face and refused directly. Not interested. The young man stood there awkwardly, not knowing how to continue the conversation for a while. But he didn't want to just turn around and walk away. Lady Marion and Marquis Luther sat together, Lady Annabel on one side of them. No matter where Hathaway goes, she is the focus of the young people on the field. But not many people dare to go up and get into trouble. Lady Marion complained to Marquis Luther in a low voice. Look, it's all you. Hathaway is spoiled. Marquis Luther smiled generously, shook his head indifferently and said, Those guys have nothing to do all day long. Apart from strolling around, they are idle every day. Not to mention Hathaway. Even I can't stand them, Mrs. Marion said with some worry. But Hathaway always needs to have a few friends. I don't want her to be isolated in the aristocratic circle. We only need one or two close friends. Marquis Luther waved his hand again. People kept coming up to Luther to say H, Lo, and the conversation between them continued intermittently. When she saw Hathaway holding Soldak's hand very naturally and walking out of the dance floor, Lady Annabel raised her eyebrows, looked at the still clueless Marquis Luther, and asked, Ferdinand, is he the young nobleman you made an appointment with in advance to introduce Hathaway to her? Marquis Luther nodded. He also didn't expect that Hathaway, who had always been dismissive of young nobles, did not reject Soldak. This was a good start. What's wrong? Luther looked at Lady Annabel and asked. Mrs. Annabel pretended that she would not say that. She just raised the teacup to her mouth and said vaguely, If you had made it clear beforehand, maybe there wouldn't be such a big twist. Marquis Luther did not understand the implication of Lady Annabel's words. Although Marquis Luther was in a good mood tonight, after he danced an opening dance with Lady Marion and another dance with his sister Lady Annabella, he sat on the sofa and chatted with Lady Annabella and Lady Marion. Lady Annabella and Lady Marion once upon a time, they are close friends. And their relationship has become even closer over the past few years. When people reach middle age, they naturally have middle age worries. The magic potions on the market today are not easy to buy. The seventh lady, Mabel, sat down. The more she thought about it, the more aggrieved she felt. She felt that Hathaway was deliberately targeting her. When the ladies next to them talked about Hathaway, they said, she made a marriage contract with Baron Sidney of Aranza City. Later, the young noble died in the war in Warsaw. Now this young man is still from Aranza City. It seems that Ferdinand is obsessed with Aranza's youth. The nobles really look at me differently. When they heard that Mrs. Mabel actually talked about Baron Sidney at the ball, it was almost the last thing Marquis Luther wanted to mention. After hearing this, the ladies immediately changed their expressions. Mrs. Cece kindly reminded, Mabel, be careful if Marion hears these words. Mrs. Mabel saw that everyone was so frightened that she almost stopped talking because of something she said that was outrageous. She leaned on the sofa in a depressed mood and said with some reluctance, Okay, I won't be stupid enough to talk to her. I said it in front of you. But our husband doted on Hathaway too much. Look at when he was so harmonious with our daughter. Hathaway made such a big fuss. But in the end, she was just grounded. At this time, Mrs. Cece said with some emotion, Yes, in Ferdinand's eyes. He only has a daughter. Hathaway. Mrs. Mabel saw that all these ladies were like quails, unwilling to reveal their feelings. So she suggested, You can sit here and make a lot of noise. Or we can go back and play cards. Actually, I want to sit there for a while. After a short moment of silence, someone refused. The round-faced Beatrice was obviously much bolder than Hathaway. She almost pressed her face into Soldak's arms so that the two of them stood with their feet crossed, and she put her hand through under Serdak's armpits. She hugged Serdak's shoulders tightly, and placed Serdak's hands on her plump waist and hips. She didn't hide her feelings at all and asked quietly, How long can you stay here? Serdak felt that he had better leave quickly. If I attend a few more of these dances, I might completely forget about that remote mountain village. Melodious music, gentle women, and sweet fruit wine can quickly completely corrupt a determined warrior. So he said to Beatrice, If there is nothing else, I will take the nearest magic airship to Alinsa. There are a lot of chores there, and the remnants of the rebels are still wandering around there. No, I can't rest assured when I go back. It will be the harvest festival in a while. When you return to Alinsa, don't forget to write to us. Soon the dance came to an end, and Marquis Luther called Soldak in front of him again and said to him directly, When you go back this time, you have to be well prepared. 
at least the territorial garrison must be established. Now that wars are breaking out in the Green Empire, it is the time for us to establish our merits. How comfortable do you think the life of the nobles is? What kind of standing? Regarding your position, you can tell me what kind of responsibilities you have and what kind of support you need. You can write to me. Bena City is much richer than Helensa City. Yes, Lord Marquis. Serdak replied seriously. When Soldak left Bena City, Hathaway and Beatrice went to the airport terminal to see him off. At this moment, a large number of demon hunters gathered in Bena City again. The Bradbury family's crystal key was stolen for the second time. As a result, the secret of the Red Dragon treasure could not be hidden. Many demon hunters, adventure groups, and servants the Corps began to collect a large number of clues in Bena City. In the past few days, the Thieves Guild in Bena City has made a lot of money, and just a few pieces of inside information have been sold hundreds of times. On the contrary, deep in the deserted land outside Paglo's Pass, there are not only some adventure groups, but also some lone wolf-style demon hunters. Their arrival made Wall Village outside the mountain pass suddenly lively, and Wall Village also turned into a small supply depot. However, it also caused many unrest factors in the deserted land. Those adventure groups and mercenaries Tuan Ku is not a kind person. However, in this barren land, people's biggest asset is the golden wheat fields in the fields. Neither the adventure group nor the demon hunters have any interest in these villagers, who have almost nothing. What Soldak was most worried about were the rebel knights, who had no fixed abode. Andrew had seen them at the junction of the deserted land and the desert. It was just that the wind and sand on that side of the desert were too strong at that time. And those rebels risked their lives to get in. After entering the sandstorm, they lost track of Andrew. Later, they could not find the rebels anyway. I heard from Andrew that several more salamanders were discovered in the Pugil Mountain Lava River Sulphur Mine, and the Ogregulitum rushed to deal with them. The Badlands Militia has been established for nearly three months. During this period, except for going to Wall Village to collect three bags of food, there was no action. Seeing that the autumn harvest is approaching, Soldak also began to prepare the training plan for the militia battalion. After boarding the magic airship, I happened to see a magic airship just docking on the high tower platform opposite. A group of young people dressed as an adventure group jumped from the side of the airship, causing a group of people on the terminal platform to scream in surprise. Soldak waved to Hathaway and Beatrice under the tower, reluctantly left the airport terminal, then turned and walked back to the cabin of the magic airship. Not long after, the floating device on the magic airship slowly opened. The crew gathered up the ropes tied to the dock. The airship shuddered for a while, and then all the ropes slowly tightened. The magic airship slowly rose into the sky and soon entered the channel in the wind layer. The sails bulged and the magic airship traveled at full speed in the air. After seven days of smooth flight, it finally arrived at the city of Alanza. This time around, although everything went very smoothly on the journey, it was also the end of September when we arrived at Alanza City. The city of Alanza is preparing for the large-scale celebrations of the Harvest Festival and the coming of age ceremony. Darcy Christie's wedding has ended long ago. It seems that she has not received the invitation yet. Standing on the airport tower, looking at the sea the highest castle in Lanza City, Serdak could not help but feel a little uncomfortable. Chapter 553 Return to the Village Every autumn is also the busiest time in Alinta City. The acorns in the mountains and forests are almost ripe. At this time, buyers from all over the world will gather in the city of Alinta. They have only one purpose here, and that is to see the gold and silver acorns all over the mountains and plains. These acorns are a fuel favored by nobles. In winter, just throw these acorns into the fireplace. And when the acorns burn, the whole room will have a light woody fragrance. When Suldak walked down the airport terminal, the large open area of the airport terminal was filled with boxes of acorns. These acorns were ready to be transported to other places by magic airships. There were also many baggage carriers on the terminal. Got up. Taking the reins handed over by the airship crew, Soldak led Gubalama out of the airport town, feeling the warm afternoon sunshine. This time when Serdak returned to Helanza City, he felt that the biggest change was that the White Elephant Trading House and the Underground Trading Market had closed down. The huge White Elephant Trading House seemed to have suddenly disappeared overnight. Only an empty ring-shaped building remained. Serdak thought of the Daler magician who had always taken great care of him. After asking around, he could not find out any news about him. Even the investigation file of the guard camp only vaguely stated that he had worked with him. There are some connections with the old rebel army. His brother is a high-ranking member of the rebel army. 
It is said that he died many years ago when Duke Jingyu was suppressing the rebellion. The next day, Serdak sold his fake certificate to Captain Sauron and rode back to Wall Village. When we reached the Pagla's Pass, the wooden crosses were still erected on the top of the mountain. However, a large wooden frame was erected on the pass. It looked like some kind of building was going to be built. Some carriages were unloading volcanic ash. When Serdak arrived at the mountain pass, he discovered that there were two wooden frames in total. The cement buildings inside the two wooden frames had begun to take shape. They were clearly two arrow towers located on both sides of the mountain pass. A group of bricklayers from the village squatted on the wooden frame. These two arrow towers were piled up continuously. A group of knights from the guard camp were sitting in the pergola nearby. Passing villagers, caravans, and adventure groups all went to the pergola for routine inspections. The villagers of Wall Village standing on the top of the wooden frame saw Serdak coming on horseback from a distance. Stood up, waved to Serdak repeatedly, and shouted, Toldak is back. I don't know when, but Serdak's status in Wall Village has surpassed that of Bright Village Chief. When he came to the mountain pass, the craftsmen of Wall Village greeted him one after another, followed by the guards on duty at Paglo's Pass. Battalion Knights These guard battalion knights are from the support squadron, and they usually have a close relationship with Serdak. Serdak rode his horse and sat next to the pergola. While responding to the knight who greeted him, he asked, Why are two arrow towers built here? Not only that, an arch will be built here in the future. This gate can be regarded as completely separating the outside of Paglo's Pass from the suburbs of Valencia City. This can be regarded as adding an extra barrier to the outside of Valencia City. The captain of the second squadron of the rescue squadron came out and explained to Soldek. Do we need to set up arrow tower guards who are on duty here all year round? Soldek frowned. The guard camp and city defense department in Halansa City are already bloated enough. And now they need to be in Halansa City. The addition of manpower to the city defense department will only add additional burdens to the residents of Halanza City. The captain of the second team cried bitterly. There is no way! Who made the rebels so rampant recently? Someone must be watching them! And building this arrow tower will not send many more manpower. The current situation is considered complete contain the three teams of our support squadron here, and the inspection station on the arrow tower side will be cancelled. After staying at Pegros Pass for a short time, Soldak rode back to the village of Wall. The dead tree at the entrance of Wall Village still bears the name of Wall Village. But there are many small merchants and hawkers gathered in the open space outside the village entrance. It seems that a small market has been formed here. A month ago, this market just took shape. Unexpectedly, the scale is now available. A group of adventure group members were haggling around a stall, and their voices spread far away. Serdak led the horse and walked around the small market at the entrance of the village. In addition to food, groceries, and magic scrolls. Craftsmen who maintained leather goods and repaired ironware also appeared in this small market. Unfortunately, due to the scarcity of magic herbs, magic potions were still available. The supply exceeds the demand, and it will never appear in such a small market. Some adventure groups will camp and set up tents outside the village, and some adventure groups will rent the row houses on the outermost edge of the village. The rent of the row houses here is not expensive, and they are also sheltered from wind and rain. The old village chief placed them in the unused row houses. The wooden bed and wooden table are very convenient to use, just like a B&B in the village. The camp of the cobalt slaves was moved to a row of houses near the mouth of the river, which was relatively remote, lest anyone see themselves living in the same row of houses as the cobalt slaves, and they would not be able to accept it in their hearts. After entering the village, the townhouses in the village were gradually completed. Only three townhouses were left that needed to be capped with gables. The other townhouses had basically been delivered to the villagers of Wall Village. The remaining bricklayers have begun to repave the roads in the village. All roads connecting various places are paved with volcanic ash cement. And there are drainage ditches on both sides of the roads. Looking into the valley from the entrance of the village, these small townhouses look like a neat row of stairs, lined up on the hillside. There are still five large pots set up in the village square. Multi-grain porridge and vegetable stew are being cooked in the large iron pots on another iron plate. Two village women are constantly making scones. They are preparing dinner at the entrance of the village after it turned into a small market. The children in the village could only play in the village square. Old Sheila and a group of elderly people sat under the trees to enjoy the cool air. Little Peter mingled with a group of children, sweating profusely from running in the sun. Zygna squatted at the door of the children's courtyard. Looking at the children, 
who kept running hard with some indie. She was the first to spot Serdek, who was returning from riding a horse. She stood on a stone at the door and waved to him vigorously. Then, there were the children playing in the village square. Little Peter was among them. When he saw Soldak, he ran towards him. Soldak jumped off the horse, picked up little Peter, who rushed towards him, and lifted him high, making little Peter giggle nonstop. Soldak held little Peter in one hand and led the horse with the other hand to come to old Sheila to say H, low to old Sheila. Old Sheila just pursed her lips and nodded, and said to little Peter, Come down quickly, and let your father rest for a while. He is tired from the journey. Chapter 554 Dreams in the Heart Dinner was a simple set meal of scones, broth and a bowl of stewed vegetables. For the villagers of Wall Village, broth is not a delicacy they can drink every day. Rita said that Serdak was lucky. He came back at the right time, and actually drank the broth that only came once a week. With the improvement of living standards in Wall Village, small wine cellars have piled oak barrels in the small market at the entrance of the village. They even placed several wooden piers next to the wine barrels, and placed a bunch of oak barrels on some wooden tables. Order the free small dried salted fish, and dried salted radish. The only characteristic of these snacks is that they are very salty. Probably only drinkers will twist one and stuff it into their mouths to wake up their taste buds. Nowadays, the villagers have some spare money in their pockets. And occasionally they go to the entrance of the village in twos and threes to have a drink. A cup of rough ale with wheat residue only costs two copper coins. A year ago, this was very important to the villagers of Wall Village. It is also an unaffordable amount of money for them. But now that the townhouses throughout Wall Village have been built, the villagers' pockets have become bulging. Occasionally, I will hear the old people in the village sigh. That guy Dake is really a kind man. He builds houses for the villagers and pays everyone wages. He is building his own house in the first place. How much wages do he need? The old man on the side couldn't even open his eyes and could only say in a low voice. You have to call him Baron Soldak. He is now the Baron. The old man who spoke first said, I heard that the nobles are all big landowners. Where do you think the land of this guy Dak is? Why don't you enclose the land in Wall Village? I heard from the boy at home that Dak's territory is in Pudu Mountain. It's a huge mountain. Even if you ride a horse for a day, you won't be able to cover all the boundary markers. The old man who spoke first said doubtfully, What's the use of having a mountain of pustules that doesn't grow hair on it? The old man who could hardly open his eyes said again, Did you know that volcanic ash can build houses? Look at the volcanic ash all over the mountains and plains. Every particle of it comes from the pussy mountains. These are all volcanic ash. Damn. Just like those oak trees in the mountains belong to other noble lords. Whoever uses these volcanic ash in the future will have to pay taxes to Duck. Duck was worried that we couldn't afford to live in such a comfortable house. So he paid for it for all of us out of his own pocket. These small townhouses were built. I heard that Dak will form an engineering team in the future and take everyone to build these volcanic ash houses. No matter how heavy the snow is this winter. You don't have to be afraid. Serdak sat on a large rock flattened out of the fourth level reservoir. From here, he could just see the night view of the entire wall village. 400 kobolds are currently working on this land to perform preliminary leveling of the bottom of the pool. Next, they will lay an anti-seepage cement layer at the bottom of the pool and dig a foundation pit for the fourth level reservoir dam. After the construction of the main dam of the third level reservoir is completed, the foundation part of the fourth level reservoir will be poured immediately. Judging from the current construction speed, it is very likely that the fifth level reservoir will also be laid before it snows. Stand up. The old village chief. Bright. Limped over with a pipe in his hand. Ever since he was injured in the last rebel attack on the village. The old village chief's legs had become a little bit sick and he was a little uneasy when walking. Come back so soon? He walked over to Serdak and sat down. Well, everything went well. Serdak replied. The old village chief held the pipe in his hand and took a long drag. The wrinkles on his forehead were deep, and his face looked as if it had been carved by a knife or an axe. It had become darkened by the wind and sun. He grinned and said to Soldak, I have been wondering if the wall village in front of me has appeared in a dream. Those dirty houses look so beautiful, with clean floors, bright windows, and can I recently remember that I had seen the sunbathing loft in the temple murals. I thought I would only be able to live in such a residence when I went to the kingdom of God in the future. I didn't expect that my dream would come true so quickly. Duck, you said we have it. There is more abundant water. So there is more land that can be cultivated. And now we have shelter that can protect us from the wind and rain. 
People have to pursue something in the future. Serdak wiped his face vigorously with both hands and followed the old village chief's topic and said, After a prosperous life, it is necessary to have a more stable living environment. For example, we need to transform this place and make the mountains and green trees become in. I need this place to be safer. I won't be invaded by so many bandits and rebels. And I won't encounter monsters attacking the village in the dense forests of Pagos Mountain. I also want to be recognized and respected by the people around me. Right. Is that a bit far? Is that why you have done so much for us? At this moment, the old village chief's eyes became bright and lively. Actually, this is a blueprint in a person's heart. I remember that at that time he kept telling me his inner longing. Yes, he wanted to have a mountain spring that would never dry up and would not compete with others during the dry season in spring. We will fight for water and we will not be unable to allocate new land because new lives are born to each family. There will not be a swamp at the entrance of the village in summer. And we will not be homeless in storms and snowstorms. Everyone will everyone wants to live a prosperous life with plenty of food and clothing. But it's a pity that he can't see what's happening in front of him. And I just want to fulfill his wish. When Saldak said this, his voice became very soft and his mood also changed. Some went down. The dreams of the past are now almost coming true. But those who fell on the battlefield will never come back. Is there anyone else who has the same idea as you? Village Chief Bright asked in surprise. Saldak grinned and nodded vigorously. What I did was what he hoped for. But the process was a little smoother. On the way back to Halanza, I had a little extra income. After I came back, I discovered sulfur mines on the side of Pudu Mountain. Saldak said. Oh, by the way, how is the project going at Charlie's side? Saldak asked. A month ago, Charlie took more than 50 craftsmen to Carl Casement's manor to build a large villa for him. It was almost a month since he left. Soldak wanted to know where the progress of the project was. The initial progress was much slower than expected. But now everything has been smoothed out. The main body of the first floor has been poured. We are just waiting for the four slabs to be laid after it is solid. And then continue to erect the second floor. Old village chief Bright said. Serdak nodded and said. After the small townhouse is built, we will send other craftsmen there and add some trucks carrying volcanic ash. It must be completed before winter. This is the first business we have received. We can definitely make it more beautiful. The old village chief nodded. Not far away from the gate of the third level reservoir, a waterfall fell into the canal below, making a rumbling sound. Looking upward, the entire reservoir looks like a huge castle, blocking the entire valley horizontally and looking majestic. Chapter 555 Enemy Traces Reappear The old village chief Bright left the reservoir construction site limping with his broken leg, leaving only his rickety back in the night. When Mayor Bright disappeared completely in the darkness, Andrew and Kai walked over from the police station. Perhaps it was because the power of the Rage Flame magic pattern allowed him to break through the last level. Recently, Andrew's strength reached the second level. Rapid growth. The first time was during the period when the Berserker Soul awakened. During that period, his strength soared until he broke through and then gradually stopped. And now with the help of the power of the Raging Flame magic pattern, Andrew feels that he can break through the shackles of the intermediate level in one breath and become a late-level warrior in the first level. The instructor in the military camp once said that if you want to be promoted to a second-level powerhouse, you must understand your own chi in your body. Warriors need to understand anger. Martial artists need to understand fighting energy. And swordsmen need to inspire sword energy. And knights need to awaken their aura. Rank 2 experts in the army are rare. Andrew has never understood what anger is. Is it just anger that is inspired from the bottom of his heart? Andrew, who has reached mid-level strength, seems to have had an epiphany recently. The so-called anger can also be said to be fighting intention. After reaching a certain level, his strength, agility, and physique can be comprehensively improved. He possesses the soul of the berserker. It is said that once he understands anger, he can form a furious posture. It is said that warriors of this level are tireless on the battlefield and cannot feel pain. Even the wolf cavalry in the orc tribe is not a berserker. Opponent, has your strength been promoted again recently? Andrew scratched his head and smiled honestly. He was wearing heavy armor, and it was a little inconvenient to sit down. So he simply sat on the ground with one leg stretched out and the other slightly bent. He supported it with one hand behind his back and looked up at the night sky. After entering September, this deserted land bien will enter the drier rainy season again. The stars were shining brightly in the night sky and not a single cloud could be found. 
Andrew said to Soldek. Yesterday, a veteran from the militia camp came to deliver a letter, saying that traces of the rebels had been found in the western wasteland on the edge of the desert. They were hiding in the Death Mountain. If they hadn't come out to rob the refugees of the western wasteland this time. Oh, Fields. Maybe they haven't been found hiding in that area. He didn't think this was such a serious matter and wanted to investigate it himself tomorrow. Serdak was a little surprised. Death Ridge in the western wasteland was once an ancient battlefield. After so many years, some ghosts would appear there from time to time. It is said that there were priests and priests from the temple who wanted to purify that place. Area. But later it was settled. In recent years, due to the intense turmoil caused by ghosts, the last village living there has also moved away. He is the sheriff of the desolate land. And this information was also found in the files of the Hellanza City Hall two months ago. Soldak asked Andrew. In Death Ridge in the Western Wasteland, weird things always happen there. Countless ghosts always appear in Death Ridge every Halloween. How can there be people there? Andrew explained to Soldak. It was not discovered by the villagers. But the information passed by a group of homeless people. There is a relatively fertile land outside Death Mountain. These refugees want to take advantage of the summer to stay there. Plant some oats in the wasteland. And when the oats are harvested in the fall, we will move to the city of Halanza to spend the winter. A group of wanderers? Sernak did not expect that there would be a group of wanderers running into the wilderness to open up wasteland. Yeah. Andre replied. Soldak pondered for a moment. And then ordered Andrew. Go and send a message to Carl tomorrow morning and ask him to mobilize some knights from the guard camp. I will go to the western wasteland to check first. After the knights from the guard camp come, let them temporarily wait for news from me here in Wall Village. Yes. Andrew, an indigenous warrior, took the order. Although Andrew was born in the Nanai tribe, their tribe has lived in Wazimra City for several generations and has already subtly become an imperial person. So he has a strong execution ability. As long as it is Serdak's order, it will be completed to the letter. Captain, let me go. My investigative ability is better than yours. Samira walked out of the darkness, and she didn't know how long she had been eavesdropping in the dark. Serdak thought for a while, shook his head and said, I'd better go. With Aphrodite here, it will be easier for us to contact you. In fact, he didn't say a word, which was, it's safer this way. Seeing that Serdak had made up his mind, Samira stopped insisting and only asked. When to set off? Serdak sat up from the big stone, patted the dust on his body, and said, Without further ado, let's leave tonight. Rita had just added fodder to the trough of the stable, and the ancient bolai horse had not even had a few bites when she saw Soldak hurry back from outside. First, he went to the living room to take a look at old Sheila, then went to the stable to put a saddle on Gubwa's horse, and then led the horse to the door. Natasha put on Soldak's riding boots and prepared his horse, knowing that he was preparing to go out. Natasha ran out of the kitchen and asked, Why are you leaving right after you come back? Serdak explained. Traces of the rebels have been discovered in the western wasteland. I am going to investigate. I am worried that they will not be found if they hide themselves if it is too late. This group of rebels hiding in the deserted land is our largest group. There are hidden dangers. Now that an arrow tower sentry has been built at Paglos Pass, it will be much more difficult for them to escape to Oak Ridge than before. They must be dealt with. When Natasha heard what Soldak said, her pretty face blushed slightly. She lowered her head and whispered, Then be careful. Although she was a little reluctant to give up, Natasha and Rita still helped Soldak put on the heavy set of Earth Shield armor. The armor added to his body, making him suddenly much taller, riding horseback through the village of Wall. The local dogs in the village were huddled in their kennels and did not dare to come out. The market at the entrance of the village was empty, and some simple sheds had not been demolished, which made the small market at the entrance of the village look a bit too messy. Taking advantage of the darkness, passing through the cultivated vegetable fields on the river bend tidal flat, a dark vegetable field looked lush and green from a distance. After Serdak left the village, he walked all night. Only at the moment before dawn, Serdak took out his sleeping bag, spread it behind a huge rock, and slept for a while. At daybreak, we got on our horses and continued walking. The further west you go, the more desolate you feel. Originally, there was some greenery in the valley at the Pagros Pass. But when you go deep into the desolate land, it is almost a wasteland covered with gravel. Some desolate mountains are simply one piece. Where horses have to be extremely careful when stepping on these gravels. 
for fear that a certain piece of weathered stone will instantly shatter and easily break the horse's legs. There are no mountains that are too high along the way. At most, there are only some huge and exposed rocks on the surface, one of which is as big as a small hill. Basically, you can't see the river, not even the dry river bed. Occasionally, you can see gray rock iguanas crawling out of the cracks in the rocks to bask in the sun. As long as there is the slightest sound, these timid gray iguanas will succumb. Rock iguanas will quickly burrow into rock crevices. There are almost no leaves growing on some rocky ground. This kind of grass is covered with thorns and has few leaves. It is very stinging when you get close. There seems to be a unique toxin on its sharp thorns. Once you are stung, you will feel. The pain was extremely unbearable. The midday sun was almost scorching the ground. When Serdak saw the tired Gubwa Lima, he decided to find a place to take a good rest. Perhaps he had to wait until the sun turned to the west, and the sun was not so fierce before he could continue. Forward, Serdak took off the saddle and began to shave the Gubalai horse's sweat. Then he took out some grains and fodder from the magic backpack and let it stand in the shade of the big stone. After simply eating some toasted wheat cakes and dried meat, Soldak leaned against the boulder and squinted his eyes and fell asleep. After getting up, he climbed up a boulder and observed the surrounding terrain. It never dies of thirst, and its thick lips don't seem to be afraid of spikes. There are no villages at all in this area, and it is sparsely populated. It is considered the most desolate area in the wasteland. The veterans of the militia camp can know the situation in the western wasteland. Soldak believes that the villagers in that village have some connections with the refugees there. But he does not want to get involved in these matters. Maybe he married a refugee woman. If these rebels were not so hungry that they would come out to snatch the oats from the refugees, no one would have thought that the rebels were actually hiding in Death Ridge. This place is far away from the desert on the edge of the barren land. Summer has just passed, but there is no trace of greenery here. There are already hunters hunting limestone iguanas in the wilderness. Soldak remembered that at this time last year, Wall Village also began to organize manpower to hunt limestone iguanas. But this year, Wall Village has been undergoing a major renovation. And there are places where people are employed everywhere. The villagers don't have time to go out into the wilderness to hunt limestone iguanas. After walking for two days in a row, Serdak finally saw a large gray mountain range in front of him at dusk. And finally saw some greenery here. There are some withered and yellow weeds everywhere. In the dusk, a large oak field appeared at the foot of the mountain. There are several dilapidated thatched houses over there. Materials are scarce here. Only two houses have roofs made of wheat straw. A plume of green smoke rises from outside one house. A group of refugees gather there. It looks like it's dinner time. A quarter of this wheat field was damaged. And Serdak rode towards the group of refugees. The refugees looked at Serdak with numb faces. Apart from children, there were only some women and old people. They were wearing tattered linen clothes and straw skirts. It seemed that their situation was even worse than that of the indigenous residents on the plain. These refugees there were only about fifteen or six people. And they gathered around the clay pot. They were silent when Serdak walked in. Although there was fear in their eyes, they showed no signs of running away. Serdak jumped off his horse and strode over. He took a look at the oatmeal in the earthen pot. There was even some unremoved wheat bran floating on the rolled oatmeal. Are you all refugees? Serdak asked, standing in front of the group. The so-called refugees are people who do not have imperial status. These people are not protected by imperial laws. They had nothing but a little more ridiculous freedom than the slaves. In the Grim Empire, there is no real freedom. Those nobles with financial freedom are still bound by family responsibilities. Even members of the royal family cannot do whatever they want. Yes, my lord. Among this group of people, an old man who seemed to be relatively strong said timidly to Soldak. I heard that you found rebels here? Serdak asked. No one answered. Everyone was silent. The children and women looked a little shivering. The children were all skinny, as if they were made up of small bamboo poles, with a big head on top. The women also have yellow faces and thin bodies because they are always hungry and don't have enough to eat. They don't look very good either. Their hard life makes them look much older than they actually are. Moreover, they don't have a graceful body at all. Under the scorching sun, their skin is a bit dull. Dark. Where are the men? Serdak asked the old man. The old man lowered his head and replied in vague words. They ran away a long time ago. We don't have the strength to run. And we can't escape. We can only guard this piece of oats. Serdak looked at the oat field, which had only destroyed a corner, and didn't ask any more questions. 
He also did not continue to stay in the refugee gathering place. Get on your horse and continue towards Death Ridge. The mountain road is very difficult to walk on Death Ridge at night. But for Serdek, it was not that difficult to walk here. And he didn't go too far before he found a secret crevice between rocks. Where the man and the war horse were hidden. In order to have a wider field of vision. Serdak gritted his teeth. Took out the last three salamander heads from his magic waste bag. Arranged a sacrificial ceremony. And obtained insight for himself. The night in front of me immediately seemed as if a layer of black gauze had been lifted off by an invisible hand. Although it looked like there was a heavy haze in front of me. All the scenery for several kilometers around fell into my eyes. He waited quietly in the crevices of the rocks for a while. And then he saw a refugee woman in ragged clothes sneaking along the mountain road toward Death Ridge. Her steps were vague, but her running direction was very clear. Sure enough, as he thought, some of these refugees had completely devoted themselves to the rebels. This also explained that after the refugee men ran away, the rebels did not destroy the oat fields. They were actually waiting. The days when the oats are finally ripe. Serdak calmed the horse and followed closely behind the woman. The road at night was difficult. And the woman walked for a long time before she finally crossed a valley. Serdak could see the guards patrolling on the rock cliff from a distance. If women hadn't led the way, it would have taken a lot of trouble to find this group of rebels who had hidden themselves so deeply. Serdak climbed to the top of a high mountain and found a group of war horses kept in the valley here. The rebels' temporary station looked like a cave. The life of this group of rebels is really difficult. There is almost nothing here. Serdak did not approach the group of rebels. They were very vigilant. Serdak was worried that if he was discovered, he might be in danger. Chapter 556 Courage The rebel guards took the woman into the cave. Immediately afterwards, a rebel team searched along the way the woman came. They were wearing black clothes and almost blended into the night. It was difficult to see them if you didn't look carefully. They did not find Serdak standing on the top of the mountain. After searching all the way to the oat fields at the foot of the mountain, no trackers were found. So the rebel reconnaissance team returned the same way. The woman leaned against the stone wall of the cave, wrapped in a worn-out military blanket. She drank a glass of cold water to calm down her mood a little. And then she told the news about seeing a fully armed knight in the evening. She even told Sir the weapons and equipment carried by Dak are described in detail. Coming to Bena province to cooperate with the Dark Moon Gate mission. Captain Cavendish is the supreme commander of the rebel army. He is sitting opposite the refugee woman. He has a thin body, slender cheeks, and a pair of big, slender and powerful hands. He asked carefully about the structure and characteristics of Serdek's armor. The refugee woman also observed it very carefully and described almost all the details. However, the more detailed it was, the heavier Cavendish felt in his heart. Because the person who came turned out to be a construct knight among the rebels he leads. There are at least 20 people who are qualified to become construct knights. But he is the only one who owns a complete set of old magic pattern constructs. The expensive magic pattern structure is almost an untouchable high-level armor for these rebels. Captain Cavendish knows that a set of magic pattern constructs can greatly improve the first turn knight. This also means that if they are singled out, I am afraid that none of these subordinates can defeat the construct that Alensa City came to investigate. Knight. He frowned and asked again the direction the construct knight was taking into the mountain. The refugee woman only said that it was too dark in the evening and the knight could not be seen as soon as he entered the mountain. The twelve team captains who received the news gathered around Cavendish one after another. Squadron captain, have any knights from Alensa City entered the mountain? A captain named Buddy asked Cavendish. He was Cavendish's old subordinate who was in Sloyd City. He was under Cavendish at that time and later joined the rebel army with Cavendish. If the coup was successful, Cavendish might now be the director of the Sloyd City Intelligence Agency or the commander of the City Defense Army. However, the coup failed and Baron K died on the banks of the Galloping Horse River. Now he was just a rebel leader hiding around. There was a great hope of breaking through the second rank and becoming a strong player. But now everything is lost because of the wrong decision. Cavendish nodded, always with a hint of worry in his eyes. Captain, what should we do? But he held his chest high. He was always in a high-spirited state. After so many years, following him through all the obstacles, Captain Cavendish glanced at him and said, Pack it up. He may not be able to find us so quickly. Some refugees must have run out to deliver news to the guard camp in Helensis City. We can no longer wait for the oats to mature. We must harvest those oats overnight. After harvesting these oats, go toward the desert. Yes. 
Buddy and other team captains took the order at the same time. Then Captain Cavendish ordered the scout team leader, who was responsible for the reconnaissance mission, and said seriously, Take someone to conduct a reconnaissance to see how many troops are around. If only a small group comes, then we will kill them. Eat it before leaving. Otherwise, there will always be people following us. Which is not a good thing. Yes. Captain! The leader of the scout team quickly walked out of the cave. The scout team has a total of 20 members. Which is the largest among the rebel squads. It is almost equivalent to half a squadron. Moreover, the members of the scout team are all good at lurking and hiding. However, they found a whole group of people in Death Ridge. At night, the Construct Knight was not found. Instead, three ghosts were discovered in the wild, taking advantage of the fact that these three ghosts had just condensed. The scout team hurriedly gathered people to kill these three ghosts. As the void door opened in the room, the breath of countless space cracks continued to spread outward from the magic circle. The room was Samira's bedroom on the second floor of the police station. Samira and Andrew were waiting in the room. Aphrodite had set up the summoning circle in the room and was sitting aside. Thick curtains were blocked tightly. And white bread, jam, and roast lamb were placed on the table by the window. The barbecue was already cold. This was food that Samira had prepared in advance. In fact, she prepared one last night. But Serdak did not come back. Serdak walked out of the space-time rift. After passing through the space-time rift of the summoning circle so many times, he had long been accustomed to the adverse reaction of traveling through different dimensions. When he saw Andrew and Samira were there, he asked, As Carl arrived at Wall Village with the knights from the guard camp? Andrew stood up and replied, Yes, Captain. Captain Carl has mobilized the knights of the relief squadron as the vanguard to rush to Wall Village. Captain Solon will lead the team to Wall Village tomorrow morning. Soldak walked to the window, lifted the curtains and looked outside. It was dark outside. Captain, have the rebels been found? Andrew asked curiously. Standing behind Soldak, Serdak turned his head, spread a map on the table, and said, I found it. Sure enough, Death Ridge is hidden in the western wasteland. If they move, I will mark it along the way. After saying that, he reached out and picked up a piece of white bread and stuffed it into his mouth, eating it while saying, This group of rebels is already on alert. It is estimated that they may move at any time. You must move quickly. Here is the map. It will save the most time to follow the route I marked. Sure enough, there was a clear thin line marked on this simple parchment diagram. Captain, how many people are there in this rebel army? Andrew asked again. Serdak thought for a while and realized that he really didn't know how many people there were in this group of rebels. If he wanted to find out the exact number of people, he would have to sneak into the cave. He didn't want to alert the enemy for the time being. So he said, They are hiding in the cave. The specific number of people is currently unavailable. Andrew asked again. Is there a magician from the Dark Moon Gate? Serdak said. There was no sign of the magician last night. If there is, I will notify you in time. After filling his stomach with the food prepared by Samira, Serdak prepared to return to Death Ridge. Before leaving, Andrew asked Soldak, Aren't you going to meet Captain Carl? Serdak waved his hand and said casually, Forget it, Aphrodite. Guard Wall Village well. And call me if there is any situation. Half a foot stepped into the void rift. Serdak stopped and asked, Is Gulitam back? Andrew said, Not yet. There are a lot of salamanders running out this time. Serdak nodded and just said, Okay, if there is nothing to do, I will go back and monitor those guys. When Gulitam comes back, remember to tell the guy to keep all the salamander heads. Got it. Captain. The indigenous warrior Andrew watched Serdak disappear into the void again. Aphrodite yawned and turned to leave Samir's room. Carl and the knights from the support squadron did not live on the side of the security team. The house of the security team could not house the 60 guard battalion knights anyway. So these guard battalion knights stayed temporarily in the row houses at the entrance of the village. Andrew waited patiently until dawn, then ran to the door of Carl's room and handed the parchment map to Carl. Is your captain back? Carl asked casually. No, I just asked someone to send the news. The indigenous warrior has red skin. And you can't tell it when he blushes. Carl led the support squadron into the desolate land first and headed towards the western desolate land along the route marked by Soldak. Andrew accompanied him. And Samira stayed in Wall Village to wait for Captain Sauron's first team. Unexpectedly, the rebels had such a strong sense of danger. And the reconnaissance team had been searching for his whereabouts in Death Ridge. 
all the rebels were dispatched after dawn. They rushed to the oat fields at the foot of the mountain, wielding their sickles, and snatched back all the half-ripe wheat ears in the oat fields. The group of refugees hid in the broken house. The old people, children and women watched with despair as the rebels harvested the unripe oats. No one dared to stand up and stop them. It had already been agreed that the oats would be harvested when they were ripe. They will also be given some food rations, enough to sustain them until they can walk back to Holanza City. But now it seems that these crazy rebels have no intention of following the previous agreement. They can only hope that when these rebels are cutting wheat, more ears of wheat will fall in the fields. After they leave, they can pick up the scattered ears of wheat that fell in the wheat fields so that everyone can pass through this desolate land, the western wasteland. The old people sat in thatched huts, watching the oats fall one after another, and slowly closed their eyes. The next evening, dark red clouds filled the sky. The wheat fields have all been harvested by the rebels, but the ears of wheat are a little green, and they are still not completely dry after being exposed to the sun for a whole day. The ears of wheat are stuck on the falling slate, and it is difficult for the oats to escape from the ears of wheat, which makes Ka Squadron leader Vindish's evacuation plan was delayed for another day. Unable to wait for the oats to dry completely, the rebels had to cut the oats from the stalks and put them hastily into linen bags. More than 150 horses were standing in the dilapidated village waiting at the foot of the mountain. These war horses chewed the green oats silently, each one with a bulging belly. The grooms responsible for managing the horses began to tell the rebel soldiers everywhere not to feed the horses too much. Otherwise, once they drink the water, the oats will swell in the stomach and easily burst the stomach of the war horse. Moreover, a full war horse will not be able to feed the horse at all. Can't run. Some rebel knights don't think this is a big problem. They are about to leave Death Hill. There is a desolate land outside. If the war horses want to have a full meal, they probably have to at least enter the Pagros Mountains to get one more bite. You will be less hungry. The rebel scout team continued to investigate the surrounding situation, but could not find the construct knight that day. The refugee woman who reported the message was found by Cavendish again. After repeated questions, he finally confirmed that the refugee woman was not there. It's a lie. It's just that the refugee woman was almost driven crazy by the endless questions. Her eyes were a little distracted, and she just kept leaning against the corner and giggling. Finally, I put the last handful of wheat ears into my pocket. Cavendish waved his hand, and the rebel army prepared to leave Death Ridge. The rising sun reveals a thin line on the eastern slope, and the foothills of the Death Ridge are exposed to the sun. The leading troops of the rebel army have walked out of the ruined village and the subsequent rebel armies are also mounting their horses one after another. The refugees are staring at these rebels, waiting for them all to evacuate, then rush into the oat fields to pick up the remaining wheat ears. Standing on the mountain ridge, Serdek had already seen the flag of the rescue squadron in the distance. But the rebels here were also evacuating from the dilapidated village. According to the speed of the rebels, they could just catch up before the rescue squadron arrived. All evacuated from the foothills of Death Ridge. This was the scene that Serdak didn't want to see the most. On top of the mountain, he took out a magic flare from his arms, pulled out the fuse, and launched the magic flare into the air. A red firework exploded in the air, and the sound of the explosion was like a copper hammer, hitting everyone's heart. Whether it was Captain Cavendish or Captain Carl Casement of the Rebel Army, they were all shocked when they saw the red magic flare exploding in the air. Carl, who was riding on his war horse, looked at the gray mountains nearby. Without hesitation, Carl shouted to all the knights of the guard battalion in the support squadron, Raise your gun and move forward! He was not even prepared to send out scouts to investigate the situation ahead, just because Serdak was on the mountain ridge ahead. At the same moment, Captain Cavendish pulled out the sword from his waist and shouted to all the rebels, Everyone! Mount your horses! Let's retreat! At this time, the scouts on the mountain who were investigating the enemy's situation also sent a warning that they had discovered the knights in the guard camp. There were chaotic sounds of horse hooves in the distance, and the rebel cavalry mounted their horses one after another and chased the cavalry at the front. Serdak was riding an ancient bull eye horse on the hillside, watching a group of rebels passing by in the wind below the hillside. He pulled out the blood-red crescent and held the Moses' blessing shield in his other hand, heading towards the front. The rebels rushed towards him. Finally a group of guard battalion knights appeared on the horizon. They rushed up from the side and charged towards the rebels. At the front was the indigenous warrior Andrew. Seeing that the knights of the guard battalion were already charging, Captain Cavendish closed his eyes and knew that the best opportunity to evacuate had been missed. He quickly waved to Buddy, 
who was already eager to try. But he quickly took some of his men, picked up the ninth spear from the saddle, lined up a formation to face the knights of the guard battalion of the supporting squadron, and launched a countercharge. Serdek rushed to the front of the rebel team alone and blocked the rebels' way. Chapter 557 Fierce Battle at Death Ridge Serdak was wearing a complete earth shield magic pattern suit, and the full covered armor completely wrapped his body. He rushed down from the top of the slope on an ancient bolai horse and stopped in front of the rebel cavalry alone. The runes on the magic pattern structure on his body lit up little by little. Serdak could feel the mana spreading throughout the entire set of magic pattern structure. His body seemed to be injected with a powerful force. Serdak felt that his body was filled with energy. Like a bridge, the power of the magic pattern structure is introduced into the body of the horse under the hip. This ancient bolai horse also has stronger physical strength. It was breathing heavily through its nose. And one of its hooves kept digging at the gravel beneath its feet. The muscles all over its body seemed to be restless and burning. When one man and one horse rushed down the hillside, they were so powerful that the rebels had to stop. The cavalry in front set up their arrow formation before charging towards Soldak. The rebel cavalry said nothing and the five knight spears were arranged very neatly, plowing towards Serdak like a comb. Neither side hesitated at all. When Serdak appeared on the top of the slope, the rebel cavalry noticed him, but they didn't expect that the construct knight would dare to charge down one person at a time. You must know that the cavalry must form a formation. Only when you run on a relatively open battlefield can you exert your greatest power. Even though the construct knight is terrifying, how much of a splash can one person cause? The rebel cavalry were a group of veterans who had experienced hundreds of battles. Naturally, they were not afraid of Serdak's charge. What they were worried about was being bitten by the knights of the guard camp behind them. A steady stream of reinforcements joined from behind. Only then did they worry. This is what Captain Cavendish is most worried about. Go and kill the construct knight in front. Don't let him block our way. Captain Cavendish ordered his two men. Yes. The construct knight in front of him rushed down from the hillside and five rebel cavalry rushed up with knight spears. The five knight spears stabbed the fully armored construct knight almost at the same time. The rebel cavalry believed that the construct knight on the opposite side was bound to slow down, and he would use the shield in his hand to block the spear attacks one by one, because even one construct knight could not block the thrusts of five spears at the same time. Instead of slowing down, Serdak slapped the horse's buttocks with the hilt of the blood-red crescent sword, asking Gubwa to run faster. Just when the ninth spear was about to stab Serdek, suddenly something happened under the horse's feet, lighting up the halo of power. The two-faced and four-armed demonic figure behind him also appeared at the same time. The blood-red crescent moon in his hand was filled with all the power, and he slashed at the five spears. Sweep. The blood-red crescent instantly cut off the heads of the five ninth spears. At the same time, Soldak waved the Moses' blessing shield in his hand and hit the decapitated ninth spear in the middle. The cavalryman felt an unparalleled force rushing towards him along with the knight's spear. He was holding the spear with one arm and could not grasp the handle of the gun at this moment. The knight's spear suddenly hit him backwards and hit him directly on the right side. On his ribs, the rebel cavalry felt his body fly into the air. His chest felt like a flame burning, and a mouthful of blood spurted out from his throat. The warhorse underneath him was also affected. He stood on his feet and let out a long neighing sound. The other four knight spears with broken heads hit Serdak at the same time. But the two-faced four-armed demon shadow behind Serdak moved at this moment. And the four-armed shadow became solid. They stood up, grabbed a spear respectively, and blocked the fatal blow for Serdak. Then, the two-faced, four-armed demonic figure instantly disappeared behind him. The four rebels were slightly stunned. They did not expect that Serdak was not affected at all by the joint attack of the five people. Serdak rode the ancient bolai horse, and rushed towards him. A dazzling holy light burst out from the bloody sword blade. The sword blade simultaneously cut the breastplates of the two rebel knights on the right, and the shield in his hand blocked the left one at the same time, with the long sword slashed by the two knights. A layer of silver light shield burst out from Serdak's shield, blocking all the full blows of the two knights. Just as the horses were crossing each other, Serdak's horse shook its head violently and hit the opposite knight's horse with its strong body. The opposite horse's body suddenly made a clear bone cracking sound. And the entire body of the horse was hit. Two meters away. He fell down on the battlefield with a roar. And the rebel cavalry on horseback was also pressed tightly under the horse. Another knight took advantage of the two horses to cross and stab Soldak in the heart again with a sword in his hand. But Serdak used the blood-red crescent to block it. The two long swords collided together. 
making a sharp sound. The rebel cavalry only felt that the opponent's strength made his arms numb. Before he could lift the knight's light shield, Serdak's blood-red crescent struck the gap of his sword blade again, and the long sword blade responded. Fracture. The expression on the knight's face was frozen in shock, and a thin blood mark appeared on his forehead, and a long and narrow wound appeared on his body. He fell off the horse silently, without even making a sound. Serdak completed this move in one go, and killed five rebel cavalry in an instant with his own strength. The cavalry who rushed up from behind looked at the construct knight in front of them in horror. Since they had already rushed in front of Soldak, they could only bite the bullet and deliver a full blow. Serdak was instantly surrounded by the rebel cavalry. With the strength advantage brought by the halo of power and blessed body, he cut left and right in the crowd. For a while, no rebel cavalry could block him completely. Just when Serdak blocked the path of the rebels, the knights from the support squadron of the guard camp in the distance had also rushed to the battlefield and collided with the rebel cavalry. The guard battalion cavalry lacked combat experience, but they were well equipped and physically stronger than the rebel cavalry. The two sides collided and fought hand to hand, causing injuries to each other. Carl's support squadron only has 60 knights, and there is an obvious disadvantage in the number of knights. Fortunately, these rebels are currently fighting on two fronts because Serdak is involved in a group of rebel knights. So the numerical disadvantage is not too great. Obvious. The indigenous warrior Andrew was worried about Serdak's safety. He carried the butcher in his hand and activated the magic pattern breeding equipment rage flame on his body. The phantom that appeared behind him was a pair of fierce eyes, which now looked more like half a pair of eyes. The face, but those bloody eyes seemed to have some kind of magic power. All the rebel cavalry who looked at the shadow behind Andrew would be subject to some kind of intimidation, as if it was some kind of tremor coming from the depths of their souls. Andrew seems to be even more violent than Soldak. He is not aiming at killing people at all. If an enemy rushes towards him and thrusts his knight's spear at him, he will be cut off directly by the butcher in his hand. And the long sword will also be cut off. The butcher in his hand chopped off. And the head of the charging horse would be chopped off by his butcher immediately. The axe in Andrew's hand was almost incomparably sharp, and there was a layer of blazing fire on the axe blade. The flames of fire. Ordinary rebel cavalry could not stop him at all. Soon Andrew rushed to Soldak's side. Serdak only felt a commotion among the rebel cavalry. A rebel cavalryman in front of him. Andrew's full coverage armor was covered with various scars, and there were several wounds on his body. He rushed to Serdak's side nonchalantly and protected his right side. The two people's eyes met, and Andrew smiled. The butcher in his hand slashed unceremoniously on the long sword thrust from the opposite side. Suddenly, the long sword of the opposing cavalry ignited a layer of flame, and the knight quickly let go of his hand, letting the long sword fall to the ground. Andrew took advantage of the situation and dismounted the rebel cavalry. After getting close to Serdak, a halo of power also lit up under Andrew's body, and his strength increased a lot, allowing Andrew to swing the axe in his hand freely. Cavendish saw Andrew killing several cavalrymen along the way and rushed straight to the constructing knights on the opposite side. He knew that they were the most powerful among the knights in the guard camp. If they could not kill the two of them, their own side would even if the way forward is firmly blocked. At that moment, he no longer hesitated. He raised a spear in his hand and a shield in his other hand. Without controlling the horse's reins, he held the horse's belly with his legs. The horse turned toward Serdak as if he had a tacit understanding. Rush away. Seeing Cavendish rushing towards the Construct Knight on the opposite side, several of his trusted captains quickly protected him. Some rebel cavalry also immediately followed their captain, which immediately formed a torrent among the rebels. Cavendish is at the forefront of this torrent. Soldak suddenly felt an aura as huge as a giant peak coming from the opponent's army formation. The rebel cavalry blocking the front left and spread to both sides, making way for Cavendish. Although Serdak was wearing a helmet, he did not have a visor. When he looked at Cavendish, it was as if a fragment in his memory had been touched. Cavendish on the opposite side was also slightly stunned. He was riding on a horse, holding a spear, and shouted, John Bach! Serdak only felt that the name was somewhat familiar, but he forgot who the person was. The other party had already rushed up with a spear, and he held up the shield of blessing of Moses to meet him. There was a loud dang sound. The spear in Cavendish's hand left a deep stab mark on Serdak's shield. The long sword swung by Serdak was also blocked by Cavendish with his shield. Cavendish's hand taking advantage of the situation. He pushed his shield with his shoulder. The shield swung out again and hit Serdak on the shoulder, almost knocking Serdak off his horse. 
Andrew wanted to rush over, but was surrounded by other cavalry. It was also dangerous for a while. Cavendish laughed loudly and taunted Serdak loudly. You are a shield warrior wearing a magic pattern, and you think you are a knight? Chapter 558 Fierce Battle at Death Ridge 2 Cavendish stabbed at him with a spear in one hand. His attack route was a bit weird, which made Serdak a little confused. Therefore, he looked a little embarrassed when he blocked it. If it weren't for the blessing of the Moses Blessing Shield, Shield of Blessing, I'm afraid Serdak has been stabbed by his spear several times. For a moment, Cavendish seemed to control the rhythm of the battle. Seeing that Captain Cavendish had the upper hand, the surrounding rebel cavalry immediately cheered as Serdak's battlefield here fell into crisis. The pressure on the support squadron on the other side of the battlefield suddenly decreased. The Knights of the Guard camp and the rebel cavalry were fighting together, and it was difficult to tell the winner for a while. Several times, Carl organized his men to rush forward to join Soldak, but he was stopped by the leadership of a fierce rebel cavalry captain. During this period, both sides suffered casualties. Serdak staggered away from Cavendish's strange spear thrust out from behind. The spear in the opponent's hand was like a poisonous snake and could be thrust out from various angles, making him somewhat difficult to deal with. Cavendish's hand is very strong. Every time the spear pierces Serdak's shield, the Moses Blessing Shield will explode with silver light. Although the Blessing Shield will reduce some momentum, the remaining strength it penetrated through a certain point of the shield making his arm sore and numb. Serdak rode on horseback and backed away frequently. Cavendish held a tower shield in his other hand. The blood red crescent in Soldak's hand could not find any opening to attack, and all attack routes were blocked by this shield. This suppression of fighting skills made Serdak feel extremely uncomfortable. Cavendish had a faint sneer on his face, and the magic pattern construct on his body continued to overflow with mana. He was also a construct knight, so Serdak did not have an absolute advantage in strength facing Cavendish's attack. Soldak was killed and retreated frequently. Occasionally, he had to deal with cold shots coming from the side, and his black iron armor had been punctured several times. Cavendish found the right moment for Soldak to retreat, and stabbed Soldak's left face with the spear in his hand. Soldak tried to retreat again, but the surrounding rebel cavalry raised their spears and approached at the same time. Erdak has no way to retreat. Cavendish was not reluctant to fight. He rode his horse, and chased Soldak in front of him. He used his spear to hold Soldak's shield of blessing of Moses, and said coldly to him, You asked me if a warrior should focus on offense or defense. I said offense, but you chose defense. Now, I will tell you how fragile your defense is under an absolutely sharp offense. Serdak looked at Cavendish, and couldn't remember who the man in front of him was. The strange runes carved on his spear lit up one by one. Before he could finish speaking, an incandescent stream of light appeared on the tip of the spear followed by arcs of electricity like silver lines on the spear. All the runes on this magical weapon were destroyed. When activated, crackling arcs of electricity erupted from the entire tip of the spear. Behind Cavendish appears the phantom of a war king holding a spear and shield, which is particularly eye-catching on the battlefield. The shadow of the Lord of War dispersed into golden fragments and merged into Cavendish's body. In an instant, Cavendish's body became gleaming with gold. The spear in Cavendish's hand was filled with electric arcs. And at this time, he was also injected with power by the shadow of the Lord of War. The entire spear instantly became like a bunch of incandescent thunder and lightning. Arcs of electricity spread out along Cavendish's body. He seemed to be a little unable to control this power. The arcs of electricity surrounded the trembling Cavendish. Dish wanders around. Cavendish thrust the spear towards Serdek. This time the spear made a harsh blast of air. When the tip of the spear came into contact with the silver light shield, the shield of blessing instantly shattered, and the spear pierced shield of blessing of Moses, pointed directly at Soldak's heart. At this time, a layer of khaki rock shield was like countless fragments condensed on Serdak's chest. Earth shield. Countless gravels formed a thick layer of armor on Serdak's body, and countless electric arcs were introduced underground along with the rock shield. The spear pierced the rock shield, but Serdak took advantage of the situation and flipped his arm. The shield of Moses' blessing bit Cavendish's spear and Serdak took advantage of the situation and snatched it away. Serdak waved the blood-red crescent in his hand and chopped at Cavendish's head. Cavendish raised his tower shield and blocked Soldak's sword. He stared at the earth shield magic pattern structure on Serdak's body, and his eyes became very hot. Soldak took advantage of the situation and waved the shield of blessing of Moses in his hand and hit Cavendish's raised shield hard. The silver light emitted by the shield of blessing of Moses made Cavendish subconsciously close his eyes. I, 
The moment he closed his eyes, Cavendish also realized that something was wrong. He twisted his body and tried to knock Suldak away with his shield. But Suldak took advantage of the situation and punched Cavendish in the face. A huge force smashed Cavendish's helmet into a dent. And there was a huge buzzing sound in his head. He fell off the horse uncontrollably and fell heavily on the rocky ground. You talk too much. Serdak rode on horseback, pulled out the spear from the shield of blessing of Moses, and wanted to pierce Cavendish's chest with a spear. Several night spears came from all around. Serdak could only try his best to block it with the spear in his hand. And the earth shield surrounding his body was instantly shattered. The two cronies carried Cavendish and retreated behind the military formation. He was knocked unconscious by a punch from Soldak. And his head was a little dizzy. Serdak used the spear in his hand to overturn a cavalryman. Gubalai Ma took him and rushed out of the breach. Joining the bloody native Andrew. A group of rebel cavalry surrounded Serdak again and suffered several wounds on his body. There were sounds of horns in the distance. The eyes of the people on the battlefield here were drawn to the stone slope opposite. A brigade of knights appeared on the top of the slope. Serdak saw that the leader was Sauron, the captain of the Helensa Guard Battalion. He was wearing a set of black armor and holding a giant sword in his hand, attacking his own knights. At the command, a group of guard camp knights rushed down from the top of the slope like a tide, and the whole land resounded with rumbling roars. The rebel cavalry on the battlefield saw hundreds of knights on the hillside, and the last bit of fighting will disappear at this moment. A large number of cavalry wanted to cross Suldak and flee southeast along the foot of Death Ridge. Andrew, covered in blood, joined Suldak. At this moment, the full coverage armor on this indigenous warrior was almost completely broken, and his whole body was covered in plasma. He didn't know how much blood he had lost. Serdak held the shield of Moses' blessing to block the frequent attacks of the rebel cavalry. Seeing Andrew's shaky appearance, he quickly cast a holy light spell to stabilize his injuries. Captain Sauron's first brigade split into several torrents on the hillside, like a claw reaching out to the fleeing rebels. Samira rode her horse and rushed to Suldak and Andrew immediately. Seeing how fierce the battle was, she snorted with disdain. However, she still rode over and worked with Suldak to help Andrew treat his wounds. The powerful knights of the guard camp rushed the rebel cavalry to pieces. The entire rebel army was divided into several battlefields by the knights of the guard camp. Some small groups of rebels tried to get into Death Ridge again. The rebel squadron leader Cavendish did not expect that the knights from the Hellanza city guard camp would arrive so quickly. After he regained consciousness, he remounted his horse and led his followers to break out of the siege. How could Captain Sauron let him easily? Escaped. Two squadrons immediately surrounded Cavendish. From the moment, the first brigade of the guard battalion appeared. The rebels were doomed to defeat. The battle lasted until the afternoon. Almost half of the rebel cavalry were killed. Some of the remaining rebels broke through the encirclement and fled into Death Ridge again. Some of the wounded soldiers were captured by the knights of the guard camp and imprisoned in the abandoned village at the foot of the mountain. Inside a stone wall, the group of refugees, consisting of old men, women and children, were just outside the stone house, watching the rebel cavalry silently, without saying a word. They just silently took away the green oats in front of them. Soldak began to treat the wounded soldiers early. The first person to treat this time was the indigenous warrior Andrew. Later, some wounded soldiers from the rescue squadron were carried to him one after another. This time, two knights from the guard battalion were killed in the rescue squadron. Seven of the knights were seriously wounded, and nearly every knight suffered some minor injury. Serdak used an abandoned hut with a thatched roof as a temporary treatment center. All the seriously injured knights were blessed with the blessing effect of the blessed body, and then treated with holy light. The injuries of the seven knights were basically stabilized. Captain Sauron took several squadron leaders, including Carl, to inspect the rebel prisoner camp. Although the guard camp paid a high price for this operation, the gains were also very great. The Helanza guard camp is like this every year. There are only a handful of large-scale operations on this scale. So each operation means that you will receive rich achievements. The 3rd Squadron and the 5th Squadron entered Death Ridge to pursue the remaining rebels. They have not returned yet. The remaining squadrons have already counted their numbers. This battle can be regarded as a complete victory. Captain Sauron was in a good mood and reached out to pat Carl's shoulder. There was a scratch on Carl's shoulder and he couldn't help crying in pain. Carl! Your support squadron did a good job this time! Captain Sauron said to Carl. Carl smiled and said, This is our responsibility! Captain Sauron walked out of the prison camp and said to Carl, 
the Hellenza City Council has always wanted to strengthen the strength of the security forces outside the city. The council wants to add long-term sentries stationed in the suburbs. Some people have proposed that the desolate land of Paglos Pass be the public security station has been upgraded to a public security squadron. I want to hear your opinion. Chapter 559 Secret The full black iron armor worn by the indigenous warrior Andrew had turned into a pile of scrap metal in this battle. He himself was wrapped in bandages due to his severe injuries and was lying on a stretcher like a mummy. But it seemed that he's in pretty good condition. This is not the first time he has suffered such a serious injury. As early as in the defense battle of Wazimra City in the Maka Plain. When Andrew was rescued by Serdek. He was lying on a stretcher like this. At that time. It also cost Sir. It took Duck nearly 20 rolls of hemostatic bandages to bandage all the wounds on his body. Andrew's injury this time was much more serious than that one. But since he has become a mid-turn warrior. His body is much stronger than before. But even so. Such a serious injury would not have been possible without Serta. Without timely treatment, it is very likely that he would bleed out and fall on this battlefield. Serdak's assistant in treating, the wounded was replaced by the half-elf archer Samira. The half-elf archer couldn't help but mock the indigenous warrior. He is just a reckless man. Andrew lay on the stretcher with a pale face and smiled weakly at Samira. In this battle, the support squadron suffered the heaviest casualties. The wooden coffins of the two knights from the guard camp who died in the battle have been temporarily built and parked outside the stone house. The two knights were lying inside wearing the armor in front of them. Captain Sauron was preparing to transport them back to the city of Alinsa. To their loved ones. The other seven seriously injured knights were also lying on stretchers. Soldek had stabilized their injuries in time. And now they were just waiting to return as soon as possible. Samira sat aside and wrapped bandages on the wounded man silently. Serdak's body was covered with bandages in many places so his movements were a little stiff when he cast the holy light technique. Because he was injured, much of the wound treatment work was left to Samira. This half-elf archer was very agile. And because she was a woman, the injured knights in the guard camp refused to cry out no matter how painful it was, in order not to lose face in front of her. The temporary treatment room seemed a little quiet, with no groans or moans of pain. For a moment, this kind of quietness made Serdak a little uncomfortable. Serdak was concentrating on treating the injured knights of the guard camp. Suddenly there was a burst of cheers outside the treatment room. Serdak only paused for a moment, then lowered his head and continued to concentrate on treating the wounded. It didn't take long. The next wounded guard battalion knight brought new news from the outside. The guard battalion knights of the 5th squadron captured Cavendish, the supreme commander of the rebel army. Serdak was slightly stunned. After all, the Cavendish commander was so powerful on the battlefield holding a spear. If it weren't for the earth shield magic construct that inspired the rock shield. That Cavendish almost killing him. This was almost the most powerful knight he had ever encountered on the battlefield. During the battle, Cavendish also said a lot of words that made him feel a little baffled. He seemed to regard himself as an old friend. Serdak immediately put these aside and continued to focus on treating the injured knight in front of him. This time, the remnants of the rebel army lurking in the deserted land were eradicated in one fell swoop, which also indirectly eliminated the potential threat to Wall Village. Serdak only hoped that the knights of the guard camp would capture the escaped rebels as much as possible. Not long after, a knight from the guard camp came in from outside and said to Soldak, Baron Soldak, that Cavendish has always wanted to see you again. Okay, I understand. I'll wait until I finish treating the wounds of the last few knights. Serdak stood beside the camp bed and agreed without raising his head. The guard camp knight turned around and left the temporary treatment room without saying anything more. After dealing with the wound of the last night, Serdak walked out of the temporary treatment room. The highly concentrated treatment work made him a little tired. He washed his hands in the pool next to him and pinched two fingers between his eyebrows. Down. There was a burst of tea aroma wafting from the side. And he turned around to see Carl standing next to him holding two cups of hot tea. Soldak casually took a cup of tea and took a sip. The bitter taste suddenly made him sober. Carl pointed to the stone pier beside him. And the two sat down on the stone pier outside the temporary treatment room. The night sky is filled with stars. At the foot of Death Ridge. To the north is a stretch of black mountains. Which is called Death Ridge. It is said that the undead tribe once built a gate of bones here. The undead army continuously entered the hinterland of the Green Empire through the gate of bones. At the beginning. Bradbury the Duke destroyed the Bone Gate by himself. But the death energy overflowing from the core of the Bone Gate completely turned the mountain into a dead place without any life. 
after Soldek drank the cup of hot tea. He felt a warm current flowing through his body, and the fatigue all over his body was slowly disappearing. Sorry, I didn't expect there would be casualties. If I had known, I wouldn't have been so reckless, Soldek said to Carl. Carl put one hand on his shoulder and said comfortingly, This is not your responsibility. Since they have joined the guard camp, they will be mentally prepared for this. Captain Sauron just came to me and said he was looking for Paglo's Pass. We have set up an out-of-city security squadron in a deserted area, and we plan to make you the squadron leader. Me? Serdek asked in surprise. Carl nodded and said with great certainty. Yes, since you have been canonized as a third-class baron of the Empire by His Majesty Charles. You are fully qualified to serve as the squadron leader of the Helensa Guard Battalion. Moreover, your achievements in recent times have been outstanding. The Hellanza City Council has a very good impression of you. And this expansion was also proposed by the Hellanza City Council. Of course, I am very honored to accept this appointment. Soldak did not shirk and firmly expressed his willingness to accept. Seeing that Soldak readily agreed, Carl also whispered happily, Hey, Dak, you are probably the squadron leader who has been promoted the fastest in the Helensa Guard Battalion in recent years. Although the official appointment has not been signed yet, but I must congratulate you in advance. Serdek walked to a fence, and the guard camp knight guarding the door nodded to him and helped him open the temporary wooden door. Cavendish was tied to a wooden cross with chains. His hands and feet were covered with chains. The magic pattern structure on his body was also stripped off. His upper body was naked, and his lower body was only wearing a pair of linen shorts. His whole body was covered with bloody scars. Many the wound is scabbed over. The most eye-catching wound was the triangular incision that penetrated the left abdomen. And blood was still oozing out. With his head hanging down and his body hanging in the air, he looked like a gangster being tortured on a cross outside the mountain pass. In fact, the knights of the guard camp had the same plan. They wanted to nail all the rebel prisoners to wooden crosses outside the Pagros Pass. Seeing Soldak walking in from the outside, Cavendish reluctantly raised his head, opened his somewhat bloodshot eyes, and murmured in a low voice, Jambak! Jambak! Soldak took two steps closer, stood in front of Cavendish and asked him, Are you calling me? Don't you remember me? I'm Cavendish Alden. We graduated from the same Warrior Academy. I happened to be one year above you at the time. We had a bit of a quarrel at Galloping War Academy. You at that time. I chose to join an adventure group called the Storm Chasers. And I served in the Military Intelligence Department of Sloyd City. Cavendish stared into Soldak's eyes. Serdak was not moved at all. Based on Cavendish's words, he quickly checked the memory fragments in his mind. But for a while, he didn't have the slightest clue. The guard battalion knight standing outside the door looked over and yelled at Cavendish. Hey! Boy! This is our Captain Serdak! He is from Halanza! You have mistaken the person. Or you did it on purpose, you want to get close to our captain and want him to marry our Captain Sauron. But your reason is too far-fetched. For rebels like you, not even the Hellanza City Council has the right to pardon you. I don't know the Jambok you're talking about, Soldak said to Cavendish calmly. Cavendish didn't believe it at all. He was even a little excited. But his body was in chains. And he would be in pain if he struggled for a moment. He shouted in a hoarse voice. You are not John Nock. You just look like him? How can there be two people so similar in the world? How can I prove that I am not the person you are looking for? Soldak asked Cavendish. Cavendish closed his eyes and thought about it seriously, and said firmly, I remember that you have a very conspicuous birthmark on your back. When you were training, you jokingly said to me, I'm afraid it will be difficult for me to grow up in the future. Draw a magic pattern construct on the back. I can let you look at my back so that you can see clearly. Serdak paused and continued, But in exchange, you also have to tell me a secret. I want to know what your rebels are doing when they come to desolate what exactly is the land for. Cavendish said without hesitation. I can tell you now. I believe this matter has been an open secret in Bena province for a long time. Yes, we are here to find the Red Dragon treasure. We have currently lost all external financial support. Just maintaining our daily expenses requires a huge fortune. When the Dark Moon Gate came to the door with this news, it also made a promise to us. Once the treasure is found, they are willing to spend huge sums of money to build a temporary portal to send us to the La Perla Plain. It's your turn now. Jaw knock. Do you dare to let me see your back? Cavendish stared at Soldak. And the knights in the guard camp outside the fence also looked here curiously. The light in the fence was a little weak. 
and Sernak took off his armor without hesitation, exposing his upper body, and turned around, facing Cavendish with his back. Ah! Why are there so many scars on your body? Cavendish whispered hoarsely. Serdak put on his constructed armor again, turned around and said to Cavendish, Now I am sure you have the wrong person. In addition, you should call me Baron Serdak. Chapter 560 The Magician Who Repairs Magic Patterns As we enter the end of September, the sky becomes less cloudy. The climate of the deserted land changes greatly in temperature difference between day and night. It becomes very cold at night, and gusts of wind blow bitingly cold. By noon, the vicious sun can scorch the rocky ground, and your breathing will be hot. Standing under the sun, it is easy to get sunburned. The knights in the guard camp could not bear the sudden cold and hot weather, and some knights suffered from typhoid fever. Captain Sauron was worried that typhoid fever would spread among the army and affect the injured knights. So he immediately decided that the 1st Battalion would give up hunting down the remnants of the rebels who had fled into Death Ridge and returned to the city of Holanza. Soldek first returned to Wall Village with the Knights of the Guard Camp. The Knights of the Guard Camp delivered some supplies of horse fodder. Soldek left the seriously injured Andrew in the village while he followed the guards. The 1st Battalion returned to the city of Holanza. This time he came to Aranza City to repair the damaged magic pattern structure. Both the Blood Red Crescent Moon and the shield of Moses' blessing were damaged to varying degrees. Although the Moses' blessing was an imitation, it was still worth repairing if it was damaged. However, Ms. Gwendolyn of the guard camp told Soldak that currently the guard camp can only bear the repair cost of the shield of blessing of Moses. The guard camp of the blood red crescent and earth shield magic pattern structures cannot repair it, but Andrew's standard armor can be replaced with a brand new one. Soldak was the first person to discover the hiding place of the rebels. This siege operation earned him a lot of merit. And these merits can be exchanged for some precious and rare materials at the munitions office of the city hall. And of course some magic crystals. This kind of thing. But unless they are extremely depressed. Few people will do this. Because after these meritorious deeds reach a certain value. They can be promoted to the title of nobility. It is said that the merit points required to be promoted from a third class baron. To a second class baron are only 500 merit points. Soldak felt that if he participated in another operation of this scale, he would probably be able to collect the merit points required to be promoted to a second-class baron. The Cavendish squadron leader never looked for Soldak again. Cavendish, the squadron leader of the rebel army, is a small leader in the rebel army. Because of this, he will be escorted to the northern province of Sloit to be tried by the military court of Sloit province. According to Cavendish, the Dark Moon Gate magicians confirmed through various channels that the so-called Red Dragon Treasure is real. The specific location of the Red Dragon Treasure was recorded on a map. But after Duke Bradbury's death, the map was divided equally between his two sons. The eldest son inherited all the glory of the Bradbury family in the Green Empire. And the other half-human, half-demon son Eustace Bradbury returned to the sea with the other half of the treasure map. In the hundreds of years that followed, Lord Eustace never appeared in the Green Empire. The remaining broken treasure map was kept in Bradbury Manor. But Bradbury's descendants could not find the treasure based on this half of the treasure map. The rebels attacked Bradbury Manor and took away the treasure that could be opened. The crystal key to the treasure gate. I heard that half of the broken map was stolen by a dozen rebels. In addition to information about the Red Dragon treasure, Cavendish also handed over the details of Benna City's attack on Bradbury Manor. What was once puzzling was how the rebels sneaked into Bradbury Manor quietly, looted Bradbury Manor and then retreated calmly before the knights from the guard camp arrived. The gates of Benna City are heavily guarded, and the old aristocratic area is also one of the main places where the guard camp conducts routine inspections every day. The rebels were able to attack Bradbury Manor under the eyes of the knights of the guard camp. This incident made Benna, the city guard camp, lost all face. Now, the answer has finally been solved by Cavendish. Most of the members of the Dark Moon Gate are a group of space magicians who have deserted the Astrologers' Union. Mrs. Calais, who participated in planning the coup in Sloit province, is a well-known space magician. What he is good at is building magic teleportation arrays, and occasionally, he can draw some magic scrolls, such as directional teleportation scrolls and the like. The rebels who attacked Bradbury Manor this time sneaked into Benna City through a temporary portal established by a directional teleportation scroll. Serdak came to the magic district of Alensa City. When he passed by the Junior Knight Academy, he looked inside the academy. There was only one trainee knight practicing a formation in the square in front of the academy's teaching building. Arriving at the Magic Guild in Holanza City, he went upstairs and directly found Lance, 
who was doing magic experiments. Soldak asked him to introduce an inscriptionist who was good at repairing magic pattern structures. Lance readily put down what he was doing and led him. He followed Serdak to the door of a laboratory on the third floor of the magic tower. This magician is the most famous inscriptionist in Halanza City. But he is usually very busy. Whether he is willing to help you depends on a little bit of luck. So far, your luck has been good. Lance stationed at the door. He knocked gently and whispered to Soldak. A delicate-looking female magic apprentice opened the door and took a look outside. When she saw the handsome Lance standing at the door, a sweet smile immediately appeared in her eyes, and she asked kindly towards Lance. Magic Lance, what can I help you with? I want to meet Magician Francis. Lance said to the female magician apprentice. Many people know that Lance is the student of Gerald, the head of the Magic Guild's law enforcement team. He has a handsome appearance, so he is very popular in the Magic Guild. The female magic apprentice smiled slightly and said to Lance, Wait a moment. Then the female magic apprentice turned around and returned to the room. Not long after, she heard from the laboratory, Invite him in. The figure of the female magic apprentice appeared at the door of the room and opened the heavy wooden door for the two of them. Lance took Soldak into the magic laboratory. The wooden shelves on one wall of the entire magic laboratory were filled with armors made of exquisite magic leather. On the wooden shelves on the other side, there was a bottle of magic leather, bottles of magic dyes of different colors, a middle-aged magician wearing a brown magic robe, standing in front of a test bench, using a magic engraving pen to carve complex magic patterns on a metal plate. Lance and Soldak were taken to a rest area by the female magic apprentice. The female magic apprentice brought two cups of tea and motioned to the two to wait. After waiting for a long time, the middle-aged magician finally stopped writing and took a long breath as if he had finished drawing the magic pattern. When he came over, Sardak found that the middle-aged magician looked familiar. He had not dealt with many magicians in Alensa City. He thought about it carefully before he remembered the magician in front of him. He once bought salamander meat in the underground market, and later Sardak made a special trip to deliver salamander meat to the magician Francis. Magician Francis glanced at Sardak and asked him doubtfully, Have I seen you somewhere? You may not remember but I sold salamander meat in the underground market. Zerdak replied quickly, Oh, it turns out it's you. I thought you looked familiar. So it's you. Magician Francis smiled and sat across from the two of them. Lance directly expressed his intention. Sir Francis, we are here to find you to ask you to repair a magic pattern structure. Is it your magic pattern construct? Magician Francis turned to Soldak and asked. Zerdak nodded. Francis said to Soldak, You might as well take it out and show it to me. I am only good at repairing a few kinds of magic pattern structures. And the damage must not be too serious. Of course, if it is the common general type. And as a separate matter, magic pattern structures with special magic patterns generally need to be repaired by the creator himself. Sardak took out the earth shield magic pattern structures from his magic belt bag and placed them one by one on the wooden table. Seeing the breastplate of the earth shield suit, Magician Francis frowned and muttered, You actually have this top level magic pattern structure. Let me take a look. He lowered his head and first looked at the breastplate of the magic pattern structure with a serious face. Then he flipped through the trousers and shoulder pads. After checking for a long time, he raised his head and said to Soldak, This magic pattern structure the damage is quite serious. But fortunately the magic pattern in the core part was not seriously damaged. Otherwise it would be quite troublesome to repair it. So, you can repair this magic pattern structure. Lance approached Magician Francis and asked in a low voice. Magician Francis showed a trace of unconcealable pride on his face. He puffed up his chest and said to Magician Lance, Of course, there will never be more than three inscription masters in the entire city of Alinsa who are qualified to repair this top-level magic pattern structure. I can barely count it as one of them. You may not feel how complicated this set of Earth Shield magic patterns is, but it is definitely the most difficult to repair among the first-turn magic patterns. Fortunately, its main magic matrix, there was nothing wrong with it. And even then, it would have taken me three days to fix it. Lance nodded repeatedly and said to Magician Francis, So you agreed? Can we pick it up in three days? Okay. Francis agreed. Magic Francis, how many magic crystals do you think you need in terms of remuneration? Lance asked. Let's do this. I will repair this magic pattern structure first. Different types of magic dyes will be used during the repair process. Finally, Linda will make the final calculation. In addition, next time there is salamander meat. 
Remember to remember to give it to me first. Magician Francis thought carefully for a moment before saying. The female magic apprentice waiting aside smiled slightly at Lance. Her eyes were like two crescents. Serdak and Lance then said goodbye to Magician Francis. Lance returned to the magic laboratory to continue his unfinished experiments. Serdak then turned around and came to Scholar Ferdinand's room. Outside, he knocked on the wooden door engraved with complex magic patterns. Chapter 561 Obstruction Scholar Ferdinand sat on a chair and talked endlessly to Soldak about his recent experience. He was recently studying the topic of how to combine Warcraft leather with the human body. Scholar Ferdinand wanted to use several simple methods. The medium allows magicians with the same attribute affinity to graft the same type of magic leather. To this end, he even transplanted a fire scorpion back armor piece on his arm. Unfortunately, this experiment ended in failure. Although he was fully prepared in all aspects, the fire scorpion demon skin still rejected Scholar Ferdinand's body so much that he still had a large skinless wound on his arm. Although hydrotherapy was used, such a large wound could be completely healed quickly. Even though two days had passed, Serdak still felt a little shocked when he saw the wound. Fortunately, the wound was not infected because it was handled properly. Scholar Ferdinand said to Soldak that perhaps it was because the treatment was not strong enough that the fire scorpion demon skin had some kind of repulsion towards his body. They obviously have a high fire affinity. But it is a pity that it is when combined. The two fire attributes couldn't completely merge. And several of the mediums didn't seem right. The teapot on the iron stand made a shishi sound. Only then did the magic apprentice on the side react. He quickly put away the magic scroll of fire gathering below. And then poured the hot tea into the teacup. Suddenly, the fragrance of lemon wafted out. Out. He was so entranced just now that he didn't notice the teapot boiling. Scholar Ferdinand said to Serdek, We talked about the magic pattern of life last time. At present, it is still a very long process to transfer the magic skin with the magic pattern of life to the human body. Recently, the Imperial Capital has from the news coming from the side. I heard that someone found the magic pattern of life on the leather of the head of the title Murloc. And it is very likely that every Murloc has such a magic pattern of life. But the collection process is very difficult. The magic pattern is a hidden life magic pattern that is very complex and difficult to find the rules. Therefore, how to peel off this life magic pattern completely is the biggest problem for skinners at present. The price of fishman leather in the Imperial City has increased 20 times compared to a month ago. I think these guys have gone crazy. Scholar Ferdinand's expression was a little exaggerated, and he couldn't understand it at all. He was obviously just an academic. Why did the price of fishman leather in the research stage increase so much in just one month? It is said that hundreds of adventure groups have poured into Ignaz in the Palestine province. And they all plan to go to the Vashki Plain through the portal to hunt fishmen. I really don't understand how the Vashki Plain can how many Murloc tribes are there for this group of adventurers to hunt. Having said this, Scholar Ferdinand looked a little regretful and wished he could cross the portal immediately and go to the Imperial Capital. It's a pity that I was not in the Imperial Capital at the time. It is said that the magician gave a public demonstration of the hidden life magic pattern on this fishman leather. Speaking of which, the atmosphere of academic magic research in the imperial capital is relatively strong. You can see it everywhere to an outstanding mage engaged in magic research. Scholar Ferdinand said, By the way, you are a skinner. Have you ever noticed the way skin is peeled? How to ensure the integrity of a piece of leather? Scholar Ferdinand asked Soldek. Soldak took the cup of hot tea handed over by the magic apprentice and nodded to him in thanks. Then he replied to Scholar Ferdinand. Well, when I was in the Warsaw Plain, I peeled off many black striped demon skins. Generally, I could peel them off completely. However, during the peeling process, I damaged this black striped demon skin. There are many hidden veins in the magic skin. To be honest, this is not easy to grasp. I was in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment at the time. I was the only person in our team who was good at skinning when collecting trophies on the battlefield. My main task was to peel off the black striped devil skins from the evil spirits. Surrender to the military. The black striped demon skin can be exchanged for more military merit than the evil devil's head. It is said that these black striped demon skins will be researched by magicians. Serdak said, They want to develop some magic scrolls specifically for evil spirits. Speaking of which, these guys in the temple can restrain evil spirits. It's a pity that this group of priests and combat priests actually just broke out in the plane war. They all evacuated the Green Empire. And in the end the remaining priests were hiding in the temple and refused to come out. 
Scholar Ferdinand complained. By the way, I recently successfully transplanted the fire scorpion scorpion tail into the H. L. Dog. This was considered a cross-element attempt. But the H. L. Dog died before it could last long. After Scholar Ferdinand finished speaking, he pointed to a salamander that had been cut into pieces and soaked in a glass vessel. Now only half of the body is left in the jar. Soaked in a green solution. It looks like very disgusting. Serdak somewhat admired his magic apprentice. Without a strong heart, he really couldn't withstand the various daily experiments of Ferdinand Scholar. Scholar Ferdinand knew that Serdak had mastered the holy light technique, so he wanted to invite him to conduct a transplant experiment together. And Serdak readily agreed. However, since the experimental materials are not currently ready, the experiment can only be postponed indefinitely. In the restaurant on the first floor of the Garden Plaza Hotel, Soldak and Carl sat opposite each other. On the dining table was a plate of white bread smeared with butter and jam. On the plate was a thick sweet corn milk soup. The milk was slightly boiled. It's thick. And a little too much maple sugar is added, making it taste sweet and greasy. Mrs. Cohen boldly wore a skirt that exposed a large area of her snow white back. She had already walked past the two of them three times carrying a dinner plate. Carl did not make fun of her sexy skirt, which made the proprietress commises and wonders if her charm has declined recently. Carl's face looked a little uncomfortable, and his speech became a little hesitant. Zerdak simply put down the white bread in his hand and stared up at him. Dak, Carl said, There have been some changes in your promotion to squadron leader. In today's parliament, your appointment letter to the Padlos Pass security squadron was not fully approved, so this matter will be announced in half a month. It was put to another vote in a general assembly with all MPs who were really bored sometimes. Is this why you are? Soldek rubbed his forehead and asked Carl. Carl blinked, not understanding what Serdak wanted to express. Soldek picked up the unfinished white bread again and said to Carl with an indifferent expression, If it's just because of this, well, it doesn't matter. I don't care about getting this extra half month salary. Don't you even care? Carl who asked suspiciously, looking at Soldek's calm face. Serdak stuffed a spoonful of sweet milk corn into his mouth and asked in a straight voice, Isn't the current responsibility of the public security office responsible for the security of the entire deserted land? Or after the establishment of the security squadron? I can have more power or some convenience. After speaking, he wiped his mouth with a napkin. This thing was really inedible. Carl shook his head. Serdak continued to serve as the sheriff of the desolate land. And this would not change. Soldak took a big sip of water and then said, Then why should I care? Is it just for the salary of dozens of silver coins per week? Or has my status in Helensa improved significantly after I became the squadron leader? What you said seems to make sense. But I think you may need to know who voted against you in Parliament. Carr said. Soldek raised his head and looked at Carl. Carl squeezed out a very forced smile and said to him, It's Earl Bulwer. He is the deputy speaker of the Helensa Parliament. He has a certain influence in the Parliament. I don't know why he suddenly voted against it this time. All the members of the same camp as him voted against you. Including my father. The surname Bulwer. Soldak. Sounded familiar. And he immediately thought of Darcy Christie's fiancé. Oh. She should now be her husband. Baron Armand Bulwer. Serdak smiled. In his opinion, this was not a big deal. He had no intention of becoming the squadron leader of the deserted land security squadron of the guard camp. Without expectations. There is no disappointment. So he asked Carl, Is this why you've been feeling a little sick all night? Sorry. Duck. Carl said apologetically. Soldak smiled indifferently and said, This is not your fault. Why do you have to apologize? And I think I can understand Earl Caseman. The situation at that time did not allow him to have another choice. Hey, Dak, if you want to be successfully promoted to the title of knighthood, the position of squadron leader is still a bit important to you. Look at me. For the position of squadron leader. I worked in the guard camp support squadron for more than two years. Carl said solemnly, Serdek said. Soldek almost pinched his nose. Stuffed the sticky milk corn on the plate into his mouth. Washed it into his stomach with water. And then said to Carl. I didn't say it wasn't important. But I don't have you. I think it's so important. Now I just want to build all the houses in Wall Village before winter comes. By the way. I almost forgot to ask you. How is the villa in your manor? Carl only said, If everything goes well, it will be completed by the end of next month. However, I need to arrange it well. If I want to move in, I will have to wait until at least tomorrow summer. The boss, 
Mrs. Yen Cohen, who was standing not far behind the two of them, saw that Serdak had eaten all the milk corn she cooked in one go. She thought that someone finally thought that the milk corn cooked by her was delicious. It seemed that Serdak had eaten the milk corn. Dak was still a good judge of things. Thinking of this, she puffed out her plump breasts and with lightning speed, scooped another large spoonful of sticky milk corn on Soldak's plate. Serdak saw a large pile of extra food on his plate and stared straight at the plate, unable to say a word. Chapter 562 Small Gathering After the collapse of White Elephant Trading Company, the residents of Alanza City suddenly found that the prices of magic items that were very close to the people in the past had rebounded. Although the magnitude was not large, the practices of these magic shops were a bit disgusting. Another purpose of Serdak's coming to Halanza City this time is to find a business firm that can purchase sulfur mines in the long term and continue cooperation. Before, he sent all the sulfur ore to the White Elephant Trading Company, and the cooperation has always been very pleasant. But now, he has to find another trading house to maintain the sulfur or business. Due to the full-scale war in the Green Empire, all kinds of resources and minerals are in short supply. Several plains where magic herbs are cultivated are all caught in the flames of war. The price of magic herbs on the market has reached unprecedented heights. The multiple dimensions of Angela have been attacked by the Nakma people. The price of mithril or has continued to rise recently. Other magic materials have also increased to a certain extent. The price of sulfur or has recently increased from the original three silver coin slash pound to five. Silver coin slash pound. Serdak decided to go to the munitions office of the city hall to see the official purchase price first. The receptionist at the munitions office was very polite. Unfortunately, the official public purchase price of sulfur or was only three silver coins per pound. Although this was higher than half a year ago. However, this was two silvers less than the purchase price on the market. So Serdak did not intend to send the sulfur or to the military supplies department. Helensa is not a big mountain town. Several other trading houses are open on both sides of the central street. Soldak rode a horse and rushed to the central street. There were many vendors selling gold and silver acorns on the street. This season is also the sea season, when the residents of Lanza City are living a comfortable life. The streets are very lively. Magic caravans are constantly flowing on the streets. Some colorful lights are hung on the street trees on both sides. It is obviously prepared for the Harvest Festival in two weeks. There is a business called Shancheng Trading at the crossroads. People are coming and going at the door. Looking into the hall along the door, there are many customers inside. The shop sells various linens, cottons, wools, and leathers. Probably before the coming-of-age ceremony, many families need to prepare a decent dress for their children who are about to grow up. When Soldak came to the door of the store, the clerk greeted him warmly and asked Soldak respectfully, Lord Baron, what can I do for you? Sardak jumped off the horse, handed the reins to the clerk, looked inside, and asked him, Are you the store manager? The clerk shook his head quickly, and Soldak said, Take me to your manager. Baron, what do you need? A well-dressed middle-aged manager came out and stood at the door and said to Soldak. He didn't wear a badge on his chest, so he was probably not a noble. Soldak nodded slightly and asked him, Does your trading company purchase sulfur mines? We mainly deal in various cloths and wools, and also dabble in high-grade leather. We also purchase acorns this season, but we do not deal in magic or products. The manager of the trading company explained to Soldak with a smile on his face. Serdak nodded, pulled a horse, and left the Mountain City Trading House. There were several other trading houses on this street, and Serdak planned to visit them all. He visited two more trading houses one after another, but neither of these two trading houses did business in magic or the trading firm in front of him, called Tricolor Iris, was already the fourth trading firm Soldak had found. Soldak stood in front of the door and hesitated for a moment before walking into this trading firm, which seemed to be quite popular. This time the store manager heard that Serdak wanted to sell sulfur or and immediately showed great interest. The store manager invited Soldak into a reception room and invited an appraiser to carefully identify several pieces of sulfur or brought by Serdak. Seeing the appraiser nodded slightly, the store the manager breathed a sigh of relief and immediately told Soldak that the Tricolor Iris Trading Company was willing to purchase these sulfur ores at a price of 4 silver and 50 copper coins per pound. Soldak felt that the price offered by this trading firm was quite acceptable, so he was ready to discuss the transaction method with the store manager. Manager Cobham, can you come out for a moment? There is something urgent here. Please take care of it. In a very soft voice, 
a maid stood at the door and said to the manager of the business bank. The manager of the commercial bank looked a little unhappy at first. But when he turned around and saw the maid, he immediately stood up and said, Uh, I'll be here right away. The manager of the commercial bank said to Serdak with an apologetic look. Sorry, Baron Serdak. Please excuse me. Serdak waited in the reception room for a long time before the business manager walked in again, but seeing that his foreheads were almost twisted together, Serdak had a bad premonition. Sure enough, after the commercial bank manager sat down, his face looked a little embarrassed. He hesitated for a moment and then said to Serdak, Baron Serdak, I am very sorry. I have to take back the purchase price of sulfur or that I just gave you. The current purchase price of sulfur or in our trading company is 3 silver 20 per pound. Copper. Soldak didn't know why the purchase price of the sulfur mine changed. It seemed that it was obviously because the manager of the commercial bank changed his mind after he came back after receiving the news just after he left. However, such a purchase price is not as good as the official price of 3 silver coins per pound given by the munitions department of the city hall. The munitions department is at least more stable. In that case, I'm afraid I'll have to think about it again. Soldak thought for a while and said, he felt that sulfur or would not continue to decline. The purchase price of sulfur or in Helensa City was not ideal. It could only be said that the commercial banks and the military supplies department were controlling the price. Then please do as you please. The business manager stood up quickly, as if Serdak was carrying a plague, making him afraid to approach him. When leaving, Soldak glanced at the three-color iris sign again, then led Gubalai Ma away. The failure to reach a transaction intention for sulfur or made Serdak a little frustrated. After all, this is his only relatively stable source of income after owning the territory. He has a mine at home, whether it is big or small. But if these sulfur ores if you can't sell it, the backlog in your hands is just a pile of useless yellow stones. I made an appointment to have a drink with Carl in the evening. Although I wasn't in the mood, I couldn't break the appointment. Serdak took the horse to the hotel in the garden square. The hotel owner Cohen helped Soldak take the horse into the stable. Serdak just rested in the hotel for a while and then went to the tavern to keep his appointment. The tavern was still the same as before and there were basically no drinkers at this time. Soldak took a few steps inside. The light in the tavern was a little dim. Only a few magic wall lamps were lit on the wall near the bar, filling the atmosphere with a quiet atmosphere. Carl Casement and Mrs. Mariana Christie were sitting side by side on the high stools in front of the bar, chatting with the charming tavern proprietress. The three of them were holding golden apple cider, and they didn't know what they said. The tavern proprietress and Lady Mariana had light smiles on their faces. Baron Soldak, long time no see, Lady Mariana said to Soldak with an intriguing smile on her face. Soldak quickly stood up straight, raised his hands to his chest, and performed a night salute. Hello, Lady Mariana. The tavern proprietress poured a glass of golden cider for Soldak. There has never been a civilian knight in Haranza City who has been canonized as a noble by His Majesty the Emperor. Baron Serdak, congratulations on becoming a noble. Lady Mariana held up the wine glass and said to Serdak. Soldak quickly raised his glass and said to Lady Mariana, This is my honor. Carl pressed Serdak on the seat in front of the bar. He knew that Serdak was going to the buyer of the sulfur mine in the morning. So he asked him, How was the discussion today? Serdak sighed and said, It's not good. Even a little bad. If we can't find a suitable buyer again, we may have to send those sulfur ores to the military supply department. Unexpectedly, Carl was not surprised after hearing this and complained together with Soldak. Those trading houses have always been like this. They are deliberately lowering prices. They could restrain themselves before. But now the white elephant trading house has closed. I'm afraid they will make the same mistake again and join forces to control the market in Halanza City. At this time, someone else opened the door and walked in outside the tavern. What are you talking about? The voice of the person speaking was a little thick. Serdak felt something sounded familiar. He turned around and realized that it was tax collector Bird and Miss Hoyle. Soldak had not seen them since they got married. Tax collector Bird married the young and beautiful Miss Hoyle. Collector Bird seemed to have a second youth. He looked several years younger. His belly seemed to have shrunk a lot, and he became stronger. Some of them spoke with loud voices. Hi! Bird! Nora! How did you get here? Carl said to Tax Officer Bird familiarly. We are not too late. Tax Collector Bird replied, walking to Soldak's side and sitting down on the high chair, which made the chair creak and groan. Miss Hoyle sat next to Lady Mariana, and the maid behind her helped her take off her shawl. 
She looked very good. Miss Hoyle. Now I want to call her Mrs. Nora Hoyle. Since she is the only heir of the Hoyle family, Miss Hoyle did not change her surname with the bird tax collector and will have their second child in the future. He will also become the legal heir of the Hoyle family. This noble lady, who had lived a privileged life since she was a child, experienced the most difficult and dark days in the past year. But she also found the love of her life and became a new powerful person in the city of Holanza. Later, even Miss Brenda, whom she had not seen for a long time, came to attend this small party in the tavern. Chapter 563 Constantine A group of friends from the city of Valencia gathered in the tavern. Three gentlemen, Suldak, Carl and Tax Officer Bird, sat together and chatted. The ladies gathered around Mrs. Mariana. Miss Hoyle seemed to have walked out. During that period of gloom, her whole person became much calmer, and even her smile had the aura of a superior. It is said that she has been obtained as a reserve member of the Helensa City Council. As long as any member of the council retires, Miss Hoyle is likely to its the new MP. Since the death of Baron Llewellyn, Soldak has not seen Miss Brenda for some time. She has lost a lot of weight recently. Her already tall figure looks more like a clothes rack. She is not as smiling as before. A beauty that has accumulated over time. When she looked at Soldak, her eyes were calm. Except for a little admiration. There was no other emotion in her eyes. The ladies drank a little gold cider, And there was so much to talk about. Tax collector Bird's life has become regular recently. And Miss Hoyle has controlled his drinking and required him to do appropriate exercise every day. Although he himself does not feel any changes. Others can feel the changes in him. Much more energetic than half a year ago. Carl and Tax Officer Bird talked about the embarrassing incident that Soldak encountered while selling sulfur ore. Tax Officer Bird asked Soldak curiously. Duck, which trading house did you go to? Tricolor Iris. Serdak replied without thinking. Tax Collector Bird and Miss Hoyle looked at each other with strange expressions. Lady Mariana also looked at Soldak with a surprised look on her face, but didn't say anything. Tax Collector Bird chuckled and said to Soldak, Well, of course the trading house will lower your price. Even if they don't do your business, they won't let you sell sulfur or to their trading house. The reason is simple that it is a Bulwer family property. You mean because of Armand Bulwer? Soldak asked Tax Officer Bird. Of course. That guy Armand is not a broad-minded person, Tax Officer Bird said. Serdak didn't expect that he would have to deal with the Bulwer family everywhere in Helensa City. He couldn't help but have a headache. There was no way to explain this kind of thing. He couldn't tell Armand that he and Darcy Christie had nothing to do with Ben. Nothing happened. Seeing Soldak's gloomy look, Tax Officer Bird immediately suggested, Dak, since sulfur or cannot be sold at a high price in Helensa City, you should actually go to other cities to find sales. I know that there are workshops in Constantinople that are always preparing fire-scale bombs. The workshop should have some relationship with the Bena Legion. In this regard, he is more knowledgeable than Carl. Okay, then I will go to Constantinople to have a look, Soldek said. If Tax Collector Bird said so, it was worth the trip. Carl interjected at this time. I remember that Mariana has a best friend who lives in Constantinople. Mariana, what is the name of your friend in Constantinople? Mrs. Mariana didn't want to get involved in this matter. So she sat next to her without saying a word. The reason was that her identity was relatively sensitive. She was friends with Suldak on the one hand and her niece Darcy Christie on the other. Husband, speaking of it, Lady Mariana had absolutely no reason to help Suldak. But since this was proposed by Carl on his own initiative, it meant that he had made his position clear. He was completely on Suldak's side. If Mrs. Mariana didn't pick up the topic, she sighed softly. The young man next to her was good at everything. But he valued friendship too much. Lady Mariana pursed her lips and said to Carl, Are you discussing Lady Annabelle? Carl suddenly remembered this name that Mariana often talked about. Nodded immediately and said, That's right. It's Mrs. Annabelle. Soldak wants to open up the market for the sulfur or in his hand. He heard that Constantinople needs a lot of sulfur ore. And he wants to establish certain connections with the workshops there. You know a good friend who happens to be a powerful person in Constantinople. Can you write her a letter and ask her for help? To be honest, Lady Mariana didn't want to write. But she had to write. She smiled a little reluctantly, looked at Carl and said, Of course. No problem. I will write her a letter tonight. Night, Serdak. You can go directly to Constantinople to visit her with my letter. Okay, Serdak said. 
It wasn't until the tavern party broke up and Lady Mariana and Carl boarded the magic caravan and returned to Lady Mariana's apartment near the magic tower that Lady Mariana complained to Carl, blaming him for not telling him about this matter. If this information reaches Armand Bulwer's ears in the future, it will embarrass Darcy. Carl did not expect that the situation inside was so complicated and quickly told Mrs. Mariana that he would not do anything like this next time. Soldat came to Constantinople with a letter written by Lady Mariana. Judging from the map, Constantinople and Hiranza are two cities in Osorno County, Beta Province. However, Hiranza is the westernmost mountain town in the Terrapagan region, while Constantine, the castle is located in the center of Osorno County, where transportation is very convenient, and it is connected to several surrounding cities by broad avenues. In contrast, the transportation industry in remote mountain cities, like Halanza City is not developed. As long as there are many mountains here, most of the roads are difficult to travel. Serdak usually did not have the opportunity to go outside the city of Aranza. This time he rode to Constantinople. It took five days. Serdak stood on the horseback in Constantinople. In front of the city gate, I looked back at the road I had traveled, thinking of transporting sulfur or to Constantinople. This road was probably the biggest problem. Constantinople was built on a large piece of red rock. One end of this red rock is connected to the jungle and the other end is a low cliff with a drop of more than 30 meters. Since the foundation is built on a huge rock, it means that the city has no underground water source. The drinking water in Constantinople was brought into the city from a clear water river. The clear river flows from the forest, passes through Constantinople, forms a small waterfall on the red rock cliff, and falls into a crescent-shaped lake under the red rock. Constantinople is larger than the city of Aranza and has tens of thousands more permanent residents than the city of Aranza. The city is surrounded by layers of vast forests, like a shining pearl in the green sea. The city wall is also a slightly double standard building. One side is close to the cliff, so it is an arc-shaped wall, and it looks very thin, much like a simple fence. As for the part of the city wall that borders the forest on the other side of the city, it is made up of straight sections, with a joint every 200 yards and a tall arrow tower built on each joint. Serdak wore a noble badge on his chest, and the guard at the door immediately let him go. Arriving in Constantinople, Soldak found that although the buildings in this city were not as compact as Aranza, they were more orderly. Every street here was straight, and many public areas in the city where there is a wooden map of Constantinople, with the main divisions of the city clearly marked on the map. Serdak went directly to the city's workshop area, where the streets were filled with various workshops. It seemed that Constantinople's industry was more developed than that of Aranza. After walking around the workshop area twice, unfortunately, he could not find the workshop that specialized in making fire-scale bombs for the Bena Legion. Soldat could only take out the autograph letter written by Lady Mariana and came to Constantinople, the most gorgeous aristocratic district. According to the address written on the letter, came to the front of a castle in the city. The guard at the gate stopped Soldak and Soldak quickly took out the letter written by Mariana and handed it to the guard at the gate. When the guard saw that the name written on the letter was Mrs. Annabel Luther Owen, he naturally did not dare to neglect and quickly sent the letter into the castle. Serdak did not wait at the door. He left the address of his temporary hotel and left from the door. Soldak read the name on the envelope and felt it was familiar. It wasn't until he saw Lady Annabella in the Owen family's living room the next day that he felt that the aristocratic circle in Benes City was really small. This Anna in front of him Mrs. Bella is clearly Hathaway's aunt. When they took the magic airship from Alensa City to Bena City, they even played cards together. Lady Annabel also did not expect that the person who came to visit was actually Baron Soldak, and he was recommended by Mariana Christie, Lady Annabel, who was sitting on the main seat, waved her hand and asked the maid to bring tea and fruits before quickly retreating. Baron Soldak! Mariana has already said in the letter that you are here to establish supply and sales contacts with the firearms workshop. Although the firearms workshop is controlled by the Owen family, I cannot completely control the specific matters. Someone can take you to see the person in charge of the workshop. But whether the negotiation can be concluded depends on how well you negotiate. Mrs. Annabel sat on a high table and chair, leaning over to face Serta in the audience. Kay said, Then thank you, Mrs. Annabel. Soldak stood in the middle of the carpet under the stage and said to Mrs. Annabel. Lady Annabel pursed her lips and smiled slightly, waved to a close confidant beside her, and then said to the trusted maid, Take Baron Soldak to see him on. The maid nodded repeatedly, 
then walked up to Suldak and said respectfully, Baron, please come with me. Lady Annabelle stood by the window on the third floor of the castle. Watching her trusted maid take Serdak through the front courtyard of the manor, she did not expect to see Serdak again in Constantinople. She came from the sea a few days ago. Sevi heard from her mouth that the territory of Baron Serdak was a volcano with a lava pool on top that was constantly burning. So she felt that his choice was a bit unique. At this time, when I saw him making a special trip to Constantinople to sell sulfur mines, I felt that he really had a lot of ideas. Chapter 564 Acquaintance Slightly adjust the relationship between Lady Annabel and Baron Amon Owen at the end of the previous chapter. Constantinople has the largest fire phosphorus ammunition workshop in Bena province. This firearms workshop was not built in the city, but on the east coast of Yuan Lake under the stone cliff. The entire Yuan Lake is designated as a recreational area. In the military-controlled area of Stantinoburg, the fire phosphorus bombs produced here are not only provided to the Bena Legion and the private legions of the provincial lords, but also sold to lords in other provinces. Although the rainy season has passed, the road is still bumpy and not so easy to walk, and the magic caravan is a little bumpy on the forest road. Constantinople is located in a large forest area, surrounded by maple forests all over the mountains. These forest lands are divided like pizza by spreading forest roads. This is a very important transportation hub in the interior of Bena province. Lady Annabelle's maid led Soldak onto a magic caravan and went directly out of the city to a large workshop under Yuan Lake. From the outside, this workshop looks like a lumberyard built by the lake. On the moss-covered grassland by the lake, there is a row of large warehouses built. If the maid hadn't told him, it would be Constantinople. Soldak may have always thought of the firearms workshop as a row of warehouses for storing wood. From the outside, there seemed to be no guards at the gate of the workshop. But the magic caravan parked in front of the gate. For guards immediately came out of the gatehouse to inspect the magic caravan. Annabelle's maid gave a badge to he handed it over. Stuck his head out of the car window. And said to the guard at the door. I want to see a Owen. The guard at the door did not let him go. But stood next to the magic caravan and said to the maid. Please wait a moment. I will pass the news to Sir Amon Owen. The maid knew this would happen. So she nodded slightly and said nothing more. The coachman skillfully drove the magic caravan to a patch of grass. Staghorn grass grew on the slopes. When the wheels ran over it, the entire wheels were dyed green and left two deep ruts. In fact, it didn't take long for Serdak to wait. A young nobleman came out of the workshop. The maid asked Serdak to step out of the carriage and first saluted the young noble respectfully. The young noble, who was familiar with the maid, just waved her hand casually, glanced at Serdak, and asked the maid, Why are you here? Come to me anytime. Is there anything urgent? Lord Amon, my wife asked me to bring Baron Serdak here. The maid introduced Amon Owen, and then said to Serdak, Baron Serdak, this is Amon Owen. Baron, head of Constantine's workshop, son of Lady Annabella. Serdak didn't expect that Lady Annabelle, who looked so young, actually had such an old son. Iman Owen glanced at Suldak with a hint of doubt in his eyes. Serdak knew that he should come out to explain the situation at this time. So he said to Iman Owen, Baron Iman, the thing is like this. I discovered a sulfur mine in the territory. This time, I came to Constantinople, Constantinople. I just want to solve some sulfur or sales problems. I heard from my friends that there are workshops in Constantinople that need sulfur or. I took the liberty to come here this time to see if you need sulfur or here. Iman just nodded slightly. He had a pair of green eyes that looked as beautiful as Hathaway's. He looked at Suldak seriously, seeing that Serdak's eyes were calm and did not flinch at all. He continued to ask, Are you from Holanza? Yes, Suldak said. Iman took two steps with his head lowered, then turned around and asked Suldak, Oh, my mother doesn't know many people in Holanza City. Are you a relative of Lady Mariana? Or do you know Dorothy? Mrs. West Newman? I know Mrs. Mariana Christie, Suldak said. It's really like that. Iman smiled a little weirdly. His expression was like that of Soldek. But his somewhat gloomy face became much more friendly. He immediately became very active and treated Sue very enthusiastically. Erdak said, I may not be able to help you if you want to buy fire phosphorus bombs. There is not much stock of fire phosphorus bombs now. And they have to be used by Bena's main army. So the number of fire phosphorus bombs that can be distributed is limited. Many lords want to be in the army. I need some equipment inside. 
and the orders from the workshop have been scheduled until next spring. I really have no choice. Iman Owen changed his tone and said, But if you want to sell sulfur ore, as long as the quality is acceptable, you can come to me directly in the workshop in the future. Iman Owen boarded the magic caravan and asked Serdak to come up. He smiled and asked Serdak, Baron Soldak, can you show me the mineral sample you brought? Of course. After Serdak said that, he took out a few pieces of sulfur or from his magic pocket and placed them on the folding table of indigo wood inside the carriage. Iman Owen picked up a piece of sulfur ore, first brought it to his nose and sniffed it carefully, then raised the sulfur ore, looked at the color against the sun, took out a small hammer and knocked on the sulfur ore, put a small piece into a silver tray and crush it gently. Use your thumb to feel for the gravel in the sulfur mine in the silver tray. There are some impurities, but overall it's not bad. Iman Owen raised his head and said to Soldak, As long as it is of this quality, you can send us any amount of sulfur or you have. When he looked at the ore, his eyes were very focused. Then he raised his head to discuss the price with Soldak, and his eyes became very shrewd. As for the price, just follow the current market purchase price. He tentatively said something. And seeing that Soldak had no objection, he added, Currently, the price of sulfur or reaching Constantinople is 5 silver and 40 copper plates slash pound. But this price may fluctuate. As you know the current market situation, the entire magic material market is increasing in price. He glanced at Soldak, waiting for him to speak. That's fair, Soldak said. Iman Owen breathed a sigh of relief. What he was most afraid of was that the Baron Serdak in front of him wanted to raise the price of the sulfur mine. Hearing that Serdak thought the price he proposed was reasonable, Iman Owen felt that this matter must be settled immediately. So he said, Okay, I can sign an agreement of intent with you. When your sulfur or arrives in Constantinople, just if someone come to me here with the purchase agreement, can. Soldak readily agreed. Iman Owen was in the magic caravan at the entrance of the workshop. He took out a piece of parchment from the drawer of the car and quickly drafted a letter of intent. The two of them signed their names on the parchment. After talking about business, Iman Owen put a smile on his face and said to Serdak, Baron Serdak, if this is your first time coming to Constantinople, I can take you around the city. Try our specialties. If I have the opportunity in the future, I would like to return to Alensa City as soon as possible to organize the supply of goods. Serdak refused. Iman Owen did not persuade, but just greeted the coachman on the driver's seat and said directly, Then I will take you back to the hotel. The carriage slowly drove away from the workshop in Yuan Lake. Regardless of Iman Owen's prejudice against him, this young nobleman was quite considerate in his work. On the main street of Constantinople, no matter where this magic caravan with the silver emblem of the Owen family on the carriage goes, the surrounding vehicles, horses and pedestrians will actively move out of the way so that this magic caravan can travel unimpeded. Serdak had never seen such a privileged vehicle in the city of Valencia. And even the current governor of the city, Bernard Christie, did not have this honor. After returning to the hotel and settling the funds for the room, Baron Amon Owen insisted on sending Soldak out of the city. Just when the magic caravan was about to leave the city, a knight rode a green-scaled horse parallel to the magic caravan. Behind him were two attendants. The tall green-scaled horse just made him a little taller than the carriage window. The knight slightly he hunched over and looked inside against the window glass. When he saw Soldak and Iman Owen in the carriage, he was slightly startled and asked through the window, Iman! Why are you sitting in the car? Iman? Iman Owen waved his hand towards the knight, opened the car window, and said to the knight outside the car window, My friend is leaving Constantinople, and I want to see him off. This is Jude, and this is Soldak. The knight named Jude looked at Soldak seriously and said, I seem to have seen you somewhere. Let me think about it. Serdak looked at the knight outside the window with suspicion, wondering how he could possibly know the knight here in Constantinople, which he had never been to before. At this time, a guard behind Jude came to his ear and reminded Jude, Boss, have you forgotten? When we were in Wazimra City, you received treatment from Knight Serdak. You injured your ribs at that time. The broken ribs stabbed the right lung lobe. You were seriously injured at the time. Seriously? This knight of Serdak accepted A.H., L. Dog Head, and cured your injury. The knight suddenly thought about it. And when he looked at Soldak again, he was quite excited and said proactively, You are the knight of Serdak from the Hellanza Guard Camp. No, Baron Serdak. He immediately changed his mind when he saw the noble badge on Serdak's chest. 
and then very warmly invited Serdak to stay in Constantinople for a few more days, giving him a chance to express his gratitude. But Serdak was politely declined. Baron Amon Owen did not expect that Jude and Suldak actually knew each other, and it seemed that Jude owed Serdak a favor. When the magic caravan passed the city gate, Jude shouted excitedly to a group of guard camp knights patrolling the city gate. Hey! Come and see who is coming to our Constantinople! It's Sir Knight Dark! Baron! Haven't you two always wanted to thank me in person? Now is your chance! Is Knight Serdak here? Someone among a group of guard knights, who happened to be patrolling at the city gate shouted. Chapter 565, Before the Harvest Festival Serdak dealt with these extremely enthusiastic guard camp knights at the city gate. After delaying for a while, he rode his horse back to the city of Halanza, when they were in Wazamala City on the Maka Plain. These guard camp knights didn't say anything grateful. Instead, a few months later, they went to Constantinople. These people in Constantinople only then did the knights of the guard camp show their gratitude to themselves. After declining the warm offer of Baron Jude, Soldak's heart became warm at this moment. There are dense woods on both sides of the avenue. There are some pear trees scattered along the roadside. Some green pears grow on the trees. Only a few pears are hanging on the top of the trees that are out of reach. A gust of wind blows through the forest. A heavy pear swayed vigorously on the top of the tree. The afternoon sun was still a bit hot. Soldak patted the horses but hard. And the ancient bolai horse spread its hooves on the forest road and ran forward with all its strength. There is only half of the moat in Constantinople. And the other half is not a high stone cliff outside the city wall. The water in the moat is crystal clear. And the river is paved with stones. In order to divert the river from several kilometers away, the residents of Constantinople spent several months digging a canal. This river is the Constantinople River, one of the most important water sources in Fort. Almost half of the residents rely on this river for daily water use. Lady Annabella's made returns to the castle in a magical caravan. Iman Owen and Jude were chatting by the moat at the gate of the city. Hey, Iman, how do you know Baron Saldak? Jude leaned on the railing of the suspension bridge beside the moat and asked Amon Owen. This suspension bridge hangs over the river. The entire bridge is made of oak, with hemp rope attached to the handrails of each railing. Above the city gate is written the words, Constantinople, and below the words is the Owen family emblem made of one meter in diameter magic copper. He planned to sell some sulfur mines. It is said that he found a sulfur mine in his territory. So he came to me and planned to sell it to the workshop. Amon Owen glanced at Jude. He and Jude have known each other for a long time. I know how proud this knight, who is about to reach the threshold of his second rank is. He paused and asked Jude. By the way, Jude, is this Baron Soldak famous? Jude reached out and touched the thick stubble on his chin. And nodded slightly. He had to admit that the brilliance displayed by this knight from Holanza City in Wazimara City overshadowed the outstanding performance of all the knights in the guard camp. Jude lowered his head and glanced at his right ribs. He was wearing the standard armor of the guard camp. But he could still feel the scar. Every time it was cloudy and rainy. The scar would hurt. He thought of the battles in Walmartala City. And how crazy those giant H. L. dogs that were taller than calves were. Jude said. At least that's the case in Wasmara City. You don't even know what he did in Wasmara City. At that time. We had the Constantinople Guard Camp. The Plex City Guard Camp. And the Hellanza Guard Camp. When the battalion is combined into a battle group and fighting against the H. L. Dogs, their combat team is always the brightest presence in the battle group. Of course, there is no shortage of such brave knights on the battlefield. And other teams also perform very well. This alone is not worthy of everyone's admiration. But he is still a knight with the holy light technique. As long as someone is injured, he can call everyone. Minor injuries do not require any reward. And serious injuries require the payment of a H. L. Dog Head. His holy light technique is very effective. As long as he can treat almost every serious injury, he doesn't care whether the injured are local aborigines or reinforced knights. In his eyes, there is only the difference between serious injuries and minor injuries. Now, if you mention the name of Baron Soldak in the guard camp, many people will definitely remember him. But why do I think he was a civilian knight before? When did he become a noble baron? Could it be that he concealed it before? Lost your identity? Jude was puzzled by this. For the smugglers who fought in Wazamala City, every time the battle ended, there was always a tent in the Halanza guard camp whose lights would stay on until the very end. Amon Owen seemed to remember some information all of a sudden and said hurriedly, I know him. 
He is the knight with the highest military merit in the Bena Province Guard camp. After my uncle came back, he also had no praise for the knight in Helensa City. Juku, it's him. But I don't think there's anything special about him. Maybe, maybe there will be a chance to meet on the battlefield in the future. Jude said lightly. What? Are we going to fight again? Iman Owen asked in surprise. Years of war have led to a significant imbalance in the male-to-female ratio of the population of the Green Empire. Now plain wars have broken out across the country. Most of the legions of the Grand Dukes with heavy troops are stuck in the quagmire and unable to extricate themselves. Duke Newman of Bena Province, as the main force of the Bena Legion is trapped in the Warsaw Plain. Not so fast, but there have been frequent plain wars recently. The Green Empire will definitely take action. At least it will blow the horn of counterattack in the most critical plains. Let's watch. Jude's eyes were burning with war. And he was determined. Said. Serdak rushed back to Wall Village, just in time for the harvest festival. The wheat in the field has been harvested. And only the vegetable field opened up on the tidal flat is still full of cabbage and cauliflower. The leaves on the pumpkin vines have gradually withered and turned yellow. Revealing orange pumpkins. There are pumpkins and cabbages piled on the table in the center of the village square. The women in the village are decorating the village square. And there is a festive atmosphere everywhere. The wheat straw stacks on the threshing floor are like domed spears. This spring, the wheat fields have been fully irrigated. So when harvested in autumn, the wheat ears are tighter and fuller. And the grains on the tips of the wheat ears are the grains are all starched. Old village chief Bright believes that with this year's wheat production, coupled with some tree rice and miscellaneous grains, all the villagers can survive the long winter. This winter, there is no need to worry about the disaster of a blizzard destroying the house. The women in the village have already begun to go into the mountains to collect various mountain products. Without the pressure of famine, the things they bring back from Oak Ridge will look much better. Gubalama stopped in front of the police station. Not far away. The main body of the fourth level reservoir was being grouted at the reservoir construction site. The plywood was built like a thick city wall. On the third level reservoir a larger arc was formed outside. The busiest things in the village are the four-wheeled carriages. At this time, the four-wheeled carriages are still driving into the reservoir construction site one after another. During this year, I don't know how many axles engraved with magic patterns have been worn out. Fortunately, this thing is easy to buy in the city of Valenza. Although it is a little expensive, Serdak has never won't save money on this. Samira stood on the terrace on the second floor of the police station and said H, low to Serdak in the yard. It seemed that she was standing there specifically waiting to greet Serdak. After saying H, low, she wore a pair of the linen tube skirt returned to the room and went to sleep. Andrew limped out of the police station and smiled at Soldak. Most of the bandages on his body have been removed. This indigenous warrior is strong and possesses the strength of a mid-level transformation. His own self-healing power is far better than that of ordinary people. In just half a month, most of his injuries were healed. Seeing Sir Dak hurried back from outside, and he couldn't wait to beg Soldak to let him ride a horse for a ride in the deserted land. These days, he stayed in the police station and ate and slept. After sleeping and eating, he almost had an extra layer of thick armor on his body. Serdak didn't object. Looking at the bandages wrapped around his body, he jumped off the horse easily, took out a brand new set of guard camp style armor from the magic waste bag, and put it on him piece by piece. With the addition of a heavy full coverage armor, Andrew immediately turned into a big stupid bear, not to mention running and jumping to fight. Even walking in the yard seemed a bit difficult. So Andrew's idea of wanting to patrol outside was dismissed. Serdak gave up. Aphrodite was wearing gauze pajamas and rested her elbows on the railing. When she leaned down, a clear shape of water droplets appeared on her chest. And her pajamas swayed gently. If it weren't for the two big bulges on her back and the hidden corners in her messy long hair, which revealed her identity as a succubus, Serdak would have thought she was more like a lady who had just woken up in the inner courtyard of a certain noble. In line with the magical contract of equality, mutual assistance and reciprocity. Aphrodite became less and less concerned about her own image in front of Serdak. Serdak bit the bullet and climbed to the second floor terrace and sat down on the wicker chair on the terrace. The view here was very good. Sitting here, he could just see the entire wall village. The succubus Aphrodite was lying sideways on the wicker chair opposite Serdak, her nightgown barely concealing her graceful body contours. As a result, Soldak could only keep giving himself psychological hints. She's a succubus. She's a succubus. She's a succubus. Is there nothing going on in the village recently? Soldak turned his head away 
and looked at the oak table in front of the wicker chair. Aphrodite blinked her big purple grape eyes and said with a smile on her face. Fortunately, the new magician from the Dark Moon Gate is timid and only rides a magic harpoon around in the evening. I walked around Wall Village twice and didn't show up again. When? Serdek asked in surprise. About five days ago, Aphrodite said very casually. How can you identify that as the magician from the Dark Moon Gate? Serdek asked doubtfully. Of course I know. Because in addition to flying around on a magic harpoon, he also likes to cross portals. Aphrodite clapped her fingers and told Serdak her reason. Listening to what the succubus Aphrodite said, the person riding the magic harpoon is very likely to be the Dark Moon Gate magician. Finally, Aphrodite told Serdak that the ogre ghoul item was no longer in the mood to herd sheep in Bago pasture, and was counting the days until the harvest festival on his fingers every day. Serdak waved his hand to show that he understood. After learning about the situation in the security station these past few days, he got up and walked down the terrace, mounted the gubo lie horse that was gnawing grass by the shrub wall of the yard, and planned to rush home. Hey! Captain! Aphrodite stood on the terrace and called out to Soldak. The last ray of sunlight at dusk filtered through her body, making her look like a silhouette in the sun. Uh, what? Soldak grabbed the horse's reins and turned around to ask. Are you discriminating against succubi? Aphrodite's smiling eyes were filled with a narrow smile. Chapter 566 Believers of the Dark Goddess Although we still don't know the purpose of the Dark Moon Gate magician flying in a circle over Wall Village, we can feel that this magician has brought an invisible magic to Wall Village. The pressure seems to have spread to the hearts of every villager. Some villagers in the village have begun to secretly talk about the magician who can fly around on a magic harpoon. When they see the magicians in the adventure group at the entrance of the village, the villagers' eyes are also strange. Serdak had nothing to do about this. Although he had given away the crystal key, the magician of the Dark Moon Gate did not seem to have forgotten Wall Village. Soldak and the old village chief first walked around the reservoir construction site. The harvest festival is approaching, and the grouting of the main body of the fourth-level reservoir dam at the reservoir construction site will be carried out after the harvest festival. Now the steel bars and plywood of the dam are ready. The volcanic ash is piled up like a hill on the construction site. And the construction site is quiet. Quietly. The bricklayers had returned to their respective villages two days ago. And they would return one after another after the harvest festival. The old village chief caressed the plywood of the main body of the dam with one hand. Tapping the plywood with his knuckles from time to time to check whether the plywood was tightly bundled. A bunch of steel bars are exposed in the place where the plywood is not enclosed. This kind of steel bars as thick as a small finger are transported from the blacksmith workshop in Benis City. Up to now, the reservoir project has only purchased these steel bars. Serdak, nearly 500 gold coins have been taken out. Bright Village Chief said to Serdak, After the harvest festival, we will start pouring the main body of the dam for the fourth level reservoir. By the way, Dak, isn't the design height of the fifth level dam a bit short? We have already repaired it. Why not build it higher? The fifth level reservoir covers the largest area. And the fifth level reservoir is not a huge overall pool but consists of 13 interlocking pools at different heights. The dam height of these pools is only one me. The old village chief knew what Serdak was thinking, but he hoped that this large dam could store more water. There are two things the old village chief wants to do most in his life. One thing is to stop the village from being short of water, and the other is to cultivate fields that can feed the villagers. Now both of these things have been realized, but he still habitually wants to save more water and cultivate more land. Serdak stood on a large area of mountainous land where the fifth level reservoir had not been completely leveled, and said to the old village chief, I plan to turn this first level pool into a large bathing beach. I will lay a layer of fine sand around the pool and plant some willow trees. In the summer, the children in the village can cool off here without worrying about the water being too hot, deep and in danger. The old village chief was unwilling. He smacked his lips, took out a walnut pipe from his arms, filled the pipe with some shredded tobacco, and without lighting it, he put it in his mouth and took two dry puffs. Frowning. Situan character. Soldak continued to explain. According to the original design, the only tanks that can actually store water in this large dam are the first three levels. The fourth level water storage tanks are to ensure buffer storage of flash floods during the rainy season. We have already moved the water in the upper reaches of the valley. The mountain spring is surrounded and there must be a place for everyone to draw water. In the future, I plan to connect some copper pipes from a certain pool in the five-level reservoir. 
so that the mountain spring can be directly delivered to everyone. Every household. The project will be completed soon. Of course, I understand this. But the more I understand, the more I can't figure it out. The total cost of the next two levels of reservoirs is nearly double that of the first three levels. And the investment of manpower and material resources is huge. But in the end, it was actually of no use. I always feel that the construction of these two levels of reservoirs was a bit of a loss. Mayor Bright said sincerely. What's the point? You'll know the benefits in the future. Serdek said with a hee-hee smile. The central square of the village is still very lively. The villagers have become accustomed to eating big pot meals in the square. When the old village chief and Soldak passed by the village square, the villagers stood up to greet them one after another. The old village chief said to these villagers, who eat and drink from big wooden bowls, have always looked down upon them. At this moment, he scolded a group of young people squatting in the corner to eat with a straight face. Those of you who have not participated in the construction of small townhouses, don't come here every day to eat. The canteen here is a small townhouse. The building craftsmen are preparing. A group of young people in the village laughed and said, Uncle Bright, we are all working on the construction site of the townhouse. Village Chief Bright immediately yelled angrily, Get out of the way. You kid. You think I'm old and stupid. Don't you know you're driving a carriage at the reservoir construction site? He picked up the crutch in his hand and limped quickly towards the young people. The other young people in the village immediately panicked and explained as they ran. Uncle Bright, we just eat porridge together. Ha uh ha. -huh. The women in the village sat on the stone strips next to the square and watched the excitement. The originally serious topic was filled with laughter. The village chief Bright walked to the big iron pot where the multigrain porridge was being cooked with an angry look on his face and ordered the cook who was cooking the multigrain porridge. Please keep an eye on the grain bags for me. The grain will be used up before the time comes. I want a replacement. The cook was so frightened that she quickly poured two more ladles of water into the big pot. Sernak and Mayor Bright walked into the carpenter's workshop. As the townhouses were being completed one after another, all the triangular wooden frames on the roof of the carpenter's workshop had been completed. Wooden window frames were currently being built in large quantities, and some finished windows were being built. The frame is hung in the open space next to the carpenter's workshop. A large pergola has been built with sunshade cloth. All the varnished windows are dried here. You can smell a strong smell of paint when you walk nearby. It was getting very late but the lights were still on in the carpenter's workshop, and a group of carpenters were working on the last batch of window frames. The carpenter's workshop has always been the busiest place in Wall Village. Stacks of wood are piled in the warehouse and will be consumed quickly. Serdak followed the old village chief to the row houses in front of the village. Most of the row houses at the entrance of the village have been rented by businessmen and turned into temporary residences and warehouses. Due to the influx of a large number of adventure groups in the deserted land, the entrance to the village has been the market is becoming more and more prosperous, attracting many businesses during this period, and the row houses at the entrance of the village have been fully utilized. A large row house near the river became a camp for cobalt slaves, and 600 cobalt slaves have been living here. Serdak and the old village chief Bright walked towards the cobalt slave camp. From a distance, they heard a scolding from the village overseer, accompanied by the low-pitched prayers of the cobalt slaves and the sound of quarreling could be heard in the silent night. So far, the old village chief heard the quarrel, but was not surprised. He only said that these cobalt slaves have been uneasy recently. When the two walked to the cobalt slave camp, they saw the village overseer scolding a group of cobalts. The leader of the cobalts had a candle on his head, and he obeyed the overseer's scolding. A group of cobalts behind the cobalt leader let out bursts of protesting whimpers. Before Serdak could figure out what was going on, the village chief Bright told the story of the incident. The reason really made Cernak dumbfounded. The cobalt slaves were protesting to the overseer. They believed that even as slaves, they would not be able to live such a degrading life in the future. The cobalt slaves filed an application to request cobalt male and female slaves to live separately. They needed two slave camps. The old village chief thought it was nothing. He just needed to divide the slave camp into two and separate them from each other. But the next request of the cobalt slaves is a bit over the line. The cobalt slaves hope that their daily labor can be converted into contribution points. As long as the contribution points are sufficient, the village must allow the cobalt slaves to form families. And the newly formed families must there are separate rooms to ensure personal privacy, etc. These cobalt slaves began to protest to fight for some benefits for themselves. However, they only make a fuss after dinner and before going to bed. They still work honestly during the day. 
and when it's time to go to bed, they will return to the camp to rest obediently. Village Chief Bright was troubled by this, and felt that it was necessary to discuss this matter with Zerdek. The main reason was that these cobalt slaves were making a fuss in a very measured manner, and did not reach the level of suppression at all. At the same time, they were indeed fighting for seek benefits for yourself. The old village chief had planned to separate the slave camp after the harvest festival, but he did not agree to the request to prepare a single gun room for the dogs and men. Serdak couldn't understand why these obedient cobalt slaves had always made so many demands recently. But then, he discovered the problem. He immediately saw the necklace on the neck of the cobalt leader. It was a necklace made of stones. It was nothing like this alone. But the pendant of this stone necklace was very special. Unusually, the pendant is a crescent-shaped stone. Serdak suddenly remembered that more than a month ago, Selina hugged him and said that she wanted to try to develop followers of the Dark Goddess among this group of cobalt slaves. The effect seems to be very significant. Obviously, this a cobalt leader has become a believer of the Dark Goddess and even wears a necklace representing the radiance of the moon around his neck. He even suspected that the cobalt slaves' fight for rights this time was due to Selina's guidance. After this whole summer, the cobalt slaves have proved their worth to the people of Wall Village. From the beginning of digging the river to the later digging of stones in the quarry, they have always worked hard and shouldered most of the hardest work. The most tiring work. So much so that now that they have made some demands, the old village chief feels that he can satisfy them as much as possible. When the supervisor saw the old village chief and Serdak coming over so late, he thought they had come in a hurry after hearing that the cobalt slaves were making a camp. He suddenly felt that he had failed to do his job well and became angry and furious. The ground whipped the cobalt leader. The cobalt leader was lying on the ground, facing the overseer's whip, holding a candle on his head, and he didn't know what he was reciting silently while crawling on the ground. Val, who gave you permission to whip them? The old village chief walked over quickly, grabbed the whip from the hands of the village supervisor, and yelled angrily. Chapter 567 Change The old village chief squatted under a dead tree at the entrance of the village with a melancholy look on his face. The plaque with the words Wall Village was swaying in the wind above his head. The market at the entrance of the village is in a mess. Vendors go into the row houses to rest and have to get out before dawn tomorrow morning. Their precious goods will be stored in the rented row house warehouse. And the worthless ones will be piled up at the door of the rented townhouse. At this time, some strange noises could occasionally be heard from the row house. There were a lot fewer tents in the adventure group. Many adventure groups passed through the deserted land and entered the Pegros Mountains. No one said what they were finding. The old village chief was still chattering. And the wrinkles on his forehead became very deep. Like the cracks carved by the wind on the rocks on the top of the mountain. What's wrong with these young people now? How come their original intentions have changed after just a few days of good times? Val was not like this before. When he was hungry, he was the eldest son in the family. His parents went to Oak Ridge to find something to eat. He looked after the younger ones at home. When he was very hungry, he ran to the north. He went to the ditch pasture to dig up the thirsty roots and brought them home to boil water for drinking. The little one was so hungry that he couldn't bear to take a sip himself. No matter how hard he lived, he never stole anything. How soft-hearted he was at that time. When the sheep are being herded in the village. Every time a sheep is slaughtered during the village festival, they will hide behind the stone mill and cry for a long time. Now that I have enough food, warm clothes, and a hardened heart, why do people live like what they least wanted to see at the beginning? What's the difference between him and a slave owner's foreman? How come you can't even recognize yourself? The old village chief sat under the tree, the pipe in his hand flickering in the dark night. Serdak sat aside, thinking that he might have to discuss it with Selina tomorrow. Her steps seemed a bit big, since this matter was somewhat unclear. Soldak decided not to continue to dwell on it. He quickly changed the subject and discussed with the old village chief the sale of the sulfur mine. This time, the acquisition location changed to Constantinople. Dimmer, how to transport the sulfur or there has become a problem. According to Soldak's plan, he wants to sign a transportation contract with the horse and carriage company in Alensa City and the transportation of the sulfur or will be handed over to him. Alensa carriages and horses. It would take at least about two weeks to transport a car to sulfur or to Constantinople and back. Calculating this, the carriage fee would not be less than 30 silver coins. It seemed to be an absolutely huge amount. But it was only the cost of a four-wheeled carriage. The carriage driver's load is about 800 to 1,000 pounds. Based on the minimum load of 800 pounds. 
the freight cost for each pound of sulfur or is actually less than four copper coins. In fact, the purchase price of the sulfur mine that Amon Owen offered to Serdak was five silver and 40 copper slash pound. So the premium in freight was about 40 copper coins, which included cost management and so on. There is still a lot left after paying the freight. Hearing that Soldak was going to give up the transportation of this fat piece of meat to the Helensa Horse and Carriage Company, the old village chief suddenly felt a little pain in his heart. It is not that there are no four-wheeled carriages in the village. Not only that, the number of four-wheeled carriages in the village has been expanded to 52, which is already equivalent to half the number of four-wheeled carriages in the Haransama Carriage Company. But now the reservoir construction site, townhouses and Carl Villa all need a large amount of volcanic ash and almost all the carriages in the village are transporting volcanic ash. As the project gets bigger and bigger, some of the places with volcanic ash closest to the village of Wall have now been swept clean. The fleet has to extend deep into the desolate land, and the journey of transporting volcanic ash is unknowingly a lot has been added. Zerdak has always wanted to pave a flat road with volcanic ash cement in the deserted land. However, the plan has been delayed again and again. Now the reservoir project is about to be completed, and there is no trace of this cement road. Let's do this for the time being. The sulfur ore will be transported to Constantinople and handed over to the carriage house first. The four-wheeled carriage transporting volcanic ash in the village cannot move yet. I plan to take advantage of this autumn to pave a road between Pudu Mountain and Wall Village. The straight road shortens the time to go to the Pudu Mountain Lava River Sulfur Mine to less than two days. The mountain road in Oak Ridge is also too difficult to walk. After the first heavy snow every year, from Wall Village to Alenza City, it becomes very difficult to walk. If we want to safely transport the sulfur ore, we must repair this road. The tidal flat downstream of the river bend has now become a fertile farmland, and the canal dug by the cobalt slaves sparkles in the moonlight. Serdak stood up, took two steps forward, and said to the old village chief, I plan to repair the waterhole in Bago Pasture this fall. At least it can store some water, so that the seed buckthorn grass and immortal grass on the slope can start growing in the spring. We need to build a pasture. Then the land on the side is low-lying and the water and grass are abundant in summer. So it is definitely not a good place. As long as the drought during the dry season can be solved, the grassland over there can grow. The old village chief still has reservations about building a pasture to graze sheep. In the past, where village did not renovate the Bago pasture, and it still raised a large group of yellow sheep. Now it needs to renovate the Bago pasture, which means investing a lot of manpower, material resources and money. The old village chief does not think it is better to eat an extra meal of mutton. What can be changed? Bright village chief said. Date, even if we don't build a pasture, the pasture is enough for us to raise yellow sheep. Serdak thought of the ogre and quickly waved his hand and said, We need to increase the number of sheep. Otherwise these yellow sheep will not be enough for Gulitum to eat alone. In addition to these yellow sheep, I also plan to raise some horses, and there may be a guard battalion night squadron here in the future. There must be a place to keep the horses. We still need to raise horses. Village Chief Bright was a little stunned. Now Wall Village has raised more than 50 horses, all of which are used to pull four-wheel carriages. A guard battalion squadron requires at least 60 or 70 horses. For a war horse, Bigo Pasture is not big enough to be eaten by hundreds of horses. Of course we need to raise it. If Wall Village needs to continue to develop, Bago Pasture needs to be operated, Soldek said. Unlike yellow sheep, horses can also be counted as wealth in the Green Empire. If the bandit group and the northern rebels had not sent horses twice, Wall Village would not have so many horses now. More than 50 horses are worth at least two above 100 gold. The value of the war horse must be even higher, Soldek continued. After the Harvest Festival, the militia battalion will enter the deserted land for field training. It will also need to organize a small logistics supply team, which also requires horses. The old village chief looked at Soldak in astonishment and asked, That militia battalion of yours that has been receiving rations and has never assembled? Um, Soldak agreed. After pushing open the courtyard gate, Soldak led the horse in. He led the Gubalai horse to the stable on the side and unloaded the saddle without saying a word. The trough of the stable was covered with chopped alfalfa. The Gubalai horse swung its tail slowly and lowered its head to eat the grass in the trough. Serdak was about to take out a bucket of water from the water tank next to the wall. The wooden door of the villa was pushed open, and Rita, who was wearing pajamas and pajamas, yawned and walked out, and said to Soldak, Why did you come back? Natasha and I saw you and the old village chief passing by the square. 
You haven't you eaten yet? Without waiting for Serdak to answer, Rita had already taken the bucket from Serdak quickly and said to him, Go in and leave it to me here. The lights had just turned on in the hall on the first floor. When Suldak walked in, he saw Natasha tiptoeing to put the lampshade of the wall lamp back on. Seeing Suldak walk in with a tired look on his face, he walked up silently and gave him a big hug regardless of how dusty he was. Then he handed him a wet towel and wiped it with him. When his face was turned, Natasha began to help him untie the leather armor on his body. He didn't know how long he had been wearing this set of salamander leather armor. The shirt inside the leather armor was already stained with white salt. And he didn't know how long it had been worn. How many times has it been soaked with sweat? The buckles on the leather armor left several deep indentations on Serdak's shoulders. And Serdak's whole body was sore. Natasha stood behind Serdak. Pressed her face against his back that smelled of sweat. Put her hands around his waist. And hugged him tightly. What? Serdak turned his head slightly and asked. In his memory. Natasha had always been the kind of woman who stood silently behind him. She would neither take the initiative nor refuse. She was timid, careful, gentle and sensitive, but not so proactive. Nothing. I just want to hug you. Natasha hid behind Soldak and whispered. Ahem. I thought you two would be in the restaurant. Rita stood at the door in her pajamas, coughed twice, then passed by the two of them as if nothing had happened, and walked up to the second floor. Ah. I forgot you haven't had dinner yet. I left a pancake in the kitchen. It's probably still hot. Natasha suddenly woke up and quickly ran into the kitchen behind the restaurant. Soldak hung the leather armor on the wooden frame at the door, wiped his face, and then walked into the restaurant. Chapter 568 Morning Exercise After finishing the dinner carefully prepared by Natasha, Serdak patted his belly and drank the sweet wine in the glass in one gulp. Seeing Natasha busy in the kitchen in her nightgown, Soldak felt that life was really good now, and took a comfortable bath in the bathroom, during which Natasha blushed. He ran over to help rub his back, and by the time he climbed into bed, most of the night had passed. Serdak came close to Natasha, who was pretending to sleep with her eyes closed and her head covered, lifted the quilt and got in. About the time a flash of fishbelly white appeared on the horizon, Natasha fell into a deep sleep, with a hint of flush on her wheat-colored face. Serdak has been sleeping rough and sleeping in the open in the past few days. He rushed all night from Constantinople back to the village of Wall in the city of Aranza. To say he was tired. He was indeed very tired. But he didn't know why he couldn't sleep at this time. Lying on the bed without feeling sleepy. He thought over and over again. Then jumped out of bed quietly. Took out the repaired earth shield magic pattern structure from the magic waste bag. And placed it carefully on the carpet in the bedroom. Check it out. It will cost a total of 20 gold coins to repair this set of earth shield magic patterns. It has to be said that the inscription master is the most profitable and profitable profession. But this time, Magician Francis did not accept the money from Serdek, but converted the fee into a deposit for the salamander's fresh tail meat, poison sack, and heart, so that Serdak could only have the fresh salamander meat. Just send him some. As a fire magician, regularly consuming the meat of fire monsters can not only improve your physique, but also enhance your affinity for the fire element. Serdak accepted it readily, and when he was taking out the magic pattern structure, he only talked about it, and did not have time to check how well the magic pattern structure was being decorated. Now when I turned it over, I found that the entire set of magic patterns seemed to have been completely renovated. The armor made of magic black iron had all the damage and scratches repaired by Magician Francis with magic red copper, and polished smooth and flawless. It's just that there are some messy lines on the magic pattern structure sitting on the carpet. He put on the magic pattern constructs one by one and installed magic crystals on each gem base. Serdak suddenly felt that the mana on the magic pattern constructs began to flow slowly. A wave of power poured into the body from all parts of the structure. And this structure was also connected with countless mana threads. No different from before. Serdak did not rush to take off the magic pattern structure. He carefully walked to the terrace outside the bedroom sat cross-legged on a wicker chair, and meditated in front of the rising sun, entering the sea of spiritual consciousness. Serdak's sea of spiritual consciousness has now been divided into two distinct worlds. Above is a world of light composed of countless illuminated stars. The pure and innocent holy light connects all the stars, occupying the upper area of the spiritual sea of consciousness. The lower part of the spiritual consciousness sea is pitch black, with all the dark stars hidden in it, and the two worlds seem to be separated by an invisible and transparent wall. 
What surprised Zerdak was that a star was actually born in this darkness. The reason why it could be noticed was that it had a purple outline. In the extremely quiet and dark world, that star was born. A touch of dark purple completely outlined the outline of the dark star. And the entire dark star exuded a trace of death. This dark star did not emit any light, causing other stars in the darkness to light up one by one. Just like the upper half of the sea of consciousness forming a bright sea of stars. Instead, it is constantly absorbing dark elements from the surroundings. Serdak can feel that it is constantly devouring it. As long as there is a trend in the surrounding darkness, it will be completely absorbed by it. And it is here. This silent devouring process continues to grow. And now a purple outline appears throughout the body, which gradually becomes clear in Serdak's sea of consciousness. The double-faced, four-armed demon statue that originally stood in the sea of consciousness seemed to have never appeared before. Serdak could not find even a trace of it. The morning sun rose slowly. And Serdak felt that the big dark star with purple light in the sea of consciousness actually fell silent. The dazzling beams of sunlight emitted by the morning sun turned into triangular light pillars, which penetrated from Serdak's body, came out, and the bright stars in the sea of consciousness became more translucent, and rays of holy light shot toward places beyond the reach of the sea of consciousness, immediately expanding half of Serdak's spiritual sea of consciousness again. At this moment, Serdak felt as if an invisible glass mirror was broken in front of him, and his thoughts were like a raging tide, pouring out into the infinite vastness of the world, and there were endless unlit things in the sea of consciousness. Stars. A beam of abundant and pure holy power fell from Serdak's head and completely poured into his body. Serdak only felt that his body was bathed in the holy light. Under the washing of the holy light, the dark wounds accumulated over time were healing little by little. The sacred aura overflowed from Serdak's body and his whole body exuded a sacred aura. Under the supervision of old Sheila, little Peter has been doing morning exercises in the yard every morning recently. According to Andrew's request, little Peter has to stand in the yard and swing his sword a thousand times, and then hold the shield in a blocking posture. He wants little Peter to do these. The basic fighting movements are deeply ingrained in his mind, becoming a subconscious reaction and a fighting instinct. And little Peter did not disappoint old Sheila. He could fully bear the hardship. Now old Sheila and little Peter were standing in the yard, looking up at Soldak sitting cross-legged on the terrace, their whole bodies exuding soft light. Little Peter shouted with excitement. Old Sheila put her finger on her lips, signaling him not to disturb Serdak. Rita, who was milking the cows, also walked out of the cow sheet carrying a wooden bucket. She raised her head and looked at the man she called her brother on the terrace. Over the past year, he had spent almost all his energy changing the life of Wall Village. But the biggest change in his life was in his own home. As a result, he had no worries about food and clothing. Lived in a big house that he could not even dream of. And was respected by all the villagers in the village. Natasha was awakened by the dazzling light. She sat up from the bed hugging the quilt and saw the sky was bright outside the curtains. She hurriedly stretched out her smooth arms from the quilt. Leaned over to pick up the nightgown scattered on the floor quickly put it on her body, and jumped out of bed barefoot. She had never gotten up so late before. The holy power in his body dissipated, and Serdak felt that his control over the holy light had become much stronger. On the terrace, he saw the ogre Gulitem running from the police station. Without waiting for Gulitem to come over, he held the railing with both hands and yelled at the ogre, Gulitem. The fighting spirit in his heart spread out along with this loud shout. The ogre also felt Serdak's strong fighting spirit and he slowed down slightly. Originally, he was discussing with Serdak whether he could roast a salamander for dinner at the Harvest Festival, and he had already prepared the ingredients. Well, I didn't expect that I just ran over and found Soldak standing on the terrace calling his name, as if he had been injected with chicken blood. Gulitem really wanted to say to Serdak, We are all good friends. Why do we have to fight and kill each other? Isn't it okay to discuss some food and drinks? However, the ogre's body was filled with the blood of fighting and he was born with an unyielding will to fight. He stood in the large open space left by the fifth level reservoir and shouted at Serdak, who was striding towards him. A roar. Howl. The ogre's loud voice almost made a wave of sound. He made fists with both hands and hit his strong chest hard. Like beating a war drum. Serdak strode towards the ogre. One step. Two steps. Three steps. Each step almost stepped on the ogre's drumbeat. And the aura on his body was also rising continuously and the Holy Spirit in his hand the light torch emits dazzling holy light. Just 20 meters away from the ogre, 
Serdak stepped hard on a huge stone slab with his legs. The magic pattern structure all over his body flowed. The night halo under his feet suddenly lit up. And a pair of combat boots burst out with magic. Glow. The next moment, the stone slab shattered one after another, and Serdak's body rose into the air. He held the holy light torch in midair and raised it high above his head. Does a simple morning exercise need to be so bloody? The ogre grimaced, grinned, and wanted to cry without tears. The two collided with each other the next moment. The ogre held a bone-crushing stick in his hand and headed towards Serdak from bottom to top. Boom! The two huge forces collided together, sending out a wave of air that blew away almost all the gravel in the empty field. The ogre half knelt on the stone ground, and spider web-like cracks appeared on the rock under his feet. This blow woke up almost all the people in Wall Village who were still sleeping. Even the adventure group camp and townhouses at the entrance of the village were looking curiously. Natasha and Rita chased after them out of breath, only to find Soldek and the ogre sitting on a rock chatting side by side. And they breathed a sigh of relief. Have you been promoted again? Gulitam asked Serdek somewhat depressedly, while checking the degree of damage to the top of the holy light torch. Serdek said, I don't know what happened. It is a little different from previous promotions. This time it should be that the power of the holy light has broken through some shackles. Gulitam complained. So you asked me to test your strength? Why didn't you find that lunatic Andrew, but insisted on finding an ogre who loves peace and delicious food? When the breakthrough happened, you happened to be nearby. Serdak smiled. Dot percent you and hashtag percent dot. The ogre uttered an ogre speak. What are you saying? Serdak couldn't understand the jerky ogre language. Praise you for your humility, honesty, compassion, bravery, justice, sacrifice, and honorary spirit, Gulitam said angrily. There was such a big commotion in the village that the villagers did not dare to come forward. Village chief Bright came to check the situation and found out that the commotion was caused by Baron Serdak and the security team Ogre Gulitam doing morning exercises. Chapter 569 Harvest Festival Harvest Festival As the largest festival in the Green Empire, Almost all people in the empire will hold celebrations on this day. In contrast, the two major festivals of the Green Empire, the Magic Awakening Ceremony and the Coming of Age Ceremony, do not reach such a scale. The former will only receive special attention in big cities with junior magic academies, and the latter will not be taken seriously by the poor. We accept that there is no special ceremony for the Coming of Age Ceremony of the Poor. At most, the boys and girls of the right age put on a new set of clothes and have a meaningless outing. The day before the Harvest Festival, the scattered villagers of Walken have returned to Walken one after another, especially when Charlie led a group of craftsmen back from the Carl Manor. The carriage was filled with a large number of gifts purchased from Alinsa City. The convoy stopped at the entrance of the village. A group of children from the village surrounded them with shouts. The villagers immediately took out the candies they had prepared and distributed them to the children. And there was a burst of laughter from the crowd. The women followed behind and watched their men and sons jump out of the carriage. They first looked carefully to see if there were any changes, and then happily followed them back home. After small townhouses were built in Ware Village, many villagers who had been working outside for a long time did not even know where their houses were allocated. Charlie said to Soldak, The main body of Carl's villa has been built. Currently, only the triangular wooden support roof is missing. The wood has been transported to Carl's manor. Now the carpenters are working hard, and will only wait until after the holiday. Installed on the roof. Not long after, Luke from the Lava River Sulphur Mine rushed back to Wall Village with 400 cobalt miners. At the same time, they also came back with the sulphur or transported in 24-wheel carriages. These 400 people the cobalt slaves lived well in the mines. And each cobalt's coat was very shiny. This group of cobalts is very adapted to the living environment near volcanoes. They are neither affected by the volcanic ash in the sky nor afraid of the underground rivers of lava. Luke had been guarding the sulfur mine for nearly two months this time. When he came back, he had a beard and his leather armor was in tatters. He had not taken care of it for a long time, making him look like he was middle-aged. Uncle, the conditions in the sulfur mine are still too difficult. Soldak plans to find a few trustworthy young villagers in Wall Village to train them so that they can share the burden of Luke and Charlie. Before. Charlie and Luke took turns. Guarding the sulfur mine, Charlie was now sent out to build a house. And no one could bring Luke back for a while. Serdak strode up and gave Luke a big hug, regardless of the fact that Luke was dirty and covered in volcanic ash. Among the young people in the village, apart from Charlie and Luke, 
There were not many that Serdak could name. Ten four-wheeled carriages from the Haransa Carriage Company arrived at the village of Wall. The carriage driver opened the boards of the cargo boxes, and some fat pigs and yellow sheep jumped out of the carriages. This time, Serdak added some more they bought yellow sheep, two big fat pigs and ten black and white cows. These animals were driven off the car and immediately made the village entrance noisy. The ten four-wheeled carriages of the carriage house are specially used to transport sulfur or to Constantinople. They will transport the sulfur or to the city of Aranza today. After the harvest festival, they will drive the four-wheeled carriage to transport the first batch of sulfur ore. Sulfur mines were sent to Constantinople. Now Baron Soldak has become a big customer in the carriage shop, with a fixed amount of steel shipped to Wall Village every month, and of course other supplies. The kobolds move the sulfur or onto ten four-wheeled carriages in the carriage house. After the director of the carriage house and Soldak signed an agreement, the ten carriages and four-wheeled carriages slowly drove out of Wall Village. Next, everyone began to prepare for the Harvest Festival celebration. Gulitam, who came back from Bago Pasture, felt that pigs with such fatness must be hung in the oven, roasted until they are sizzling and oily, and the skin is crispy, and the meat is rotten. It was enjoyable to eat. But this proposal was rejected by Soldak. Making barbecue was too wasteful of meat, especially this kind of fatty pork. Of course, it would be most fragrant to make braised pork. Braised pork and crystal elbow. He has taught Rita and Natasha the general methods of cooking these dishes, and even conducted a go test of the dishes in the morning. It turns out that Natasha cooks braised pork very well. Mayor Bright also specially prepared two barrels of ale this time. During the harvest festival in previous years, the villagers of Wall Village could only drink a bowl of mutton soup with meat and a large piece of baked wheat cake. No one expected that the time would come. The next year, not only can everyone eat meat at the Harvest Festival, but they can also drink ale. Harvest Festival celebrations begin in the morning. In the early morning, the central square of the village was like a large slaughterhouse. In addition to slaughtering some pig samples, the hunters in the village also brought back more than a dozen gray rock iguanas from the depths of the desert. The butchers cut off the bones and meat, throwing it into a large pot of boiling water to make broth. The villagers no longer need to eat at home in the morning. They hold a bowl of fragrant awful soup, pick up a large piece of baked wheat cake, take a sip of the broth, and eat one bite of wheat cake will instantly make your whole body feel warm. The formal banquet starts in the afternoon. Every year, the leader of Bright Village will stand up and offer the fullest ear of wheat in the wheat field to the goddess of harvest, praying for good weather next year and that the dry season will not be as long as this year. The whole blessing process is full of excitement. With a sense of ritual, the villagers also follow the old village chief meticulously and clasp their hands in front of their chests in a prayer gesture. Serdak stood next to Selina and Signa, and the three of them were behind the crowd. Selina and Signa, who believed in the goddess of darkness, certainly would not pray to the goddess of harvest. And Serdak did not pray either. They were all praying. And Serdak whispered to Selina, Have you made those kobolds believers? Selina looked at Soldak and nodded slightly. Selina was tall and conspicuous standing at the back. She asked quietly, What's wrong? Serdak shook his head and said, It's nothing. Just don't meet all their requirements at once. I still hope that they can dig stones in the quarry. No. Selina pursed her lips and smiled, then stopped talking. The old village chief's sacrifice on the central square ended with cheers, and the villagers piled the prepared food on the long table. A young magician riding a magic harpoon passed by the Paglos Pass. When he passed the wooden crosses on the top of the mountain, he saw piles of corpses. Some vultures landed on the bones, looking for some edible dried meat. Meat made the young magician feel a little nauseous. It is said that the folk customs in the deserted land outside the mountain pass are tough. Although the young magician was fully prepared mentally, he was still shocked when he saw the white corpses on the top of the mountain. He did not expect that the villagers here were so tough. Situation. He passed the arrow tower over the mountain pass and a group of large-scale dam clusters immediately appeared in front of him in the upper reaches of the valley. The young magician took a breath of air and paid no attention to the scouting guards on the mountain pass archery tower. Just as he was flying over the top of the arrow tower, a red flag had been raised on the flagpole of the arrow tower. But he didn't even look at it. The news soon spread to Wall Village. The villagers were still participating in the Harvest Festival celebration. The only people who knew about it were members of the security team and the village chief of Bright. The half-elf archer Samira came from the position next to Serdek. Stand up and quietly exit the banquet. She was carrying a bow on her back. Her body was as light as a cheetah. 
and she climbed up a small townhouse in a few steps. She was looking at the direction of the Paglo's pass from a distance. With the long bow already in her hand, the young magician rode the magic harpoon without realizing it, and galloped all the way to Wall Village. When passing the village entrance, I actually made an extreme dive, flying past the dead branches on the top of the trees. Chapter 570 Shooting A deserted land with vast plains. The green vegetation was gradually replaced by yellow sand and rocks. There were bare stone ridges everywhere on the top of the mountain. Only some of the ravines between the valleys had a little greenery. And these ravines seemed to have been occupied by some natural villages. The sky is cloudless. After the deserted land entered autumn, it was sunny and windy every day. The ridges under the sun are a bit dazzling. The patches of green disappeared before our eyes. There is nothing but clear blue sky and vast wilderness in front of me. Wearing crystal goggles and riding a magic harpoon, Batcom flew ahead. He passed by the dead tree at the entrance of Wall Village. Although his mother had solemnly warned him never to put himself in danger. As an excellent space magician, he must know how to hide himself at the end. But Bacon believed that in the absence of the Dragon Knight, a mage who can fly in the sky riding a magic handle is simply invincible. Especially since he just won the first prize in the flying competition. He felt that he could fly as much as he wanted under this vast sky. The original plan of their team was to bypass Wall Village, fly to the meeting point with supplies, and wait for members of other forces to join together. But Bakken believed that detouring from Paglo's Pass would be an insult to the magicians of Dark Moon Gate. When did the Dark Moon Gate operations actually care about those guard camps and arrow tower guards? So he rushed out at the lead, past several ridges of Oak Ridge, and went straight to the arrow tower at Paglo's Pass. When he flew over the wooden cross filled with bones on the top of the mountain, the archers on the top of the tower didn't even have time to take out the arrows from the quiver, and they just watched the young magician passing overhead. Backham saw the dead tree that everyone was talking about. He even wanted to burn the dead tree with a fireball to pay homage to the dead magician Kirsten. However, he hesitated and remembered that his mother had told him not to cause trouble, put the fireball magic scroll into his arms, and resisted this idea. He saw a group of cobalt slaves bathing by the river. Several large pots were set up at the entrance of their slave camp and several mutton leg bones were put out. The milky white soup was rolling in the large pots. The stacks of baked wheat cakes were as big as a mountain. And he curled his lips in disdain. I saw a dozen small townhouses arranged neatly, seeing the huge reservoir complex in the upper reaches of the valley. The white water waterfall flowing at the gate of the reservoir looks like a group of waterfalls. I saw the lively village square crowded with villagers with smiles on their faces. Several rows of long wooden tables were filled with various delicious dishes. A group of naughty children climbed up on the bench and were eating meat on a dinner plate. Bacon planned to fly around the village square twice and fly away after the demonstration. But when he saw the scene of the harvest festival, he thought that he would sit at the dining table at this time every year, waiting for the monster dinner prepared by his mother. But now, he is actually riding a magic harpoon eating sand in the wasteland that can't be seen at a glance. Bacon suddenly felt a little unbalanced in his heart. So he decided to leave something impressive to this small village such as a fire bomb. He took out the magic scroll of fireball technique that he put in his arms and unfolded the scroll into the wind. With a brief spell, the magic scroll caught fire in the wind and suddenly burned to ashes in the wind. The fireball then gathered in Backham's hand and the flames were suppressed by the strong wind. The villagers of Wall Village saw a magician riding a magic harpoon, holding the magic harpoon steering wheel with one hand and holding a fireball in the other hand, swooping down towards the square. The village chief Bright stood on the stage, looking up at the young mage swooping down from the sky. He was a little overwhelmed for a moment. The old village chief even forgot to shout to everyone, Get out of the way! The villagers were so frightened that they ran away. Some children quickly hid under the dining table. The village square became chaotic for a while. Samira scurried up to the roof as quickly as a cheetah. Serdak was talking quietly with Selina. When he saw the unexpected situation, he stepped on the long table filled with delicious food and took the shield of blessing of Moses in his hand. Almost at the same time, the young magician dropped the fireball in his hand. Serdak didn't hesitate at all. He jumped high from the dining table with both legs and raised the shield in his hand to block the fireball thrown by the young magician. The fireball exploded against the shield, and the intense flames were like fireworks exploding in the sky. Serdak, who was behind the shield, was blown away by the impact of the exploding fireball, and fell back into the square in embarrassment. A piece of the stone platform at the edge of the square collapsed. The ogre Gulitum and the injured Andrew sat on the edge of the dining table in the second row. 
Lil Peter was usually very close to Andrew. So he insisted on sitting next to Andrew. Old Sheila, Natasha, and Tara, then he sat across the dining table with Little Peter. When Gulidum saw something strange, he suddenly stood up from the dining table. Without any explanation, he used his body to block the old Sheila family. With his big hands like cattail leaf fans, he lifted the running child behind him and looked at him fiercely. Young mage in the air. At this time, the young magician suddenly pulled up the handle of the magic pot and rushed high into the sky. Samira was like a cheetah, lying on the roof staring at the prey above the square. After seeing him dive towards the square and drop a fireball, she tried her best to pull up the handle of the magic pot and let it go. The magic harpoon flies into the air. Seeing that Bakum was about to leave the square of Wall Village, Samira suddenly stood up from the roof, stepped on the attic covered with blue tiles with one foot, instantly drew the alloy bow, and aimed at the magician flying in the sky. The arm nearly doubled in thickness in an instant, and shot out a sharp white light arrow. When he saw the archer suddenly appearing on the roof, Backham realized that something was wrong. He was a little carried away. Backham was glad that he had brought a magic light shield. Although the scroll worth one magic crystal was a bit expensive, Backham did not dare to block his luck at this time. He quickly unfolded the scroll and cast a light yellow light. The shield fell on Bacom's body, instantly forming a light shield. Almost at the moment when the magic light shield was formed, an arrow hit the light shield. The next second, the shield is shattered. Bacom was startled. And before he had time to rejoice that he had escaped disaster, an arrow that followed from behind pierced his throat. The young magician felt that he had lost control of his body in an instant. And the magic potion handle suddenly flew into the sky. And he fell on his back from the magic pottery handle. He felt that he could not breathe. And he fell from the magic pottery handle in a dizzying state. Go down. At this time, his mother's advice rang very clearly in his ears. As a magician, Never put yourself in danger. Before he had time to repent, his body fell heavily on the hard stone steps. All the bones in his body seemed to be broken. Blood kept pouring out of his mouth and nostrils. He felt depressed for a while. And then one after another, a burst of severe pain made his eyesight go dark. He has not truly enjoyed the beauty of this world, has not kissed the girl he loves, and has not even signed his name on a magical design. Although there was a sudden wave of attacks in the village, they quickly calmed down and the harvest celebrations continued. However, Mayor Bright and Suldak in the police station were not happy at all. The young magician was lying on a wooden board, his body completely stiff. After the arrow at his throat was pulled out, a large bloody hole as thick as his thumb was left. There was no color on the young magician's face. His body seemed to be broken into several pieces, and his arms and legs were twisted in an extremely unnatural way. The pattern on the magic robe is exactly the same as that of the previous magician named Gurdon. Needless to say, this young magician should also be a member of the Dark Moon Gate organization. Serdak specially told Aphrodite not to touch anything on the young mage's body. He only waited for the relevant personnel from Alensa to come to Wall Village and hand over the dangerous body as soon as possible. The person who was going to Alensa City to deliver the message was already on his way. All the members of the security team returned to the security station. Only the Ogre Gulitum was reluctant to part with the delicacies and stayed in the village square in the name of protecting Little Peter's personal safety. No matter what. After killing two magicians from the Dark Moon Gate in succession, the grudge has been forged. And maybe the entire Wall Village will be implicated. Now all Serdak can do is to dig out the Dark Moon Gate organization. As long as they are eradicated from Benna City, Wall Village can be quiet. At present, the Helenza Guard Camp has eradicated the remnants of the rebel forces. But every magician of the Dark Moon Gate is hiding in the dark. And it is not easy to dig them out. Serdak sighed and said, It seems they haven't given up on this treasure yet. Andrew's elbows and thighs were still wrapped with bandages. But he was still very familiar with the situation in the desolate land. He told Soldak, The number of adventure groups gathering in the desolate land recently has not only not decreased, but has increased. There are a lot of things. And everyone is here for the treasure. But speaking of which, who got the magic crystal? We don't know yet, Serdak replied. Captain, what should we do next? Andrew asked Soldak. Serdak thought for a while and then said, I'm afraid we can't ignore this matter. So what we have to do now is to collect information about various adventure groups in the deserted land and find some new clues. Tomorrow I will go find Carl and Lance. Collect some information about the Dark Moon Gate organization. Seeing that Soldak would no longer give in, Andrew excitedly waved his fist 
and said loudly, Then kill them all! And then drive the Dark Moon Gate out of Bina Province! Chapter 571 News About the Black Magic Monastery The rebel attack on Wall Village did not happen. The young magician seemed to pop out of the cracks in the rocks, flew to Wall Village and drew a circle, and was shot to death by Samira with an arrow. Lance and a group of magicians from the law enforcement group of the Magic Guild in Halinsa City arrived faster than Suldak expected. As soon as the genius dawned, a team of magicians rode on magic harpoons and flew over Oak Ridge to Wall Village. Apparently the messenger delivering the message from Wall Village knocked on the gate of Halinsa City at night. After receiving the news, the Lance magician and a group of magicians rushed over non-stop, which is why they arrived at Wall Village so quickly. When Suldak rushed to the courtyard of the security station, Captain Gerald and a middle-aged magician were examining the dead young magician. Two magic assistants on the side were recording the information carried by the young magician. Thing. Lance walked over first and nodded to Soldek. Soldek pulled Lance aside and asked, Why did you come so fast? Lance's eyes were red and bloodshot. And he looked tired. He sat on a bench beside the shrubbery wall in the yard and said to Soldek, When we received the message from you, we happened to be meeting in the conference room on the top floor of the Magic Guild. The messenger you sent said that Wall Village was attacked by the Dark Moon Gate organization again. So we rushed over directly. Recently in the past few days, we have been troubled by this incident. I don't know how this incident reached the ears of Archduke Newman. When the Archduke heard that the manor, which symbolizes the highest glory of the Bradbury family, was attacked by the rebels, the first thing he did was the commander of the Benegard Battalion will be transferred to Hendenar County in the Warsaw Plain and the military general will take over the daily work of the Benegard Battalion. None of the lords and counselors in the city wanted to be implicated in this matter. So they stepped up their investigation of the Dark Moon Gate. Lance pinched the corners of his eyes helplessly, his voice a little hoarse. Soldek added, I heard that the Dark Moon Gate once participated in the coup in Sloit Province. This time Archduke Newman is on the front line of the Warsaw Plain. Is he worried about something happening in Bena Province? Send the military to take over the Benegard camp? Lance shook his head slightly and said, There must be some consideration in this regard. But the matter is far more complicated than you think. According to the news from the intelligence agency, the Black Magic Hermitage is also involved. An adventure group composed of members of the guild has now secretly sneaked into Alanza. The Priory of Black Magic? Hasn't it been completely eradicated from Bena Province? Serdak frowned when he heard the news about the Black Magic Monastery. Lance glanced at Suldak and said with some surprise, I thought you didn't care about these black magic cloisters scattered throughout the empire. They are a group of magicians who secretly study black magic. Their foundation is it's much bigger than we imagined. Serdak smiled bitterly. I have such a big hatred against them. How can I be indifferent? Magician Gerald and a middle-aged magician walked side by side. And Lance and Soldak hurriedly greeted them. As the head of the law enforcement team of the Hellanza Magic Union, Magician Gerald behaved extremely humbly in front of this middle-aged magician but he did not introduce the origin of this middle-aged magician to Soldak. He walked over and said, You are indeed a member of the Dark Moon Gate organization, Baron Soldak. Can you tell us what happened? Serdak immediately replied, Of course. He invited a group of magicians into the living room of the public security station. Samira had already prepared some hot tea. Everyone sat down around the table. Serdak was worried that he had missed something and would also half-elf archer Samira and indigenous warrior Andrew called over and then introduced to several magicians. That's exactly what happened when we were having a harvest festival celebration. Serdak told all the details of the battle. Several magicians in front of the round table looked at each other, and their eyes inadvertently fell on Samira, who covered her face with a conical hat, facing such an archer who could shoot the magician at any time, no matter who it was. Beyond guard, magician Gerald and the middle-aged magician whispered a few words, and the conference table fell silent. Then magician Gerald said, there are various signs that the dead magician is indeed a member of the Dark Moon Gate organization. Recently, a group of secret infiltrators from the Black Magic Hermitage organization appeared in Helensa City. No! To determine if he has any connection to the Priory of the Dark Arts. After a pause, he said to Soldek, We are going to bring the magician's body back to the Magic Guild. The corresponding achievements and rewards will be passed on within a month. You are the Sheriff of the Deserted Land, so you need to pay close attention to this place. If anything happens, please inform us immediately about news about the Dark Moon Gate and the Black Magic Monastery. Yes, Lord Gerald. Serdak acted very calmly. 
without mentioning the young magician's belongings or other related trophies at all. Perhaps magician Gerald felt that if the young magician was taken away like this, Zerdak's interests would indeed be affected. So he thought for a moment and then said, When I attended the Hellanza City Council last time, the guard camp proposed to upgrade your place to a security squadron and increase the police force of the guard camp. However, the matter was temporarily shelved due to various reasons. But this time, don't worry. In the middle of this month, the House of Representatives and all the magician representatives in Helensa City will vote in favor. As long as you can ensure that the representatives who supported you last time will continue to support you. The formal appointment will definitely be communicated within this month. Serdak did not expect that because he gave up the ownership rights of the young magician, he would actually get the full support of the magicians in Helensa City. He originally didn't care much about the squadron leader, mainly because there is currently no place in the desolate land that can raise war horses. The hard conditions for establishing a night squadron are not yet mature, and I don't know how to answer it for a while. However, you still have to say thank you. Serdak immediately said to Magician Gerald, Thank you Lord Gerald for your support. Magician Gerald admired Serdak's calmness, so he leaned over and patted his shoulder and said, You have always done a good job. Before the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Team left Wall Village, Soldak pulled Lance over to understand the situation. Lance, Archduke Newman seems to be particularly concerned about the Dark Moon Gate organization, Soldak said. That's natural, Lance whispered to Soldak. The Dark Moon Gate organization holds the most mature temporary magic circle construction drawings and mana center. That group of magicians can build temporary portals anytime and anywhere transferring the effective forces far away from the Dark Moon Gate headquarters to any place is the Dark Moon Gate's biggest threat to the Green Empire. Of course, teleportation also has a certain cost. The Dark Moon Gate and the Northern Rebels join forces. And it is also possible to see we were struck by their outstanding combat effectiveness. We were able to attack Bradbury Manor under the eyes of the Knights of the Bene Guard Battalion. And we also took advantage of this advantage. You think, there is such a group of magicians, they can let an elite team sneak into the hinterland at any time. How could Archduke Newman not be worried? After Lance finished speaking, he took out the magic pot from his magic pocket and the other magicians he had already taken off first. And he didn't want to be left too far behind. So he had to catch up immediately. This time the magicians from the Bene City Magic Guild also came to Alensa City, looking at Magician Gerald flying away. And the middle-aged magician who communicated with Magician Gerald the whole time. Serdak then asked, Lance didn't hide anything, nodded and said, That's it. So you should know how much pressure our law enforcement team is under. Okay, it's time for me to leave. Remember to contact me if you have anything. He stepped on the handle of the magic harpoon and waved his hand towards Soldak. The magic patterns on the magic harpoon lit up one by one and slowly rose into the air, carrying the Lance magician and flying out like an arrow from a string. Looking at such a convenient flying tool, Serdak also looked envious. The aroma of tea filled the square table, and Lady Mariana's maid brought out several plates of desserts and fruits from the kitchen. Soldak first came to Carl's apartment in Helanza City. He and Mrs. Mariana Christie usually dated in this apartment. However, as Carl's status in Helanza City gradually rose, he and Mrs. Mariana Christie gradually Lady Mariana's lover's relationship is already considered semi-public in the aristocratic circle. So there is no need to hide it. Through a crystal curtain, Soldak could just see Lady Mariana sitting in her pajamas in front of the dressing table by the wall. While a maid was dressing her, Carl sat across from him and said proudly to Soldak, That Cavendish Knight's performance on the battlefield was okay, but his bones were not that hard. Those days in the prison of the guard camp almost made him a traitor. All the military situation was told. According to him, in just a few years, several major changes have occurred within the rebel army. The generals who were best at fighting have left the rebels one after another. This group of northern rebels has long lost their original fighting strength. This is one of the reasons why Dark Moon Gate gave up on these rebels. Of course, after this group of rebels attacked Bradbury Manor, several traitors appeared and stole the incomplete map. At this time, the internal reasons for the break were already laid. The final reason that led the Dark Moon Gate to abandon the rebels in the north was probably the death of Magician Gurdon. It is said that joining forces with the northern rebels has always been promoted by the magicians of Gurdon. Many magicians at the Dark Moon Gate do not agree with this. But it involves some interests in the organization. The Ding Mage faction has taken the initiative. We almost got this information. Cavendish just left Helensa on a magic airship the day before yesterday. If you had come two days earlier, you might have been able to meet him. This time, 
the actions of our Halanza Guard Battalion were actually commended by Duke Newman. By the way, is this why you came to me this time to learn about this? Carl asked Soldak, who was choosing dessert on the plate with his head down. Well, this time I have forged a deadly feud with these northern rebels. Of course, I need to know more about them. Serdak said, as he stuffed a piece of cake into his mouth. You can rest assured of this. Without the support of the Dark Moon Gate, those northern rebels would not be able to reach Bina province. Carl said to Soldak very confidently. Then he said to Soldak, I thought you would care about your position as squadron leader. Chapter 572 News from Paglos Mountain Mrs. Mariana Christie was wearing a rose-red dress and sitting next to Carl with a faint smile on her face. She became radiant under the nourishment of love. She was the most valuable widow in the city of Aranza. Carl kissed her on the white cheek, and Mrs. Mariana smiled at Carl. The personal maid brought a cup of milk tea and placed it on the coffee table in front of Mrs. Mariana. She also placed a letter in front of Carl before retreating. Carl reached out and picked up the letter on the coffee table and used a paper cutter to cut open the envelope. The letter inside was stamped with the guard camp's mimeograph. Carl opened the letter, read it silently, and then handed the letter behind him. The maid put the letter into a walnut box. He picked up the teacup and took a sip before saying to Soldak, The news from the Thieves' Guild is that the Crystal Key is currently in the hands of the Black Magic Priory. I heard that many adventure groups and mercenary groups have been in contact with the Black Magic Priory. And they all want to share it. A piece of the pie. The Black Magic Priory has not yet given a clear response. Serdak did not expect that the man following the young adventure group that night would turn out to be a member of the Priory of Black Magic. I heard that the Crystal Key has been hidden in the showroom of Bradbury Manor. Soldak said casually, There are two theories now. One is that the crystal key was summoned by the mysterious magic circle on the wall. This statement itself is a bit baffling. The other is that the crystal key has been hidden in the cracks in the wall. But there is no one there. It's just a discovery. Which is simply an insult to the intelligence of the rebels. Lady Mariana said elegantly, Didn't the crystal key break into pieces after being taken out? Serdak asked. Carl spread his hands and said, it is said that it was repaired by a senior gem craftsman using jewelry fusion technology. And this information also came from that gem craftsman. Serdak took a breath of cold air. He had never heard that the crystal could be repaired after it was broken. However, after repairing, the image in the magic crystal would probably be gone. So the magicians of the Black Magic Monastery secretly sneaked into the city of Alensa. And they also came for the Red Dragon treasure. Maybe they have cooperated with the Dark Moon Gate organization. If that is the case, it would be really troublesome. But they only have half of the map in hand. And it is probably not easy to find the Red Dragon treasure in the Paglos Mountains. Soldak speculated. Carl nodded in agreement and said, The people from the Benegard camp and the intelligence office will take the magic airship and arrive in Halinsa City this afternoon. I will go to Bena City with Viscount Emmett later to receive them. It is said that there are three powerful second-level experts in Bena City leading the team this time. He paused and said, This time, the Bena Magic Guild also dispatched a team of magicians. The fact that so many people came to Alensa City in large numbers shows that this matter is much more serious than imagined. This time, the Magic Guild. Serdak was listening to Carl's speech when he suddenly felt a throbbing in his heart, as if someone was pulling him into a meditative state. Then it seemed as if someone was calling him in his heart. He immediately realized that this was Aphrodite's calls. The Pact of Equality established some kind of telepathy between him and Aphrodite. And now it was Aphrodite who was calling him. Maybe something happened in Wall Village. He sat up straight and said to Carl immediately, Well, it's getting late, and you still have to prepare to receive your colleagues from Bena City. So I'll take my leave first. Carl and Mrs. Mariana looked at each other. They were fine just now. And the topic was not finished. Turning to look at the grandfather clock in the living room, Carl said to Soldak, there is still plenty of time. Mariana has also prepared a sumptuous lunch for you. I also want to ask you about Constantinople this time. Did your trip go well? Serdak touched his nose and thought, it seems a bit rude to leave like this. Everything went very smoothly. With a letter of recommendation from Mrs. Mariana, the people there were very cooperative. The first batch of sulfur mines is already on its way to Constantinople. After speaking, Soldak asked Mary. Lady Anna nodded in thanks. Lady Mariana smiled slightly, her expression very indifferent. Ah, uh, let me go to the bathroom first. Serdak rubbed his hands in embarrassment and said, Carl looked stunned, and waved to the maid beside him with a smile on his face. A maid came over quickly. Carl ordered her, 
Take Baron Soldak to the bathroom. The maid led the way, and Serdak followed. They walked out of the gorgeous living room and passed through a straight inner corridor on the other side of the corner of the stairs. The maid opened the door of the bathroom and was about to lead the way. Serdak walked in. Serdak walked into the bathroom first, blocked the door, and said to the maid, I will do it myself. The maid glanced at Soldak doubtfully and then stood outside the bathroom door. Serdak walked into the washroom. The washroom was much larger than expected, including a bathroom, a dressing room, and a toilet. The bathroom and toilet are completely independent. Serdak walked into a cubicle in the washroom and then responded to Aphrodite's call. Passing through the void rift, Serdak returned to the police station. Aphrodite still looked like she couldn't wake up, and the summoning circle in the room had not disappeared. Soldak rushed to the window, looked around Wall Village, and found that there was nothing unusual in the village, and then asked Andrew on the side. What happened? Andrew sat on a chair in the corner with a bandage on his hand and said to Soldak, Captain, someone discovered a group of suspicious magicians in the deserted land. We suspected members of the Dark Moon Gate organization. So we rushed to call you. Return. Serdak took out a parchment map from his arms, spread it on the table, and asked Andrew, Where is it? Andrew studied the map for a while, pointed to the edge of the map near Paglo's Mountain, and said, Here was discovered by a group of hunters who went into the mountains to hunt. This group of mages had walked out of the barren land and entered Paglos, deep in the Gro Mountains. They moved very slowly. They should be looking for somewhere. The group of hunters followed behind, and the hunter who sent the message was still waiting downstairs. I will come back tonight, and all the team members will be ready to go. Soldak thought for a while, and then said to Andrew, Wait a minute, and immediately send someone to the Helensa Guard Camp and the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group. Send a letter and say that we have discovered the whereabouts of the Dark Moon Gate organization. Yes, Captain. Andrew agreed readily. Soldak had a sumptuous lunch at Carl's apartment before leaving with Carl. The two separated at the door. Soldak was going to ride directly back to Wall Village. Carl was going to Viscount Emmett's manor. After meeting with Viscount Emmett, he went to the airport terminal to receive those who came from Benna City. Piers. A caravan full of acorns blocked the city gate. When Serdak came to the city gate, the city gate guard recognized Serdak and quickly pulled the caravan aside, asking Serdak to take the lead in passing, letting him feel for the first time how privileged the nobles were. Convenience. Running all the way. Soldak rushed back to Wall Village at night. Andrew, Samira and Gulitam had already made preparations for departure and were waiting in the courtyard of the police station. A hunter wearing a leather robe and carrying a hunting bow and spear was also standing among them. There were several deep wrinkles on his dark face when he smiled and squinted his eyes. He looked a bit wretched. His hands were covered with calluses. When Serdak rode into the yard, he quickly hid behind him. Serdak jumped off the horse and glanced at the hunter, suddenly feeling that he looked familiar. Under Soldak's gaze, the hunter straightened his waist unnaturally, and instantly his body became much taller, almost as tall as Andrew, but slightly thinner. Have I seen you? Soldak asked the hunter. Military Battalion Carol reports to Baron Soldak. The hunter immediately popped up his chest and said loudly, hearing what the hunter said. Serdak remembered that there was indeed such a person in the militia camp roster. Serdak clearly remembered that when he first came to Wall Village, he was hunched over, holding an arm that could not move. What impressed Soldak most about him was the injured arm. Um, I remember your right arm was injured, Serdak said. Carol quickly pulled up his sleeves, and a scar like a giant red earthworm appeared on his right arm. It looked ferocious and terrifying. He grinned bitterly and explained. Lord Baron, the injury on your arm was caused during the spring hunting this year. At that time, a group of us met a geomantic bear that had just woken up in the Paglos Mountains. We almost lost our lives in the mountain forest. It was not because everyone had enough to eat. You are recruiting militiamen. I couldn't do anything at that time. I heard that you didn't mind being disabled. So I came to register with you. I have been receiving public food from you for more than three months. And I was recuperating at home. Now I'm almost better. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to we went hunting in the mountains again with others. A group of us met a group of magicians on the edge of Pegro's Mountain. Others were watching them in the forest area over there. I am here to deliver a message to you. How many adventure groups are there on Pagos Mountain? Serdek asked. There are many. The area is actually much larger than imagined. Stretching for hundreds of miles to the north is the Paglos Mountains. 
There are high-level magical beasts entrenched in the mountains, and many of them are cunning and powerful people who have fought countless battles with the Empire. Dangerous beasts. Ordinary adventure groups simply don't dare to mess with them. These adventure groups can only wander around the edge areas and will not rush into it. Carol explained to Soldak. How many magicians are there in that team of magicians you saw? Soldak asked again. Carol replied, Most of the team of more than a dozen people are riding magic harpoons. And there are also some strange guys who completely wrap themselves in linen. They fly high into the sky to determine their position from time to time. The purpose is very clear. But I'm just not very familiar with that mountain forest. So I didn't walk very fast. Chapter 573 Mountain Giant Sernak led members of the security team. The indigenous warrior Andrew, the half-elf archer Samira, and the ogre Gulitam, to leave Wall Village. Under the leadership of the militia battalion militiaman Carol, they entered the deserted land at night. Aphrodite stayed in Wall Village as usual. The deserted land outside the Pagros Pass is a narrow strip of land. The southernmost foothills of Pagros Mountain are like antlers that penetrate into the deserted land. The top of the antlers is Pussy Mountain, which is the only active volcano in the deserted land. The top of the mountain it burns with billowing flames all year round. And the volcanic ash almost covers an area of dozens of kilometers in radius. The closest road to the Pagros Mountains is the road to Pussy Mountain. However, this road is very difficult. Few adventure groups choose to go here. This road is basically covered with a thick layer of volcanic ash. Horses walking on the volcanic ash are like walking in a difficult desert. And the sky there are volcanic ash flying everywhere. Making it difficult to breathe smoothly. People who are not familiar with this place dare not take this road at all. Once the horse's leg is broken by a rock crevice on the way, it will fall into death. Therefore, many foreign adventure groups who enter the adventure village through the deserted land will choose to take a detour to avoid the ash-shrouded area of Pudu Mountain, which will virtually double the distance traveled. For the villagers in the barren land, it is not difficult to cross Pussy Mountain. The four-wheeled carriages in Wall Village have almost opened a flat road between Pusty Mountain and Wall Village. Sernak and his party only put masks on the mouths and noses of their war horses and headed towards Pussy Mountain overnight. As long as you pass Pussy Mountain, the brown barren mountains will gradually return to green, which is the northern edge of the barren land. Once you enter the Pagalos Mountains, you have left the Bina province. The villagers here in the deserted land rarely go to the mountains to make a living, even if they have to store some mountain goods for the winter and the autumn. The villagers living here only dare to live in the outermost woodlands of the mountains. Only some experienced hunters dare to enter the mountains. Deep in the Grow Mountains, there are some rare high-level monsters living in that mountain range. And the materials on these monsters are extremely precious. Therefore, even though everyone knows that there are dangers there, there are always some hunters and adventure groups entering Pagro's Mountain every year. And they die in Pagro's every year. There are definitely not a few hunters and adventure groups in the mountains. It took Serdak and his party more than two days to reach the foot of Pussy Mountain which was already his territory, when passing by the Lava River Sulphur Mine. Sernak also went to inspect the camp of the Sulphur Mine, due to the Harvest Festival. Luke, who was guarding the Sulphur Mine, led 400 Cobalt Slaves back. Wall Village. Currently on vacation in Wall Village, there is no one at the Sulphur Mining Camp. Before leaving, Luke had already hidden the Sulphur Mines and grains that he could not take away. There was nothing in the camp except a few roofless houses built with stone flakes. Carol saw the boundary markers around Pudu Mountain and was puzzled that Soldak chose Pudu Mountain as his territory. However, when he saw that there were sulfur mines hidden near the lava river here, he regretfully said, In the past, when Pussy Mountain was still a no man's land, why didn't anyone discover that there was a sulfur mine here? Sernak and his party continued to travel north from the Pudu Mountain sulfur mine when they entered the foothills of the southernmost part of the Paglos Mountains. More than a thousand knights from the joint forces of the two cities composed of the guard camp of Helena City and Bena City. And the intelligence office of Bena City just arrived at Wall Village. A large number of knights marched into the deserted land. The knights were divided into several long thin lines in the vast deserted land. Like winding centipedes crawling among the mountains. There is nothing in the desolate land. So the military supplies department of Helena City is responsible for the logistic supply of the coalition forces. From the most basic war horse fodder marching rations, weapons and armor tents and other basic supplies, to magic scrolls, fire scale bullets, bed crossbows magic consumables, and expensive ordnance have to be prepared. When these knights leave the city, 
there is already a steady flow of supplies being transported to the deserted land. Apparently Archduke Newman's anger made the people at the Benna City Guard camp, and the intelligence office finally realize that if this matter is not handled well, they may be transferred to Handanar County in the Warsaw Plain at any time to participate in the fight against evil. A ghost plane war is the nightmare they least want to see. No one dares to take it lightly anymore. However, in this operation, the top leaders of the two cities' coalition forces actually dragged out two bed crossbows, which seemed a bit exaggerated. You must know that what they are chasing is just a group of more than 20 magicians. To deal with the magicians, the heavy bed crossbow will most likely not be used. The two cities' coalition forces dispatched nearly a thousand knights. The main reason was that they were worried that Dark Moon Gate would also prepare a large number of cavalry in the rear. What the Dark Moon Gate organization is best at is creating temporary portals. As long as they are given enough time, they can evacuate a city in the shortest time regardless of the cost. This is the most terrifying thing about the Dark Moon Gate organization. Place. In addition to these more than a thousand knights, the two cities coalition forces also had a squadron of Bena swordsmen, who were also on their way to Helensa City. Grand Knight Glenn originally planned to join the knights of the guard camp in Helensa City, and then enter the deserted land together. However, he did not expect that news of the Dark Moon Gate magician would come from the deserted land so quickly. Only then did they have to make a quick decision and decided to abandon the constructed swordsman squadron. And all the coalition forces entered the deserted land. That night, Aphrodite summoned Serdak back to Wall Village. Serdak's security team had entered the Pagros Mountains at this time. He drew the marching roots of the Night Alliance and the Mage Group on two parchment maps of the deserted land and then asked Aphrodite to move the two the parchment map was given to Selena, who then handed it to the village chief of Bright, who handed it over to Lance of the Magician Group and Carl of the Knights of the Guard Battalion. Although the Magician Group set out half a day later than the Knights of the Guard Camp, the more than 20 Magician elites from the Hellanza Magic Union Law Enforcement Group and the Bena City Magic Union arrived at Wall Village one step ahead of the Knight Alliance of the two cities. And he got a clearly marked map from the village chief Bright first. The magicians rode magic harpoons directly over Oak Ridge and into the desolate land. Although the higher-ups ordered the magicians and the knights of the two cities to cooperate in fighting, the commanders of both sides had no intention of joining forces. The magician group is also led by a great magician sent by the Bena Magic Guild. His level is half a level higher than the commander of the Knight Alliance of the two cities, Glen Knight. After Lance got the map, the magician group took the lead into the deserted land according to the map route left by Suldak. By the time the knights from the two cities arrived at Wall Village, the magician group had already flown away in a swarm. Grand Knight Glenn did not stay any longer in Wall Village and just rested for half the night. As soon as it got dark the next morning, he led more than a thousand knights and set out again. Before leaving, Grand Knight Glenn temporarily designated Wall Village as a transit point for supplies. The southern slopes of the Paglos Mountains near Pussy Mountain are covered with bare rocks, and they look desolate at first glance. But as long as you walk a little further, you will see the endless green mountains. And even the foot of the mountains is a lush grassland. However, the villagers in the deserted land would rather hide in the ravines of the deserted land than dare to build a village at the foot of the Pagros Mountains. This is mainly because there are often monsters here. If a monster walks out of the Pagros Mountains, possessing the power to destroy small villages. When he arrived at the edge of the Pagros Mountains, Carol became cautious. He was very familiar with the surrounding environment. He led the security team through the forest in a familiar way, looking for marks left in the forest as he walked into the depths of the Pagros Mountains. I also met other adventure groups on the way, and both parties were on guard, although some adventure groups were willing to exchange information with each other. Serdak did not give those adventure maps any chance to get close. They did not need the information on those adventure maps. So naturally they would not waste time on them. The deeper they went into the Paglos Mountains, the more cautious Carol became. Serdak was a little confused. Such a lush mountain range was rich in Warcraft resources. Since the lords would develop other planes, why was there no one leading the Construct Knights to occupy this mountain range? Along the way, we did not encounter those difficult monsters described by Carol. There were no traces of these ferocious monsters such as the Geomancer, Knight Saber, Jungle Saber Toothed Tiger, and Giant Ape. This made Guaidam somewhat disappointed. However, the security team was very lucky to encounter a herd of blue ice deer. However, the group of blue ice deer was very alert. When they saw Serdak's team from a distance, they quickly went into the jungle. It was not until dawn on the fourth day 
that Carol finally found the companion responsible for tracking in the Paglos Mountains. The companion was covered in camouflage made of green branches and was hiding under an umbrella that was almost 30 meters high. At the top of the tree, if Carol hadn't found the mark under the tree, he wouldn't have been able to find this companion. The hunter slipped down from the tree, and Carol quickly asked, Where are they? The hunter pointed forward, In the mountains in front. They have been staying here for two days. Every once in a while, magicians will come out to patrol on stilts. The trees here have a good view. I'm just hiding here. With that said, he led a group of people forward. Why did they stop here for so long? Carol asked strangely. Isn't there a mountain giant entrenched in the ruins of the mountain ahead? They are organizing a hunt for that big guy. The young hunter smiled, showing his white teeth. The warhorse and the ogre Gulitum were left in a dense forest. Gulitum's target was too big, and he would be easily discovered by the enemy's patrolling magician if he moved forward. So he stayed behind. Suldak, Andrew and Samira also followed Carol's example, and wrapped some branches and leaves around themselves, carefully climbed up the mountain ridge in front, and hid behind a crevice in the cliff. From here, they could just see the mountains in front of them. Valley. There are ruins at the bottom of the circular valley in front of you, hidden among the lush green forests. Now, that woodland is littered with downed trees. On the battlefield, a mountain giant with a height of more than 20 meters was holding a log more than 20 meters long in each hand, constantly trampling on the boulders between the ruins, panting and chasing the magicians riding magic harpoons. More than two dozen magicians rode magic harpoons around the ruins, throwing fire bombs and lighting bolts at the mountain giant from time to time. Chapter 574 Joined Forces Serdak and his party hid behind a gap in the cliff at the top of the mountain. This is an excellent observation point discovered by Carol's fellow hunters. A dense clump of oleander leaves blocks everyone. Even the patrolling magicians looking down from the sky cannot see Serdak. A hiding place for a group of people. The valley in front of you presents a complete circular outline. Even if it is covered by dense forests, you can still see it very clearly. The mountain giant is more than 20 meters tall. Its body is as huge as a hill. And its height is almost the same as a five-story building. He waved the two giant trees in his hands. And the ruins below the valley suddenly flew into the air. No one within a hundred meters around him dared to approach. And countless trees fell to the surroundings. The mountain giant's body was covered with mottled rock armor. The fireballs, which were not much bigger than coconuts, fell on him. Just like the mountain giant casually struck matches, the weak fluorescence could not cause any harm to him. A series of lightning fell, turning into countless electric arcs and drilling into the body of the mountain giant, and then flowed into the ground along his body, looking at the flies flying randomly above the head. The mountain roared irritably. It violently threw the giant tree in its hand towards a dark moon gate magician who was riding a magic harpoon and galloping through the air. The huge tree was mixed with fierce wind and whizzed past the magician's feet, frightening the magician. The pants under the teacher's robe were all wet. The roaring giant tree brought up a strong wind, causing him to somersault three times in the air before he could stabilize his body. At this moment, transparent mana light shields lit up on the bodies of other magicians riding magic harpoons. Under the refraction of the sun, those egg-shaped masks are particularly dazzling. How long has this level of fighting lasted? Serdek retracted his head from behind the boulder and asked the hunter beside him in a low voice. Overhead, a magician from the dark moon gate roared past on a magic harpoon. Samira put back the fully drawn alloy bow and stared at the retreating figure in the sky. She had a chance to shoot down the mage with an arrow just now, but she held back at the last moment. She knew in her heart that once she did this, the whereabouts of the security team and her team would be exposed. She took two deep breaths, calmed down silently. It's almost two days and two nights. The hunter felt the murderous aura emanating from Samira's body and moved his body towards the stone wall. Andrew leaned against a rock wall that had been washed clean by the rain, readjusted the branches and leaves above his head, and asked, What on earth do you think those magicians are doing? Maybe they want to exhaust the mountain giant's physical strength, Samira guessed. Carol shook his head at this time and whispered, What they did has no effect at all. It is the son of the earth goddess Gaia. As long as the feet do not leave the earth, the power of the earth will continue to flow along the feet. The feet are injected into its body. It is the master of this mountain. We hunt here and never dare to go close to this area. This is my first time here. Samira squatted on a fragrant tree and looked down through the gaps between the leaves. Not long after, she pointed to the ruins below and said to Suldak, Look over there. 
They seem to be setting up a magic circle. Why are the costumes of those magicians different from those in the sky? Under the cover of thick leaves, Sernak looked in the direction pointed by Samira. Sure enough, in the gap between the dense forest and the ruins, he could see several magicians laying metal rune plates in the open space. The magic circle seems to be made up of nearly a hundred metal rune plates. And there are seven obsidian round pillars at the edge of the magic circle. Each stone pillar is engraved with a strange rune. The magic robes worn by the magicians are all black with dark gold stripes. But the style is similar to that of Cyrus. The robes of Hickok, Marion, and Samoa, the magicians of the Black Magic Priory, are almost identical. Those who set up the magic circle should be magicians from the Black Magic Hermitage. Soldak said in a positive tone, facing the spells of the Dark Moon Gate magicians. The mountain giants violently trampled down a large area of trees around the valley, moved huge boulders from the ruins, and threw them violently at the magicians flying in the air. They were huge, and the group of magicians were like flies landing on the skin of a watermelon. They all dispersed with a buzz. Near the edge of the ruins, seven magicians from the Black Magic Monastery stood under the obsidian pillars. As they recited stagnant spells, the obsidian pillars slowly released their magic power and the runes on the pillars were written one after another. It lit up, and a ferocious-looking ghost head slowly rose in the center of the circle. With its mouth wide open, the sound of curses continued to sound, and a pale arm stretched out from the ghost's head. The moment the arm stretched out, the ghost head in the center of the magic circle was burst open by a huge force. Purple blood instantly filled the arm, and a four-meter-tall, blood-red tortured demon burst open the evil statue. The ghost head crawled out from the door. The tortured demon had a huge shackle on his neck, and his body was full of muscles. He came out of the evil ghost door, his body burning with black flames, and he looked at the mountain giant on the battlefield and let out a roar. In front of the mountain giant, the Shing demon, covered in black flames, was just as tall as the mountain giant's knees. A lavender hexagram formation emerged at the feet of a magician. Sleeping cloud? A faint cloud of smoke condensed in the air, and as the wind enveloped the mountain giant's body, the mountain giant's body swayed as if he was drunk. The mountain giant almost fell, but he woke up instantly and grabbed a huge stone, smashed towards the magician. Shing Imo jumped away quickly, protecting the magician and avoiding the boulder. The mountain giant finally lowered his head and took a serious look at the hell torture demon and the black mage. He raised his big feet like a hut with an expressionless face and stepped fiercely towards the hell torture demon. This time, the torture demon did not without hiding. He raised his hands up to meet the mountain giant's feet. At this time, the magician beside Shingemo recited the incantation again, and a larger magic array appeared. Serdak could even feel that the magical elements around him became active. A huge stalagmite broke out of the ground in an instant, and the sharp tip of the bamboo shoot went straight towards the soles of the mountain giant's feet. Unexpectedly, the mountain giant was not afraid of the stalagmite at all, and directly stepped on it together with the stalagmite and the torture demon. The stalagmite instantly cracked into rubble. Shing Imo held the mountain giant's feet with both hands. But the stalemate only lasted for a few seconds before it exploded with a bang. And countless black flames wrapped around the mountain giant's feet and burned violently. Who would have thought that the Hell Punisher, who possesses at least a third level of magical beast strength, would be crushed into pieces of paper with just one kick in front of the mountain giant? Several more torture demons covered in black flames crawled out from the summoning circle and silently surrounded the mountain giant. Carol's other three hunter companions also gathered at the crevice on the top of the mountain. When they saw Serdak, they all showed great respect. Serdak looked at the ruins below, thought for a moment, and turned his head, said to Samira, Tamira, you and a hunter guide go to the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group. Tell them that the members of the Dark Moon Gate and the Black Magic Hermitage are here. And bring them here. Yeah. Samira jumped down from the tree and stood next to Soldak. Soldak said to Andrew again, Andrew, take the hunter guide to Captain Sauron and the others. I will keep an eye on them here. Yes, Captain, Andrew said. The two of them followed the hunter guide down the mountain, while Serdak continued to guard the crevices on the top of the mountain, monitoring the situation in the valley. McLeish stood behind a large boulder in the ruins at the bottom of the valley, looking at the mountain giant that was about to flatten the ruins, and spit out the sand in his mouth. Unexpectedly, there was such a huge creature outside the Red Dragon Treasure. The magicians from the Dark Moon Gate were divided into three teams and took turns fighting. They had been staying in this valley for two days. 
The original battle plan was just to send a team of magicians riding magic harpoons to lure this big guy away. But for two days in a row, this mountain giant only walked in circles in this valley, which made him lose face in the team. He felt that although the magicians from the Black Magic Monastery didn't say anything, they must have doubts about his ability in their hearts. Due to a major irreversible mistake in the Red Dragon Treasure operation organized by the Dark Moon Gate, the collaborators in the Northern Rebel Army were almost completely wiped out in Binna Province. Originally, the Dark Moon Gate held the crystal key and half-broken map of the Red Dragon Treasure. At that time, they were only one step away from the Red Dragon Treasure. Unfortunately, due to various internal accidents, the broken map and the crystal key were all lost from the hand. How Hal's trump card was beaten to pieces by the Kirsten magician. And it took a lot of effort to regain the half of the broken map. At this time, the Black Magic Hermitage came directly to the door and offered cooperation with the crystal key. McLeish didn't even want to look at the Black Magicians at the edge of the ruins. Those Black Magicians who fell into darkness are like a group of rats in a hole in the rolling continent. If they didn't have the crystal key, McLeish sighed again at the thought. Cyril Dent slowly descended from the sky with several young magicians from the first team. The figures of the second team of magicians had already appeared in the sky. Now it was their team's turn to continue to contain the mountain giants. Cyril Dent's face was covered with sweat. He strode up to McLeish and said, Teacher, the low-level magic scrolls we carry are not too many. Why don't we change our strategy? After speaking, Cyril Dent sat down in front of McLeish, drank the water in the cup, and sat in the awning to rest. Those black magicians have already taken action. But the demons coming out of the dark summoning circle only have the strength of the early stage of level 3 and cannot deal with the mountain giants of the peak stage of level 4. I guess they must have some other backups. McLeish said with a cold face. The four torture demons were still being beaten back by the mountain giants on the battlefield. If it weren't for the magicians from the dark moon gate in the sky, they might have been trampled to death by the mountain giants at any time. At this time, a black magician stood in the summoning circle on the edge of the ruins. He opened his arms and recited a long spell loudly. And a lavender six-pointed star magic glow appeared under his feet. Chapter 575 Tide The black magician in the summoning circle is Flanagan, the leader of this group of members of the Black Magic Monastery. The entire array was filled with a faint purple mist, and huge black bubbles continued to emerge from the ground covered with metal rune plates. These bubbles continued to emerge from the black swamp and burst. At this moment, the summoning circle turned into a huge quagmire. Five huge eyeballs about one meter in diameter slowly emerged from the quagmire. The red pupils exuded an evil aura. There were dozens of willow branches growing under these eyeballs. Tentacles. After these eye monsters emerged from the summoning circle, they slowly rose into the air. They stared at the mountain giants on the battlefield. Their eyes constantly absorbing the devilish energy. The tentacles under the eyeballs are constantly flowing with mana and these eyes gradually become blood red. The mountain giant seemed to feel the threat of the evil eyes. He slowly twisted his body and looked at the floating evil eyes in the air. He wanted to use the giant tree in his hand to pull these floating eyes out of the air. The photo was taken, but there were a few torture demons entangled with it at its feet. The mountain giant was furious. He raised his foot and stepped on one of the torture demons, turning it into a ball of purple blood. Magician McLeish stood on the boulder, looked at the big eyes in midair, and said with surprise, they actually developed a magic circle to summon the evil eyes of H. L. These evil eyes can release death rays, and the mountain giants my armor may not be able to withstand these rays. Then he said to the student Cyril Dent in the awning, it seems that we have to prepare a little bit this time. Send a signal to the second team, and let them fly farther. We are ready to release the lightning matrix. The lightning matrix is a large-scale composite electric magic developed by the Dark Moon Gate organization. Space magic is an advanced magic of electric magic. Just like ice magic is an advanced magic of water magic. As space magicians, they are also proficient in electric magic. See those evil eyes gathering momentum in midair. When ready to go, McLeish immediately organized the magicians, who were resting in the rear, to form a formation. And then began to prepare large-scale magic. As the same spell sounded, each of these dark moon gate magicians standing in a circle gathered a lightning ball in their hands. McLeish stood in the middle of the circle, and the lightning power from all the magicians was transmitted to Magician McLeish. Countless lightning balls gathered together and formed a continuously beating lightning chain under the control of Magician McLeish. As Magician McLeish finished reciting the spell, the lightning chain turned out to be like a chain with a length of two meters. The electric snake, which was more than ten meters thick as a bucket, 
quickly scurried towards the mountain giant a hundred meters away. Cyril Dent originally did not think that these magicians on his side could kill this mountain giant that had surpassed the peak of the fourth level. However, he saw that the lightning chain turned into a ring of restraint, locking the body of the mountain giant. And the lightning beam electrocuted it. His whole body was burned. And a glimmer of hope arose in his heart. The huge lightning chain turned into a huge power grid on the mountain giant's body. And the giant tree in the mountain giant's hand was completely carbonized in an instant. At the same moment, five eyeballs in midair opened their eyelids almost at the same time. Five beams of black light shot out from the eyes. And the death beam instantly penetrated the body of the mountain giant. Five bloody holes appeared on the mountain giant's upper body. And were wrapped with countless lightning bolts. Seeing the mountain giant's vitals pierced by five beams of light. Cyril Dent, who was standing in the mage queue, breathed a sigh of relief. However, after waiting for a long time, the mountain giant did not fall as tragically as everyone had hoped. Instead used brute force to break free of the big net woven by lightning. Reached out and pinched the evil eye in midair in the palm of his hand. And with a slight exertion, the evil eye turned into a pool of purple blood. The mountain giant followed the same pattern and crushed all the slow-moving evil eyes in midair with a few waves of his hand. Even though his feet were wrapped in black flames, he killed all the summon torture demons, and the arcs on his body disappeared little by little. Although the mountain giant had a few more wounds, it did not affect his movements at all. It found the summoning circle on the edge of the ruins at a glance, and rushed towards the summoning circle in large strides, covering more than 10 meters in one step. The magicians from the Dark Moon Gate rode around again on magic harpoons, tearing open the magic scrolls, and fireballs and arcs fell on the mountain giant again. The mountain giant hunched over, letting the magic fall on his generous back, and rushed to the summoning circle. Those black magicians had no time to put away the summoning circle. They only had time to put the obsidian pillars into their magic pockets, and the metal ring plate on the ground was trampled to pieces by the mountain giant. The mountain giant was stronger than expected and the injuries on his body only aroused its ferocity. He stepped heavily on the ground, and the entire valley trembled slightly. The mountain giant turned sideways to avoid a series of fireballs, and raised his voice. He hit a magic potion handle with his hand, and the magician riding on the magic pottery handle rolled and fell out. A dark moon gate member riding a magic harpoon happened to fly near the magician's landing point. When he saw the magician flying over, he grabbed the magician's belt and caught him in midair. McLeish did not expect that the large magic matrix of the Dark Moon Gate could only restrain the mountain giant for a few seconds, and did not cause any wounds on him. On the contrary, two magicians were injured in the battle. Seeing that the H, L torture demons, and evil eyes summoned by the black magicians could not defeat the mountain giant, McLeish gritted his teeth and strode towards the black magician Flanagan. Magician Flanagan had just spent a lot of mana to summon the H, L demon, and his face turned slightly pale. The summoning circle, he had worked so hard to build was crushed by the mountain giant. And all the magic rune boards worth hundreds of gold were destroyed. He could only temporarily withdraw from the battlefield with seven black magicians. In the morning, he also laughed at McLeish's incompetence. But now, he finally understood McLeish's inner feelings. That feeling of unexplainable pain was very uncomfortable. When magician Flanagan saw McLeish approaching, he stood up politely and said politely, It's a bit embarrassing to say, that the demon summoned by the magic circle is at least one level different from the mountain giant. In this mountain giant, it actually has no effect in front of me. Our forbidden magic is useless. So this time, I am here to formally invite you to join our second plan, Magician McLeish said. I want to withdraw some magicians to build a temporary teleportation array, so the Priory will also participate in the task of containing the mountain giants. We will try our best to complete it, Magician Flanagan said seriously. McLeish nodded, and then discussed with Magician Flanagan to send magicians to take turns to contain the mountain giants. Magician McLeish led a group of men to build a temporary teleportation array in a hidden forest in the valley overnight. Serdak and Carol took turns watching the battle in the valley. It was not until noon the next day that Magician McLeish finally successfully built a temporary portal in the hidden woodland on the edge of the ruins. He casually put a large number of magic crystals into the gem base. The magic portal began to operate slowly and a magician from the Dark Moon Gate walked into the temporary portal. What are they doing? Carol asked doubtfully, as he watched a teleportation array being built. It's probably to bring in the reinforcements from the Dark Moon Gate, Zaldek said softly. Before he finished speaking, groups of tall warriors wrapped in linen entered the valley through the portal. These warriors held tridents in their hands, 
several graceful figures appeared in the team. But they were also tall. This group of warriors moved very quickly. And soon they began to form a square array at the entrance to the ruins. The magicians riding magic harpoons in the sky continued to pull the mountain giants. Those graceful figures held crystal balls in their hands. They first looked around the valley, and then selected the mountain where Serdak was hiding. I climbed halfway up the mountain in one breath before stopping. Serdak thought that these people had discovered their whereabouts, and was considering whether to fight before evacuating. Unexpectedly, the group of people stopped halfway up the mountain. At the same time, he also saw clearly the group of tall men. The true identity of the figure is that these people are actually a group of fishtailed warriors from the Pompeii Sea tribe. These guys were actually covered with scales. Those strong warriors held tridents in one hand and solid conch sh. Ls in the other. Their bodies were covered with green scales. There were actually three witches among the Pompeii tribe who climbed halfway up the mountain. Magicians Flanagan and McLeish immediately walked to Pompeii, the leader of the Pompeii tribe, and a group of people gathered together to discuss the battle plan. Those Pompeii warriors did not enter the battlefield immediately. Nearly 300 Pompeii warriors formed a huge encirclement around the ruins. And the Pompeii warriors on the mountainside moved out 20 conch sh. Ls that looked like huts. These sh. Ls were engraved with lengthy magic runes. The three Pompeii witches quickly inlaid some snow white pearls and magic gems into the conch sh. Ls. On the sh. L. This time. All the magicians from the dark moon gate withdrew from the air. Only the six black magicians from the Priory were restraining the mountain giant in the air. Magician McLeish set up a lightning matrix formation on the hillside this time. And the three Pompeii witches began to cast spells continuously. The conch sh. Ls halfway up the mountain kept flashing with light of mana. And poured out from the conch sh. Ls. A large amount of seawater did not flow down the hillside into the valley bottom. The large amount of seawater seemed to be restrained by an invisible force. It poured out of the conch sh. L and was accumulated halfway up the mountain. As if it was being contained. Enter an infinity transparent bathtub. As the seawater poured in. The three Pompeii witches raised their hands. Almost simultaneously to control the huge wave. That was tens of meters high on the hillside. The mountain giant finally noticed something strange on the hillside here. He got rid of the entanglement of the black magician. And rushed towards this side. With big strides. The Pompeii warriors hiding in the forest still did not launch an attack. At this time. McLeish and the members of the Dark Moon Gate once again gathered a huge electric snake. This lightning chain was drawn directly on the mountain giant. The lightning chain turned into electric circles and tied the mountain giant firmly in place. Serdak was hiding on the top of the mountain and could clearly hear the Pompeii witches singing the spell in Janna language. As the spell fell, the tens of meters of sea water accumulated halfway up the mountain instantly turned into thousands of troops and rushed toward the mountain giant. The front wave carried the rocks and trees in the valley and swept the mountain giant away. Into it. At the same time, nearly 300 Pompeii warriors plunged into the sea, and rushed towards the mountain giant, along with the raging tide. Seeing the huge tide appearing in the valley, Soldak and Carol both looked at the scene in front of them in shock. Chapter 576 Escape The sea water carried a large number of rolling stones and giant trees, forming the first huge wave that hit the mountain giant. The sea water directly covered the waist of the mountain giant. The huge momentum caused the mountain giant to take two steps back. It tried hard to maintain the balance of its body and faced the waves to stand firm in the seawater. It clumsily picked up a huge log from the sea, faced the wave, rounded its arms, and smashed it towards the mountainside. Before he could retract his hand, another higher wave came, and the seawater directly flooded its chest. The mountain giant roared in panic for the first time and flapped its arms vigorously in the seawater. It wanted to as it walked higher, a huge tree hit its chest head-on. Its body suddenly leaned back and fell into the sea. Its hill-like body was instantly submerged by the seawater. Hundreds of Pompeian warriors holding tridents shuttled back and forth in the rapids filled with boulders and rolling logs in the sea. They had giant tails like mermaids. But there was no tail fin at the end of the giant tail. But a point like a moray eel. There are dark red fins on their tails. Armpits and elbows. Allowing them to swim freely in the sea when the mountain giant was knocked down by the waves. This group of Pompeii warriors swam towards the mountain giant in the sea. A fierce battle suddenly broke out under the sea. The mountain giant disappeared, and the sea water seemed to be boiling. Then, one arm of the mountain giant stretched out of the water. Several tridents were inserted into the arm that was harder than rock. Several Pompeii warriors, who were brought out of the water jumped into the water one after another. 
Then the head of the mountain giant emerged from the water. There were some wet branches hanging above its head. It stood up from the sea in a very embarrassed manner. But it was hit by another huge wave of waves. Serdak never expected that the reinforcements brought in by the Dark Moon Gate organization would actually be a group of Pompeii warriors. These eel-tailed warriors could reach almost five or six meters in length and shuttle freely in the seawater. This valley is a natural crater, and there are no low-lying gaps around it. The tide summoned by the Pompeii which suddenly turned the valley into a vast ocean. The mountain giant stood in the seawater up to his chest, and the surroundings were full of whirlpools. He was a little unsteady on his feet, and Pompeii warriors kept attacking his body underwater. It was unable to resist at all, and could only let out a roar of rage. Facing the waves coming towards it, the mountain giant found that he could not get close to the mountainside. He could only let out an unwilling roar and fled towards the north side of the circular valley, thinking that to escape across the mountains into the depths of the Paglos Mountains. A large group of Pompeii warriors chased after the mountain giant. The mountain giant kept charging forward, but Pompeii warriors kept chasing and intercepting them. They stopped and went all the way, and the battle continued until sunset. On the water surface of the ruins, the sea water formed a huge whirlpool and continued to pour into the ground. The three Pompeii witches exhausted their magic power halfway up the mountain and could only maintain the water level in the circular valley. The mountain giant became exhausted after soaking in the sea water. He stood with his lower body in the sea water, leaning against the mountain wall to resist the siege. Pompeii warriors. Even when it got completely dark, the fighting there still didn't stop. The magicians from the Dark Moon Gate and the Priory rode on magic harpoons to attack the mountain giants in the air. After dark, these magicians landed one after another. The terrain near the circular mountain wall was complicated, and they rode on magic harpoons at night. Flying is very dangerous. The mountain giants could no longer be seen in the field of vision. Serdek emerged from the cracks in the rocks and stood on the edge of the cliff to look at the valley. The valley was flooded by sea water. The waves continued to swallow the mountain walls. Many rocks on the mountain walls continued to collapse. Fall. I want to get closer and see the situation of the mountain giants, Serdak said to Hunter Carol while standing on the rock. Then let's go around here. Carol didn't ask too much and took the lead in leading the way. The two of them got into the dense jungle at the top of the mountain. The jungle was pitch dark. The little beasts that lurked during the day and came out at night all fled when they heard the noise. Thorny grass grew out of the low bushes and scratched on Serdak's leather boots. The rotten grass scraped everywhere, making my trouser legs rustle. After walking for a while, I pass through this bush. The road ahead is a jagged cliff with strange rocks. It is more difficult to walk here than in a dense forest. It is pitch black below. From time to time, there is the sound of the seawater hitting the rocks. The mountain wind howls. And from time to time, there is the echo of some gravel falling into the sea. The mountain giant's battlefield seemed very far away. Serdak spent most of the night searching along the mountains before he finally saw the mountain giant trapped in a mud pit under a steep cliff. He was covered in scars and leaning against the rock wall. His head was resting on a rock, and most of his body was sunk in the mud. The sea water washed over his chest and abdomen one after another. It was like a silent rock mountain in the dark night, and he couldn't even hear any of his breathing. Pompey marine warriors swam in the dark water, guarding the mountain giant. Serdak squatted on the stone cliff at the top of the mountain. Through the faint moonlight, he could clearly see the black shadows swimming back and forth on the sparkling water. He looked through the magic waste bag and found that there were plenty of sacrifices inside. He took out a bundle of ropes from the magic waste bag, tied one end of the rope to a boulder next to the stone cliff, and then dropped the whole bundle of ropes off the stone cliff. He pulled on the rope with both hands and felt that it was still very strong. So he planned to slide down the cliff along the rope. Carol grabbed Soldak's arm and said to him, Baron, it's dangerous down there. Soldak originally wanted Carol to let loose on the cliff. But after thinking that if he was discovered by the Pompeii Sea Tribe, he might be in danger at any time. So he said to Carol, I want to give it a try and see if it can work. Rescue it. Don't worry about me later. Go find Gulitum to meet up. It may become very dangerous here. I will find a way to find you. Hunter Carol wanted to dissuade him again. But half of Soldak's body was already submerged into the cliff. So Carol nodded and said, Baron, please be careful. I will go find the ogre to pick you up. Waiting for me where you are. You and Gulitum keep an eye on our horses. After saying that, Serdak pulled the hemp rope tightly and slid down the rope little by little. Normally, this would be nothing. But in the dark night, the surrounding light was dim. 
so one must be careful. A few rocks were kicked off along the way, and the sound of splashing water was quickly drowned in the sound of the waves, and did not attract the attention of the Pompeii warriors. The tide formed a huge whirlpool in the valley, and large amounts of seawater continued to pour into the space under the ruins. The seawater level in the valley continued to decrease. Serdak jumped from the cliff to the mountain giant's head. The mountain giant's head was almost as big as half a room. Its face looked very old, and its rock-like skin had countless marks of carvings and axes. He only had a very straight nose and deep eye sockets. Those eyes were as white as two large pieces of white jade. There were no pupils or even eyelids in the eyes. They emitted weak fluorescence and were always open. He put one hand to his mouth and spread the other hand, telling the mountain giant that he had no intention of doing anything. He could feel that the mountain giant had focused its attention on him. Serdak quickly hid behind a rock. Here you can avoid the sight of the Pompeii warriors, but at the same time be in front of the mountain giants. Serdak squatted beside the stone. To the mountain giant, he was as small as a bird under the eaves. He could feel that the power of the mountain giant was slowly fading, and the vitality in him was forming. Fading away is a very mysterious feeling. Serdak said to the mountain giant, Can you understand me? I can help you. Those jade-like eyes were like huge screens, flashing brightly and dimly, as if in response to Serdak. Serdak suddenly set up a sacrificial ceremony on the ground and took out a few sacrificial offerings of salamander head quality from his magic belt bag. Then he said to the mountain giant, I want to try, but I can't guarantee it, and I will leave immediately if I encounter danger. Seeing no response from the mountain giant, Serdak started the sacrificial ceremony. The double-faced, four-armed demon statue slowly appeared in the altar. Serdak smiled hesitantly and took out a Cerberus head covered in quicklime to sacrifice. The Cerberus head had become very shriveled. Serdak didn't know whether it could still be used as a sacrifice. After he offered the sacrifice, a beam of light fell on the mountain giant in the dark night. Although the light was very weak, it still penetrated far in the dark night. A group of Pompeii warriors discovered something strange here. Get closer to this side immediately. They were worried that the mountain giant still had the power to fight back. So they did not dare to come close. They just climbed onto the mountain giant's chest and stabbed everywhere with their tridents. Isn't it even possible to use the blessed body? Serdak said to Presley when he saw that the mountain giant didn't respond at all. He lowered his head and rummaged through his magic pocket, gritted his teeth and took out three precious salamander heads. These three salamander heads seemed to be very fresh. They were brought back by the ogre Gulitum this time. The ogre brought a total of seven such salamander heads from the lava river. It must be said that the ogre is an excellent hunter, not only possessing sufficient strength, but also very patient. In order to guard a salamander, he squatted motionless on the bank of the lava river for a day and a night. Three salamander heads were sacrificed, and Serdak chose to bless the mountain giant with the blessing effect of hegemony. In the dark night, it was like a golden light broke through the clouds and shone on the mountain giant. The Pompeii marine warriors were completely shrouded in the golden beam. They jumped into the sea in panic, as the mountain giant let out a long roar. The mountain giant pulled out one arm from the mud. And then, he used one hand to support it. He clung to the rock wall on the shore. And half of his body stood up from the mud. The shouts of Pompeii sea warriors kept coming from all around. And the tridents fell on the mountain giants, like a rain of arrows in the dark night. It climbed out of the mud pit with great difficulty. Holding on to the dark cliff rocks with both hands. Its huge body, which was more than 20 meters high, was pulled out of the mud pit. The escaped mountain giant quickly disappeared into the thick night. Chapter 577 Good Neighbor Serdek When McLeish saw the mountain giant leaving the valley, he felt infinitely disappointed and felt a little relieved. This can be regarded as completing the original goal set. Moreover, these young magicians under their command did not have the courage to continue chasing the mountain giant at night. The purpose of their coming here was not to hunt down this mountain giant, whose strength was infinitely close to that of a level 5 monster. They just wanted to lure the mountain giant away and take the opportunity to enter the ruins and find the red dragon treasure. Just now, in everyone's eyes, the mountain giant was an easily accessible treasure. But now there is nothing. For these dark moon gate and monastery magicians, the most difficult thing to accept is not that there is no hope, but that they have clearly seen hope and then watched this hope slowly disappear in their own hands. McLeish advocated killing the mountain giants when they were at their weakest. Unfortunately, the three Pompeii sea witches were unwilling to sacrifice more warriors. They wanted to wait until daybreak for the three Pompeii witches to recover their mana, and then transform the valley. 
it became a vast ocean. And only the Pompeii warriors in the sea were able to completely suppress the mountain giants. In the dark night, the roars of the mountain giants in the distance gradually faded away. And the three Pompeii witches looked extremely ugly. The Black Magic Hermitage suffered the most serious losses this time. An entire set of metal rune plates for the summoning circle were destroyed in this battle. In addition, two black magicians were injured. Although their injuries are currently stable, came down, but also consumed two bottles of precious intermediate life potions. Hundreds of Pompeii marine warriors gathered around the maelstrom of ruins in the valley, silently watching a large amount of sea water pouring into the ground. Serdak stood on the shoulders of the mountain giant, watching the surrounding scenery quickly retreating in the endless night. When the mountain giant escaped from the valley, he slapped away a magician who tried to follow him in the night, and there was complete silence behind him. After running through two mountains, various monsters in the dense forest fled in all directions under the strong pressure of the mountain giant. The night wind blew through the wet sea water on the mountain giant's body, and the power of the earth poured in from the mountain giant's feet again. On his body, the mountain giant's two white eyes lit up again. He stopped in a mountain call, then sat on the hillside, reaching out and holding the soldak on his shoulder in his hand. Serdak talked face to face with the mountain giant. The mountain giant made a sound like rolling thunder in its throat. Its pitch was very limited. Like a terminally ill old man talking with a thick phlegm in his throat. Why are you helping me? The mountain giant stared at Soldak and asked solemnly. Serdak held a faintly shining holy light torch in his hand to make himself more conspicuous in the night. He straightened up his chest and pointed at the noble badge on his chest and said to the mountain giant, Yes, to you, to me, those people are a group of invaders and I am the master of that wasteland. He pointed casually at the deserted land. The mountain giant asked again, Human, you saved me. What do you need me to do for you? The strong coercion emanating from it made Serdak a little breathless. This kind of mountain giant, whose strength is on the verge of a fifth-level monster, can at least compete with the third-level strong men of the Green Empire, such as a certain dark man, knight, holy sword, magister, etc. Wanting it to become a follower is tantamount to wishful thinking. Serdak is very self-aware. So he asked, Will you continue to live here in the future? The mountain giant obviously did not understand this sentence and did not understand why Serdak asked this. Serdak came over, reached out and patted the tip of the mountain giant's index finger and said very proudly, We are neighbors. Since we are neighbors, shouldn't we help each other? The mountain giants accepted Serdak as their new neighbor. But then the mountain giant abandoned his new neighbor in this valley and walked into the depths of Paglo's mountain alone. In the distance, you can still hear the heavy and distant roars from the mountain giants. The whole mountain was shaking. The first ray of sunlight at dawn shines on the top of the mountain on the west side of the valley. The bottom of the valley became a mess. The sea water finally receded overnight. And the terrifying mountain giant also fled deep into Paglo's mountain. There were fallen and broken trees everywhere and there were almost no trees in the valley. In the intact forest land, the ruins were flattened by the tide, and a huge hole appeared in the center area. A large amount of seawater in the valley poured into this cave, causing the diameter of the cave to reach an astonishing more than 200 meters. Now, although all the seawater in the valley has receded, there are still some naturally formed creeks flowing like spider webs. A trickle of water continues to flow into this large cave. Magician McLeish of the Dark Moon Gate Magician Flanagan of the Priory, and three witches from the Pompeii Sea tribe stood side by side on the stone at the edge of the cave. Looking at the deep entrance, Magician Flanagan, he still held the crystal key in his hand. But he didn't expect that the crystal key, which had been repaired at a huge cost, was not used at all. A wave of level 4 group magic completely washed away the entrance to the ruins. Now Magician McLeish just hopes that the treasure inside will not be damaged. They have been carefully planning this red dragon treasure for nearly 10 years. Whether it is to obtain the dragon egg left by the female dragon or to obtain Angus Bray, the plain gate left by the Grand Duke of Deberry, or the legendary dragon slaying sword Qualsera, will make the operation of the Dark Moon Gate worthwhile. Duke Angus Bradbury was a dragon knight in the early days of the Green Empire. However, this matter has been overshadowed by another incident that is more likely to cause a sensation. One of his wives is a giant beast of llamas who was once the overlord of the Twin Seas. This wife even gave birth to a son with half-sea beast blood to Duke Angus Bradbury. After the death of Duke Angus Bradbury, he handed the treasure map to his two sons respectively. However, not long after, 
The second son with Sea Beast blood returned to the Twin Seas with half of the broken map. The Pompeii Sea Clan forces in the Twin Seas are qualified to participate this time mainly because they have half of the treasure map in their hands. The fall of the Bradbury family gave Dark Moon Gate an excellent opportunity to seize the Crystal Key and the treasure map. However, due to the unexpected death of Magician Gelden, the Dark Moon Gate suffered huge irreparable losses. After many twists and turns, the current situation of the three families carving up the Red Dragon treasure was achieved. Magician Cyril Dent rode on a magic pot and patrolled around the edge of the cave. And then came to Magician McLeish. He said to his teacher, Teacher, the sea water at the entrance of the cave has almost receded. Another young magician from the monastery also flew over and nodded slightly to Magician Flanagan. The three Pompeii Sea Tribe witches waved directly towards the Pompeii Sea Tribe warriors. And dozens of Sea Tribe warriors quickly jumped into the caves. The three combined forces officially began to search for the Red Dragon treasure. Not long after the Pompeii warriors jumped into the cave, a brilliant magic flare suddenly exploded in the sky on the north side. This should be an advance warning from the magician responsible for patrolling. Magician McLeish and Magic Flanagan the two teachers looked at each other. They didn't expect that the magicians from the law enforcement group would come to the door so quickly. And they would go straight to the treasure location. The three Benahai witches did not understand the specific meaning of the magic flare and looked at Magician McLeish with doubts on their faces. Magician McLeish immediately explained to the three Pompeii sea witches, Our trouble has arisen. But don't worry. There are no second-turn magicians in Alensa City. In terms of strength, they may not be our opponents. But we are exploring the speed needs to be accelerated even more. He glanced at the student next to him. Cyril Dent, almost without any instructions from him. Cyril Dent mounted the magic cauldron again and organized his men to fly towards the location where the magic signal flare was blooming. At the same time, there were three people from the Priory. A magician joined in. Serdak and Gulitam stood on a high hill, looking up at the two dozen magicians flying over their heads. He even waved to Lance and the magician team. The magicians in the law enforcement group didn't even plan to stop to say thank you to Soldek, or to stop to find out about the other magicians. This group of magicians from the law enforcement group, who were somewhat paranoid and arrogant, flew straight to the valley, preparing to make first contact with the magicians from the Dark Moon Gate. Serdak turned to Hunter Carroll and said, Do you know the reason why Imperial magicians repeatedly pay tuition during battles? Carroll, the reserve militiaman of the militia battalion, looked at Soldak in confusion, not knowing how to answer. It is because of various contradictions and estrangements. The contradiction between the magician nobles and the traditional old nobles. The contradictions between the nobles and the common people. Etc. That everyone dislikes each other. If there is no high-ranking commander who can suppress all this, then the war will become a mess. Soldak said to Carol. Serdak waited for a while, and then saw the half-elf archer Samira hurried back on the ancient bow lie horse. The light and sound of the magic explosion could be felt across the mountain range. Samira looked at Soldak with confusion and asked, Have they started a war so soon? Soldak nodded and said to Samira, Come on! Let's take a closer look. I hope Andrew can move faster. Immediately after there were several loud noises from the other side of the valley, which were clearly the explosions of fireballs. Serdak quietly entered the place with Samira, Gulitam, Carol and his fellow hunters. Ring Valley. By the time Soldak arrived in the dense forest of the Ring Valley, he could already see that the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group was at a complete disadvantage in this magic battle. Chapter 578 The Price of Growth In Soldak's mind, fire is omnipotent. Most of the magic guilds in the Green Empire are fire magicians. So the price of fire magic materials is much higher than other magic materials. The meat of fire monsters is also a hot commodity in many monster meat varieties. Meat can enhance fire resistance and fire element affinity, and is highly sought after by fire magicians. In addition, the inheritance of fire magic and various types of fire magic books are very complete. Many great magicians will also write some experience or analysis books about fire magic in their later years, so that more young magicians can learn about it. The master has gone further on the road of fire magic, but on the battlefield in the valley in front of them, dozens of magicians were flying around in the air on harpoons, chasing each other. The performance of the magicians of these law enforcement groups did not show that they were superior in fire magic. A fireball broke through the tree crown, hit the grass and exploded instantly, causing grass blades and soil to fly everywhere in the flames, leaving a burning smell everywhere. Fortunately, Samira was very alert and pulled Soldak to hide behind an oak tree in advance to avoid this wave of explosions. 
The ogre Gulitem who followed behind was not so lucky. Mud and grass clippings instantly covered his body. The ogre reached out and wiped the grass clippings off his face. He looked fiercely through the gap between the tree canopy and looked at the sky. The fire magician who flew by looked unhappy. Carol and her fellow hunters also got up from the ground, patted the dirt and grass clippings on their bodies, and continued to follow everyone very low-key. These hunters often hunted in the jungle and relied on them when tracking prey. Sensitive to avoid danger, the top of the tree crown 50 meters away shook violently, and a magician from the priory rushed out of the tree crown on a magic shackle. His body was covered with branches and leaves. If you look closely, you can still see his face, and there were several red marks on his arms, and a cut in his magic robe. He squinted one eye, which seemed to be injured. Only one eye was wide open and looking forward. He pulled the handle of the magic harpoon upwards with all his strength, raising the flying height trying to avoid a towering ancient tree in front of him. A young fire magician from the law enforcement group followed closely behind. He was holding a fire magic scroll in his hand, always trying to find an opportunity to throw the fireball. In this high-speed flying state, the accuracy of the fireball will be greatly affected. If you want to hit the black magician in front of you, timing and luck are essential. Seeing the monastery magician rushing from the dense forest with complex terrain to the rugged mountains above, the young magician from the law enforcement team behind him was still chasing after him. The hunter Carol, who was standing behind the team, said worriedly, He's going to suffer like this. Serdak followed Carol's gaze and saw the magician from the monastery doing extreme flying against the mountain rock wall, as if he was showing off his flying skills. The magicians from the law enforcement team behind were also very skilled, using the same movements to complete difficult rock flying and extreme turns. The fierce mountain wind blew across his face and the sleeves of the magic robe made a snapping sound. The young mage of the law enforcement group tightly clutched the scroll in his hand, missing a fleeting opportunity again, and he said with some regret, Try! The mountain wind filled his mouth, and he quickly closed it. He felt that his flying skills were a bit better than the magician from the monastery in front of him. The magic handle was also the latest model launched by the magic guild this year, but every time he was about to catch up, the other party would put a sticker on it. He leaned against the rock wall, and made an unexpected U-turn to put some distance between the two of them. The young mage of the law enforcement group decided to increase his speed. He threw the magic scroll in his hand at the corner of the rock in front, blowing up the guy in front of him. The magician of the priory seemed to have a premonition that flying ahead might be dangerous. He turned early and rushed towards a raised cliff. The young mage of the law enforcement group was unwilling to give up and quickly followed closely. Catching up quickly. At this moment, a bolt of lightning fell from the sky and landed accurately on the head of the young mage of the law enforcement team. In an instant, the brand new magic weapon hit the cliff and made a violent explosion. The young mage fell from the air. His whole body rolled back and forth in the sky, and he hit the cliff. He was so close to the stone cliff that he could not tear open the scroll of the magic light shield in time. The flesh and blood body hit the rock wall, and a pool of blood suddenly burst out, and the body rolled down the cliff. On the stone cliff at the top of the mountain, a magician from the Gate of the Dark Moon put away his staff, stepped onto the magic handle suspended next to him, and followed the monastery magician in front of him into the battlefield in the sky. On the battlefield above the valley, when the magicians of the law enforcement group first appeared, they caused some confusion to the group of magicians in the valley. Later, when these magicians discovered that the magicians in the valley were only twenty, when there were many, Cyril Dent commanded his magicians to quickly launch a counterattack. Bolts of lightning struck down from the sky, far more accurate than the fireballs thrown. The magicians of the law enforcement team held up their magic light shields and quickly lowered their flying altitude. They flew ultra-low over the undestroyed dense forest, trying to use the surrounding branches to guide the falling lightning into the ground. They had just flown over the dense forest when a group of Pompeii warriors holding tridents emerged from the forest and threw their bone spears at the magicians of the law enforcement group flying in the air. Whoosh whoosh whoosh. Under the influence of huge force. Those bone spears shot straight into the sky. Each bone spear flew past the magician of the law enforcement group, and the unlucky magic light shield was pierced on the spot. The magicians of the law enforcement corps fled one after another, and the magicians of the dark moon gate and the priory followed closely behind, driving them out of the desolate valley. Serdak and his party climbed up to the top of the peak. The convex rock here just overlooked the entire battlefield, seeing the magicians of the law enforcement group being beaten back steadily. Samira just snorted. Obviously she was worried about this. 
The magicians of the law enforcement corps, whose eyes are higher than the top, are not impressive. Lance was also among the retreating crowd, but he seemed to be in good condition, following Gerald, and was not injured for the time being. The head of the law enforcement group of the Hellanza Magic Guild, Magician Gerald, climbed over the mountain and saw a group of Dark Moon Gate magicians still chasing after him. Superior, another great magician from the Bina Province Magic Union also made the same choice as Gerald Magician. He landed on the top of the mountain almost at the same time. They stood on both sides of the mountain and drew magic patterns almost at the same time. Formation. A series of fireballs flew out from the hands of the two magicians. These fireballs flew a hundred yards away and exploded in the air. The exploding fireball formed a burning fire cloud. Those pursuing Dark Moon Gate magicians did not dare to rush forward and could only fly in circles from both sides. A magician from the Dark Moon Gate stood out from the crowd. He held up a light shield and broke through the fire cloud. When he emerged from the fire cloud, the magic mask was gone and there were several burns on his body. His arms were wrapped with layers of electric arcs. When he saw Gerald and another magician on the top of the mountain, about to leave on magic shackles, he released all the electric arcs on his arms in one go. Countless electric arcs were scattered like lightning. Go out with a big net. Magician Gerald gave a slight eh. He stopped, stretched out his hand, and a ball of flame quickly condensed in his palm. The flames flew out with a series of spells by the magician Gerald. The fireball flew out from his fingers. The moment it touched the power grid, the entire fireball exploded and then formed a circular fire wave centered on the explosion point. Spread outward, wherever the fire wave passed, all the arcs disappeared instantly as if they had been swallowed up. Gerald once again flicked a spark at the magician who was catching up. The magician from the Dark Moon Gate was so frightened that he didn't dare to look back. He rode on a magic pot to avoid the light spark, and a ball of the flames exploded. If there wasn't a strong man like Gerald sitting in the mage group, maybe these magicians of the law enforcement group would have been scattered by the Dark Moon Gate magicians chasing after them. Serdak had thought that they might be defeated, but he didn't expect that they would lose so quickly. He had just climbed to the top, and the group of magicians who had just rushed to the battlefield from the law enforcement group had almost disappeared. The Dark Moon Gate magicians did not chase them out. They drove the law enforcement team's magicians out of the valley area, leaving only a part of the magicians to continue patrolling in the air on their handles. The remaining group of magicians returned to the ruins, rest in the temporary camp on the side. The trees in the valley were severely damaged. Serdak noticed a group of Pompeii Sea warriors guarding the temporary teleportation array arranged by the Dark Moon Gate magician. The Pompeii Sea tribe, like the Janus Sea tribe, could not leave the sea for a long time. This temporary teleportation array is the only way for the Pompeii Marine warriors to leave the Green Empire alive. So there is no room for any mistakes. There were many Pompeii warriors standing around the cave in the ruins. And they seemed to be heavily guarded. Half-elf archer Samira stared at the cave at the bottom of the valley and asked Serdak in surprise. Captain, is that the entrance to the treasure? Serdak didn't know whether that was the entrance to the treasure. But the Dark Moon Gate and the monastery magicians went to great lengths to find this place. So it was impossible for them to come here for tourism. So he said with some uncertainty. Probably. Captain, should we sneak in? The half-elf archer's eyes flashed with gold coins. And he felt a little restless in his heart. She had lived in a children's home in Wazamala City since she was a child. She was afraid of hunger and poverty. And she couldn't control herself when she saw anything related to gold coins. It may not be possible now. We probably can't count on this group of magicians from the law enforcement group. Now it depends on when Andrew can bring the guard camp knights over. I hope they can come over soon. It's too late and maybe nothing can be obtained. Serdek said. Now he just hopes that the coalition forces from the guard camp can get here quickly. Chapter 579 Fire Element The temporary camp of the Magicians of the Law Enforcement Corps is located on a hillside 10 kilometers away on the west side of the Circular Valley. More than 20 outstanding young magicians returned home. Two of them died. And five were injured. Captain Gerald's face was a little ugly. Because he was driven out of the valley battlefield. So failed to bring back the dead magician. He first checked the injuries of the five wounded people and confirmed that they were not life-threatening, and then walked out of the tent with Morrison, the middle-aged magician said by Bina Province. Lance, go get ready and replace all the magic crystals on the gem base of the magic cannon with new ones. We have to use this guy this time. Gerald ordered Lance, who was following behind him. Rode. Yes, teacher. Lance agreed quickly. 
when the law enforcement team left Holanza City this time. They also brought out the portable magic cannon from the Holanza Magic Union. This kind of magic cannon was made by the goblins in the Hex era. The current level of magic technology in the Green Empire is not yet able to manufacture such magic weapons. The power of one strike of the magic cannon is equivalent to a fourth level magic. The only disadvantage is that each strike consumes a huge amount of mana. This thing burns magic crystals. And the gem base requires seven magic crystals to be installed at one time to open it normally. It was a silver cylinder engraved with inscriptions. To use the magic cannon, you needed a golden key. This key was usually carried by Captain Gerald. Captain Gerald sat down on a tree stump and said to Magician Morrison, Those guys may have found the treasure. If we really let them take Lord Angus's Qualsera this time, the swordsman Benna will probably have a record of shame on his wall of honor. This Magician Morrison was sent by the Benna Province Magic Guild to assist Captain Gerald. His main task was to deal with the Dark Moon Gate organization and the Red Dragon treasure. Magician Morrison pondered for a moment, then said, We have to find a way to contain them. Unexpectedly, this time the Dark Moon Gate actually lowered its status and cooperated with the Black Magic Hermitage. After a moment of silence, Magician Morrison asked Captain Gerald, Why are there sea tribes in the valley? If I read correctly, those should be Pompeii sea tribes. Captain Gerald glanced in the direction of the circular valley and said dully, With a group of mages from the Dark Moon Gate here, it wouldn't be surprising even if the lizard people in the wild swamp appear. He regretted not accepting the suggestion of the president of the Hellanza Magic Union that he should bring more magicians for this operation. Before leaving, the Magic Union had already gathered a group of magicians, but he refused at that time. He sighed softly. At this time, a young magician brought two cups of concentration tea made with silver leaf grass. This tea has a certain effect of restoring mental strength. Captain Gerald took the bitter tea, thanked him, and then said to Magician Morrison, I just discovered the temporary teleportation array built by the Dark Moon Gate in the valley. These Pompeii Sea tribes should pass through. Those who came from the teleportation gate. I plan to lead people to attack this temporary teleportation array later. Hoping to contain these people. Magician Morrison agreed with Captain Gerald's plan. And then he said, Speaking of which, don't you think the appearance of the Pompeii Sea tribe in the Paglos Mountains is very strange? Captain Gerald waved his hand and said, What's so strange about this? Lord Angus's wife's hometown is in the Twin Seas. The current owners of the Twin Seas should be this group of Pompeii Sea tribes. The Pompeii Sea tribes may have the other half of the treasure map. Magician Morrison suddenly said, No wonder they found the treasure so quickly. The two magicians talked about their opinions. At this time, Lance carried over a silver cylinder as thick as an adult's thigh, with seven magic crystals on the gem base emitting sparkling light. Lance handed the magic cannon to Captain Gerald and said, Teacher, you're ready. Take the first team's manpower and let's go now. Captain Gerald stood up and said, This time, he only planned to take the five magicians from the first team of the law enforcement group to the Ring Valley for a sneak attack. He did not want to take all members dispatched. Yes. Lance immediately straightened his back and said, knowing that he couldn't run away this time. Captain Gerald patted Lance on the shoulder, suddenly remembered something, stopped and asked, By the way, when will the coalition forces of the guard battalion arrive? Lance stopped and immediately replied. The news came from over there that it was probably before dark. Okay, when Night Glen arrives, we will launch a general attack. Magician Morrison said excitedly. This Grand Knight of Glen is the new leader of the Benna City Guard Battalion. And he is also a second level warrior. With him leading a 1,500 strong knights all the way. It is estimated that it is possible to turn the tide of the war. Captain Gerald led the first team of magicians of the Law Enforcement Corps in a large circle in the sky. They plan to go around the mountains in the northern part of the circular valley. However, in the northern area of the valley, there is a magician from the Priory riding a magic harpoon patrolling back and forth between the peaks and cliffs. This gives Captain Gerald a headache. If he is not killed, he will this first infiltration plan will turn into another strong attack. If discovered in advance, this attack may be meaningless. Thinking of this, he glanced at the heavy magic cannon in his arms and felt that he should find an opportunity to shoot down the magicians flying around. Just as Captain Gerald was hesitating, Serdak was squatting on a large tree with dense leaves, looking up at the Priory magician flying overhead. He might have discovered some clues, has flown back and forth over the mountains more than a dozen times this time. With no intention of stopping, he patrols here, forcing the Serdak team to hide in the bushes. Soldak glanced at Samira beside him. She was quietly pushing aside the leaves in front of her. 
Her pair of light red eyes were staring at the magician. She calmed down her breathing slightly, and then taking the painting of Withering from behind. She closed her eyes and adjusted her breathing. There was only the whistling wind in his ears, and suddenly a sharp sound broke through the air. Samira opened her eyes suddenly, just in time to see the patrolling magician flying through the air 30 yards above her head. She didn't even have time to hesitate. The moment she pulled the bowstring string hard, the magic pattern clothing on her arm suddenly lit up through her clothes. Samira shot the arrow, and the arrow drew a thin white line in the air, immediately shot through the body of the monastery magician, and he fell from the sky into the forest before he even had time to turn on the magic light shield. An arrow followed immediately and entered his throat. The body of the priory magician fell from the air and fell into a wood. Captain Gerald was worrying about how to secretly kill the patrolling magician. His original plan was to send someone to lure the monastery magician over. But later he felt that as long as the magician had a little bit of brain, he wouldn't be fooled. Lance has prepared the gun mount. He wants to get closer and cooperate with Captain Gerald to use the magic cannon to directly knock down the patrol magician. But when the two of them flew closer, they happened to see the patrol magician fall from midair. Captain Gerald planned to fly over to see what was going on. He happened to see Serdak waving to him from the top of the tree. Under the tree stood a tall ogre. It was now carrying a corpse. Captain Gerald secretly praised in his heart, turned the flight direction of the magic weapon, and led the first team to swoop down along the stone wall, rushing as fast as possible towards the temporary teleportation array hidden at the bottom of the valley. The bottom of the valley was in a mess. The original dense forest has completely disappeared, leaving only some giant trees that have fallen down here and there. After rushing into the valley, Captain Gerald was quickly discovered by the Dark Moon Gate magician, and a warning signal sounded in the Ring Valley. Captain Gerald glanced at Lance and made up his mind to speed up the flight. The first team of magicians followed closely behind Captain Gerald and took the lead to arrive near the temporary portal guarded by a group of Pompeii warriors. Captain Gerald jumped off the magic cauldron 60 yards away from the temporary portal, took out the magic cannon in his arms, aimed at the temporary portal not far away, and directly activated the magic cannon. The runes on the silver cylinder lit up one after another, and a light bullet ejected from the cylinder towards the temporary teleportation array. Just when Captain Gerald felt that the magic cannon hit the temporary teleportation array, a wall of water appeared out of thin air at the edge of the temporary teleportation array. The magic cannonball exploded on the water wall, just shattering the water wall. The Pompeii which walked out from behind the exploded water wall, and a large group of Pompeii warriors rushed up from behind her. The magicians of the first team threw fireballs around Captain Gerald. Countless fireballs were made at one time. One after another exploded among the crowd of Pompeii Sea Tribe warriors. These Pompeii warriors were also ferocious and rushed forward without fear of death, unable to blow up the temporary portal immediately. Captain Gerald could only sigh secretly in his heart. Then a four-meter-tall fire elementalist appeared behind Captain Gerald, and the fire elementalist was tumbling all over. It was burning with flames and raised its hands as soon as it appeared. Its body frantically absorbed the surrounding fire elements. As the fire elements continued to be injected into its body, its body expanded like a balloon. Then it bent down, pointed its big mouth at the Pompeii warriors who rushed up, and blew out a mouthful of extremely powerful flames. Chapter 580 Fierce Battle in the Valley The shadow of the fire elementalist instantly materialized behind Captain Gerald, blowing out a stream of flames from his huge mouth, spreading like a fan in the forest. The fire ignited some trees in the forest, as well as the group of people rushing in from the front. The Pompeii Sea Warriors, who came up instantly turned into a sea of fire within their sight. The flame element then disappeared from behind Captain Gerald. The warriors of the Pompeii Sea Tribe struggled in the sea of fire. The skin of these sea tribes who live in the water all year round cannot maintain the moisture in their bodies. They need to replenish water after being out of water for a few hours. Otherwise, the body will dry out due to being out of water for too long and will become dehydrated soon and die. Since there are three Pompeii witches in the team, they can continuously summon sea tides to nourish the bodies of these Pompeii warriors. Therefore, these Pompeii warriors have always maintained a strong combat effectiveness on land. But in this case, it does not include throwing yourself into a sea of fire. The fan-shaped flame spurted out from behind Captain Gerald immediately turned the Janna Sea tribe warriors at the front into flaming men. They made a squeaking cry in the fire. And the sound was sharp and harsh. The Pompeii which was guarding in front of the temporary teleportation formation immediately swam forward a few steps. She raised her staff high. Her body exuded a light blue water element breath. And her snake tail-like lower limbs spread out a light. 
the blue six-pointed star array, and the burst of spells made her look like a sincere believer. Behind her appeared the figure of a giant Rama's beast. The tall body of the giant Rama's beast looked like it is a mage tower. The eyes of the Pompeii which glowed with light blue, and the rich aura of water elements continued to steam upward, forming a thick ink-like cloud over the fire field, and pattering black rain fell from the sky. These black rains were like thick ink. Falling the trees quickly eroded into pits and pits, falling into the sea of fire, and within the reach of the raindrops. The fire quickly extinguished. Those Pompeii warriors stood in the black rain, their burnt bodies rapidly healing themselves. Black rain fell from the sky, and Captain Gerald led a small team of magicians to retreat quickly. When the black rain fell, all the magicians had already retreated to the edge of the black rain. The mage who can get out of the poisonous rain in time activates the magic shield and then everyone can escape from the poisonous rain in embarrassment. There was a surging sound from the trees in front. This time the Pompeii Sea Tribe warriors rushed up again on the waves. Captain Gerald stopped the magicians from releasing fire magic and let them ride on magic harpoons to quickly rise into the air. Not only that, but also to hide out of the range of the bone spears of the Pompeii warriors. Gerald took out a thick copper-covered magic book. The cover of this magic book showed a winding path and a sea of fire. At the end of the road, was the back of a magician. Captain Gerald he quickly opened the magic book and faced the Pompeii warriors who came riding the waves. He ruthlessly tore out a page. The pages that were torn off suddenly turned into little magical lights in the hands of Captain Gerald. A huge red magic pattern formed in front of him. This magic pattern actually solidified into a ray of light. A thick wall of fire blocked Captain Gerald's path. He stood behind the wall of fire and quickly rode on the magic handle. As he transferred his magic power to the magic handle, the magic handle carried him into the sky. The Pompeii, which never left the temporary teleportation array, Lance flew into the sky holding a magic cannon. As the runes on the magic cannon lit up again one by one, the magic cannon was finally fully charged. Energy is stored, and the magic crystal inlaid on the magic cannon becomes smaller at a speed visible to the naked eye. Boom! Lance once again aimed at the temporary teleportation array and turned on the magic cannon. At the moment when the magic cannon was turned on, a large amount of seawater poured out of the entire temporary teleportation array, and a ring-shaped water wall completely covered the temporary teleportation array. Protected within it, the magic cannon landed on the water wall, immediately blowing the water wall into pieces. The powerful magic cannon was eliminated in this way. The temporary teleportation circle stood intact in the forest. The surrounding dark moon gate magicians quickly rushed towards the temporary teleportation array. Captain Gerald knew that if he didn't leave, he might be surrounded by the Dark Moon Gate magicians, who came to reinforce him. So he quickly lead the first team to quickly evacuate out of the valley. The law enforcement team actually used a magic cannon to destroy the temporary portal. And the great magician McLeish was so frightened that he broke into a cold sweat. As the talker of the Dark Moon Gate, he has the responsibility to bring every member back to the headquarters safely. This temporary portal is the most convenient way to leave Bina province. Without this temporary portal, he wants to bring everyone back to the headquarters safely. After these subordinates left Bina province, apart from taking the risk of taking a magic airship, they could only sneak across the empire riding a magic harpoon. Neither of these methods is a good choice. The magicians of the Green Empire Magic Union Law Enforcement Group will be chasing behind them, like a group of flies that cannot be driven away. Magician McLeish did not expect that the Witch of Pompeii was so proficient in controlling water. This kind of water wall technique which usually seems to be the most useless, actually has the power to turn decay into magic in the hands of the Pompeii witch. It can perfectly absorb the full blow of the magic cannon. This is something that other magicians cannot do anyway. If Magician McLeish wants to perfectly avoid the attack of the magic cannon, he must at least wait until he becomes a magician after three turns and learns space tearing. In this way, when he faces the attack of the magic cannon, he can tear open the cracks in the void and let the destructive cannonball be swallowed by the endless void. However, McLeish, the great magician, still has a long way to go before he can become a magister. There is a large space under the cave in the ruins, and the search for the red dragon treasure is still going on. This underground space is a very large group of underground caves. Although there are traces of dragons living in the caves, there is not a single gold coin like this one. Or Jem's cave is definitely not a dragon's lair. It's more like a large training ground. The joint exploration team of the Dark Moon Gate, the Priory, and the Pompeii Sea Clan have gone deep into the cave. But unfortunately, they have not been able to find the treasure door so far. After hearing the warning, 
Archmage McLeish flew out of the hole. When he saw the magicians from the law enforcement group actually controlling the magic cannon to bombard the temporary portal. He was so frightened that he almost hit a giant protruding tree in front of him. Just before hitting the giant tree, he decisively gave up the magic weapon, and his body turned into a bolt of lightning. In an instant, the bolt of lightning fell in the forest, and the voice of the great magician McLeish reappeared, seeing that the water wall spell cast by the Pompeii which perfectly blocked the attack of the magic cannon. The great magician McLeish calmed down. Archmage McLeish ignored the damaged magic harpoon. And the shadow of a void warp beast emerged from behind him. His power is extremely rare even among the many space magicians at Dark Moon Gate. As the shadow of this void leaping beast appeared, magician McLeish's eyes flashed with a trace of lightning. He took a step forward. And a bolt of lightning struck his head. As the lightning fell, his figure disappeared again. At the same moment, 50 meters away in front of him, a bolt of lightning appeared, and the figure of the great magician McLeish also appeared there, with the shadow of the leap beast still following behind him. Every time lightning falls, the figure of the great magician McLeish will appear at the point where the lightning falls. He controlled the lightning technique, and under the flash of lightning, the great magician McLeish quickly approached Captain Gerald, who was escaping from the valley in a hurry. Captain Gerald also discovered that the great magician McLeish was chasing after him with lightning. In order to cover the safe evacuation of the small team from the valley, he could only stop again. Except for him. No one in the small team could stop this man. The electric magician of the Dark Moon Gate. Captain Gerald rode a magic harpoon handle and tore open a scroll before three fireballs appeared in his palm. Fireballs. The three fireballs formed a line and flew towards the lightning strike point on the trajectory of McLeish's movement. The fireballs exploded one after another. But unfortunately, they were all skillfully avoided by the great magician McLeish. A bolt of lightning appeared in front of Captain Gerald. The great magician McLeish appeared. His arm was filled with arcs of electricity. He punched Captain Gerald in the chest. Hundreds of arcs struck McLeish. The great magician's fist exploded. Serdak, who was hiding behind a crack in the stone, was almost blinded by hundreds of exploding arcs of electricity. The place where Captain Gerald and Archmage McLeish fought was on the mountainside less than a hundred meters away from him. Although Captain Gerald opened a magic light shield, the magic shield was instantly melted by hundreds of arcs. His body was thrown away by a huge repulsive force. A stream of light flashed on the magic rope, and a stream of air the shield was released, and it was instantly disillusioned again. The violent arc instantly burned the dark patterned magic robe of Captain Gerald. When he fell to the ground, his whole body was scorched black by lightning. McLeish, the great magician, had a cold face, flashing lightning, and caught up with Captain Gerald again. He pulled out a long lightning bolt from his hands, and was about to kill Gerald, who was twitching on the ground. The leader suddenly felt a very bad premonition in his heart, as if someone had punched him hard in the heart, without any hesitation. McLeish, the great magician, exploded with lightning in his hand and the figure disappeared in an instant. Six short-tail feather arrows landed on the rocky ground behind him in no particular order. If he hadn't dodged in time, there would have been six more bloody holes in his body at this moment. Seeing a red sound flash across the canopy of the peak, Archmage McLeish once again condensed a dense arc of electricity on his arm. He also wanted to use the power of lightning to escape, but the shadow of the space-time warp beast behind him turned into nothingness. The lightning in his eyes also dispersed and the great magician McLeish could only watch the red figure disappear into the dense forest. A huge ogre rushed down from the mountain ridge carrying a large bone club. It ran up to Captain Gerald, picked up Captain Gerald with one hand, put him on its shoulders, turned around and ran up the mountain with almost no pause. Chapter 581 Red Dragon Territory The magicians of the small team of law enforcement team refused to run away when they saw Captain Gerald turning around to block the great magician who was chasing after him. They landed on a bare giant rock one after another. They looked back at the dense forest on the mountain slopes behind them. They only saw thunder flashing continuously in the forest. There was no trace of Captain Gerald at all. A group of dark moons at this time. The magicians from the gate also chased up from behind. They were riding magic harpoons. And their bodies were all shining with different magic light shields. Lance Magician stood at the front of the huge rock with his magic cannon. His eyes red and he aimed at the magicians who were chasing after them on magic harpoons. Seeing the runes on the magic cannon lighting up one by one, Cyril Dent, who was riding on the magic handle and rushed to the front, quickly shouted, Holy shit! Magic cannon! Get out of the way! 
as a group of magicians dispersed like flowers. The magic cannon on Lance's shoulder emitted a white light. Boom! The energy beam rushed past the arm of a cloistered magician. And the arm and the sleeves of the magic robe melted instantly. Red hexagram arrays flashed on the huge rock on the top of the mountain. Fire bombs flew out from the top of the mountain and exploded in midair forcing back the dark moon gate magicians who were chasing after them. Look for landing points everywhere on the top of the mountain. You can't cast high-level magic while riding on the magic handle. At this moment, a figure rushed out of the dense forest riding a magic harpoon. And all the magicians looked over there. To the disappointment of the small team of magicians from the law enforcement team, the voice flying out of the dense forest was not Captain Gerald. At the same time, the magicians at the dark moon gate suddenly became morale-boosted and cheered. Lance stood on the giant rock with a magic cannon. Seeing that Mr. Gerald failed to fly out of the dense forest, he suddenly felt as if someone had hit his heart with a sledgehammer. He quickly took out the magic cannon. Go ahead and get ready to rush into the jungle to check out the situation over there. At this time, a magician from the Priory appeared on the top of a super tree not far away. The moment he almost fell down, he threw out three shadow arrows. A shadow arrow flew straight towards Lance. Lance was caught off guard and was about to step onto the handle of the magic pot. When he found the shadow arrow, it was too late to avoid it. He hurriedly activated his magic with a look of shock on his face. But the magical harpoon has been unable to fly. Shadow arrows flew towards him, and Lance felt a chill in his heart. He seemed to see a god of death holding a scythe floating behind the shadow arrow. A shield appeared in front of Lance's body, and the shadow arrow hit the shield. A layer of silver holy light suddenly appeared on the shield and the shadow arrow immediately disappeared. Soldak held the holy light torch in one hand, and the Moses blessing shield in the other hand, and squatted steadily in front of Lance. A half-elf archer wearing salamander leather armor followed him, and shot an arrow unceremoniously at the monastery magician opposite. After the magician released six shadow arrows, he condensed a small magic shield on his arm. When the arrows flew past, he raised the small shield as if feeling something, and the arrows were immediately nailed to his small magic shield. On the top, the magic shield was a little dim. But before he had time to rejoice, a sharp pain suddenly came from his arm. The second feather arrow shot through his arm silently, and the magic shield disappeared instantly. The cloister magician hurriedly hid in the dense branches and leaves of the tree crown. He angrily took out a magic scroll. Before he could unfold the scroll, an arrow penetrated his head and nailed his whole body. He fell onto the tree trunk, and until his death, he still didn't understand how he was shot by the archer from the opposite side. In the middle of the tree branches less than five meters away from the magician, the branches suddenly moved. Hunter Carroll habitually stuck his head out to investigate. He was stuck in the branches and crouched between the branches. I don't know how long I squatted on this tree. Lance had always been curious about Serdak's security team. Especially Samira and Andrew. When the magician Gurdon led a type of rebel cavalry to attack the village of Wall, it is said that the half-elf archers in the security team shot and killed more than 20 rebel cavalry in one fell swoop. Serdak even killed Gu in one fell swoop. Magician Erden. This matter caused a heated discussion in the law enforcement group at that time. Many magicians in the group thought that Serdak must be hiding something. Otherwise, how could it be possible for a small security team in the guard camp to defeat a dark moon gate mage and a band of rebel cavalry? Now he and his companions saw the most realistic scene. It was clear that Samira pulled out an arrow. And after shooting it, it instantly turned into two arrows. Moreover, there were actually mana fluctuations on Samira's shoulders. After Samira shot an arrow, she immediately moved her position, quickly pulled the bowstring, and shot an arrow at another magician. Samira completed the entire set of movements while constantly moving, and the arrows she fired were astonishingly accurate. The magicians of the small team of law enforcement team felt that their spines were cold. They thought that if they encountered such an archer in the mountains and forests, there seemed to be nothing else to do besides riding a magic harpoon and flying as far as they could. There is a better way. Otherwise Samira will definitely lead her around in the jungle. Arcs of electricity. Wind blades. And shadow arrows continued to fly towards the boulders. The number of chasing dark moon gate magicians gradually increased. And the magicians of the law enforcement group were almost unable to fight. In particular, the great magician McLeish controlled thunder and lightning to fall on boulders from time to time. In the lightning fire. The magicians of the law enforcement team were injured one after another. Guidem carried Captain Gerald to the top of the mountain with a groan. Threw Captain Gerald to Lance. Bent down to pick up a big stone. 
and headed towards the group of people riding magic harpoons who were messing around. The flying magician threw them away. But unfortunately, the ogre had never practiced throwing stones before. So it posed no threat to those magicians at all. Hurry up and take Captain Gerald away. Otherwise it will be too late. Serdek said to Lance beside him. When Lance saw the unconscious Captain Gerald, he was no longer in the mood to continue fighting. Then what should you do? Lance asked Soldak with a worried look. Serdak saw that the magicians with light shields in front of them had been bombarded by the other party's magic and said to Lance, Let's escape separately. Don't worry about us. I have my own methods. At this time, Magician Flanagan led several monastic magicians to come from the cave in the valley. At the bottom of the hillside, two Pompeii witches held up their staffs and led a group of Pompeii marine warriors upstream on the huge waves. Wherever the huge waves passed, they plowed out a river in the forest land. Lance tied Captain Gerald behind his back and then took out five third-level magic scrolls from his arms, which were almost all the high-level magic scrolls he brought this time. He gritted his teeth while unfolding these magic scrolls and chanting with a short spell. A fireball flew out and exploded into a fire cloud in the sky. Then Lance ordered a small team of magicians. All members of the small team, evacuate with me. After speaking, he led a small team of magicians to quickly evacuate the mountains. Serdak said to the ogre girl at him, Glide him. Retreat quickly. With that said, he took the lead and jumped from the boulder into the dense forest. The ogres and half-elf archers quickly followed. Serdak planned to rely on the cover of the dense forest to run out of the mountains. McLeish led a group of magicians through the cloud of fire and chased the magicians of the law enforcement group. Magician Flanagan rushed over from behind, just in time to see Serdak and the ogre jumping from the boulder into the jungle. He landed on the boulder immediately and kept drawing a magic picture on the boulder. When the formation came, as he recited the magic spell, a demon gate with a green face and fangs appeared from the center of the formation. A three-headed H, L dog broke through the flesh membrane of the devil's gate, covered in mucus and purple blood, and struggled to get out. Immediately afterwards, Another three-headed H, L dog came out. And then the devil's door burst like a rotten pustule with a pop. The H, L dogs that had just landed on the Roland continent were repelled by the power of the world's laws. And their black armor quickly melted and rotted. They roared under the severe pain and walked back and forth restlessly, leaving traces on the rocks with every step they took. A bloody footprint. Magician Flanagan cast spells on the three H, L dogs to help them recover from their injuries and gave them orders. The two three-headed H, L dogs gradually adapted. The heads of the six evil dogs looked around. Among them, the head of the dark-type dog sniffed on the boulder. The three-headed H, L dogs, which were larger than the one-horned bison, suddenly shook their heads, jumped into the dense forest. Its body was dripping with lava fire, and the lava fire fell on the branches and leaves of the dense forest and burned immediately. Magician Flanagan followed the three H, L dogs, with a faint smile on his face. The Pompeii Sea Witches led a group of Pompeii warriors up the mountain. The great magician McLeish and the magician from the Dark Moon Gate had already flown far away. The magician Flanagan followed the three H, L dogs into the dense forest. Just after a battle, the dense forest on the northern slope of the valley was full of thick smoke, and some trees were already burning. A group of Pompeii warriors retreated one after another. The Pompeii which did not want to waste her mana, and used the water magic tide to extinguish the mountain fire in front of her, then led the Pompeii warriors back to the valley. In the cave of the ruins, less than a hundred meters deep into the cave, there is a very vast cave. This large cave is five times the size of the Helanza Opera House. At the entrance of the cave, seven monastic magicians are surrounding a magic array. H. L. Dogs emerged from the center of the magic array and rushed into the cave one after another. These magicians have explored all areas within a 10-kilometer radius of this cave. But unfortunately, they still have not been able to find the Red Dragon treasure. The crater shown on the treasure map is clearly here. Duke Angus Bradbury spent his whole life in battle. And in his later years, his Red Dragon companion settled in the Paglos Mountains. At the beginning, the Emperor of the Green Empire assigned the Paglos Mountains to the Red Dragon and made it its territory. This is also the reason why Paglos Mountains have been unoccupied for hundreds of years. It is not that there are countless powerful people entrenched in the mountains. Warcraft. But the owner of this mountain range was once a red dragon. Not only that, but hereditary inheritance. Chapter 582 Don't Chase. Serdak originally wanted to use the dense jungles of the mountains to get rid of the magicians flying in the sky on magic harpoons. Of course, 
He is not too afraid of these magicians catching up. As long as they dare to get into this dense forest, they will break into Samira's home field. Unexpectedly, two three-headed H, L dogs were chasing after them. They followed the smell. And the six evil dog heads kept spitting out magic bullets in the forest. Ever since being targeted by these two H, L dogs, so the escape path for Erdek and the others became very difficult. He didn't know how many magicians from the other side were following him. So he didn't dare to rush into the fight and could only keep running towards the opposite mountain. The magic bullets spewed out by the three-headed H, L dogs could only be blocked with a shield. Fortunately, he had rich fighting experience with the H, L dogs in Wazamala City. Therefore, facing the pursuit of two three-headed H, L dogs, Su Erdak is fully capable of handling it. He could feel that there were magicians following him, but he could not tell the specific number of magicians. A firebomb exploded in front of the ogre's feet, splashing up a large amount of gravel and moss. Although it did no harm, it caused the ogre to stumble and almost fall to the ground. He turned around and glanced fiercely at the two rampant three-headed H, L dogs, and said in a naive voice, Dak, I'll go over and kill them. Lead a little further forward. Samira has already gone to investigate the number of magicians behind. As long as there are not too many people, we will cut off their heads in front. Serdak panted beside the ogre, said. The ogre took long strides and ran as fast as he could, much faster than him. He could only keep up by running as hard as he could. Hearing Soldak say that the battlefield is ahead, the ogre immediately got excited and ran forward with his big feet. Serdak took a deep breath and quickly gritted his teeth to follow. In this way, the two of them stumbled through a valley. Just as they were about to cross the ridge in front, Samira sent a signal, only a magician from the monastery was following behind. If the ogre hadn't run too far ahead, Serdak would have wanted to stop immediately and kill the two and three H, L dogs behind him on the spot. Dodging a shadow bomb, Serdak rolled around on the ground to offset the momentum. And then a fierce hot wind came. Two vicious dog heads attacked from the left and right sides. There was a wind blade in the fireball. Serdak raised his shield to block the fireball, and the edge of the Moses' blessing shield in his hand was bitten by the vicious dog of H, L. The H, L dog locked the shield with its sharp teeth. Serdak could not break free, so he immediately abandoned the shield and rolled aside. Two three-headed H, Lound surrounded Serdak one behind the other. Only then did the ogre notice that there was no sound of Serdak's panting and footsteps behind him. He turned around suddenly and found that Serdak was surrounded by two H, L dogs with three heads. The vicious dog sprayed out magic one after another, and Serdak could only dodge in embarrassment. The ogre then stopped, roared, and then strode back along the original path. Gulitam rounded the bone crushing stick in his hand and hit it on the smoldering head of the three hell dogs. The head of the hell dog was immediately smashed to pieces. At this moment, Serdak took the opportunity to fight back against another three headed H, L dog. He no longer just dodged and dodged. When he saw the head of a vicious dog biting him, he faced it with a holy light torch in his hand, and a halo of power lit up under his feet. The round crown at the top of the torch hit the H, L dog's jaw hard, and the fire bomb that didn't have time to spit out exploded in the dog's mouth, causing the dog's head to wail repeatedly. The ogre Gulidum has been eating and drinking in Val Village for more than half a year. In the past six months, in addition to grazing in Bago pasture, he also went to the Lava River Sulphur Mine to hunt salamanders and his weight and strength have increased by leaps and bounds. He also became more comfortable with the bone-crushing big stick in his hand. He hit the 3H, L dogs with one stick and smashed the 3H, L dogs into a shorter size. Magician Flanagan did not expect that this fast-running ogre in the jungle would be extremely fierce when fighting. The H, L dog he summoned was actually hit by a big stick and was knocked back repeatedly. Spitting out several the magic bullet hit the ogre without any pain or itching so he quickly controlled the magic weapon to catch up. He very carefully landed on the crown of a tree, and then used a wand to draw a magic circle. A strange-eyed shadow appeared above his head. As he finished reciting the spell, countless shadow auras poured into the body of the eye monster. Sleeping cloud? A lavender ring was released from the body of the eye monster. And as the ring continued to spread, it seemed as if everything around it was falling into a deep sleep. But before the cloud of sleep spread, an arrow pierced the eye with a pop sound and immediately a large amount of sticky juice fell down the top of Magician Flanagan's head, pouring all over Flanagan. The ring of the sleeping cloud also quickly dissipated at this moment. Magician Flanagan didn't have time to think too much and immediately activated the atmospheric shield in the wand, surrounding his body with a light shield. 
Two arrows hit the light shield. And there were two. Ding ding. Sounds. It scared Magic Flanagan into a cold sweat. He looked around, trying to see who secretly fired the hidden arrow. But he only saw a red shadow flashing past in the dense forest. The three-headed H, L dog on the battlefield was beaten back by the ogres. Magician Flanagan looked at another H, L dog with three heads. Only to find that the H, L dog had fallen into a pool of blood. And its three heads had been cut off. The knight on the battlefield had also been cut off. Disappeared. He didn't expect that a three-headed H, Lound would be born so quickly. He immediately decided to ride on the magic harpoon and leave here quickly. Before he could get on the magic harpoon, two arrows hit his atmospheric shield again. The magic fluctuation of the mask dropped to the lowest point. This atmospheric shield is considered a level 3 magic. Normally, 10 or 8 arrows shot by longbow archers may not be able to penetrate it. But the opponent only shot 4 arrows. And the atmospheric shield seemed to be shaky. Magician Flanagan did not dare to delay any longer. He stepped on the magic handle, and without waiting for the runes to light up completely, he rode the magic handle, and fell straight down from the top of the tree. The runes on the magic handle lit up one by one. Rise. He calculated that the magic harpoon would be able to fly before landing. Just waiting to pull up the magic handle at the moment of landing. But before the magic pot fell completely. A black figure next to the tree rushed toward him. Magician Flanagan had no time to react. His body was hit hard. And his head hit the tree trunk next to him. Then he fell heavily on the forest floor. Serdak landed firmly next to Magician Flanagan. He reached out and turned over the body. And found that Magician Flanagan's neck bone was completely broken. And a bloody hole was made on his head. Chapter 583 Visitors from the Mountains Soldak found a magic belt bag from Magician Flanagan. And broke off the valuable looking wand from his hand. Before he had time to remove the valuable looking dark pattern. The magic robe was peeled off. And the roar of H. L. Dogs was heard again in the distance. Samira poked her head out from the tree and made a quickly retreat, gesture to Serdak below. Serdak didn't even ask what happened. He directly put down the body of Magician Flanagan and ran with Gulitum in the direction where Samira disappeared. Less than 20 seconds after the figures of Serdak and Gulitum disappeared in the dense forest, several three-headed H, L dogs followed the scent and rushed into the forest area. They immediately discovered Flanagan magic. One of the three-headed H, Lown stopped next to the division's corpse, and let out a dull roar from behind. The other three H, Lounds continued to follow the scent. A five meter tall giant torture demon appeared in the dense forest with heavy shackles around its neck. It broke a large and thick oak tree. Three monastery magicians were riding magic cauldrons over the dense forest. They heard the message from the three H, L dogs, and immediately dived into the dense forest. They saw magician Flanagan lying on the forest floor with a bloodless face. Eyes widened suddenly, and they came over in panic. Lord Flanagan. What's going on? Ah. They killed Magician Flanagan. Hurry up and chase them. Otherwise the higher-ups in the parliament will be held accountable. And we may all bear the responsibility. Hurry up. The cloistered magician ordered the three-headed H, L dogs and torture demons around him. The tall torture demon. Covered in blood. With his skin completely corroded. Revealing large areas of purple muscle. Stood there and protested to the magician impatiently. The monastery magician's face turned pale, and his voice was trembling. The companion said, It is not satisfied with the blood food donated. I'll do it this time. The companion hesitated for a moment, then flew to the top of Shing Demon's head on a magic harpoon, picked up a dagger and cut a two-finger wide wound on his wrist, and a bright red wind flowed out. Heat flowed from my wrist. The tall torture demon raised its head, held up the heavy shackles, opened its mouth, and greedily swallowed the blood that flowed from the wrists of the cloistered magician into its stomach. Xing Mo's eyes turned bright red again. Some black and purple magic patterns appeared on Xing Mo's body. And traces of dark demon energy condensed from all around. The magician rode on the handle of the magic pot, and shook his body slightly before he stopped his bleeding wrist. Although Xing Mo seemed a little unsatisfied, he continued to chase forward with long strides. Serdak and Gulitum killed four three-headed H, L dogs one after another and used the blood-red crescent in their hands to obtain twelve H, L dog heads in one breath. The heads of these three-headed H, L dogs belong to the second level. The precious sacrifices of Warcraft. As long as you sacrifice three of them, you can get the high-level blessing from the face of God. In order to be able to collect sacrifices at any time, Serdak always keeps three magic sealing boxes in his magic pocket. But this time, 
they were in a bad situation. Two three-headed H, L dogs stopped them next to the mountain wall. After a fierce battle, although they successfully killed the two H, L dogs, the two three-headed H, L dogs also failed. It was considered successful in delaying their escape, and two three-headed H, L dogs appeared behind them. In addition, there were three monastery magicians riding magic cauldrons, and a tall demon was still following behind them. After a hard fight, even Gulitum was a little out of breath. The ogre sat on a big stone and leaned his bone-crushing club against the stone wall. He raised the water bag above his head and poured it inside. All the water was poured on his head and he wiped his face casually. Several wounds were made on his body by the sharp claws of three H, Lounds. And the blood that flowed out has stained his upper body red. There was also a bone-deep wound cut by the wind blade on his shoulder. Although Serdak used holy light to perform basic treatment on the wound, the toxins on the wound were not cleaned away. So the wound remained, continued to suffer corrosion. Samira stood on the top of a tree. She looked down at the quiver with only nine arrows left, and a hint of worry flashed in her eyes. The piece of magic pattern clothing on her right arm has been used frequently. And now the entire right shoulder is hot. She can even feel a faint repulsive force. If she overloads the power of her arm, it is very likely that that piece of power will Xiang's magic pattern breeding equipment can no longer bear it. Serdak squatted in the stone crevice behind Gulitum, quickly arranged the sacrifice altar, and sacrificed all nine heads of the three-headed H, L dogs to the face of the god in one breath. With three pale golden light pillars, they fell from the heads of the three of them. After Serdak understood the specific functions of the three advanced blessings, he chose to bless the ogre Gulitum with the hegemony. This blessing not only greatly enhanced the physical fitness and recovery power, but also gave the body a strong resistance. Alleviating curses. Magic and poisoning to a certain extent. A beam of light full of sacred power fell. And the ogre felt a powerful force injected into his body. Some of the blood power in his body was awakened by that force. He could feel that the muscles at the wound were constantly squirming and splitting. The open wound actually healed visibly to the naked eye. Samira received the blessing effect of the Eye of Truth and the vision in her eyes changed somewhat. Samira squatted on the tree, and it was difficult to adapt to it for a while. Those messy lines made her a little dizzy. She could only close her eyes first. Even so, the surrounding information was still flooding into her brain crazily. Serdak chose the holy shield for himself. When the blessing effect came, the Moses blessing shield on his arm, which had been chewed to pieces by the vicious dogs of H, L, actually glowed differently. The holy radiance appeared on the entire shield and the color of holy silver appeared. The two three-headed H, L dogs stood far away and did not dare to come near. They were only willing to spit magic bullets desperately. For three-headed H, L dogs had fallen in front of them one after another. Therefore, these H, L dogs with rudimentary intelligence they didn't dare to get close easily. Even though the three magicians flying from behind kept issuing attack commands, the three H, L dogs still refused to move forward. The three magicians from the monastery also did not dare to get too close, since they could only emit low-level magic while riding magic harpoons. They had the courage to fall next to the H, L dog. At the same time, the the torture demon, with some black magic patterns appearing on his body, finally walked into the battlefield. His five-meter-tall body was much taller than the ogre. He had two shackles on his hands, and every time he took a step forward, he would make a series of noises. Whoa! 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 Whoosh! Due to the huge size of the Shing Demon, after entering the dense forest, any trees that hinder his movement will be trampled down by it. The Demon Shing held a dark red six-pointed star formation at his feet. The first thing he saw was the Ogre Gulitum, waving the blood-colored chain in his hand, and the huge chain made a whirring sound through the air. Seeing a chain being pulled down towards him, Gulitum quickly raised his bone-crushing stick to resist. A huge bloody chain was drawn on the bone-crushing stick. The end of the chain broke a tree trunk behind Gulitum. Then the chain was wrapped around the bone-crushing stick. The torture demon was nearly two meters taller than the ogre. He pulled back suddenly, thinking that he could snatch the big stick from the ogre's hand. But he didn't expect that he only pulled the ogre forward two steps. In terms of strength, this huge torture demon had no obvious strength. Advantage. The torture demon let out an unwilling roar. And the dark magic marks all over his body burned one by one. The ogre can clearly feel that the power of the torture demon is constantly increasing. And he is getting closer to the torture demon little by little. Samira dodged several magic bullets one after another on the tree. She shot the next three arrows. 
blinding the eyes of three H, L dogs, and then quickly hid behind a big tree. Although she had a clearer vision and looked at the empty quiver, she couldn't express her sorrow. Serdak blessed himself with a holy shield, originally to resist the two three-headed H, L dogs. It's just that these two three-headed H, L dogs are a little timid. They don't dare to rush up to hold up the shields. Instead, they are like two movable forts. The six heads are constantly spitting magic bullets, pulling Samira on the tree, beaten and scurrying around. Samira's side had been silent for some time. Only then did Serdak realize that the half-elf archer had probably emptied his quiver. Serdak's holy shield also failed to have the expected effect. The magicians of the priory on the opposite side actually used negative magic effects such as sleeping cloud, heightened pain, slowness and so on. The holy shield could not block such cursed magic at all. If it weren't for the holy light spell, it could make him to resist the hypnotic effect of the sleep cloud. I am afraid that he has fallen into a coma on the battlefield at this time. Even so, the three magicians took turns to cast magic and release shadow arrows. Serdak couldn't get close to him, so he could only use his shield to block. This shield of Moses' blessing was in the shadow. Under the corrosion of the arrow, the surface pattern has changed beyond recognition. Make him realize that war is a waste of money. For a time, the three members of the security team were locked in a bitter fight. Soldak missed Andrew a little. If he were here, it would probably be a different situation. A fireball exploded under his feet, and Samira fell from the tree. The three H, L dogs and Serdak pounced at the same time. The three giant mouths of the H, L dogs bit down at the same time, and Serdak rounded his hands. The shield inside was smashed towards the hell dog. The sacred shield burst into a burst of holy light, and a large piece of the hell dog's head was suddenly dented. Serdak dragged Samira behind him, and the salamander leather armor on the half-elf archer was also scratched several times by the sharp claws of the three H, Lounds. The situation on the ogre side is also very bad. The torture demon's chain tightly locked the ogre Gilladam's bone-crushing club, and another chain was locked on the ogre, making it impossible for him to breathe normally. Just when the battle situation was gradually deteriorating, violent vibrations came from the distant mountains. The three mountain giants ran side by side along the mountains. Every time their footsteps fell, the ground shook violently. At first, the three magicians from the Priory prayed that they would not run this way. But after a few breaths, the magicians from the Priory discovered that the direction in which these three mountain giants were running happened to be this way. Standing in the dense forest, the top of the large forest has just reached the mountain giant's chest. And only a few super trees can be as high as the mountain giant. The mountain giant, who was running at the front, was still a few hundred meters away from Serdek. He had already grabbed a boulder the size of a millstone with one hand, and smashed it towards the torture demon in the dense forest. Shang Emo felt the roar of the wind, and he ducked to avoid the stone the size of a millstone. The ogre took the opportunity to break free from his shackles. But Gulitem was unwilling to give up his bone-crushing stick, and was still in a stalemate with the torture demon. At this time, the mountain giant, who was running in front, had already arrived in front of Shang Emo Shang Emo, who was more than five meters tall, only reached a little above the mountain giant's knees in front of the mountain giant. The mountain giant stepped over and nimbly avoided the mountain giant's kick. But it obviously ignored the two taller mountain giants behind it. Boom boom boom! Two feet larger than a house stepped on Demon Shing's body in no particular order. The demon from the flaming age. I had no power to resist and was stepped into the rocky ground. The whole body was squeezed by the rocky ground and the big feet. Next, it burst like a bubble. At the same time, spider web-like cracks also occurred in the rock and two two-meter-long footprints were clearly imprinted on it. These two mountain giants were like planters standing in the rice field, bending down to pick up the two three-headed H, L dogs in the forest, and tore them into two bloody pieces amidst their constant screams. Seeing that the situation was not good, the three cloistered magicians took the first step and rode on the magic shackles and fled towards the circular valley. The mountain giant, who was rescued by Serdak the day before yesterday, squatted in front of Serdak, stretched out his hand to lift Serdak up, and smiled. The mountain giant said, Hey, good neighbor, I'm looking for help. Let's go and drive out those intruders. His voice was like rolling thunder in the air, making Soldak feel dizzy. Serdak stood in the palm of the mountain giant's hand, looked at the tattered armor on his body, took a long breath, and said, Okay, let's drive them away now. The three mountain giants stood up in the forest and strode toward the circular valley. Serdak sat on the shoulders of the mountain giants. The three mountain giants climbed up the mountains of the circular valley 
and looked down at the valley bottom. He was shocked to see that the opposite side of the mountain was actually filled with densely packed guard camp knights. With dark armors and armors, the bright blade looked a bit dazzling in the sunlight. Led by Grand Knight Glen, 1,500 knights from the Guard Battalion Alliance finally arrived at the circular valley in Paglos Mountain. Chapter 584 Glen Knight The Southern Foothills of the Paglos Mountains Serdak stood on the shoulders of the mountain giant and had a panoramic view of the vast mountains and forests within dozens of kilometers around him. The three mountain giants let out a deep roar, and the entire land trembled. Looking down from a high altitude, the circular valley is more like a sinkhole created by a huge meteorite with a diameter of more than 10 kilometers. The surrounding mountains are not steep. Only the inner mountain walls appear very steep. And the height difference is almost hundreds of meters. The mountain giants did not stop at the top of the mountain. They slid down the steep slope to the valley bottom. And their strong bodies stirred up rolling stones and slid down to the valley bottom. The valley was in a mess. And the dense forest was completely washed away by the fourth level group water magic sea tide. And a large number of trees fell to the bottom of the valley. After the water at the bottom of the valley receded, the ruins were completely revealed. And the tide washed out dark caves from the ruins. Due to the steep mountains inside the circular valley, the knights from the guard camp could not rush down in one go. So they could only head into the valley along three rugged mountain roads. Knight Glen rode a black scale horse and walked at the end of the line with the first echelon of knights from the guard camp. Front. These knights simply could not conceal their inner horror. Three mountain giants stood on the ridge opposite them. The valley below them also looked like a scene after a typhoon. With countless dense forests lying like wheat fields. Many huge trees fell on the battlefield. They couldn't guess what kind of amazing destructive power it was that could turn this valley into the scene. Hundreds of Pompeii warriors were guarding around the cave. And some Pompeii warriors were guarding beside the temporary teleportation array. A group of magicians from the Dark Moon Gate and the Priory gathered at the entrance of the cave in the ruins of the city. McLeish Magic the Master stood in front of the magicians. He looked up at the east side of the mountain where the three mountain giants were and turned around to see thousands of guard camp knights surrounding the west side of the mountain. The knight hovered above his head and a battle was about to begin. Magician McLeish looked at the cave in front of him with a wry smile. After spending countless people's efforts, the red dragon treasure he finally found was an empty natural cave. Unexpectedly, the knights from the Bene Guard camp arrived here so quickly. Looking at the densely packed knights on the mountains in the distance, he knew that he would not be able to leave if he didn't leave. He ordered a group of magicians under his command. You guys, hurry up to the temporary teleportation array and reopen the teleportation array. Everyone must withdraw. So hurry up and do it. The magicians of the Dark Moon Gate gathered around Archmage McLeish. After hearing McLeish's instructions, they immediately mounted the magic harpoon and flew along the low altitude towards the temporary portal. Magician McLeish said to the two Pompeii Sea Tribe Witches, Dear Elder Silwani and Elder Lubica, I'm sorry that we found nothing in this treasure hiding place. The Imperial Knights are about to rush up, and we need to invite you. The three elders released a large sea tide to temporarily block this group of knights and buy us some precious time to evacuate. Two Pompeii witches stood in front of a large group of Pompeii warriors, and the atmosphere was somewhat solemn. The Pompeii Sea Tribe and the Janus Sea Tribe are about the same size, both nearly three meters tall. The difference between the two is also obvious. The Janus Sea Tribe has a human body with a fish tail, while the Janus Sea Tribe has colorful fins at the end of its tail. The Pompeii people have eel-like tails like sea snakes. They keep swinging their eel-like tails to keep their bodies upright. One of the Pompeii sea witches got a little excited and asked the great magician McLeish loudly, We have made so many preparations. Dozens of excellent Pompeii warriors paid the price with their lives. And now we actually say that there is nothing here. This is just ridiculous. Okay. Lueka, follow what the great magician McLeish said. And give the order to all the soldiers to move closer to the temporary teleportation array. We are ready to release the sea tide to block the Bene cavalry. Which Savani his eyes released a sharp light and he scolded his companions around him. Follow your orders, great elder Savani. Although Livica was still a little unwilling, she could only lower her head unwillingly in front of great elder Savani. Elder Savani calmly said to the great magician McLeish, The sea snail is still storing energy, so this tide will not last long. So please act as soon as possible. McLeish nodded quickly and said, Please summon the Pompeii warriors to leave first. The expression on elder Savani's face softened slightly and he waved to the Pompeii sea warriors behind him. 
and hundreds of Pompeii warriors began to withdraw in an orderly manner toward the temporary teleportation array. The two Pompeii wizards and Macleish's great wizard stayed where they were, looking at the mountain giant slowly sliding down the mountain with solemn expressions on their faces. The dark moon gate magicians rode on the magic shackles and arrived at the temporary teleportation array one after another. A group of dark moon gate magicians quickly activated the temporary teleportation array. At this time, the Pompeii wizard, who was guarding the door of the temporary teleportation array opened the protective light shield of the temporary teleportation array. A group of Pompeii warriors walked into the portal in an orderly manner. Seeing the Pompeii warriors retreating in an orderly manner, the knights from the guard camp slowly entered the valley along the mountain road, riding their war horses and circling in circles. Lord Glenn, they are preparing to escape. A knight scout stood on the boulder, looking at the Pompeii warriors retreating to the temporary portal at the bottom of the valley, and shouted to the Grand Knight Glenn. Knight Glenn frowned slightly and took the lead to enter the valley bottom. Pompeii warriors near the ruins gradually evacuated toward the temporary portal. He turned to look at the knights entering the valley and found that there were less than 200 knights here. Most of the guard camp knights were still crowded on the narrow mountain road. Our knights haven't completely come down yet. Wait a moment. Let us know and let the construct knights from each squadron come down. Grand Knight Glenn ordered his subordinates. The magicians of the law enforcement team in the air also began to increase the patrol area at this moment. The two Pompeii witches once again used the tide to stop the three mountain giants on the east side of the valley. And Grand Knight Glenn finally gathered 300 guard camp knights, including 15 construct knights. These constructs the knights are all squadron leaders of each squadron of the guard battalion. Most of the Pompeii marine warriors on the other side of the temporary teleportation gate had disappeared. Knight Glenn then rode his horse to the front of the team. He pulled out the storm sword at his waist, pointed at the temporary teleportation array in the distance, and shouted, All knights, follow my footsteps. Everyone rush over. More than 300 knights from the guard camp, who entered the valley one after another mounted their horses and rushed towards the temporary teleportation array. The knights from the guard camp, who came out of the rugged mountain road one after another also hurriedly joined the attacking team. The magicians of the law enforcement group in the air immediately followed the knights of the guard camp and flew to the temporary teleportation array on magic harpoons. The three mountain giants slid down the hillside and ran toward the ruins with rapid strides. As the spell sounded, the two Pompeii tribe witches raised their wands with both hands, and the surging waves gathered behind them again. But this time they were missing one witch. So the tide gathering slowed down a lot. And this time it was in the bottom of the valley is not halfway up the mountain. Therefore, a huge water level difference cannot be formed, and the resulting ground impact cannot be compared to the one the night before yesterday. However, when the tide formed, it was still very powerful. A large amount of seawater surged out of the circular valley again. The seawater formed huge waves, rising one after another behind the Pompeii witch. When the Pompeii witch used her magic to the extreme, the stacked waves were as high as 20 meters, almost as tall as the Pompeii witch. Mountain giants are the same height. Seeing the three mountain giants striding forward, the Pompeii witches could no longer accumulate seawater. They chanted the last spell in unison, and the sea tide once again seemed to have vitality, transforming into thousands of galloping horses, heading towards the three mountains. A mountain giant rushed away. The three mountain giants seemed to be well prepared this time. Facing the surging sea tide, they slowed down their pace. The three mountain giants linked arms with each other, forming a stone wall, and rushed towards the waves. The huge waves hit the mountain giants and instantly turned into countless white foam. The mountain giant's body shook violently in the sea, then stood upright again and faced the waves. The three mountain giants stood in waist-deep water. The pace slowed down, but still walked towards the two Pompeii witches very firmly. Seeing that the sea tide failed to stop the mountain giant, the two Pompeii witches looked at each other and jumped into the water one after another. Like two flexible fish, they quickly fled towards the temporary portal along the spreading seawater. The mountain giants chased the Pompeii warriors step by step. That night, the mountain giants almost died in the hands of these Pompeii warriors. This time they made a comeback. And the main target of attack was these Pompeii warriors. These sea tribesmen were slippery in the seawater. So the mountain giants could only continue to rush towards the gathering place. A group of Dark Moon Gate magicians also planned to intercept the magicians of the law enforcement group in the air and drive them out of the valley like the previous two times. But as soon as they approached the magicians of the law enforcement group, a shower of arrows shot out from the mountains at the bottom of the valley. The magicians of the Dark Moon Gate were caught off guard, and arrows hit their thighs 
and buttocks one after another. Before the official confrontation, the magicians from the Dark Moon Gate and the Priory were driven back by the archers in the guard camp. The magicians of the law enforcement group in the sky gained some courage. Morrison, the great magician from the Bina City Magic Union, led a team of magicians and continued to approach the temporary portal, with the Grand Knight Glen echoing on the ground. The great magician Morrison is full of confidence and has changed from his previous timidity. More than half of the Pompeii warriors have passed through the portal. The two Pompeii which is guarding the last layer of defense followed the incoming seawater and retreated to the vicinity of the temporary portal. The Pompeii warriors stranded here began to become anxious. At this time, a group of magicians from the law enforcement group had flown outside the temporary portal light shield, and large fireballs exploded outside the light shield one after another. The great magician McLeish did not dare to let them attack the light shield wantonly. This protective shield was more fragile than imagined. With just a dozen fireballs, the protective shield was already on the verge of collapse. A group of magicians followed McLeish. The great magician stood inside the protective shield, and a dozen magicians from the Dark Moon Gate, under the guidance of the great magician McLeish, recited the magic spell at the same time again, as a huge six-pointed star magic array emerged at the feet of the magicians. The sky was changing. The sky above the circular valley was originally clear, but in an instant, it was covered with dark clouds, and countless electric snakes scurried into the dark clouds from all sides. Thunderstorm. Bolts of lightning fell from the sky, covering a hundred meters in diameter of the mobile teleportation array. The magicians of the law enforcement group who were attacking the temporary teleportation array fled from the vicinity of the temporary teleportation gate. The great magician Morrison, who was riding on the magic handle, quickly landed on the ground. He held a wand inlaid with rubies in both hands. He raised the wand with both hands high, and his body seemed to be burning with flames. A fire elementalist came out of the void and stood next to Morrison Magician. It took the same posture as Morrison Magician and raised its hands. Countless fire elemental breaths poured into the fire elemental's body crazily and injected into the body of Magician Morrison through the fire elementalist's body as a bridge. The magic pattern array in front of Magician Morrison frantically absorbs the surrounding fire elements. This is the biggest difference between the second turn Magician and the first turn Magician. The second turn Magician not only has an elemental body, but can use the body as a bridge to absorb the surrounding fire elements. He can also sign a contract with a fire elemental to become a partner. When fighting, you can use the fire element body as a carrier to directly absorb the fire element in the surrounding air and cast large-scale group magic above level 4. A cloud of fire expanded at a speed visible to the naked eye. And then the cloud filled with fire elements rushed into the thunder waterfall covered with dark clouds. It made a series of bursts in the clouds and violently exploded and destroyed the thunder waterfall. All the dark clouds exploded. The thunderfall in the sky stopped abruptly. A group of knights from the guard camp, who rushed at the front finally arrived in front of the temporary portal. The one who rushed at the front was Knight Glenn. He took the lead and crossed the trees. The black-scaled horse under him ran like a horse. A dark cloud. He wore a dark magic patterned outfit. When charging, Grand Knight Glenn almost blended into his horse, holding a dark knight spear in his hand. In front of the protective cover of the temporary teleportation array, Countless arcs and shadow arrows were shot towards Night Glen, exploding like fireworks around his body. At the feet of Night Glen's horse, two night halos lit up in sequence, and the black shield in his hand was placed in front of his body to block those magic attacks. The black scaled horse leaped high, and the black spear was like a bolt of black lightning, instantly piercing the protective shield of the temporary teleportation array. The more than 300 knights from the guard camp, who followed behind them, rushed into the temporary teleportation formation and strangled the Pompeii Sea Tribe warriors, who had not had time to evacuate. At this time, the tide summoned by the Pompeii which at the bottom of the valley had completely disappeared. The Pompeii Sea warriors were fighting in an environment without water, and their bodies became extremely weak. Chapter 585 Harvest Grand Knight Glenn and Magician Morrison rushed into the center of the temporary teleportation array almost at the same time. The three Pompeii Sea Witches, members of the Black Magic Monastery, and members of the Dark Moon Gate have all entered the temporary portal at this moment. The Great Magician McLeish looked at the Great Knight Glen with a magic wand in his hand. Saying nothing, Fadi stepped into the teleportation gate. Grand Knight Glen and Magician Morrison stopped in unison. Even as level 2 experts, they did not dare to rush into this portal easily. God knows what kind of power lurked on the other side of the portal. Maybe the person's head is in a different place before he can escape from the state of emptiness. 
near the temporary teleportation array. There were only some Pompeii marine warriors, who had not had time to enter the temporary teleportation array. These Pompeii warriors were tall and powerful in the seawater. But after leaving the seawater, it was a different situation. The eel tails whose skin was covered with mucus could not grow. Time was swimming in the forest, its tail covered with dead branches and mud, surrounded by a group of guard camp knights. Although they could still resist vigorously, everyone could see that the strength of these Pompeii warriors was rapidly diminishing. Magician Morrison walked to the central system of the temporary magic circle first. But before he could touch the astrolabe that located the teleportation coordinates on the teleportation center, the rune plate made of thorium exploded with a snap, instantly shattered into several pieces. The magic runes that lit up the entire temporary teleportation array were gradually extinguished, and the entire temporary teleportation array stopped functioning. The Dark Moon Gate magicians hurriedly used the temporary teleportation array to evacuate the circular valley. Taking this route meant that they could not take away this priceless temporary teleportation array. However, before evacuating, Archmage McLeish also did some tricks on the temporary teleportation array. This was mainly because he was worried that the astrolabe recording the secret coordinates would be obtained by the law enforcement group. In that case, the magic of the Green Empire Astrologers Union would be lost. The masters will use the teleportation coordinates recorded on the astrolabe to deduce the secret locations of the Dark Moon Gate organization. That's why the great magician McLeish destroyed the astrolabe that recorded countless important coordinates before leaving. Just when a group of knights in the guard camp were worried that three angry mountain giants would attack everyone, everyone actually discovered that the three mountain giants actually stopped after seeing all the Pompeii warriors withdraw. And then, they seemed to be discussing after a moment. He turned and left without looking back. Many knights in the guard camp saw the scene that followed. The three mountain giants took one step ten meters away. They quickly climbed up the mountain and took a few steps forward. Inexplicably, they waved their hands behind them. As if in front of them, he conveyed kindness to the Imperial Knights and then disappeared into the foothills of the Paglos Mountains. Serdak stood on a large raised rock in the mountain and waved vigorously towards the mountain giant. At this time, the Ogre Gulitum and the half-elf archer Samira, who had fallen behind the forest, caught up with them. They stood beside Serdak and quietly watched the mountain giant leave. Andrew brought the Guard Battalion Coalition to the Ring Valley. After arriving near the Ring Valley, he left the Helensa Guard Camp and began to look for the Serdak team. He met the Hunter Carlo, who was hiding in the dense forest to avoid the war. Air. Only then did we know the whereabouts of the Serdak security team. When Andrew caught up from behind, Soldak had already reached the temporary station of the Helensa Guard Camp and was chatting with the knights from the rescue squadron outside the city. The support group outside the city was assigned the task of assisting in peripheral defense. It was estimated that they would not gain much benefit. But the victory was easy. They did not charge forward. And it would not be their turn to clean up the battlefield now. Seeing that although the three people were scarred, they all looked good. Andrew was relieved. Took a deep breath. Sat down beside the ogre Gulitum and said, I knew you would join us so soon. I won't run around looking for you anymore. He noticed the scars on Gulitum's body. The ogre had never been so embarrassed before and asked Gulitum. Gulitum, how are your injuries? I think I can eat a whole salamander this time. The ogre said to Andrew in a naive voice, under the blessing effect of the overlord body. His body was healing rapidly. This mission is over. I will accompany you to hunt salamanders in the lava river. Andrew said with a smile as he pushed the ogre's belly with one hand. Forget it. I can do it myself. The ogre held Andrew's elbow with his hand and said without appreciation. Carl and Serdak were sitting on a fallen log. The log was more than one meter in diameter, and had some white spots on its outer skin. But it looked relatively dry. Carl asked Soldak curiously, How on earth did you find this place? Serdak pointed at the inconspicuous hunter sitting in the corner, wearing tattered leather armor, and said, When the group of Dark Moon Gate magicians entered the forest on the edge of the Paglos Mountains, was discovered by a few of them. So they asked a carol to run to report to me. The others continued to stare at these magicians. They were looking for treasure hiding places in the mountains. They were not walking fast. So they kept following. In the back until you get here. Carl said in surprise. So, these magicians from the Dark Moon Gate have found the Red Dragon treasure? I don't know. Serdak shook his head and continued. There is a ruins over there. Later, when they were fighting the mountain giants, several witches summoned a sea tide and the sea water rushed in the center of the ruins. A hole was opened. But we have been unable to get close. We only know that they have been searching the hole nonstop these days. 
When Carl heard that there were ruins over there, he immediately became energetic, jumped down from the log, put his arm around Soldak's shoulders, and said excitedly, Let's go over and have a look. In fact, after the magicians of the Law Enforcement Corps cleaned the battlefield toward the temporary teleportation array, the entrance to the cave in the ruins was already under martial law sent by Knight Glenn. Carl and his group planned to walk over and join in the fun. But a group of knights stopped them with a straight face. After Carl was frustrated, he and Soldak returned to the outer defense area of the support squadron outside the city and said angrily, Oh, martial law is actually in place. Even we can't get close. They are obviously in the territory of our city of Valenza. But they are treated as if they are the masters. If I had known this, I should have left them to eat sand in the deserted Gobi Desert. This is the Paglos Mountains. The territory of the late Lord Johannes the Red Dragon. This is not the territory of the city of Halanza. The territory of Halanza only involves the edge of the deserted land. It was these people who discovered where are the members of the Dark Moon Gate organization. Captain Sauron came over and said to Carl with a smile. Yes, Lord Sauron. All the members of the support squadron stood up and saluted Lord Sauron. Carl looked a little embarrassed. But Carol heard Captain Sauron specifically ask him. So he took a step forward with his companions behind him and said loudly, Carol, the militiamen of the Deserted Land Militia Battalion, pays homage to Lord Sauron. Are you a militia member of the Deserted Land Militia Camp? Captain Sauron looked at Serdak in surprise before asking, Yes, Lord Sauron. Carol and other hunters replied in unison. Obviously, he wanted to brand himself as a militia battalion. Captain Sauron glanced at Serdak, nodded slightly to him and said, Oh, I do know about this. Marquis Bernard wants you to form a local armed force that can guard the deserted land. I thought you didn't carry out these tasks. But I didn't expect that it actually started to show results. Not bad. Serdak couldn't say at this time. I can't even count all the members of the militia battalion. Basic training has not started yet. Apart from distributing some food. These few have done nothing else at all. He could only smile at Captain Sauron. The allied forces of the guard battalion guarded the caves of the ruins. And together with the magicians of the law enforcement corps. They explored here for nearly half a month. They explored almost all the underground caves within a radius of 10 kilometers. And all the cave walls that might contain the red dragon treasure were explored. I blasted it with fire scale bombs. But unfortunately I still found nothing. During this period, the various units of the guard battalion and coalition forces gradually evacuated the circular valley. As the first echelon to evacuate the valley, the Halenza guard battalion did not receive many benefits from this mission. Under the pretext of handling official duties in the deserted land, Serdak led the security team through the deserted land and returned to Wall Village. Carol and the hunters also returned to the village early. Although they did not hunt valuable prey this time, this contribution could bring them a lot of rewards. Their names were hung on the roster of the militia camp. No matter what happens. In this way, it will not be divided completely by the above. The spoils of this mission were divided. According to the news from Carl, the magicians of the law enforcement group obtained a complete set of temporary magic arrays. Unfortunately, the most precious astrolabe was damaged. The greatest achievement of the guard battalion coalition forces was the capture of 12 dying Pompeii warriors. In addition, the guard battalion also found the location of the red dragon treasure. Destroying the conspiracy of the dark moon gave magician in one fell swoop. What makes everyone feel most discouraged is that the legendary red dragon treasure is actually fake. Although Grand Duke Angus Bradbury had a sword of Quelsera, he did not use this Quelsera to kill a red dragon. This red dragon, known as Lord Johannes, is the battle partner of Duke Angus Bradbury. Angus Bradbury himself turned out to be a red dragon knight. When Duke Angus Bradbury died, he was cursed by the magic contract and died together with him. Although this operation was a complete victory, each knight did not receive much credit. Serdak finally received the official appointment from the House of Representatives of Valencia City and became the squadron leader of the Deserted Land Security Squadron. Although the personnel organization has expanded to 60 knights, the Deserted Land wants to recruit all 60 knights. Knight, it is still a bit difficult now. At the same time, the Deserted Land Militia Battalion in Valencia City was also commended by Marquis Bernard Christie. It's so outrageous. The militia battalion personnel in the deserted land had not yet gathered together, and no training or operations have been carried out. But the commendation for the militia battalion has been passed down. Serdak could only begin to summon the guard battalion militia for the first field training after the harvest festival. 
Another gain for Soldak was the trophy seized from Magician Flanagan. This magician's magic pocket not only contained a sum of magic crystals, but also some precious items such as magic potions and magic scrolls. In addition to these, Soldak also found the crystal key that had been restored to its original state in Magician Flanagan. Unexpectedly, after going around in circles, the crystal key actually returned to Serdak's hands. Chapter 586 Early Winter The Red Dragon Treasure Incident finally came to an end after November. The joint forces of the Bena Provincial Guard Battalion and the Law Enforcement Corps foiled the plots of the Dark Moon Gate and the Black Magic Priory in the Paglos Mountains. This news was like snowflakes filling the streets and alleys. For a time, the entire Bena province was talking about this incident, and many heroic figures emerged from it. It's already very cold this season, and city residents are looking forward to the arrival of the first snow. The streets were covered with leaves from sycamore trees, which made a rustling sound when stepped on by leather boots. Some cleaning workers with jade handles gathered the leaves at the roots of the trees and piled them up thickly. They would not remove these dead leaves. Transport away. In winter, these leaves will act as a quilt for the trees, preventing them from freezing to death in extremely cold weather. Pedestrians on the street put on thick woolen coats, turned up their collars, and hurried away in the bleak autumn wind. Some cafes and barbecue restaurants are full of people, and everyone prefers this way to welcome the cold winter. Order a cup of milk tea and find a table next to the window, where you can sit leisurely all afternoon and chat quietly with a few people. Some people will discuss the Supreme Commander of the Guard Battalion Alliance, Grand Knight Glenn. It is said that this knight is a second-level strongman who was transferred back from the front line in Warsaw. There are many stories about him, but the most talked about is his piercing with a gun, the feat of creating a teleportation array protective cover. This trip to Benna will at least prevent him from returning to the Warsaw Plain in despair without securing his position as the leader of the security battalion. At this time, it was as if these people had been present at the scene, analyzing every detail, including the precise angle of the shot, clearly. Night Glen became the biggest topic in Alenta City, and even many people the noble lords all considered marrying their daughters to him. Another name that everyone talks about the most is the great magician Morrison of the Magic Union of Benna City. This great magician Morrison finally used the fire cloud to disperse the enemy magician's thunderstorm, and let the sea the citizens of Lanza believe that the great magician Morrison is likely to be promoted to a magister soon. Some people are also talking about magician Gerald. Regarding this leader of the magic community in Halinsa City, everyone can still control their mouths. It was only said that he was heroically wounded while covering the retreat of a group of men on the battlefield. And few others talked about it. As for the brave guard camp knights, they have been unanimously praised by the citizens of Halinsa City. Since these guard camp knights participated in the Maka Plain, these large-scale operations have been recognized by the citizens of Halinsa City. And even some people even openly complained, Is this still the Halinsa guard camp I know? Why does it feel like a reserve force of the constructed knights? People have a new definition of the legendary dragon-slaying sword Qualsera. Everyone says that the sword is not actually a dragon-slaying sword, but the sword of the dragon knight Angus, Duke of Bradbury. The sword may be buried under Lord Angus' tombstone. As for the so-called Red Dragon treasure, some people think that if Duke Angus Bradbury is really that rich, maybe he should buy more territory or something. In that case, his descendants will not be in poverty hundreds of years later. That's it. Of course, the biggest winner this time is generally believed by the citizens of Helena to be the law enforcement team of the Magic Union. Because this time the law enforcement group has obtained a complete set of temporary teleportation arrays. From the cornerstone to the central system to the rune pillars. These are the advanced magic pattern arrays that the space magicians of the Green Empire cannot complete independently at present. Such a complete set of temporary teleportation arrays. The door is worth at least several thousand magic crystals. Except for the lack of an astrolabe. Other parts of the temporary teleportation array were intact. So the law enforcement team got a big advantage this time. People were talking about these topics everywhere. And it was during this period that Serdak became the captain of the security squadron of the security battalion in the desert. The only people who rushed to Serdak's house in Wall Village to celebrate were his friends Carl Casement and Lance Magician. However, this also meant that Serdak had officially entered the aristocracy of Valencia City. Circle. Before leaving, Carl's words were still a little sour. Carl felt that he had been in the guard camp for more than three years before gradually climbing to the position of captain of the support squadron. Soldak joined the guard camp a year ago. The original purpose of the guard camp was to let him serve in Hylon. Seichin can have a convenient job, 
and can also receive a set of free maintenance weapons and equipment. But now, in just one year, Serdak actually became a squadron leader in the Haranza Guard Battalion. His friend Lance Magic once again expressed his gratitude to Soldak for Magic Gerald. Magic Magic Gerald was recuperating in the Helensa Magic Tower. This time, Lance made a special trip to express his gratitude to Sue. Thanks to Erdek. Serdak said to the Lance Magician from the bottom of his heart, Can you change the Shield of Moses' blessing to a new one? The metallurgical forging technology in Bena Province is really poor now. They all look beautiful. But they are all just fake. They can't stop the bites of 3H, L dogs. Soldak sent the two of them to the entrance of the village. Lance Magician had something to do. So he flew away on his magic harpoon. Carl boarded the magic caravan alone. Took Lady Mariana's luxurious magic caravan. And slowly returned to the city of Halanza. The fourth embankment of the Wall Village Reservoir is like the outermost wall of the castle. It encompasses almost the entire upper valley. In order to have enough irrigation water next spring, the gate at the downstream end of the reservoir has been closed after the harvest festival. The creek that passes through the village has exposed the bottom of the river. The villagers in Wall use all their daily water. As for the water tank led down from the upstream valley, it is a drinking water channel that is built over Wall Village. It leads from the water tank to the village square. The clear spring water flows into the circular pool in the center of the square. A group of village women squatted by the pool and chatted quietly, carrying clothes they wanted to wash. All the townhouses in the village have been built, and the streets between the townhouses have been paved with a flat layer of volcanic ash cement. The entire wall village now has a completely new look. Standing at the entrance of the village and looking up, the townhouses in the village are arranged very neatly. Some sheets and cotton padded clothes are drying on the second floor terraces of some buildings, making the village full of life. 600 cobalt slaves, led by Luke, went to the sulfur mine on the other side of the lava river. This time, the old village chief Bright expanded the scale of sulfur mining, mainly because he was worried that Serdak's money bag would be robbed. Many projects in Air Village have been hollowed out. At present, the sulfur mine in the Lava River is still the largest source of income in Serdek. The supply and sales contract signed with the Constantinople Firearms Workshop was also successfully completed. After the carriage shop's convoy returned to Halansa City, Village Chief Bright received the first payment for the sulfur ore and immediately loaded the second batch of sulfur ore onto the carriage shop's truck. These sulfur ores needed to be transported to Halansa first. Saw City. These goods must be transported to the city of Aranza first. And then the carriage company will arrange the trucks to Constantinople. After the first heavy snowfall in winter, the road to Constantinople will be very difficult. Mayor Bright doesn't care who can transport the ore. But for now, the horse carriage in Alensa City is still the safest. One's business partner. What Serdak has been busy these days is forming a militia battalion. After the harvest festival, the wheat fields in each village had been harvested. And Soldak thought it was time to gather the personnel from the militia camp. When the last trace of green in the desolate land disappeared from people's sight, the militia camp began its first round of training. Serdak's militia battalion has a total of 150 militiamen, but he has not fully recruited the militiamen. Now there are less than a hundred people gathered at the security station. Almost all the militiamen have some disabilities on their bodies. Most of the injuries on his body were from his military service. These veterans have completed four years of military service and returned to the village from the battlefield. Their lives will not change because of how many meritorious services they have performed. Whether they are lame with a leg or a veteran with a broken arm, those meritorious deeds can only be exchanged for a few meager silver coins, which cannot support them for a lifetime. During the lean summer, Baron Soldak's militia camp recruits people and has no restrictions on disabled veterans. After joining the militia camp, you can get a bag of rations every month as a subsidy. This bag of rations is not enough to support a family. They were all full. But it was better than eating those wild vegetable porridge mixed with grass roots and cassava. It was at that time that these veterans joined the militia battalions. During that season, almost all the healthy villagers went to the city of Holanza to seek life. And the only ones left in the village were those who could not travel far. Carol was injured when he went hunting in the Paglos Mountains in the spring. Due to his injury, he stayed in the village. He somehow joined the militia camp and received three months of rations in a daze. Then the militia camp issued the first one mission is to keep a close eye on outsiders in the wasteland, especially those magicians. Looking back now, luckily Carol was able to join the militia battalion. The first outdoor training of the militia camp was a little different from what the militiamen thought. There was no outdoor survival or trekking in the wild, spanning dozens of kilometers. 
Serdek just asked the militiamen to lead the way and casually walk around the villages to understand the current situation of the village residents in a deserted land. Winter is about to enter, and the villagers in each village are seizing the time to prepare for the winter. Do the villagers prefer to go there? What a dangerous place in Oak Ridge. But people there have basically been looking for the goods there over and over again. And it's not easy to find some that have slipped through the net. In comparison, the woodland resources on the edge of the Paglos Mountains are richer. But monsters are rampant there. And it is very dangerous to walk into the Paglos Mountains rashly. Serdak only brought a pair of eyes this time, and did not express any opinions on the living conditions of the villagers in the deserted land. He spent all his money to build Wall Village, just because he had some imagination with someone in Hendonar County. The original promises have now been fulfilled step by step. He has no intention of spending his own money to improve the living conditions of all the villagers in this land. He just walked around and looked everywhere. Along the way, the half-elf archer and the half-elf archer held a map and wrote on it, constantly correcting the marks of each village and connecting some roads with dotted lines, especially the Great Rift Valley in the deserted land. This training was more like an inspection in each village. And then the militiamen returned to their respective villages. Soldak only asked them to collect some intelligence on outsiders and pay close attention to the bandit group in the desert. Once traces of those bandits are discovered, they must communicate with Wall Village as soon as possible. Serdak took Samira back to Wall Village and took out a map that clearly marked the specific locations of these natural villages. Currently, the biggest hidden danger in the deserted land is the bandit groups from the desert. Every spring and autumn, these bandits will sneak out of the desert and loot villages in the deserted land. When this group of bandits looted a village, they usually only took half of the food. Otherwise, the villagers would not be able to survive. As the sheriff of the deserted land, Serdak's duty is to eliminate these bandits. Of course, this requires the establishment of an effective intelligence network. Sitting in front of the window, watching the snowflakes falling outside the window, Soldak used a wooden stick to pull the roasted chestnuts out of the charcoal fire of the fireplace. Zygna squatted opposite Soldak, hugging her knees with both hands, looking at the brown roasted chestnuts with her big eyes open, her little hands eager to grab them. Serdak used wooden sticks to accurately separate the chestnuts into two piles. Cygna squatted aside and sighed in disappointment. Although she was dissatisfied with Serdak's allocation, she had nothing to say. Her expression was extremely cute. The door was pushed open, and a cold wind blew in from outside. Selina walked in from the outside with a gust of wind and snow. She stood at the entrance and dusted off the snowflakes on her body. She hung her coat at the door with a faint smile on her face. Smile walked into the living room, first kissed Cygna on the forehead, then stood behind Soldek hugged him tenderly from behind, and placed her pointed chin on his broad shoulders. It's snowing so much. Why don't you forget to go to the cobalt slave camp? Before Soldak could finish his words of complaint, Selina took a cold breath and blocked Soldak's mouth with her soft lips. Oh! Serdak could feel that Selina was particularly proactive this time. After being separated for a long time, he patted Selina's delicate face with his hand and asked curiously, What's wrong? You're so happy? Selina waved her fist excitedly, leaned into Soldak's ear, and whispered, The prayers of the cobalt slaves have been answered by the dark goddess Selene. I finally developed some goddess followers. Serdak looked stunned. He didn't expect that these cobalt slaves would actually become believers of the dark goddess. He asked with some worry. They have become believers of the goddess Selene. Will the goddess free them from their slave status? Selina kicked off her shoes, curled up comfortably on the soft sofa, and shook her head with a smile. Serdak looked at her smiling face and asked suspiciously, You don't want to go to the Lava River Sulfur Mine to develop the 600 cobalt slaves there, do you? Selina opened her big blue eyes and asked with a look of astonishment, Have you guessed this? Chapter 587 Viscount Emmett's Visit There was a knock on the door, and Zygna ran out to open the door in her pajamas, barefoot, and heard a series of footsteps on the floor of the outer corridor downstairs. Not long after, Zygna poked her little head inside through the crack of the door and shouted to the two people sleeping hugging each other on the big bed. Someone is looking for you. Soldak, I heard it was from Hylon, the noble master who came from Saw City. Serdak sat up from the big bed with his upper body naked. He opened a corner of the curtain and looked outside. It was just morning. In the winter in Wall Village, no one wakes up so early. In the past, sleeping for a while would save breakfast. Now! No one in the village cares about the grains. But they are still used to getting up when the sun is high. There's nothing to do anyway. 
Selena was lying lazily on the bed. The room was very warm. She covered her body with a blanket. Her golden curly hair was spread out on the bed. She sat up and helped Serdak fasten the straps of his leather armor. Serdak turned around and patted her fair face and said to Selena, It's not a wise choice to go to the sulfur mine at this time. After all, it's going to snow soon. You can wait until spring. Selena kissed Serdak on the cheek, which seemed to have developed cobalt slave followers, which greatly increased her confidence. She slightly raised her delicate cheeks, raised the corners of her mouth, and said to Serdak with a hint of charm, Go and do your business. After walking out of Selena's townhouse, Andrew stood across the street and shouted, Captain. Soldak walked over and asked, Andrew, who is coming to see me? It's Lord Viscount Emmett. The indigenous warrior Andrew said to Soldak. A gorgeous magic caravan was parked outside the yard of Soldak's house. The coachman had a hat covering his face and was lying on the charioteer seat, taking a nap in the sun. Two snow-white draft horses without any stray hair stand side by side in front of the car. Soldak opened the door and walked into the courtyard. When he saw Rita coming out of the kitchen and walking out of the courtyard with a fruit plate in her hand, Soldak asked in a low voice, Lord Viscount is in the living room. Rita nodded, her face flushed, and she lowered her voice and said, Mother is talking to him. I'm going to give the coachman some food. When Serdak walked into the living room of the villa, he saw four knights from the guard camp standing on both sides of the door of the living room. When he saw Serdak walking in, he immediately performed a military salute to Serdak with a smile in his eyes, with eyes full of admiration. It was obvious that they knew Serdak. Serdak couldn't call them by name, so he could only stop and return the same military salute. The living room of the new home is also very elegant. This set of light brown soft leather sofas was given by Carl, as well as the exquisite coffee table and wall table. Old Sheila and Viscount Emmett were sitting in the living room chatting. Viscount Emmett was very talkative, and his speech and behavior are all gentlemanly. He did not expect that Viscount Emmett could actually come to Wall Village. Walk up to Viscount Emmett. And, salve. To Viscount Emmett. Lord Viscount Emmett. Viscount Emmett had a faint smile on his face and looked up at Soldak. His introverted eyes looked a bit sharp, and he said very directly, Baron Soldak, I didn't expect you to build this place so well. No wonder Lord Luther thinks so highly of you. Soldak smiled slightly, sat down on the chair opposite old Sheila, and asked, Lord Viscount, what is the purpose of your special trip to the deserted land? Viscount Emmett paused for a moment and then said, This time I was entrusted to lead the deserted land. There are two main reasons. It has been almost half a month since the deserted land security squadron was established. And I have never seen you guarding the deserted land. The battalion has received municipal funding. Let me see how the preparations for the guard battalion squadron are going. Preparatory work can be carried out slowly but the municipal funding must be received as soon as possible. If we wait until winter is over, we must submit a financial application for next year in the spring. If you don't, this year's allocation will be missed in vain. Serdak knew that there would be special funding for the formation of the squadron and the guard camp, but he did not expect that there would be so many explanations. Ah, I'm planning to go back to the guard camp to recruit some knights. Thank you, Lord Viscount Emmett, for the reminder. Viscount Emmett nodded slightly and added, This is a remote place, and there are frequent incidents of bandits washing the village. It is estimated that it will be difficult to recruit enough knights for the guard camp, but you can try recruiting at the Knight Academy. Serdak nodded noncommittally. He had never been in a hurry to do this, mainly because he didn't want to recruit the newcomers in the Knight Academy. Do you want to take them to the battlefield? Ever since Serdak saw the performance of the students of the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy on the battlefield in Handanar County, he had no good impression of these students. Viscount Emmett continued, The other thing I came here for is actually being asked by my boss to see what your attitude is. Forehead. Serdak immediately sat up straight and looked like he was listening. To be able to ask Viscount Emmett to be a lobbyist and his boss. He must be a high-ranking nobleman. Even if he is just pretending, he must be given enough respect. Viscount Emmett first looked at old Sheila sitting opposite. And then with an aristocratic smile on his face, he said to Soldak, Marquis Luther was the leader of the Constructed Swordsman group when I was in the military. I heard that you had gone to Benna City before and met Lord Luther's beloved Miss Hathaway. And you met during that time. We had a great conversation. So I made a special trip to you to ask what you mean. Lord Luther wants to marry Miss Hathaway to you. Are you willing? Soldak hesitated for a moment and glanced at old Sheila sitting opposite. 
Old Sheila's face was calm, and she sat there quietly as if she was about to fall asleep. This Count Emmett's words were not tactful at all, and there was no room for maneuver in these words. He only did not say directly to Soldak, Marquis Luther wants to marry his daughter to you. For this reason, I, I came here to inform you. Please accept it happily. Serdak pondered for a moment and then said, Actually, I plan to rush to Benna City in person after the Harvest Festival to seek the opinion of Marquis Luther. If the Marquis agreed, I would propose to Miss Hathaway. However, things here in the desolate land have kept me from doing so. To get away. That's why I haven't been able to leave for a long time. Old Sheila's eyelids moved, and she raised her head to look at Soldek, with a hint of surprise in her cringing eyes. This Count Emmett did not know the relationship between Soldak and Hathaway, but was asked by Marquis Luther to come here to ask Soldak what he thought. After hearing what Soldak said, he immediately smiled at Soldak and said, So that's it. Lord Luther also said in the letter that you and Miss Hathaway had a very happy conversation at the ball. But I don't know why. There is no follow-up. You performed particularly well in the Maka Plain War. Lord Luther admires you very much. When Viscount Emmett said this, his tone became more cordial. After all, the newly promoted noble baron in front of him would marry the daughter of Marquis Luther. This visit to Wall Village was probably mainly for this matter. He didn't care much about the establishment of a guard battalion squadron in the deserted land. When he saw Soldak expressing his love at first sight for Miss Hathaway, he acted very happy. It can be regarded as a successful completion of his mission. This Count Emmett did not stop at Wall Village, but only had a not-so-luxurious lunch at Soldak's house, and then left in the luxurious magic caravan. The warm sunshine in the afternoon shone on the oak floor in the living room. Old Sheila was leaning on the lounge chair, her legs covered with blankets, her eyes closed, and she seemed to be asleep. Little Peter sat on the floor, stacking blocks that smelled faintly of pine, and he built a castle on the floor. Soldak walked in and little Peter quickly ran over and hugged Soldak's thigh, begging him to join him in the building block game. Serdak touched little Peter's head and said to him softly, Aunt Rhea seems to have something for you. What does it want to give me? Little Peter immediately gave up the blocks in his hand and ran out of the house. Soldak rubbed his hands and sat on the chair opposite old Sheila. He didn't rush to speak, and just sat there quietly enjoying the quietness of the afternoon. Old Sheila slowly opened her eyes. The wrinkles on her face had deepened a lot and her hair was almost completely white. She seemed to have become older during this year. Is it the master who made you a noble? Old Sheila asked slowly. Yes, Serdak replied. What's his daughter's personality like? Old Sheila asked again, with a hint of worry in her eyes. It's okay, Soldak said. Old Sheila sat up from the recliner, looked at him seriously and said, You have now become a noble and the sheriff of the deserted land. If you wish, we will not object. But I hope you can do it in the future treat Natasha as always. Well, I think you need to discuss this matter with Natasha. After all, it will affect her life. I will. Serdak did not expect that old Sheila was not so repulsive to this matter. Seeing Soldak's hesitant expression, old Sheila's eyes moved from his face to the window, where a bird flew past the window. Old Sheila said softly to Soldak, I know that during this year, you have been doing your best to make our life better. I have seen him in my dreams more than once. I told him about our current life. He also kept telling me, You should also have your own life. Your life should not be just this small wall village. You have your own journey. This is everything for me. Soldak looked into old Sheila's eyes and said, I know. You have always done this. A faint smile finally appeared on old Sheila's face with a hint of melancholy. And she added, Go and have a good talk with your wife. She is so gentle. Serdak stood up and said, I will try to get her permission. Serdak felt that there was no way to talk about this matter. It's so shameless to tell my wife that I want to marry another woman. He's not that thick-skinned. So he had been struggling all afternoon. He wanted to organize his words well to prevent Natasha from reacting too violently. Natasha was folding clothes. There was a faint fragrance in the room. There was also a set of leather armor hanging on the wooden shelf in the corner. She also planned to apply some grease on the Soldak leather armor. She was wearing a cotton skirt, wearing a sheepskin fur vest. A happy smile filled his face. Seeing Serdak walking in from the door, he quickly walked over and helped Serdak take off his soft leather armor. Serdak turned around and held Natasha in his arms, caressing her back with his hands, and said to her, I may want to marry a noble lady. Yeah, I know. Rita told me everything. Natasha rested her head on his shoulder, her eyes brightening. 
I want to know what you think. Soldek asked guiltily. What? Natasha was stunned for a moment and asked strangely. What about getting another wife? Soldek said. Is she the lady from the noble family who recommended you to become a baron? Natasha stared at Soldek and asked. Yes. Serdek replied. Natasha asked uneasily. Then will she drive me away? No. I promise. Soldek said. After hearing this, Natasha became happy again. She said, Oh, I will get along well with her. Don't you blame me? Serdek asked in surprise. Natasha smiled reluctantly, and then said in a low voice, I know that when you become a noble baron, you are his confidant. If you want to make this relationship more stable, besides marrying your daughter to you, what else can you do? Is there any better way? Daughters of noble families in Halanza City almost all have to accept this fate. I know that. She lay in Soldak's arms and whispered. Serdak has recently been busy preparing to build a guard battalion squadron. And has also led the militia battalion in a large circle in the desolate land. He does not know much about what has happened in Wall Village recently. He only knows about level 4 after the rough construction of the water storage was completed. The old village chief ordered all the gates to be closed and was working hard to store water in the reservoir. After the townhouses in the village are built, the villagers will also go to Oak Ridge to pick some chestnuts, mushrooms, etc. And they will also stock up on rations such as cassava for the cobalts. Some villagers also follow Bright Village. We will continue to open up tidal flats and strive to transform more swamplands into fertile farmland. The cobalt slaves began to use a large amount of volcanic ash cement to build roads. Serdak planned to build a flat and wide road between the deserted land and Halinsa City. This road was just an expansion of the original roadbed. Therefore, as long as there are enough manpower and material resources, it is not difficult. He didn't know anything about other things that happened in Wall Village during this period. For example, the old village chief announced the reward and punishment system for cobalt slaves. And the village also established a convoy. As Wall Village has undergone earth-shaking changes, at least the villagers will no longer lack food and clothing. And they can live in warm houses before the winter blizzard. Therefore, during the period after the harvest festival, Many young people in Wall Village the villagers held weddings. And many people from other villages wanted to marry their daughters to Wall Village. Even marrying two wives on the same day was not unusual. Because everyone knew that at least marrying to Wall Village would not be possible. Starve no more. The population in the village has increased dramatically during this period. And it is estimated that the population of Wall Village will increase significantly next summer. Chapter 588 Robbers in the Desert Early morning. When Serdak woke up, Natasha beside him was no longer there. A pile of clothes with the smell of sunshine were neatly placed on the bedside. Soldak got dressed and walked out of the bedroom. Arriving at the restaurant, old Sheila and little Peter were already sitting at their seats. Natasha wore an apron and brought out oatmeal and multi-grain cakes from the kitchen. Rita walked in from the outside with some grass blades still on her apron. I should have gotten up early to feed the family cow and the gubwa horse. Serdak still remembered the first time he saw Rita. At that time, she looked disheveled. Even though she was hungry every day, she could still feel that her body was very strong. Now that she eats better, her whole body looks better. It swelled up like a balloon. And the shoulders and thighs were very fleshy. Now Rita is also a big girl. And there are always some other thoughts in her clear eyes. Old Sheila is also considering Rita's marriage. Many young people in the village have a good impression of Rita. Only in recent times have many young people become estranged from Rita. The main reason is that Serdak has been promoted too quickly in recent times. Young people who have some thoughts about Rita are now almost afraid to come out to find Rita. For fear that they will actually be together in the future. If anything goes wrong, his brother, Baron Serdak, will lead a group of men to beat him half to death. Many people say that Serdak is now the master of this desolate land. Soldak also felt that Rita's husband should not be a farmer in a deserted land. He told old Sheila about this, and maybe he could find a young guard camp knight. Old Sheila sat in the main seat. Natasha sat down next to Soldek. And Rita sat opposite Natasha. Natasha sat down after everyone in Natasha's family had their plates filled with the food they needed. Taking a spoon and scooping a spoonful of oatmeal into her mouth. Rita asked Serdak vaguely. I heard that the Red Dragon treasure is just an underground cave with nothing. Well, there is no treasure there. And there is no Quelsera. Serdak said while chewing on a piece of multigrain cake. I'll just say it. Rita said with satisfaction, blinking her big clear eyes. Little Peter couldn't understand what Soldek said. So he turned to Rita and asked, Auntie, 
What is Qualsera? Seeing little Peter asking, Rita patiently told little Peter the legend of the sword of Qualsera, which made little Peter almost forget to eat. Soldat came to the security station, preparing to arrange the daily affairs in the security office, and then went to Alinsa City to apply for funds to form a guard battalion squadron in the deserted land. According to what Viscount Emmett said, if he did not get it quickly, when I come back, this funding will be cancelled soon. As Viscount Emmett said, there will naturally be funds for next year. Andrew was already familiar with the magical power given by the Rage Flame Magic Pattern clothing. He was standing in the yard, holding the butcher in his hand with burning flames, and was competing with the ogre in martial arts in the yard. The ogre girl at the bone-crushing stick held in Moo's hand. Whenever he was at a disadvantage, would forcefully use brute force to erase the advantage that Andrew had worked so hard to establish. Serdak stood by the flower pond and watched for a while. When he saw Samira sitting at the door taking care of the withering painting long bow in her hand, he walked over and said to her, I plan to go to the Lensa soon. City. The patrols and the deserted land will continue. Before winter, I estimate that the bandits hiding in the desert may come here to loot the villages. We cannot let them do whatever they want. If there is a chance, I also want to go into the desert to see where the bandits are hiding. I heard that there are dozens of oases hidden in the desert. I always have to go in and clean them up to let them know who has the final say in the desolate land. How long are you going for? When no one else is around, Samira will pull back the hood on her head, and her light red eyes will glow in the sunlight. At this time, Andrew also stopped and walked over, and said to Soldak, Captain, how about you let me bring some water and dry food? Go into the desert and kill those bandits. Serdak waved his hand and said, Wait a little longer. When I establish the security squadron of the security camp in the deserted land, we will go to the desert together to see it. What you need to do now is to help I'll take care of this place. The ogre walked up to Soldak with a big belly and said to him angrily, Captain, I want to go to the sulfur mine. There has been no message there for a while. I'm worried about so many kobolds. The slaves have become food for the salamanders. After Andrew withdrew the flame, he would sharpen the edge of the butcher's axe again with a whetstone and wipe it carefully with an oil rag. While wiping the weapon, he said, The truck transporting sulfur or did not just come from the mine the day before yesterday. Are you coming back from the field? Didn't you say that the security situation there is fine? A few days ago, Luke rescued an adventure group that strayed into Pussy Mountain. Don't you think they saw the boundary marker? The ogre didn't care much about his bone-crushing club. The traces of blood had not been cleaned off yet. Maybe it will come out in the next few days. I'll take a look and come back. The ogre said to Andrew with a smile. Wearing a loose long skirt, Aphrodite leaned out from the second floor terrace and said to Serdak in the yard, Captain, I want to go to the city of Valenza with you. She didn't wear the cold mithril mask, and her eyes were naturally charming. Serdak said, Are you going to Valenza city? Aphrodite nodded. Her loose cotton skirt formed two clear drop-shaped outlines on her chest. She leaned on the railing with a look of anticipation on her face. Aren't you afraid that the law enforcement team will discover your identity? Serdak raised his head and looked at Aphrodite and asked. I can become your attendant. After saying that, Aphrodite drew a magic pattern array for herself. And as she recited a series of magic spells, dots of blue magic light circled and fell from Aphrodite's head. Just above Aphrodite, the moment Rhodey's spell stopped, he suddenly turned into a young knight, and even his clothes turned into a set of ordinary leather armor, and he even had a decorative sword on his waist. Serdak and Andrew both opened their mouths in shock. It was hard to imagine how such big breasts and butts could disappear in an instant. Aphrodite in front of them had a neutral beauty. But those eyes but it's still dark purple, and it's still indescribably beautiful. She stood on the terrace and walked around, and said proudly to Soldak, What do you think, Captain? Can you guarantee that the magicians in the city won't detect this? Serdak was a little worried and couldn't help but ask. Absolutely not. I promise. Aphrodite patted her chest with her hand and said proudly. Then he complained and sarcastically said to Soldak, I've never seen you be so careful before. It's true that the more daring you are in your position, the less daring you will be. Serdak remembered the time he met Aphrodite on the execution ground and remembered that she was a bird with her wings cut off and that she had turned her back on Asmodon, the king of sin, although she gradually settled down in Wall Village. I have never left Wall Village for so long. Although this place cannot be said to be a prison, Aphrodite wants to go outside and have a look. Serdak can still understand this feeling. He pondered for a while, 
then stood downstairs and said to Aphrodite, who had turned into a handsome guard upstairs, Okay, this time you go to Helensa City with me, but you must remember not to cause trouble for me. Otherwise, this kind of thing will not happen again in the future. You agreed? Got it. I promise. Aphrodite cheered excitedly. He no longer changed back to his original appearance and just ran downstairs like this. Serdak asked for an ancient bolai horse from the old village chief. He and Aphrodite rode away from the entrance of the village. The weather was getting colder and colder, and the market at the entrance of the village gradually became depressed. Several villagers set up stalls, and Aphrodite rode a horse, happily following Serdak. The villagers who knew Serdak had to look at Aphrodite with surprise. Soldak was about to ride his horse to the Paglos Pass, when an injured donkey appeared on the Lus Road in the distance. A villager was lying on the back of the donkey. Soldak after being promoted in level. His five senses also improved. Although he was far away, he still saw some blood stains on the man carried on the donkey's back. He took the reins of Gubalai's horse, turned its head, and slapped the horse's rump with the whip in his hand, urging it to run faster. The Gubalai horse ran in front of the donkey like a gust of wind. Soldak jumped off the Gubalai horse and walked in front of the donkey. He saw a villager lying on the donkey's back. The injuries were not too serious. They were just stab wounds. The wounds were not deep, but there was a lot of blood loss. His skin was pale white. His hands and feet were slightly cold, and he only had one breath left. Serdak quickly carried him to the roadside and let him lie flat on the ground. At this time, Aphrodite also caught up from behind. Seeing this situation, he quickly rode to the police station to find Andrew and Samira. The ogres. Serdak condensed a ball of holy light in his hand and let this ball of holy light get close to the wound on the villager's body. The warm holy light slowly integrated into the villager's body, and his breathing and heartbeat slowly recovered. The unconscious villager gradually had a painful expression on his face, and then his eyelids trembled twice, and he slowly opened his eyes. Lord Serdak. He recognized Serdak as soon as he opened his eyes. Excitement. Sadness. Anger. Lamentation. Different emotions appeared on his face at the same time. Soldak quickly comforted him. Don't be excited. Tell me slowly what happened. Lord Serdak, hurry up and save our good village. Those desert bandits are coming to rob our village again. Please save my family as soon as possible. The villager cried to Serdak with a sad face. It turned out to be those bandits. How long has it been since they attacked Guda village? Serdak took a quick look at the sky, and it was almost noon. The villager took two breaths and then said, They entered the village last night. Someone saw them rushing into the village. The village chief asked me to ride a donkey and run out to deliver the message. Some robbers noticed that I ran out. So I chased on horseback. And I rushed into the rocky hillock in one breath. And then I used the rocky area there to get rid of the pursuing robbers. Seeing that the villager was a little weak and had a lot of wounds from the knife, Soldak saw that his life was not in danger. So he let him lie on the side of the road. Then he took out a finely marked map from his arms. First he drew a line between the desert and Guda village. And then he drew a line between Guda village and Wall village. A line was drawn at the edge of the desert. And a triangle just appeared on the map. Serdak thought in his mind that even if he arrived at Guda village now, the bandits should probably loot the village and escape. Captain! What happened? Andrew's voice came from far away. Serdak did not raise his head. He bet that these bandits did not dare to stay in the deserted land for too long. They were probably on their way back to the desert if they rushed directly from Wall Village to the edge of the desert. With luck, they should be able to catch these bandits. Jia live. It's those bandits from the desert who ran out and looted Guda Village. Andrew, Samira, and Gulitam. You go with me to the edge of the desert to stop them. Aphrodite, you stay in the village. Soldak, he mounted his horse and gave instructions to everyone. Andrew and Samira followed Serdak on horseback. The ogre carried a bone-crushing stick and stood behind them barefoot, looking eager to try. Only Aphrodite jumped off her horse with a depressed look on her face, stood on the side of the road and complained. I knew it would be like this. So you can go with ease? Serdak pulled the reins and stopped the horse. He turned around and said to Aphrodite, If this operation goes well, I will allow you to go to the city of Halanza alone. Aphrodite's eyes suddenly brightened and she asked Serdak, Are you serious? Of course it's true, Soldak said with certainty. After saying that, he raised his riding crop and took Andrew, Samira and Gulitam to fly towards the edge of the desert. This time, Serdak led the militia group to train in the deserted land. 
nothing was done. The only thing was to determine the locations of the villages in the deserted land. In addition, the nearest roads connecting each village were also marked. On the map, the deserted land looks flat. But in fact the fault zones, gentle hills, and rift valleys in the deserted land also form a very complex terrain. If you are not familiar with the terrain here, it is easy to take a long way around. They had to pass through a gap in Gale Valley, cross the Rift Valley, and then go around a patch of Redridge Mountains before they could take a shortcut and reach the edge of the desert in advance. In order to catch up with these bandits in time without destroying the warhorse, Serdak could only ruthlessly take out the heads of 4H, L dogs and sacrifice them to the face of God. In exchange for the blessing effect of blessed body, the three war horses were blessed. And the ogre Gulitum was blessed with the blessed body. A group of four people ran until dusk and saw the huge sand dunes that were almost connected at the edge of the deserted land. From a distance, those sand dunes look like the scales of a giant beast. There is a dry atmosphere at the edge of the desert. The sky is getting darker and the temperature here is getting colder. Chapter 589 The New Master of the Deserted Land a red sunset slowly sank into the endless sea of sand. The clouds on the horizon are connected into a light orange gauze, which is connected with the endless yellow sand. The color in front of you is a complete gradient from light yellow to orange. The sky gradually darkened. Night came, and the warm sand quickly turned cold. Serdak looked up at the stars that gradually lit up in the night sky. The gap at the edge of the desert was more than 10 kilometers long. It was almost impossible to monitor the entrance to this desert at night. In desperation, Serdak once again opened the sacrificial altar and consumed three three-headed H, L dog heads to bless Samira with the blessing effect of insight. After the sacrificial altar could obtain a more powerful blessing effect, Serdak found that the sacrifices he had stored were obviously not enough. The team found the highest sand dune nearby, and Samira stood on the top of it. She was like a silent cheetah, lurking there quietly. The camel team passed through the red rock wall full of gravel. The thick fleshy palms of the camel humps walked very slowly on the gravel. Some strong men with dark red turbans on their heads led the camels. And their faces were full of tears. Looking tired. Each camel was dragging two heavy bags of supplies on its back. These people walked silently in the darkness without talking to each other. A huge shadow appeared in front of us. And soft and cool sand appeared in front of us. We finally reached the edge of the desert. Just like fish swimming back into the sea. The tense heartstrings of these strong men relaxed slightly, and someone was about to step on them. The scimitar on the waist was rehung on the hook next to the hump. The strong man walking in the front pulled away the gauze covering his face. His sharp eyes like a falcon looked behind him. And then he pressed his body to the ground and listened for a while. When he stood up, the camel team behind us followed. The strong man took off two water bags from the side of the hump and threw them to the men beside him. Then he pursed his dry lips and said in a hoarse voice, all team members will rest where they are for a while. They will not be able to rest until they go into the desert and walk back to the oasis. The strong men leading the camels immediately gathered around the two water bags, sharing the clear water in the water bags, and then laid down on the soft beach with their scimitars in their arms, squinting their eyes to relax quickly. The strong man took a few steps toward the top of the sand dune. The soft sand kept flowing downwards. Every step he took would almost send him back to where he was with the quicksand. Behind him, an old man with gray beard and hair slowly walked up. His eyes were eroded by time, making them cloudy and burnt. He hunched over, stood beside the strong man, and said to him, A Wang, we shouldn't have killed so many villagers. And we took too much food this time. It is estimated that some people will not survive this winter. Maybe this village will be deserted next year. And we will no longer be able to get food here. Even if we can't grab food, it will only be next year. If we don't grab it, we won't even be able to survive this year, no one said coldly. The strong man Awang sat down on the slope of the dune. The soft sand made him feel inexplicably at ease. The old man also sat down with him and said in a nostalgic tone, In the past, when we went to the deserted land, we didn't even need to cross the Windy Rift Valley. It was only half a day's journey to the desert. Basically, we had to go early. If you go out, you can come back at night. At that time, there were many villages close to the Great Rift Valley. They cultivated oat fields next to the Rift Valley. In the fall, we will collect some oats. The old man sighed, and then said, In the early days, those who were willing to make a living in the deserted land were poor exiles. Later, some wanderers and criminals came here, and they settled here. After more than ten generations of hard work, 
some villages were slowly formed. There is a sand sea of nearly a thousand kilometers between here and Barbetala province. And the closer we get, the more desolate the sand becomes. Even people like us who are familiar with the desert, if we don't know about the hidden oases, would come here to rob the villages. The old man continued. Later, other bandit groups in the desert saw that we could always survive the severe winter safely, and the secrets of the deserted land slowly leaked out. Those people did it more ruthlessly than us, and they killed more people. Killing. The land is slowly becoming desolate, and there are basically no villages to the west of the Gale Rift Valley. A robber on the side handed the water bag to the old man. The old man took a cherished sip and then said, The villages now hidden in the deserted lands are very hidden. They are usually hidden in mountain valleys, and they are far away from the desert. Sometimes there is no harvest, and there are many less bandit groups willing to come here. A wang spat out blood streak spit and said to the old man, If that old dog Gage hadn't been very cruel and drove us all to the eastern part of the desert, I wouldn't have risked entering the deserted land. I heard that there is a new baron here, and he is ruthless. And there are still hundreds of robber corpses hanging on the top of the Paglos Pass. The old man sighed again. A wang then cheered up and said, But this time our harvest is pretty good. With this food, plus what we accumulated before, it should be enough to get through this winter. When next spring comes, I will let's try to see if we can cross that big meadow in the northwest. I heard there are many wandering herdsmen raising horses there, as well as herds of wild horses and yellow sheep. So it's easier to survive. The old man shook his head again and said, The nomadic herdsmen have many animals, but the Durwa herdsmen are all good at riding and archery. They ride green songs of Chinlin horse descent, and they stare at them on the grass. Our camel team cannot escape them. Before the old man could finish these words, a scream came from the silent night. Ah! The strong man Awang suddenly stood up from the sand and asked loudly in the direction of the scream. What's going on? A subordinate ran over in the darkness and ran to the leader in a panic. He said with horror on his face. Chief Awang, Ganda has been shot to death. Awang's eyes widened and he walked towards the darkness. As he walked, he asked, Where is the enemy? The bandits around him held weapons in their hands and looked around. The panicked subordinate pointed to the top of the hill and said hesitantly, It seems to be over there. Leader, It's too dark, and I can't see where the arrow came from. It seems to be over there. At this time, a wang had found the man who had been shot through the throat on the sand dozens of meters away. He looked at the top of the sand dune with a pair of sharp eyes, and shouted in a deep voice. Follow me! A group of men gathered around a wang, wearing leather armor and holding scimitars in their hands, and rushed up the sand dune at a fast pace. In the dark night, the arrows that had been flying silently pierced the forehead of a sand thief. The sand thief was immediately pushed back by the huge force, and his whole body rolled down the sand dune. He even screamed. No chance. Immediately afterwards, a sand bandit behind him was shot through the shoulder by an arrow. Marksman! Shield, a wang growled through gritted teeth. He didn't lose any men along the way. He was about to enter the desert when he was blocked by an unknown team with a marksman. He gritted his teeth and ran towards the top of the sand dune. His men behind him hurriedly rushed follow up. He couldn't remember which bandit group had such a powerful archer. In the darkness, a wang only felt that his body was locked from a distance. It was a mysterious and mysterious combat intuition. This kind of intuition had never saved him on the battlefield. How many times had this feeling arisen in him when he faced the darkness at this moment? A wang did not hesitate at all. His whole body was like a fish jumping into the water. His waist suddenly turned over. And his whole body suddenly turned around and moved five to the right. Position. I saw a black arrow flying silently from his original position. And another flying arrow flying close to his cheek. The sharp hook carved a bloody groove on his face. A wang stopped. Halfway up the sand dune. Huddled in a ball. He had never been so close to death. Samira, who was standing on the top of the hill, let out a light sigh, drew her bow again and fired an arrow, shooting down two bandits who continued to charge upward. The bandits were almost rushing to the top of the sand dune. The bandits in front held shields in their hands, but ten brothers lay down during the charge. A wang rushed to the top of the sand dune and saw an ogre over three meters tall wearing simple black shoulder pads waiting there with a bone-crushing stick in his hand. A chill rose from the soles of his feet. And he suddenly remembered there was a rumor among the bandits before. I heard that among the retinues of the newly arrived noble lords in a deserted land was an ogre and an elf archer. Unexpectedly, the archer turned out to be of the bloodline of the night elf. Ability to see at night. 
A Wang regretted his recklessness. His body was like a strong sand wolf. Stepping on the soft sand and rushing toward the right side of the ogre's waist. The scimitar in his hand wanted to follow the ogre's waist. A wound was made on the left side of his forehead. The bandit and a wang beside him cooperated very well and pounced directly on the ogre's right rib. The ogre ignored a wang and the robber at all and swung the bone-breaking club in his hand. It was a circle. And the robber who rushed forward swept out sideways. A wang took the opportunity to lower his body, almost pressing his body against the sand, barely avoiding the sweep. And then the scimitar in his hand drew a strange arc. Just when the blade was about to approach the ogre, a dwarf chain shield appeared in front of the blade. The scimitar struck the sharp jagged edge of the dwarf chain shield, splashing out a trace of sparks, and a silver light covered the shield. A wang he felt a countershock force that made his wrist rise suddenly. Before he could counteract the momentum, a blood red sword light flashed in front of him. A wang did not feel how sharp the blood red crescent was. He only felt that his sight was not controlled by his body, and the surrounding scenery suddenly rotated violently. The severe pain in his neck was transmitted to his brain. He seemed to be flying up, but he was so light. In the rotating night, he saw a body standing in the sand with blood spurting from its neck. He looked at it in horror. Looking at the scene in front of me, I realized at this moment that I had been beheaded by my opponent. A wang's head rolled down on the sand dune, and the headless body fell to the sand with a thud. Drink! The ogre shouted loudly, and swung the bone-crushing stick in his hand to fly away five bandits, who rushed up. Almost all the lumbar vertebrae of the bandits hit by the bone-crushing stick were broken, like wheat cut by a sickle in autumn. The body was also swept into two parts. Who are you? Someone in the bandit group shouted angrily. But no one answered. Everyone! Spread out and run! Hurry! Someone among the robbers shouted with an accent different from that of a deserted land. The robbers running behind didn't even see clearly what was happening in front of them. Someone shouted this voice. And dozens of robbers immediately fled in all directions. No longer looking at the battlefield behind them. They are very experienced in escaping. Almost all of them curl their bodies into a ball and roll down the dune continuously when rushing down the dune. Under the sand dunes, Andrew had already killed several bandits guarding the camel caravan. He was holding a butcher's axe in his hand, standing in front of the sand, stepping on the head of an old bandit with gray hair under his feet, and spitting out the grass roots in his mouth, looking at the sand pirates rolling down quickly. His eyes were filled with blood. The battle at night went much smoother than Serdak imagined. After Samira had the ability of insight, she almost chased and killed the bandits who escaped into the night. Compared to the battlefield on the dunes, the battle under the dunes was too bloody. The indigenous warrior Andrew held an axe in both hands, like a wild boar rushing into a cabbage field. He never thought about the integrity of the robber's body. The axe in his hand was round. He stood up and struck the skull, and the skull instantly shattered. Serdak even thought about whether the heads of these bandits could be taken out as sacrifices. But he just thought about it. If he really sacrificed them, he would probably be labeled a heretic soon and be enchanted. The magicians of the Union Law Enforcement Team are hunting everywhere. Before dawn, Serdak even had a chance to take a nap. More than 40 camels have been connected in a string by ropes. And the supplies on each camel's back have been counted. Most of them are carrying wheat grains and some messy mountain goods. As well as some tents to keep out the cold and other supplies. Some supplies were even stained with dried blood. Serdak put the heads of all the robbers into boxes. These heads were handed over to the guard camp and they could also receive some meritorious rewards. While helping the half-elf archer Samira collect the camel team. The ogre discovered a camel with a broken leg. So by the morning, the camel had turned into a veritable roasted camel. The ogre held a huge hump and bit into it, his mouth full of grease. When the sky completely brightened, the headless corpses that could not be taken away from the battlefield had been strung up with dozens of spears and stood on the top of the sand dunes, along with these piles of corpses. There was also a giant stone weighing several thousand kilograms. Rock bar. This huge rock is about three meters high, Placed on the sand dune, there is a line of imperial text. Desolate land boundary. Engraved on it. Chapter 590 Return to the village. Under the dusk. Gouda village looked depressed and dilapidated. Now it had just been plundered by desert bandits. And the whole village was immersed in grief and despair. The cold winter was coming. The bandits took away all the food they could find in the village and killed more than 20 villagers who resisted them. Many villagers were injured under the force of the bandits except for some who had been hidden in secret cellars. Apart from food, there is almost nothing left in Gouda village. From a distance, 
he saw wisps of smoke rising from Guda village. Serdak rode his horse to the entrance of Guda village. And he stopped Gubalai's horse. On the hill not far from the west side of the village entrance. A group of people gathered there. Serdak and Andrew rode over and saw a group of listless villagers holding mining picks in their hands and digging hard on the rocky ground. There are about a dozen tombs that have been excavated. And they must have been buried. On top of the tombs, there is a semicircular stone platform built with gravel. In front of the stone platform, there is a board with scrawled writing on it. Seeing Serdak coming over, the group of Guda villagers with numb eyes gave way to the main road and walked around the cemetery. There were still six corpses of villagers that had not been buried here. So the villagers continued to dig new ones. At the tomb, some villagers stared at Serdak with some hostility. As if complaining that he came so late. The surrounding atmosphere was a bit depressing. And there were faint cries of sadness. Some women and children were picking up some stones in front of the tombstones that had been built. And around the tombs that had not yet been dug. Their steps were empty. The shock and sadness were still clearly printed on his face. When Serdak returned to the village entrance, the village chief of Guda village was already waiting there. He was looking at the camels with horror on his face. When he saw Serdak coming back on horseback, he immediately recognized the baron from the police station. With a trace of sadness in his eyes, he walked up to Serdak and paid him a deep respect. Bowing deeply, he raised his head and said to Serdak, Baron Serdak, I am the head of Guda village. Do you still remember me? Serdak jumped off his horse and said to the village chief, Of course. I just came here with the militia battalion a few days ago. Village Chief Huggins, I received a report from the villagers that this place has been looted by desert bandits. The current situation, how about it? 21 villagers died. Basically all the young men in the village. Among them were three militiamen from the militia battalion. There were more injured villagers. About 30. Village Chief Huggins stood there with a dejected face. Said with his eyes chasing Soldak. All three of my militiamen died in the battle. Serdak asked again. They and other villagers tried to keep the bandits out of the village. But they were hacked to death by the bandits riding camels. As he spoke, village chief Huggins couldn't help but glance at the security teams behind Soldak. Members and camel teams. Serdak knew what kind of doubts village chief Huggins had in his mind. He said, After hearing the news about the desert bandits looting the village in our street, I rushed to the edge of the desert to intercept them. I guess you can see it too. This camel team belongs to them. Take me to see the injured villagers. Maybe I can help them with their injuries. With that said, Serdak walked into the village. Huggins quickly followed from behind. He led the way and led Soldak into the dilapidated Guda village. Perhaps because some villagers were still there at the cemetery. The village seemed very quiet. When Huggins village when the chief arrived at the village square, Serdak discovered that a group of villagers were waiting in the village square. When some villagers in the village saw Chief Huggins returning with a group of Soldak, they gathered around him. Soldak walked to a dromedary, patted the goods they carried hard, and told Chief Huggins, Mr. Huggins, take the grain and mountain goods that belong to you. After getting off the camel's back, the first thing I did when I came to Guda village was to return the materials stolen by the bandits to everyone. The villagers in the square exploded with a bang. They had been completely desperate for life. When they heard that Soldak had recovered all the lost materials, the hope of living was rekindled in their eyes. Some even he was so excited that the crowd cried, Woo woo. No matter how strong a person is, they are all moved by the scene in front of them. Serdak's figure suddenly becomes taller. Serdak raises his voice and says again to the villagers in the square, In addition, please help spread the word to those who are injured. When the villagers come here, I can help them deal with their injuries, especially those with more serious injuries. Even if I lift them, I have to carry them here. Village Chief Huggins immediately made arrangements. First, he called on a group of villagers with relatively quick hands and feet to unload the supplies from the camels one by one. Bags of grain were piled again in the village square. And then a group of injured villagers were helped to the village square. Serdak was in the village square, treating these villagers on the spot, and would casually ask about the injury process. When he met brave villagers, he would also compensate them with some of the property confiscated from the robbers. He was the one who separated the brave and the cowardly. To distinguish, Although all villagers can receive treatment, the brave ones will receive an extra piece of property. Serdak is already very proficient in the use of holy light. So this treatment process is very fast. By the time the treatment for the last injured villager was completed, a bonfire had been set up in the village square. 
and the villagers who had buried their relatives in the cemetery had also returned to Guda village one after another. They had learned that Baron Serdak had returned all the news of food being taken away left them with only the grief of losing their loved ones. For the families of these victims, Serdak also gave some additional compensation, especially to the three militiamen of the militia battalion. It is said that they were very courageous when facing the desert bandits. Serdak even gave these three militiamen a pension of five gold coins for each family member of the battalion militiamen. With such a high pension, even those soldiers who died on the front line did not receive such treatment. The family members of the three militiamen were even a little overwhelmed holding five golden gold coins. They usually rarely get silver coins. See, what's more, these are heavy and golden gold coins. The front of the gold coins is printed with the head of the first generation monarch of the Green Empire. And the back is the vast territory of the Green Empire. Standing in the village square, Mayor Huggins also looked very excited. Originally, he thought that many villagers might not be able to survive this winter and was planning to marry some of their women to other villages. He heard that this was happening in Wall Village. Many villagers are getting married recently. And he even plans to send the girls from the village to Wall Village. He and the village chief Bright know Wall Village well. Before finishing the affairs of the village, Baron Serdak snatched the food from the desert bandits and sent it back. Seeing the camel team and hearing Baron Soldak make such a decision, village chief Huggins' legs became weak and he almost knelt down to Soldak on the spot. After Soldak had dealt with these matters, he did not stay in Gouda village any longer. He told Chief Huggins to handle the follow-up matters. He also left the selection qualifications of the three militia battalion militiamen and asked him to select three brave men on his behalf. The villagers who are good at fighting will report to Wall Village when they receive subsidized rations next month. Serdak then drove the camel team back to Wall Village overnight. When passing the entrance of the underground river, the sound of rushing water could still be heard in the darkness. Soldak stayed at the entrance of the underground river for a short while. He planned to visit the underground river cave during the dry season. A circular embankment is built at the entrance. When the water level is lower than the embankment, the lake water here no longer flows into the underground cave, so that a lake can be artificially constructed here. After those cobalt slaves have repaired several cement roads in the deserted land, and when the dry season begins next spring, the cobalt slaves will come here to surround the lake. The reason for the lack of water in the deserted land is not only because of the long dry period, but also because there are cracked limestone layers everywhere, and the entire land cannot hold the rain. Andrew led the leading camel in front. Samira rode in the center of the team, and Gulidam followed at the end of the camel team carrying a bone-crushing stick. Return to Wall Village. Several large iron pots in front of the row houses at the entrance of the village have already cooked multigrain porridge, and several village women who got up early are adding water to the large iron pots. Nowadays, because the village's reservoir is filling up, the river in the village is dried up. To wash up early in the morning, the cobalt slaves have to fetch water from the bottom of the artificial canal on the river bend tidal flat. As soon as it gets light, there is a group of people. The cobalt slave walked back from the artificial ditch carrying a bucket. Serdak discovered that the leading cobalt slave actually had a dark necklace of the moon hanging around his neck. He was wearing linen clothes and seemed to be wearing a simple leather armor. Judging from the clothing, he seemed to be better than the others. Cobalt slaves are superior. A long camel team passed through the dead trees at the entrance of the village and walked slowly into Wall Village, immediately attracting the attention of the villagers. It is rare to see so many camels in the deserted land. Even the noble lords in Helensa City rarely raise camels. These precious camels are basically controlled by the bandits in the desert. When the village chief Bright heard the news, he rushed over immediately. When he saw these camels, several large packs of blood-stained leather armor, and more than 40 scimitars. He immediately knew that this was Soldak. These people had killed a desert army. Only a robber can gain something like this. Village Chief Bright was lame and leaning on a cane and asked Soldak with concern. Have you stopped those nasty group of sand thieves? Well, we arrived at the edge of the desert. Just half a day ahead of them. Serdak stopped and briefly recounted what had happened. The old village chief patted his forehead and said to Soldak. Duck, Luke came back from the sulfur mine yesterday. It seems he has news to tell you. This guy ran to the mine just after he got a wife. He shouldn't be up yet. Soldak asked Andrew to hand over the camel reins to the old village chief. And then said to him, Please help me resettle these camels. It is easier for these camels to walk in the deserted land than horses. This will it's our first camel team. Then he waved to the old village chief and said, I'm going home first. When Luke wakes up, ask him to come to the police station to find me. 
After saying that, Soldak rode on the ancient Bolai horse, asked Andrew and others to return to the police station, and walked alone along the cement road in the village towards his home in the upper reaches of the valley.